Gravity Wave, Book 3 in the Quantum Realm series. Written by USA Today best-selling author J.J. Falconer. Narrated by Gary Tiedemann. Chapter 1 Denial will bleed you dry. That's true whether you're talking about your career, your relationships, or in Lucas Ramsey's case, the future of humanity. Denial would have been easy for most men, especially if they were standing, like him, on a steep mountaintop in Arizona, preparing for a confrontation with 211 copies of themselves, each copy walking toward him wearing a smart skin suit. Their skin-tight, body-length time travel uniforms looked identical to his, covered with an intricate pattern of gold lines, like what you'd find on the bottom of a computer circuit board. He wished he could take the easy way out by deflecting responsibility for what had just gone haywire, but it wasn't going to stop the mob of copies heading his way with a look of disbelief on their faces. Granted, this journey back in time to old Earth was supposed to happen, but not like this, not with a bevy of clones in tow. His original task was to arrive solo, then make carefully plotted changes to the timeline in order to restore the integrity of the universe. Lucas wasn't sure what went wrong, but given his long list of failures, a smarter man would have expected something like this to occur. A smarter man would have known not to blindly accept the theories of the late Dr. Cleesby and his tunic-wearing accomplice, Master Fuji. Not after they'd shown a propensity to obfuscate the truth, usually in the name of science or some other malicious lie. He couldn't deny he was impressed with Fuji and his ability to catch glimpses of the future by tapping into the Akashic field. But even the hairless monk couldn't have predicted Lucas would arrive on Earth with 211 copies of himself. Something obviously malfunctioned, a common occurrence for his less-than-common existence. Lucas drew in a deep and purposeful breath, paying close attention to the pressure and intensity of the heartbeat pounding in his eardrums. He watched the gang of Lucas copies walk toward him, their heavy footsteps pounding on the sun-baked Arizona landscape, reminding him that life had its own rhythm and intensity, as did death. The copies were spread out, forming a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder skirmish line that covered the mountaintop's desert surface from left to right. He knew the plot all too well. He was slated to compete in the ultimate gunfight against his own past, thanks to an endless series of scientific blunders and personal miscalculations. Some might say his first mistake was just being born. Of course, that wasn't within his control, and neither was becoming an orphan at a young age. His life was a raging tire fire, burning with reckless abandon until its toxic fumes choked the life out of everyone he came in contact with, and many he didn't. He accepted the fact that he couldn't outrun his own inevitability, but still, time seemed to pick on him relentlessly, mangling his reality into a cosmic joke. Regardless, he needed to press on, clinging to a flicker of hope that he could somehow tweak the future in his own universe and start a chain reaction that would ripple across multiple universes and set everything right. A daunting task, to say the least. If he failed, the multiverse would once again become the unwilling victim of his mounting collection of failures. A bald version of Lucas seemed to be leading the crowd of copies, his blue eyes wide and filled with determination. The look-alike glanced over his shoulder to the left, then to the right, as he waved to his fellow travelers to close ranks and join him. They did, coming together with precision like an angry college marching band forming the letter V during a halftime show. Lucas forced himself to swallow the sticky batch of saliva that was collecting on the back of his tongue. He watched the horde of self-pity approaching him, realizing every decision he made, every action, every thought from this point forward would forever create a link. A link that would bind his soul to the soul of all his copies and everyone they've ever known or loved. He knew the after-effects of this event would create endless, cascading scenarios that would spread across the fabric of space-time until it touched the lives of countless billions. He fiddled with the supercharged Google glasses resting on the bridge of his nose. 
Fuji, he said into the device, not waiting for a response across space-time. Are you seeing this? Not yet. Still waiting for video sync to stabilize, attempting to compensate. Lucas didn't have time to wait for the subspace video feed to connect to Fuji's home universe. Looks like we've sucked 211 copies of me into this anchor point. You must have dropped a digit somewhere in your calculations. Not possible, Fuji squawked across the communications link. You'd rethink that answer if you were standing in my shoes. I've got a shitload of duplicates approaching my position, and they look pissed. Video link established, Fuji reported. See what I mean? Yes, obviously we have a problem. You think? We may have caused an unstable transdimensional incursion, funneling in multiple anchor points across the narrows of time. The multiverse may be compromised. How is that possible? Fuji hesitated for a second, then responded. If your transmission passed through a chronometric eddy that was supercharged with dark energy, then it must have created an unstable convergence of space-time. That would mean that the eddy was interwoven with subspace, Lucas said. So basically, we weakened the fabric of space-time near an intersecting point between the 212 universes, like we ripped a hole in the bottom of a giant lake being fed by hundreds of tributaries. All the water is pulled together with force, then sucked through the opening to a central point on the other side. Yes, a coalescence of realities. I really can't stand that word, coalescence, he snapped as a memory flashed in his mind. He remembered the painful, dark traveler who'd squatted in his brain for months, tormenting his every thought until it was ripped out by the mind-stealing machine on the Baku ship. If the telepaths hadn't lied to him about it being a medical healing device, the traveler would still be hiding inside, since Lucas never would have allowed them to use it on him. The Baku called the hitchhiking coalescence random patterns of cognitive distortions that grouped together and became self-aware. There may be other side effects as well, some possibly catastrophic and certainly unpredictable. Space-time itself may have been destabilized in and around your penetration point. We may see any number of fractures in the timeline. Some could widen and grow in intensity as you move forward making a complete timeline reversion more difficult. I thought you factored all possibilities into your equations. The location and density of dark energy is difficult to anticipate. It's fluidic by nature, not static. That much is obvious, Lucas said, taking a step backward. He could feel the edge of his heels angling downward as the loose dirt along the edge of the cliff started to give way. But seriously, I need suggestions. Otherwise, it looks like I'm going to be kicking my own ass in a minute. They're closing in. Try to reason with them. Diffuse the situation, a new voice said across the comm link. It was the late, or at least supposedly late, Dr. Cleesby. Professor, you're alive? Apparently, yes. How's that possible? Your arrival in the past must have altered the timeline, Fuji said. But I just got here. I haven't done anything yet. Oh, but you will, Cleesby said. Or you already have. Cause and effect are not sequential by nature. Ripples in time cascade in all directions, not just forward, Fuji added. It's possible. You altered events in the near past. A predestination paradox, Lucas said. Yes, the dark energy may have amplified the bleed-back effect. Effect before cause, Lucas mumbled, remembering the theory from one of his classes at the university. But, like before, trying to understand the complexities of temporal mechanics made his mind seize. He wondered how much of the timeline had already been restored. Are Drew and Carrie Ann with you? What about Bruno and Rico? Sorry, Cleesby said. They're all still dead. Just then, a trio of the Lucas copies walking on the left flank were pulled into the air about ten feet, all three men screamed as their bodies began collapsing in on themselves, like six-foot-tall hunks of bloody string cheese being sucked into a powerful straw until only a single speck of matter remained. Then they vanished from sight, followed by a blinding flash of light. Holy crap! Did you see that? Lucas said. Looks like the multiverse may be autocorrecting, trying to compensate for the imbalance of matter and energy, Cleesby said. Or this incursion is unstable, Fuji said. Is that going to happen to me? Lucas asked his distant friends. Unclear, Fuji answered. More data is needed. The advancing horde was now only 30 feet away. 
they slowed their pace, spreading out to form a skirmish line in front of Lucas. Guys, a little help here. What's behind you? Cleesby asked. A steep cliff. I know what you're thinking, but I really don't want to experience the effects of gravity firsthand. What about the recall switch? Can't you just pull me back? Unavailable. The chamber needs time to recharge, Fuji said. The power draw exceeded its expected load, possibly due to your transmission's penetration of dark matter. The mob stopped walking after the bald Lucas held out his arms. The leader moved forward three steps, giving Lucas a clear view of the bald copy's heavy swatch of freckles. They were different than his, and so were the man's micro-focused blue eyes, a few shades deeper with tiny flecks of black surrounding the pinpoint-sized pupils. Why did you bring us here, he said. Lucas held his arms up, hoping to avoid a beating. You think I'm responsible for this? The hairless copy pointed at the Google glasses. You're the one wearing the tech. I'm guessing it's some type of transportation device. Not exactly, Lucas said, using a soft tone in his voice. The man knelt down and picked up a rock the size of a grapefruit. He stood, bouncing the stone in his right hand. Several other members of the clan did the same, though two of them were using their left hand, which was odd since Lucas was right-handed. Why would some of his copies be left-handed? Baldy turned his body sideways, leveraging his arm back like a baseball pitcher. He brought his arm forward, sailing the rock at Lucas. Lucas ducked instinctively, but realized he didn't need to. The rock flew over his head, missing him by a good ten feet. The bald Lucas picked up another rock. I suggest you hand it over. And I mean now. Next time, I won't miss. Just then, a trio of military-style helicopters rose up behind the group of Lucas copies from the depths of the cavernous valley below, their four-bladed rotors whirling through the cool mountain air. The sound of the blades were muffled and not chopping as expected, probably using whisper mode to conceal their approach. The twin-engine airships carried an impressive array of weaponry mounted across the underside of their fuselage, making them easily identifiable. Boeing AH-64 Apaches. The Google Glasses heads-up display identified each ordnance, 30mm chain gun, 1,200 rounds of ammo, and a suite of Hellfire missiles. The three warbirds angled their hulls in different directions, spreading out into a three-sided attack formation. The swarm of Lucas copies covered their heads as a hurricane of downdraft wash pummeled them from above. The loudspeaker mounted to the underside of the middle chopper activated. On your knees. Hands up. This is General Alvarez. We have you surrounded. This is your one and only warning. You've got to be kidding, Lucas said, remembering the man's ruthless actions from the earlier timeline. He dropped to his knees, putting his hands over his head. He thought the 200-plus copies would have done the same thing, but they didn't. Instead, each one took off running in a different direction. The heavy-caliber machine guns on all three Apaches opened fire, spraying the mountainside with a hail of exploding rounds, incendiary charges, and depleted uranium penetrators. Lucas covered his ears, then plopped to the ground and curled into a ball. He watched seven Lucas copies on the left explode into chunks when a flood of rounds hit their mark, center mass. Arms and heads flew one way, torsos and legs went another. Copy after copy was gunned down without mercy, sending body parts, flames, and streams of blood and guts across the desert terrain as the rapid-fire boom of the chain guns shook the earth. The rightmost helo leaned and circled around, aiming its deadly ordnance at Lucas. He knew he needed to act, but he only had one choice. He removed the Google glasses from his face and folded them, holding them securely in his palm. He rolled his body backward with his arms laced across his chest, hoping and praying that he and the skin-tight smart skin suit would survive what came next. He worried about the integrity of the time travel suit since it covered him from neck to toe and would surely take a beating when gravity took over. If he damaged a single strand of the gold nanocircuitry, it wouldn't be able to form a stable communications link with Fuji and the professor back home. 
A second later, he found the edge of the mountaintop, just as the gunship opened fire. A barrage of rounds tore through the dirt on both sides of him as he took a deep breath and swung his lower body around. His legs slid over the cliff. Then gravity took over, sending him sliding down the mountain on his backside, feet first. Bushes and rocks flew past as he fought to maintain his body's upright position despite the uneven terrain battering his undercarriage. For a moment, he thought he might survive the ordeal, but then his right foot caught an edge of a protruding rock, flipping him end over end. He landed on his stomach with his face leading the charge downhill. His heartbeat hammered at his chest when he noticed a flowering green-colored cactus. It was dead ahead along his current trajectory. He flung his head and shoulders back and to the right, hoping to avoid the lattice of needles sticking out from the drought-stricken plant. The three dozen or so spines missed his eye and cheek by mere inches, but they caught one of his kneecaps when his hip hit something hard, pushing his lower body into the plant. The impact with the cactus tossed him again. This time, he landed on his back as the skin on his leg ignited with radiating pain. His slide down the mountain continued, picking up steam as he went. A few seconds later, he realized the free fall was about to come to an abrupt halt. Twenty feet in front of him was a shallow gully filled with dirt and rock near the base of the mountain. He tried to protect his head with his arms before impact, but it didn't work. His cheek crashed into a pile of rocks, tearing his flesh open as shockwaves of pain burrowed their way into his jaw and landed in his neck. He rolled over onto his aching back and waited for the pain to subside a bit so he could catch his breath. Somehow, he'd survived the fall, but his body was screaming at him from several locations. Lucas sat up, putting pressure on the gash in his cheek with his hand. He scoffed, realizing the haunting cheek scars were back. Poetic justice, some might say but at least he was able to enjoy a day without them after Carrie Ann repaired his face with the dermal regenerator. He took inventory of the rest of his body. His left wrist was sore and tender to the touch, but other than a wicked headache and a myriad of sore spots, he thought he was okay. Then he remembered the Google glasses. He checked his hand. Shit, they weren't there. He looked up, realizing he'd lost them somewhere on his way down the mountain. Without them, he wouldn't be able to communicate with Fuji or return home. He thought about climbing up to recover them, but decided against it when he heard more screams and gunfire coming from the plateau above. He needed to get moving before the gunships came looking for him. A stand of tall, dense brush was about 15 feet ahead of him. There was plenty of shade and cover underneath the thick foliage. He figured he could wait there until the airships finished their assault and left the area. Then he planned to find the glasses and get the hell out of there. He stood up to walk to the shade, but his vision blurred as vertigo took over. His feet stumbled backward, sending him falling to the ground on his ass. Walking to the shade wasn't going to be an option. That meant crawling on his knees, one-handed because of his sore wrist, toward the shadows. It wasn't easy or quick, but he made it just before one of the Apache war machines swooped down from the ridge above his position. The roar of the twin-engine monster was soon replaced by the chop of rotors when the craft drifted overhead, sending dirt and pebbles thrashing through the air. Lucas checked to make sure his arms and legs were tucked under cover and not visible from above. The attack helicopter hovered slowly to the right, Lucas worried that the general's pilots might be using the warbird's onboard thermal imaging system to look for heat signatures. If so, they'd be able to locate him, assuming they could distinguish his heat signature from the rest of the objects baking in the desert sun. He was safe from detection while hiding under the thick brush, since it would obscure his heat signature from above. But his bloody face plant and subsequent crawl through the dirt and rocks might have left a trail of differential heat, something the trained soldiers might be able to trace. Lucas listened closely, keeping tabs on the location and speed of the warbird as it circled around behind him. So far, so good, he thought. But then his headache and dizziness intensified, making his eyes glaze over and his body weak. A few seconds later... His face hit the sand, and everything went black. 
Chapter 2 Lucas opened his eyes and waited for the floating, speckled blobs in his vision to clear. They did, but the invasive headache was still pounding inside his skull. He was lying on his back, spread eagle, in a poorly lit room with only one source of light, a small desk lamp to his left. It was in the corner, with a weak, fluttering bulb installed. His body was covered with a soft, plush garment, and not the tight, stretchy fabric of the smart skin suit. The dim light didn't allow him to see much, but from what he could feel, he was covered in a white robe. His breath quickened, taking in a torrent of air through his nose. Must and mold were the dominating odors, but that wasn't all. The air was humid and thick, almost too thick, as if it were being saturated artificially, probably by the motorized device buzzing somewhere above him. The surface pressing against his back was rigid and at least six feet long, a fact he knew was true since neither his head nor his feet were hanging off the end. He wanted to sit up, but couldn't move his arms or legs. Something had a hold of him. He rolled his head to the left and noticed a rope around his wrist. It extended out and down, disappearing below the edge of the wood-grained surface he was on. He tried to pull his arm free, but the lashing held firm. The surface beneath him jiggled each time he moved. He was on a platform, probably a table, and it seemed likely the rope securing his hands was tied to the table's legs for reinforcement. He tried to free himself again. This time he summoned all his might, yanking and tugging with his good wrist and both legs in rapid fashion, hoping he could wriggle at least one of them free. He couldn't. The rope was too strong, threatening to tear at his skin. A second later, he heard the strike of a match near his feet and saw flickers of flame bouncing off the ceiling. He craned his neck to look down across his body. The shimmering face of a young Asian girl looked back at him, brought forth from the shadows by the burn of a ten-inch matchstick. Her smile was stunning. You really need to keep still, otherwise you'll injure yourself further, she said, before the match completed its initial high-intensity burn. Who the hell are you? he asked, feeling his chest tighten and his blood pressure rise. She didn't answer, giving him a slight grin with her dark eyes locked onto his. Where am I? Why am I tied up? I'll answer all your questions, but for now, I need you to relax and remain calm, she said, walking to the right side of the table with the flaming match in hand. The slender woman was dressed in a black t-shirt and pants with a duty belt around her waist. Her camo-style headband was pushed up high on her forehead, puffing up the jet-black strands of hair along the front. She stood with the burning match next to his knee, which was swollen to the size of a football. There were at least two dozen needles sticking out of his kneecap, each with a brown-colored ball the size of a marble stuck on the end. Holy shit, he said, remembering the impact with the cactus during his tumble down the mountain. I was able to remove the spines, but then I discovered something else. Two fang marks. A snake? That would be my first guess. Then you need to get me to a hospital, now. Sorry, that's not possible. The nearest hospital is more than a day's walk. You'd never survive the trip. You're too weak. Besides, a hospital won't be necessary. I lanced the area and was able to extract most of the venom. It took some effort, but I managed to remove the dead and discolored tissue. I'm pretty sure I got it all, she said, lighting one of the needle balls with a match. What the hell are you doing? He asked with his eyes wide. Apply treatment. First we heat, then we treat. Treatment? She nodded, lighting the rest of the balls. Ancient family remedy. Hey, I appreciate the help, but I need a real doctor, not this mumbo-jumbo crap. You need to call 911. Like I said, that's not possible. Well, make it possible. I'm dying here. I don't have a phone. You have to do something. Look, it's been nearly 24 hours since I found you in the desert, and you're still here. Plus, there's no telling how long you were lying there before I found you. Your fever has broken, and your vitals are getting stronger, so I'm pretty sure you'll be fine. We just need to continue treatment. 24 hours? Yes, and let me say, you've been a real handful. Vomiting, violent seizures, hysteria. I'm guessing, since we're having a normal conversation, you're feeling better? That all depends on what your definition of normal is. Normal is normal. What else is there? 
Lucas didn't want to spar with her. I don't know, but my head's freaking killing me. You may have a grade three concussion. The gashes on your face were pretty severe. I had to use almost 30 stitches to close them up. I did what I could with the sutures, but I'm afraid you'll probably have some nasty cheek scars. Trust me, I'm used to that. I just wish my heart would stop racing. It'll slow down once your anxiety lessens. He hesitated, letting his heart rate slow a bit. You could start by untying me. Not yet. I want to make sure you don't freak out again. My kidney can't take any more rights. I hit you? A couple times. Sorry, I didn't mean to. She finished lighting the last needle ball. No worries, it's understandable given the circumstances, but you can see why I don't want to untie you quite yet. Yeah, I do. But trust me, it won't happen again. I give you my word, he told her, in his most sincere voice, peering down at his right hand. He didn't see any swelling along his knuckles, as expected, making him wonder if she was telling the truth about the punches. He thought about bringing it up, but decided against it. She seemed calm at the moment, and he didn't want to upset her. Until she untied him, he was at her mercy and needed to choose his words carefully. He turned his thoughts to the mission. If I've been here a day, that means that today is Friday, December 21st. Yeah, 2012, he added, realizing that the first window of opportunity to change the past was fast approaching. His other self and Drew would soon be prepping to run the anti-gravity experiment in their lab tonight. I really need to go. I can't be here right now. You're not going anywhere with that knee. Look, I appreciate the concern, but I have something important I need to do. Lives depend on it. I'm sorry, but it'll have to wait. He was trapped, with no leverage to debate the issue. A super-hot Asian chick had him strapped to a table and was performing zen-level voodoo crap on his knee. He needed to know more about her. Was he at the mercy of some wacko, or was she really trying to help? Am I a prisoner? No, but if you leave now, you run the risk of serious infection, and I can't allow that. I know you said lives are at stake, and even if that's true, you need to rest and let yourself heal. You can't help anyone right now, not until you're better. Then we'll talk about what comes next. Lucas let his head drop back to the table, exhaling. This is unbelievable. Patience, she said. Let the medicine work. It won't take long. What type of treatment is this? One designed for a snake bite? Once the healing medicine has been ignited, it works its way down through the needles and into your immune system, releasing powerful antibodies and other healing magic. Sounds like antivenom. Or should I say magic antivenom? Something like that. Now relax. You'll be able to free climb in a few days once the swelling dissipates. Free climb? Where did she get that from? Lucas thought about it for a moment, then remembered what he was wearing when he fell off the cliff. The smart skin suit might look like some type of uniform to her, possibly even mountain climber's garb. She must have undressed him while he was unconscious and slipped on the white robe he was wearing. Where was I when you found me? Under a stand of scrub oak in a dry wash near the edge of a cliff, not far from the Catalina Mountains. You were pretty dehydrated. And my clothes? She pointed to the left. I've never seen a climbing suit like that before. He could see the gold and black material hanging over a chair. Can I see it? She went to the chair and returned with the suit in her hands. She held it up, just beyond the blaze of the needle balls. There was a section missing from the right knee. What happened to it? I had to cut a chunk of it off in order to treat you. It's ruined, Lucas said, realizing that he wasn't going to be able to return home. Not without the nanowire circuitry intact. The suit wouldn't be able to form a stable connection with Fuji's incursion chamber, not with a hole in it. Where's the piece you cut out? Maybe I can mend it, Lucas said. It was full of blood and pus. I burned it. It was a biohazard. Damn it, he snapped, knowing he was stuck in the past. Then an idea popped into his brain. Even if this incursion failed, he could have Fuji from the future tweak his calculations and send him back a few days earlier. That way, he could avoid the general's ambush on the mountain and probably not suck in the other Lucas copies. Of course, his plan assumed he'd arrive early enough to avoid the blowback ripples in time. But there was another choice. Fuji had pre-programmed a series of anchor points into the incursion system, each an important date from Lucas's past. This trip was the first of those anchor points, and the most recent of them all. 
Those that remained were further back on the timeline and targeted pivotal events from his own history. Before he could do anything, he needed to find the Google Glasses before their battery ran out of juice. He ran a quick calculation in his head. About seven days of power remained. Plenty of time to let his leg recover and then make contact with Fuji on the distant Earth outpost, Utopia 3. Once he did, the brilliant monk should be able to walk him through repairing the suit. If he was lucky, there might be some fabric pieces lying on top of the mountain that he could use as a patch. I was wearing some special glasses when I fell. You didn't happen to see them lying around somewhere, did you? No, sorry, she said, putting the suit back in the corner. You might want to think about wearing something white next time. Dark colors are dangerous in the Sonoran Desert. So we're still in southern Arizona? Yes, northeast of Tucson. This is my home. How did I get here? I carried you. By yourself? Yes. Luckily for me, you're skinny. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Still, that's damn impressive, he said, needing to know more about her. Where was she from? Why was she helping him? The list of things he didn't know about this good Samaritan was long, but he didn't want to press her. Not yet, anyway. She bent her arm at 90 degrees and curled her fist to show off her bicep. I'm stronger than I look. Lucas nodded, watching her egg-shaped muscle bulge at the seams of her tiny arm. It was laced with veins sticking out along the skin. A smaller, more sculptured version of Drew's arm muscles after a couple hundred push-ups. She was strong and in fabulous shape, that much was clear. At five foot nothing, she couldn't have weighed more than a hundred pounds. Then, he noticed her dark tank top and how well it fit her petite figure. Her jet black, shoulder length hair was clean and shiny, and she wore very little makeup. Not that she needed any, she was a natural beauty. Her skin was flawless and porcelain white. He let his eyes drift down across her toned body, taking in every curve along her jaw-dropping physique. Get a grip, he scolded himself. This is no time to be thinking about sex. Now that all the needle balls were lit and flaming at full intensity, he could see more of the room than before. He saw at least 35-gallon containers stacked along the wall to the right. Each blue plastic receptacle had the same three letters written on it with black magic marker ink, H2O, plus a date, 12-1-2012. A faded three-foot square U-Haul moving box was standing with its open end next to the water canisters. The feathered ends of at least a hundred arrows were sticking out of the top of the container. He counted four flights that looked pristine, but the rest were tattered and dirty. A pair of full-sized compound hunting bows were leaning against the wall next to the arrows, along with an impressive-looking camouflaged-colored crossbow. A bulletproof vest hung on a hook to the left of the bows, just above six stacks of Mountain House No. 10 food storage cans. There was even a smattering of feminine products, such as tampons and pads. He studied the concrete walls. There was a hatch-style door behind the girl, he thought about the lack of natural light, the musty air, and the rectangular metal device attached to the ceiling that was pumping in air through a series of vents. He was in a bunker. Are you a prepper? he asked. I'm a survivalist. I prefer to live off the grid. Can't trust the government these days. They have eyes and ears everywhere. Everywhere, huh? he said, holding back a roll of the eyes. Yeah, everywhere. Plus, they send boots out here to sweep the area twice a month. Sometimes fighter jets, too. Almost caught me a couple of times. He realized the paranoia was thick with this chick. Time to change the subject. So I take it we're underground? Yes and no. We're inside a mountain. How deep? 212 feet. Lucas was starting to hate that number. It seemed like every time he turned around in the past couple months, that number was staring him in the face. He coughed. Is it safe? Yes, as long as the ventilation system is working properly. I've been living here for several years without a hitch. By yourself? I'm waiting for my dad to return from his hunting trip. How long ago was that? She hesitated, looking up at the ceiling. Two years, eleven days. Seriously? Lucas said. Obviously, she was a little nuts. Gorgeous, but nuts. Not that he could blame her. After all, she was living alone in the middle of the desert, in some doomsday bunker buried deep inside a mountain. Anyone would go nuts in a place like that. Eventually, even the walls would start to talk. 
Still, being a recluse didn't change the facts. She was just another big bag of crazy. What kind of person thinks their father is coming home from a hunting trip when he's been gone for two years? A delusional person, that's what kind. He cleared his throat, buying time to choose his next set of words carefully. He wanted to gain information, but didn't want to upset her. Right now, she wasn't agitated, and he wanted to keep it that way. He needed to probe, but not pry, letting her feel like she was steering the conversation. That's a long time. It's possible something might have happened to him. That's what my brother Rocket said when he moved out last year, but I still have faith. My father promised me he would return, and he's a man of his word. Rocket's an unusual name. Actually, it's his middle name. I can't tell you what his first name is. He'd kill me. Lucas thought about Dr. Cleesby. I know all about that. I have a friend back home whose first and middle name is Drock Morton Leslie. He prefers to just be called D.L. I'll bet he hates his parents for that. Probably. Not that you'd ever get that man to admit it. Talk about tight-lipped and obsessed. What about your mother? I haven't heard you mention her. She ran off with the bailiff she met while sitting for jury duty. My father told me she finally met someone as messed up as her. He said their neuroses were a perfect match for each other, melding themselves together to make one complete person. How did your dad take it? Lucas replied, thinking of Cleesby's torturous past with his wife. He kept it all hidden from us, but I know he's hurting. It wasn't long after Mom left when he started this whole survivalist movement in the desert. Always be prepared, he'd say to me and my bro. I think that was code for Mom's an adulterous bitch. Not that I could blame him, but I still miss her. Lucas didn't know how to respond, so he didn't. She stared into space for a few seconds, then turned her eyes back to Lucas and smiled. My name's Masago. I'm Lucas Ramsey, he said, flexing his hand to get her attention, hoping she'd untie him for a shake. Thank you for saving my life. She grabbed his hand and shook it with a powerful grip, like a sumo wrestler. You're welcome. By the way, I really like your birthmark. It reminds me of a cute little koala bear. He tried to reach for his hip to cover it up out of instinct, but his hands were tied. You saw that? Kind of hard to miss. I tried not to look when I undressed you, but what can I say? How about sorry? Okay, sorry. I promise not to look next time. Next time? She shrugged, tilting her head as her face flushed red. How long have you been in the military? I'm sorry, what? Lucas answered, trying to make sense of her comment. Yesterday morning, when I was out checking my traps, I saw three Apaches circling the far end of the mountain range. Normally, when a hiker is lost, they send out the search and rescue, not the National Guard. So you must be a reservist, at least. Obviously, I was curious and decided to check it out. But by the time I got there, everyone was gone. I figured the search was over, so I decided to refill my canteen. When I headed for the only water source in the area, I found you. Good thing, too, because otherwise you'd be coyote food right now. Fortune smiled on you yesterday. Yeah, it was my lucky day, all right. But I'm not in the military. Then why were the helicopters looking for you? Beats me. Maybe search and rescue was busy somewhere else, and they were the only resources available, he said, needing to shift her focus. Did your father teach you the medical skills? She shook her head. We have a well-stocked library at the other end of this compound. Reading is the best way to pass the time. My father is a firm believer in being prepared for everything. What would your old man say if he walked in right now and saw me strapped to this table? Bringing home a complete stranger is pretty risky. I wasn't worried. You have a kind face, she replied, watching a fly buzz around the table. What's left of it anyway, Lucas said. He moved his cheek around, feeling the cotton bandage tugging at the skin. Something told me that I needed to help you. I feel like we're connected in some way, like I was supposed to come along and find you lying there. Do you believe in destiny? Not really. Well, I do. Deep down, I can feel it, like it's coursing through my veins. There's a higher force at work, bringing souls together to enrich their lives. The more this chick talked, the crazier she sounded. Yeah, there's a force at work, but I don't think it's God. She shook her head with vigor. You're wrong. It's God. She's everywhere. He didn't want to upset her or insult her religious beliefs, so he decided to tread lightly. You're probably right. I don't know. Sometimes I think it's the universe and not God. 
The universe has a strange way of twisting destiny into something evil. But then again, I'm not exactly a religious person, so what do I know? Why would you say something like that? Only God controls your destiny. It's just a feeling I have. No offense. You get that way when you've been through what I have. It seems like everyone I know, everyone I've ever cared about, is dead or suffering because of me and the mistakes I've made. It doesn't matter what I do. Someone always gets hurt. It's like I'm cursed or something. I'm sure it's not that bad. Sometimes bad things happen. It's all just part of life. It's what you do afterward that defines you. You have no idea, he said, rolling his eyes. I'm the reason the world is so messed up. If my father was here right now, he'd say you're a little too preoccupied with yourself. The world doesn't revolve around you. Believe what you want, but I'm telling you the truth, at least my version of it anyway. She didn't respond. Her perky face dissolved into something more placid. He must have hurt her feelings. Not a good idea, since he was tied to a table and completely at her mercy. Look, I'm sorry. You have faith, and that's cool. I totally respect that. Don't let anyone, including me, ever tell you what to think. People have been doing that to me all my life. It sucks, I know. No need to apologize. You're entitled to your opinion. Still, I'm sorry. It's probably just the medicine talking. Could be. My head's swimming right now. Hell, I'm amazed I can even form complete sentences. It'll be okay, she said, smiling. Everything happens for a reason. I wish I shared your optimism, but I've learned the hard way that I can't afford to. Every time I do, shit goes completely fucking sideways, like I'm some cartoon character. You curse too much. Sorry, sometimes the F-bombs just take over. I'll tone it down, but one might fly out now and then. Look, everything will be okay. You must have faith. This was meant to happen. Maybe, I don't know. Regardless, you saved my life. Thank you. Not many people would have done what you did. She offered a tender smile, followed by a hair tuck behind her ear. I'm just glad we met. Before Lucas could decide if she was hitting on him, the same fly from earlier buzzed Masago's face and then strafed the table. She looked at him with an unfocused stare, then snatched the fast-moving fly out of the air with a lightning-quick swoop of her hand, never looking at the insect. She pulled a switchblade from a Velcro pocket on her duty belt and held it up in front of Lucas. She flipped open the knife and gave him a mischievous smile. Her hand shook the creature inside for a three-count before tossing it in the air. An instant later, she sliced the air with her glistening knife, cutting the fly into two halves, which fell onto Lucas's stomach. He looked down to inspect the remains. Each half of the tiny carcass looked to be exactly the same size. Holy shit! The room was filling up with all kinds of crazy. Lucas cleared his throat, trying to think of something intelligent to say. Whatever was going on inside her brain didn't bode well for him, not while he was strapped to a table with a sexy ninja chick carving up insects with a wicked grin leading the charge. He needed to shift her focus to something else before he became the next subcreature to be halved. Masago's a beautiful name. I've never heard it before. It's actually a boy's name. My father wanted another son, but he ended up with me, she said, with eyes downcast. The hand holding the knife began to tremble. So did her bottom lip. Nothing I ever do seems good enough. His logic screamed at him to choose his words better. I hate when fathers do that. They put such unrealistic expectations on their kids. It's not fair. All we ever do is disappoint them, monumentally. She nodded as tears welled in her eyes. He could relate to how she was feeling. For what it's worth, I think you're amazing. If your dad couldn't see that, then he's a bigger fool than me. Her face lit up with an ear-to-ear -ear smile. Thank you. That might be the nicest thing anyone has ever said to me. Lucas found her statement hard to believe. But then again, the elevator didn't go all the way up to the top with this one. At least she wasn't depressed anymore. Is Masago a family name? It means the sands of time. Dad was really into history and the meaning of stuff. He loved the early Japanese texts and spent years studying mystical and religious cycles, mapping them to current events. Everything was normal, well, almost normal, until he read some paperback book about chariots and ancient aliens. Some German nutjob wrote it, but I can't remember his name. Eric von Daniken? Yeah, that sounds right. Have you read it? No, 
but I had a professor in college who mentioned it once or twice. The book's called Chariots of the Gods. Hey, I was close. I knew it had something to do with chariots. Anyway, Dad tried to get the rest of the family to read it, but we refused. That's about the time he started to go all squirrely, dragging us out here in the middle of the night. He became obsessed with anything related to the end of days and prepping, always preaching that we needed to be ready for their return. You know, to survive the alien apocalypse. Can you believe it? Aliens? At first, my brother and I resisted, especially after he told us he figured out how to catch glimpses of the future. Really? How? He'd meditate for hours, trying to tap into something called the Akashic Field. You ever heard of it? Master Fuji's face appeared in his mind, sitting on the floor of the basement in the remote cabin on Utopia 3. Uh, yeah, once or twice. I have a friend who's into all of the same stuff. I'm not sure what it's all about, but some of the things he predicted came true. Eventually, we had no choice but to start believing him. Well, sort of. I hear you, sister. Seeing is believing. She touched the back of Lucas's hand, rubbing the skin with the soft of her thumb. It's nice to have someone to talk to again. The nights can get pretty quiet around here. A strange calm rose up out of nowhere and washed over his body. He wasn't sure why. She was odd and major league scary, to say the least, but the soothing feeling was what it was, so he embraced it. He considered whether or not to tell his new friend he was a scientist, too, and he was from the future. Would she believe him, or would she think he was suffering from a snakebite-induced delusion? He decided to keep his mouth shut. He'd already contaminated the timeline more than he wanted to, and needed to stop the information flow before he told her even more. Two things were for certain. She was easy on the eyes, and he was happy to be alive. He wasn't sure what to say next, so he stared at the flaming medicine balls warming his kneecap. A second later, Lucas's heart nearly stopped when a police-style red light in the corner of the room started flashing intensely. What the hell is that? Perimeter breach, Masago whispered before extinguishing the flaming needles in one massive breath. She held an index finger to her lips and flared her eyebrows. I need you to stay calm and not make a sound. I can't let them find us here. I'll be back as soon as I can. Lucas nodded, though he suddenly had a dozen questions for her. His brain wanted to follow her instructions, but his lips thought otherwise. What's going on? Who's here? He asked in a whisper. Shh, she said, moving to the other side of the room. He tugged at the rope around his wrists, hoping to get her attention. You can't leave me here like this. What if you don't come back? Masago hesitated, then used the knife to make quick work of the rope, pinning him to the table. Lucas was free. She held the knife to his throat, touching the blade to his skin, but not drawing blood. Don't make me regret trusting you. I won't. I'm one of the good guys. Trust me. She pulled the knife away. He sat up and spun his legs over the edge of the surface. When gravity bent his injured leg toward the ground, pain swelled in every cell of his body. He wasn't going anywhere, not without assistance. He waited for it, but she never offered. Chapter 3 Masago slipped on a bulletproof vest. Kevlar, size extra small, and cinched it tightly around her chest with the Velcro straps. She grabbed the bigger of her two hunting bows and a handful of carbon composite bolts from the U-Haul box and tucked them under her arm before spinning the handle of the wall hatch and pulling it open. The submarine-style doorway led into the next compartment of her desert abode, where she found a pair of night vision goggles on the shelf. Then she returned to the opening and nodded to Lucas to make sure he was okay. He gave her a thumbs-up signal. I'll be back as soon as I can, she whispered. Secure the door behind me. Lucas pointed at his injured leg, then shrugged, giving her a cheap imitation of a wounded puppy dog look. She didn't respond. There wasn't time. He'd just have to figure it out on his own. She ran to the far end of the stronghold, then scurried up the exit ladder that led to a connecting mine shaft her father and brother had reinforced a few years earlier by replacing the rotting timber supporting the walls and ceiling. The lumber was expensive, but her father was able to afford the proper material by using the generous profits he made from the sale of their spacious home. She missed that place in the foothills of Tucson. It held the last memories of her estranged mother.
Masago prepped her weapon, tailoring the feathered fletches before slipping the bowstring into the slotted knock at the back of an arrow. Her eyes peered around the corner, scanning the first section of the switchback tunnel. It led out of the mountain and into a desert clearing surrounded by scrub brush. She listened carefully. No unexpected sounds rustled in the darkness. That meant one of two things. The intruder was waiting for her in the shadows ahead, or he was still just beyond the mountain, near the perimeter of her detection grid. Of course, there was always the possibility the breach was caused by a woman, but only a small chance. Men were usually her biggest problem, but not in a social way, more of a I'm-gonna-take-everything-you-have-and-then-kill-you kind of way. When you live in the desert and do so alone, defending the homestead becomes a daily worry. The string of incandescent bulbs attached to the ceiling was off, just as she'd left it earlier after hauling Lucas to the bunker. She didn't want to turn them on, fearing their luminance would signal the intruder. Instead, she strapped the head-mounted night vision system over her head, adjusting the gain on the Gen 3 device to maximize its efficiency. The scenery in front of her lit up through the goggles, showering it with a translucent green glow. The battery indicator showed 40%. It wouldn't be long before another recharge would be necessary. She made her way down the corridor, keeping her body low and tucked in close to the rock-infused wall as she scanned the area for intruders, all quiet in the section ahead. Slow and steady, she reminded herself, before working her way through the remaining corridors of the zigzagging passageway. Ten minutes later, she came upon the entrance of the mine shaft. No sign of anyone. Not inside, anyway. She removed the goggles, flipped the power switch off, and hooked them to her duty belt. A signal booster device hung on the ceiling above. She stood on her tiptoes, her fingertips just reaching a strip of electrical tape covering the LED status indicator. She peeled it off. The diode was green, meaning the booster had AC power and was communicating properly with each of the security devices outside. The unit acted as a relay transmitter between the monitoring equipment in the bunker and the wireless detection grid outside. She reapplied the tape to cover the diode. The 15 motion sensors, each strategically placed for concealment, were spaced along the clearing's half-moon-shaped perimeter in 20-degree increments. Their coverage area spanned an area the size of a city block, with some overlap to spare. Normally, she'd spend time each morning replacing the batteries in the wireless units with fresh rechargeables. However, with the recent Lucas distraction, she'd forgotten to change them that morning. She thought, or maybe hoped, the sensors may have malfunctioned due to low power levels, sending a false alarm to the underground equipment. If not, then she had another intrusion to thwart. Anything but tanks, she mumbled, looking out the tunnel entrance. There was no movement in the area outside. Then, a mix of dulled voices drifted in from the left. Men, as expected, just loud enough to trump the trickling water in the stream running lengthwise through the clearing she knew was ahead. She slipped outside, veering left and ducking behind a thicket of brush that bordered the fishless waterway. Her feet crept slowly all the while keeping the bowstring taut and at the ready, the deadly tip always aimed in the same direction as her eyes. The voices grew louder with each advance. The men were close, at least four of them, possibly more. She approached slowly, using carefully planted footfalls and covert techniques she'd honed during the years of living alone as a self-sufficient huntress. The last of the thick vegetation was her destination, the same point where the winter runoff from the Quinlan Mountains fed the stream. Motion stirred through the foliage, giving her the intruder's location, a 30 by 30 foot clearing just beyond the rushing water. She stayed low and moved ahead, using the brush as cover until she could see the threat. She counted two trucks and six men, all slender, tall, and wearing street clothes. One middle-aged man with short-cropped hair and a stiff jaw carried a sidearm strapped to his belt line and was shouting orders to the others. He opened the driver's door to one of the two 50-foot twin-axle transport trucks that didn't carry any signage. The vehicle's orange and black-colored paint was peeling and faded, but recognizable. Old U-Haul trucks. 
A man climbed into the cab and shut the door before rolling up the driver's window. He held a cell phone out in front of him, pressing the screen with his fingers, then put it to his ear. She watched the other men fumble through their work. The precision, speed, and efficiency of military training was missing, meaning they were rank amateurs. They unloaded crate after crate from the hydraulic lift gates attached to the back ends of the twin trucks. Each 4 by 4 foot wooden box had the words fragile this side up stenciled on all four sides. It appeared the men were preparing to set up camp, but for what purpose? One of the unloaders, a less than handsome man with pitted cheeks and a huge can opener shaped nose, used a crowbar to pry open and remove the top to one of the cartons. He put his hand inside and pulled out a wad of straw-like packing material, tossing it aside. What is this stuff? he asked with a look of surprise on his face, his voice carrying fifty feet to her position. Cover it, one of his fellow workers replied with a charged whisper. He leaned and craned his neck around the back of the truck, peering toward the cab. Then he looked back at the other man. If Hatcher gets out of the cab and catches you, he'll have your ass. We're just supposed to unload, not open them. The other man did as he was told, placing the cover back on the crate, but left the nails protruding and didn't pound them into the frame. Masago decided she needed to get a look inside that box. She surveyed the area, quickly formulating a plan. Continue left, then cross the water and work her way around. A trio of heavy boulders stood tall where the mountain's runoff landed in the stream bed. She should be able to sneak behind the men by using the boulders and rushing water as cover. These weren't trained soldiers like the last time this happened, so she figured they wouldn't be paying much attention. Civilians. Piece of cake. She unloaded her bow and set it aside, along with her stock of bolts and the rest of her gear. She needed to improve her mobility and lessen the chances of clatter during her incursion. She stood to move but changed her mind when the cab door of the truck opened. She took refuge behind a bush. The leader, Hatcher, as the other man had called him, climbed out of the vehicle and walked to the rear of the truck. He held a smartphone at arm's length from his body, pressing and swiping the screen with his middle finger. GPS says 53 meters, due east. Let's get it done, people. Why here? Wouldn't it be easier to drive them to the storage location? One of the long-haired workers said, removing his baseball cap to wipe his brow with the back of his hand. He shook his head from left to right, making his locks flop wildly in the air. Then he tucked his hair inside the cap's brim and around the back of his neck as he put the cap back on. This is the closest access point for the vehicles. The rest of the way is on foot. So we carry the crates, boss? By hand? Hatcher exhaled a long, slow breath, shaking his head. Look, this isn't a debate. You have your orders. Each man grab one of the canisters inside and get moving. They only weigh about 30 pounds each. They look heavier, the ugly man with the big nose said. I'd say 50 pounds easy. You looked inside? He nodded. They were to remain sealed until I gave explicit orders to open them. What's the difference? We were going to open them anyway, the curious man said. I've never seen anything like it. What is that shit? Something the eggheads don't want us messing with. Now get busy. We've got work to do. Boss wants this done ASAP. Only one more crate, Hatch, one of the workers reported from inside the second truck. Seconds later, he and another man pushed the wooden container to the edge of the cargo bed. They spun it around on top of the lift gate, then used the hydraulic controls to lower the cargo to the ground. Open them up, grab the canisters, and let's get them to the storage site, Hatcher said, looking at his watch. On the double, people. We're due back in 90. Moments later, crowbars were prying off the lids to the boxes, and material was flying up in the air as the workers yanked it out to uncover what was waiting inside. Just then, a squad of twelve armed men, all wearing loose-fitting street clothes, came out of nowhere and surrounded the group. Military-style AK-47s and Glock 40 caliber handguns were the weapons of choice. Nobody move. We have you surrounded, one of the armed men said, with his left shoulder to Masago. He was bald, six feet tall, very thin, and hadn't bothered to button the front of the cotton dress shirt he was wearing. The shirt tails flapped in the breeze with each step he took. Masago leaned forward, slightly prying the limbs of the bush apart to get a better look. She caught a glimpse of something else underneath the man's open shirt. More clothing. 
she recognized it. A skin-tight black uniform with gold symmetrical lines covering the material. It was the same climbing gear outfit she'd found on Lucas. Hands up. I won't tell you again. Back away from the containers, the bald man told the group of transport workers. They followed his demands, raising their hands without hesitation and stepping back. They huddled themselves together, loosely facing Masago. The armed men shuffled their positions, forming a semicircle around their prisoners. What do you want? Hatcher asked with his hands above his head, his sidearm still nestled in its holster. Let's start with your weapon, the bald man said. He moved forward and removed Hatcher's weapon. He ejected the magazine, then tossed the gun. Masago moved ten feet to her left, changing her position while four of the marauders closed ranks around their captives. The shift gave her a better view of their faces. One of the new gunmen had long red hair, but she recognized his face. She couldn't believe it. He looked just like Lucas, could have been his twin brother. Then she studied another man when his profile became more visible. This guy had only one arm, but he too could have been Lucas's brother. She caught glimpses of more of their faces as the scene played out, each one resembling Lucas, even the old man with the thick gray-colored eyebrows and sideburns. She was about to stand up and get their attention, planning to take them to Lucas, but changed her mind when the bald man rammed the butt of his stock into Hatcher's knee, sending him to the ground in a heap. Hatcher screamed in pain, grabbing his legs with both hands. The bald assailant walked behind and around the rest of the workers, now huddled over their leader, who was rolling on the ground in pain. Baldy stopped in front of the standing hostages after completing a full circle around them. He took off his cotton shirt, revealing the gold and black clothing underneath. We're looking for our brother. He has this same uniform and looks just like the rest of us, except he wears some odd-looking glasses. Have any of you seen this man? No one responded. Think hard. He may be injured. I won't ask again. None of the prisoners said anything. Instead, they shook their heads slowly, keeping their heads down. The bald attacker moved back four steps and waved his hand. The rest of his men opened fire, sending a blitzkrieg of rounds from the machine guns. The high-velocity projectiles tore into the bodies of the helpless workers. Smoke, blood, and body parts were all Masago could see from her position. She ducked her head and covered her ears. When the gunfire stopped, Masago looked up. Hatcher was the only worker still alive, but the bald assailant had a large caliber stainless steel handgun to the side of his head. Last chance, asshole. There were two sets of tracks that came right through here, so we know one of you helped him. Where's my brother? Hatcher spit in the bald man's face. Fuck you. I'm not telling you shit. Masago put her hand over her mouth, preparing herself for what she knew would come next. The bald intruder pulled the trigger, blowing Hatcher's head apart in an instant. She gasped into her palm, trying to control her breath and growing panic. Something inside of her told her to run. Run now. Run before they find you. But she didn't. Her training took over, keeping her calm and still. Wait for them to leave. They don't know you're watching. Just then, one of the attackers, the older man with the bushy facial hair, started to convulse. Milliseconds later, his body was yanked hard, like his waistline had just been attached to a fighter jet traveling at Mach 3. He flew toward the sky in an instant, disappearing into a pinprick of light. She flinched, snapping a branch in front of her knee. The hairless leader turned his head, his hawk-like eyes looking directly at her position. She gasped and froze. Chapter 4 Dr. Cleesby advanced the month on his office wall calendar by one to show December 2012, realizing it had been sitting on November for three extra weeks. He pulled a thick folder from the four-drawer filing cabinet and carried it to the desk in his campus office. He plopped the file on the desk, sat in the high-backed leather chair, spun his legs around, and opened the research. He read through the handwritten notes, page after page, scouring the data, making sure he hadn't missed a single calculation. Minutes later, 
His eyes grew tired, and his mind lost focus, drifting to memories of his wife and son waiting for him back home in his universe. He smiled, enjoying the moment of peace, but it didn't last long. Paranoia took over, fueled by the harsh reality of his situation. He shook his head, knowing he'd been gone for decades, and doubted his family would still recognize him. What were the chances Caroline had waited for him after all these years? Slim and none, he told himself. She probably moved on with her life and married someone else, forgetting his worthless ass a long time ago. The question burned in his soul, fueling his desire to push his research further and his staff harder. Nothing was off limits now. He needed to get his crew and their technology off this planet and out of this universe, back to where they belonged, before it was too late. The world of the global internet and networked smart devices meant instant information flow, something that couldn't be controlled, quantified, or anticipated. Everything was happening at the speed of light, making it increasingly more difficult to keep his secrets from the public and the government. He knew time was running out. Eventually, someone would discover their presence on Earth and seek to control their advanced technology. His network of underground silos were built and operational, but were sitting ducks just waiting to be discovered by some curious blogger who was simply following the money flow. If that happened, they'd never get home. He'd been planning every detail of their exodus since his crew's splash landing on Earth in the 60s, but now all the hard work and covert actions came down to a single experiment. Success hinged on Lucas's anti-gravity experiment, meaning the results of tonight's E-121 power test had to be different. Otherwise, there was a good chance he'd have to kiss his family reunion goodbye. His plan to keep Lucas and Drew in the dark was a gamble, but he didn't have a choice. If they knew the real truth, they wouldn't understand, nor would they continue to help him. The Ramsey brothers would feel betrayed and misled, and he wouldn't blame them. But he couldn't risk the chance of another information leak, not with the lives and the future of his entire crew at stake. Well, everyone except Eugene, who'd gone off to join Hollywood shortly after they'd first arrived on Earth. When Gene quit the team, he carried with him a faith and conviction to change the world with his vision of the future. Gene wasn't a supporter of Cleesby's plan to get everyone home, and the professor wasn't a fan of Gene's planned TV series. Regardless, they still had mutual admiration for each other, not that either of them would ever admit it. Their collective pride and stubbornness wouldn't allow it. In the end, they were two men with different visions of the future. The professor hadn't talked with Gene since the late 60s, not since their heated argument over one of the season two Star Trek episodes his friend had written and aired. Gene had made a pact with him before he left not to divulge any of their secrets, yet that's exactly what happened, ending their relationship. When Gene died in October of 1991, Cleesby decided to attend the funeral, but stayed in the shadows. He mourned his friend's passing with a heavy heart, but the loss wasn't as difficult to bear as the thought of never getting the rest of his shipmates home to their families. Even if the professor's plan was ultimately successful, he wasn't sure if he'd come clean with his young protégés. Telling them he was a former starship captain from the future and from another universe wasn't going to be an easy discussion. Neither was telling them he'd been marooned on Earth with his crew of loyal shipmates and a suite of advanced technology. The truth would certainly break Drew's heart, and probably Lucas's too. The door to his office opened. In walked his longtime security friend, Bruno Benner, carrying a priority message envelope. Hey, boss, you got a second? Sure, Cleesby said, closing the research folder on his desk. He sat back in the chair, expecting the rotund man to start off by cracking one of his silly jokes, but he didn't. Bruno's face was serious and stiff. Hector, our man inside the general's unit just sent us an encrypted communique and samples. Of what? I'm not exactly sure, Bruno replied, putting his hand inside the envelope. He pulled out a swatch of black fabric covered with gold etchings that resembled the underside of a computer's motherboard. He gave it to Cleesby. Some type of fabric with gold circuitry built into it. The professor pulled at the material, inspecting its elastic properties. 
He opened the desk drawer and found a four-inch magnifying glass tucked behind a couple of rulers and a tray full of pencils with teeth marks along their shafts. He held the magnifier close to the cloth and turned on his desk lamp, showering the fabric in light. Impressive nanocircuitry. I've never seen anything like it. Military issue? Not sure. However, assuming these pathways are made from gold, there's something we can test, the professor said, pulling another item from the drawer, a powerful rare earth magnet. He put the fabric on the desk and was able to pick it up with the magnet. Gold is not magnetic, so this test proves the base material is. It looks to be made out of a densely layered metallic substance, possibly graphene, but without better equipment, I can't tell you its composition. Where did Hector get this? The general's men found pieces of it on a remote hilltop near an undeveloped section of the Catalina Mountains. Apparently, there was a failed incursion. His troops gunned down an entire company of men wearing uniforms made out of this stuff. Alvarez sent the material off to be analyzed. Hector managed to reroute a sample to us. When was this? Yesterday, just after Homeland Security received credible intel about an imminent attack on NASA's underground lab on campus. The general and his men were patrolling the airspace when they spotted the insurgents wearing this stuff. When they refused to surrender, the trigger-happy general took them out. How many? Hector's encrypted note said 190 verified kills. He sent a video, too. Bruno pulled a flash drive from the envelope. What's on it? The professor asked. Unknown, sir. It's marked DLK only. Pleasby took the USB drive from Bruno and plugged it into the port on the front of his desktop computer. The video file auto-started, displaying on his LCD monitor. The professor angled the screen to allow Bruno to watch the recording, too. Various text-only instrument displays, including speed, direction, pitch, roll, yaw, altitude, and GPS coordinates were superimposed across the screen. The bottom of the recording contained the date and time of the event, serialized in real time down to a hundredth of a second. Looks like this was taken from one of the belly cams, the professor said, watching the images on the video bank sharply to fly toward the mountain. When the aircraft circled around, it caused a change in sun direction, casting three surface shadows on the landscape below. Then the pilot dipped the nose gear, flying closer to the surface. The shadows grew in size and clarity, revealing more detail. Three choppers, heavily armed, he told Bruno. Apaches, Bruno said. This is going to get ugly. The screen showed dozens of uniformed men gathered on a hilltop in a V formation, walking toward a lone man near the edge of a cliff. The video showed all the insurgents being highlighted with red tracer outlines, one after the other in rapid fashion as the onboard targeting system cataloged its targets. The helicopters slowed their approach, then hovered just beyond the edge of the mountaintop's clearing. The intruders turned in unison to look at the helos, putting their arms up to protect their faces from the downdraft wash. Seconds later, all but one of the uniformed targets took off running. The aircraft opened fire, sending a shower of bullets into the scrambling men, ripping them apart like string cheese. Like shooting fish in a barrel, Bruno said with a grimace on his face. The video ended 33 seconds later and hung on the last frame. Both men remained silent, eyes focused on the final image of a cactus torn apart in the attack. Did you notice anything strange? Cleesby asked, breaking the quiet in the room. Bruno shook his head. None of them were armed. The general gunned down unarmed men, Cleesby said. That ain't right, I tell you, regardless of the intel. I agree, Cleesby added, fiddling with the video controls on his computer. His heartbeat calmed and his logic took over. Let me see if I can zoom in a bit. There's something I want to check. He restarted the video, then paused it when one of the intruder's face was centered on the display. He highlighted the middle of the screen with the video software's crop handles, then tightened the camera's focal point. He clicked the Z key on the keyboard several times until the distorted face of the bald intruder was large enough to fill the highlighted area. Now we adjust for pixelation and let the software render the man's face, Cleesby said, clicking a few more keystrokes. And bingo. The professor's jaw dropped open. So did Bruno's. Lucas? How can that be? I don't know. Where's his hair? Jesus, he's as bald as me. Cleesby laughed, though he didn't want to given the bloody circumstances. But sometimes horrific situations can be softened with some levity. 
He and Bruno had certainly seen their share of death and destruction during their space travels before the crash landing on Earth in the 60s. They used to talk about it behind closed doors, but not anymore. They'd seen too much over their lifetimes, becoming desensitized to the mayhem and gore. Mostly for self-preservation, but also to keep logic in control. It's obviously not our Lucas. I saw him earlier today, hair and all, Cleesby said. No extraneous bullet holes. None that I could see. That's good news. I would miss that kid and his off-color humor. He's definitely one of a kind. Well, two of a kind now, apparently. I think you'd miss his mother's fudge bars more. They are to die for, Bruno said, rubbing his hanging belly. I do have a bit of a sweet tooth. So that's what you call it, Bruno shrugged. Hey, what's a man to do? I've got the same problem. And I'm not one of you, so what does that tell you? That every species loves chocolate, synthetic or not. You've got that right, brother. Bruno laughed, then his face ran stiff. Do you think Lucas has something to do with all of this? Maybe. But this could simply be the result of a software malfunction, Cleesby said, letting the video advance a few more frames. He paused the recording again, then centered and zoomed in on a different intruder's face. This person had long red hair, but the same face. He ran through the same procedure a few more times, showing close-ups of a one-armed man and three others with cheek scars. All of them resembled Lucas. Cleesby brought his elbows up to rest them on the desk, then dropped his head into his hands, trying to make sense of what he'd just seen. What the hell is going on, D.L.? How can they all be Lucas, or versions of him, Bruno said. I don't know. Something's not right here. Clones? No, definitely not. Human cloning technology doesn't exist, even in our time. Is it possible one of our facilities was breached? Someone may have obtained a working supply of our biotechs, then used it to create an army of replicas. Cleesby shook his head. That seems unlikely, especially since we segregate the biotechs from its activating enzyme and randomly move them to different locations every few days. And you and I are the only ones who know the current locations. Precisely. It mitigates the threat level. The odds of randomly selecting the correct pair of storage facilities would be in the neighborhood of 5,000 to 1. Then, let's not forget that each Lucas looked slightly different. Biotech's copies would all be identical. Plus, there were almost 200 of them. Yes, which is more than our supply of biotechs, Cleesby said, appreciating his lifelong friend's insight. Bruno nodded. No, this is something else entirely. I wonder if any of them survived. Doubtful. They were cornered and no match for the gunships. I don't know what idiot came up with the idea to send them in unarmed, but it was a complete and utter slaughter. What a waste of men. God rest their souls. You'd better double security tonight, in and around the lab. I'm concerned about the timing of this event. It's no coincidence this happened the day before our most important experiment. We can't take this lightly. My gut is telling me that everything has changed somehow. I'm sure the general is more than curious about all the lookalikes. If he identifies the insurgents as being related to Lucas Ramsey, he'll try to shut us down tonight under the guise of national security. Consider it done, Professor. Cleesby pointed at the video screen. What do we have in the area where this took place? Transport Unit 12. Hatcher's men, sir. It's his team's first trip to storage site Delta 3. He should be just about finished with today's exchange. Let's retask him and see if he can find the exact location of the massacre. The general's men may have missed something. If nothing else, have him collect blood samples for a DNA comparison. Then we'll know more. If this incursion is some type of elaborate ruse designed to implicate our young friend down the hall, we need to find out who is behind it. You got it, Chief. Anything else? Cleesby tossed the fabric piece to Bruno. Drop this by Griffith's lab and have him run a complete analysis. I want to know exactly what we're dealing with here. While you're down there, stop in and make sure Lucas is still Lucas and has a pulse, the professor said, winking. You know, just in case. Roger that. And check if the E-121 has been delivered. If not, get on the horn and find out where it is, Cleesby said, closing the video window on his computer. Lastly, when the new lab tech arrives, I'll need ten minutes with her to bring her up to speed before she meets Lucas and Drew. I don't want Darby walking in unprepared. Those two can be a handful for the uninitiated. I thought her name was Abby. This is a different gal. The other one changed her mind about the intern position. Called me late last night. Talk about waiting until the last minute. Yep, kids these days. 
Why'd she change her mind? Safety concerns, but I really don't know why she felt that way. She didn't elaborate, and I didn't want to pry. So I went with my second choice, Darby Richardson. She's more than capable. Chapter 5 Randall Larson flipped on the blinker of his 2012 Lexus sedan for a few seconds before moving his car onto the roadway's shoulder. Clicking the turn signal was a habit he couldn't break, even though there wasn't another car around for miles. Hell, he'd do it without thinking when pulling into his driveway at home. A few seconds later, he put on the brakes, then eased the vehicle into the shade under a seldom-used railway overpass 20 miles outside of Tucson. He turned the car off, but left the key in the auxiliary power position, then unbuckled the seatbelt. Larson turned on his portable MP3 player and plugged it into the car's stereo system, choosing the first classical music selection. He let the melody cradle him for a full two minutes before turning his attention to the latest draft of lab expansion contracts. He pulled the paperwork from his briefcase, seeing a cover sheet of paper with notes on it from his paralegal secretary, Crystal Richardson. Her handwritten note identified three new sections needing his approval. Every few minutes, he checked the rearview mirror, looking for a black SUV that should arrive any moment. He hoped the buyer would be on time today, not like the last time when the man was over an hour late. Larson never would have chosen this meeting location, especially since he was without his cell phone. Nobody knew where he was or who he was meeting with, and that was by design. Of course, even if he wanted to let someone in on his illegal activities, he didn't know who he was meeting with. His buyer was a ghost, some anonymous corporate spy who paid him well to leak technical specs and project information from the university. Three small purchases thus far, but this time was wholly different. Today was about a life-changing amount of money, meaning he could pay off his mounting debt and right his financial ship, possibly even retire if all went according to plan. He looked around, checking the surroundings in all four directions. No cars, no homes, no signs of life. He was alone, utterly alone. If his car broke down, or if this meeting went sideways, nobody would find him for hours, possibly days. But he didn't have a choice in the matter. The buyer insisted he come alone, and without his cell phone, whenever they met. Larson assumed the buyer chose this spot for both its remoteness and to take advantage of the cover provided by the railway overpass. Plus, there were the regional power lines that ran parallel to the train tracks. Their massive electrical field should scramble any remote listening devices pointed in their direction. The buyer's attention to detail was impressive, but this clandestine meeting still made him nervous. An inner battle was raging between his military training and the money he was going to be paid. For a few moments, he considered turning around and heading back to town, but the piles of cash he was about to receive won the argument. They convinced his inner marine to ignore the obvious risk and complete the exchange. He had seven kids to put through college, and even though he was paid handsomely by the university for his legal skills, his lifestyle and family were far more expensive than he could afford. Plus, he couldn't say no to his wife or kids, so that left him only one choice, earn some serious cash on the side. Besides, it wasn't like he was committing treason or selling secrets to the Russians— all he was doing today was sharing schematics for an experimental reactor, a reactor that would probably never work because it was designed and built by a pair of grubby-faced youngsters in one of the campus labs. He exhaled, then continued reading the expansion agreements. He circled a few sentences with his fountain pen for Crystal to change, then left her handwritten notes in the margin of the pages. She was a proven assistant, though she didn't always spell-check like she should before handing the document to him for review. Ten minutes passed before something caught his eye, a reflection in his car's side mirror. He studied the image, then realized someone was approaching, but it wasn't a black SUV. It was a black four-door car with a light bar mounted across the top and twin push bars sticking out from the front bumper. The car was traveling in the right-hand lane when its lights started flashing red and blue. Seconds later, a siren chirped twice. 
Larson put his seatbelt on and started the car, waiting to see what happened next. The police cruiser slowed its approach and pulled alongside his Lexus. It stopped, and the passenger side window rolled down. Inside was an overweight female cop, Hispanic. Larson rolled his window down and leaned through the opening, consciously wanting the officer to get a good look at him. He didn't want her to see him as a suspicious person or a threat, so he smiled at her. Her eyes were on him, though her right hand was busy on the computer terminal mounted to the dashboard, only inches from a tactical shotgun. Everything okay? she asked, leaning her upper body to the right, the seatbelt still wrapped around her shoulder. Yes, officer, I'm just taking a break, resting my eyes, he said, hoping the cop wouldn't get out of her car and ask for his ID. If she lingered, the buyer might get spooked, and then Larson could kiss the money goodbye. You live around here? she asked in that special tone that cops use. No, ma'am, just passing through on my way to an early meeting. Her eyes tightened, so did her jaw. Where? What kind of meeting? I'm an attorney for the University of Arizona. We're negotiating with several contractors for a campus expansion. I have a meeting with the highest bidder in Nogales, he said, reaching for the contract sitting on the passenger seat. He held them up for her to see. I was up all night working on the agreements. Didn't get much sleep. There's no stopping on the pavement, she said with authority. You need to get moving. There's a rest stop 15 miles ahead. I suggest you use it. Okay, will do. Thank you. She studied his car for a few seconds, then gave him a sharp mini-wave of her hand. She closed the passenger window and drove off, accelerating to high speed as she sped around the curve and out of sight. He exhaled and held his stare for a few seconds, letting the back of his head hit the headrest before looking at the fabric covering the underside of the roof. He rolled his eyes. What the hell am I doing here? He took a long minute to let his pounding heart slow down. It did, but before he could decide what to do next, a black SUV pulled alongside of him, skidding to an abrupt halt. His blood pressure surged into overdrive again, sending a sudden rush of adrenaline pumping into his system. Here we go, he mumbled, preparing himself for what he hoped would be the final encounter with this man. He grabbed his data recorder, swiped the menu screen to the second page of icons, and turned on the covert audio recorder. He waited for the screen to go blank, then got out of the car. The buyer, a smartly dressed businessman in his forties with a thin nose and pale lips, got out of his car and walked to the rear of his vehicle. The man pulled a semi-automatic Glock handgun from a shoulder holster hiding under his suit coat. He cocked the weapon and pointed it at Larson's face. Easy now, Larson said, taking a shallow step back and putting his hands up. He could feel the beat of his heart pounding at his eardrums. His military training kicked in, helping him appear calm. Let's not do anything rash. What the hell was that cop doing here? She stopped to see if I needed any help. What'd you tell her? That I was just resting my eyes, taking a break from driving. She bought it and drove off. End of story. No reason to get jumpy. The buyer didn't respond or move. Look, she was just doing her job and I took care of it. It's all good. Are we going to do this or not? The buyer stared at the pavement ahead, then put the gun away. Do you have it? Yes, in my briefcase. Give it to me, before the LEO returns. Do you have the money? The buyer nodded, but only once. Let me see it. The man opened the rear hatch of the SUV. He pulled out a green canvas bag with an exaggerated sag at its midpoint. He opened the bag, showing the contents to Larson. Bundles of hundreds were lying inside. One million, as agreed. You want to count it? Larson didn't want to extend the exchange any longer than necessary. The cop might circle back any minute, putting his ass and his family's future on the line. No, I trust you, he said, leaning into the Lexus. He opened the briefcase and grabbed the thumb drive from inside one of the pouches. He stood, holding the storage device in front of his face. You hand me the money, and I give you the drive, agreed? The buyer held the money bag out with one hand, extending an upward-facing palm with the other. Larson put the drive into the man's free hand and snatched the bag by its straps. Oh, and there's one more thing, the buyer said, slipping the flash drive into his pocket. What's that? We need an exclusive. What kind of exclusive? The campus experiment needs to be shut down. Today. 
That's a tall order, my friend. I don't have that kind of authority. Only the advisory committee can terminate a university-funded research project. Can you do it or not? It might be possible, Larson said after a two-count, but it'll cost extra. How much? Another 500 large should cover it. That's a bit steep. What you ask is difficult. I may have to grease a few palms along the way, not to mention the added risk I'm taking. The buyer looked at his shoes for a few moments, then made eye contact with Larson. Fine, 500,000, but you're committed now. The project gets terminated today, he said, yanking out his gun again. He pressed the barrel hard against Larson's chest. Otherwise, you get terminated tomorrow. Understood? It took Larson a few seconds to find his voice. He sucked in a few extra breaths to energize his vocal cords. Yes, completely. Uh, won't be a problem. Good. Then we have an understanding. A binding agreement, if I choose to speak in your vernacular, the buyer said with attitude in his voice. Larson nodded. The buyer lowered the gun and returned to the SUV. He slipped in and spun the car around, then drove off with squealing tires, leaving a trail of burned rubber and black smoke. Larson threw the bag of cash into the trunk of the Lexus, closed it, then leaned his butt against the car. He turned off the audio recorder and put the unit into his pocket, making a mental note to save the recording to a secondary backup device. How the hell am I going to pull this off, he asked himself, as his mind began to swirl with panic. He ran his fingers through his thinning blonde locks, finding the dollops of sweat thick and plentiful. He didn't know the buyer's name or who the man worked for, and that was just fine with him. Just do as they ask and pocket the rest of the cash, then you're done with everything. It sounded simple in his head, but it wasn't. He had no idea how to get the project's charter revoked, much less do so in a few short hours. Cleesby had too much clout with the advisory committee and wouldn't allow it. He hated that arrogant man. Then the answer hit him. He didn't have to stop the project, just remove one of the pieces from the game board. Lucas Ramsey. If he did, the experiment would fail, or at least be delayed long enough for him to collect the money and disappear with his family. Chapter 6 Lucas slid his body off the table and gently set the foot of his injured leg on the ground. It was sore, but manageable. Certainly better than an hour ago. Masago's needle ball remedy must have started to penetrate and work its magic. He might be able to resume his mission to restore the timeline soon. He leaned to the right, putting more of his body weight on the knee. Almost instantly, the pain became too intense. He backed off the leg, realizing he wasn't going to walk normally for a while. He considered his options. Masago had been gone a while after leaving the bunker to investigate the perimeter breach. The tense knot in his stomach told him something must have happened to her. If that were true, he was on his own, stuck in an underground mountain bunker in the middle of the Tucson desert. He looked around the room to see what items he might be able to use to help with his exodus. Then he remembered the pair of hunting bows. Masago had taken one of the two bows with her, leaving the other behind. If it were long enough and could support his 160-pound frame, he might be able to use it. He hopped on one leg to the wall where the bow was leaning and grabbed it, tucking it under his arm like a crutch. He kept a firm grip while pressing down hard to test its support properties. It seemed to hold, though there was a fair amount of flexing along the bow's shaft each time weight was applied. It needed reinforcement. But how? He found a roll of duct tape and a hacksaw under some loose clothes near the water canisters. They gave him an idea. He took a few of the arrows from her U-Haul box stash and unscrewed the razor-sharp tips, then cut the flights from the ends. The next couple of minutes were spent cutting the carbon shafts into equal-length sections with the saw. He applied the pieces to both sides of the bow near its midpoint, forming a 90-degree angled cross piece, and wrapped duct tape around the ends to hold them securely to the shaft. He tested it. It worked. The new cross section kept the bow from flexing too much and provided him with a handhold to use. Now, somewhat mobile, it was time to outfit himself with a few more items. First, he took the robe off and slipped on the smart skin suit. 
Then he found a two-quart water canteen with a shoulder strap and a child-sized backpack. It was smaller than the canteen and wouldn't hold much. Prioritize. Only the essentials. A handful of dusty energy bars with faded wrappers were sitting on a shelf, just begging to be eaten. Their expiration date hadn't passed, but the aging treats were stiff and hard as a rock. A smarter man would have left them behind, but his fingers couldn't resist. He was starving, and a gurgling stomach would always trump logic. He tossed the bars into the knapsack. If nothing else, they'd make an excellent hammer or a paperweight. He couldn't see a way to carry any of the number 10 food cans, not without a much larger rucksack and a stronger back, so they remained untouched. Masago's stack of two-ply toilet paper caught his eye, but he didn't want to use up the remaining space for a single roll of creature comfort. His butt would have appreciated it, but not at the expense of more important items. A man must choose wisely, especially when it came to... Before he could finish the thought, inspiration found him. He unclipped the canteen's shoulder strap and squeezed its end through the center of a roll of toilet paper. A smile grew as he repeated the same process with two more rolls. He reattached its clip to the side of the canteen and slid his arm inside. Not bad, he said. Three rolls ought to last a while. He hobbled his way into the next compartment, where he found a few things he wasn't expecting. A four-by-four-foot section of plywood had been attached to a wall with cement anchors. Deep gouges and slices covered the wood surface, forming an ellipse around an object at its center, a traditional dartboard. However, Masago wasn't throwing steel-tipped darts at it. Instead, she was practicing with knives and throwing stars, several of which were stuck deep into the center of the dartboard. Lucas pried one of the knives and one star loose from the board. It took several wraps of toilet paper to protect their sharp points before they joined the other items inside the backpack. Next to the dartboard was a boxer's heavy bag hanging from the ceiling. Beyond that, a long stack of dumbbells ranging from 5 pounds to 50 pounds. Nothing he could use. He continued his recon, discovering a pack of waterproof matches, two small candles, six bandages, a travel-size version of antiseptic spray, sunblock, and a metal compass, all of which he made room for in the pack. It was now full. Time to leave. He made his way through the rest of the bunker, section by section. First, it was the simply appointed kitchen and laundry area, then the sleeping quarters that featured stacks of bunk beds attached to three of the four walls. He found an equipment room surrounded by walls of glass. Inside were stacks of old computers with reel-to-reel -reel tape drives and metal desks from the 60s. Masago did mention her dad was a scientist, but Lucas wasn't sure if her old man built this place or acquired it from someone else, like the army. Either way, he was impressed by the size and scope of the underground facility. He limped down a connecting hallway that led to the library. Masago wasn't exaggerating earlier when she said her father had stocked the book repository with hundreds of books, covering everything from hunting and fishing to surgery and science. The nerd inside of him wanted to spend the next hour skimming through the impressive collection, but he needed to press on. The homemade crutch helped him through another doorway. This time, he found a smaller room. At first, he thought it was a chapel, complete with candles, an altar, and a kneeler positioned in front of it. But the person's face featured on the wall above the altar wasn't Jesus. It was Lucas's face, hand-drawn, and a very good likeness of him. What the hell, he said, waddling a few steps to the shrine. There were dozens of sketches lying about its wooden surface. Some of the drawings showed his face with cheek scars, while others didn't, but all of them depicted him as a young man. He dug through a few more, moving them aside, until he found two color photographs hiding at the bottom of the pile. The first snapshot was that of a child sitting with two adults on a park bench. It was an Asian family, who Lucas assumed belonged to Masago. The young girl was about eight years old and looked just like her. He tossed the photo aside and studied the other one. Masago was a little older, sitting partially sideways in front of an easel with a thick charcoal pencil in her hand. The drawing she was working on was a portrait of Lucas, detailed and complete. He held the photo up and compared the easel's sketch to the artwork hanging on the wall. 
It was the same rendering. You've got to be kidding me, he said, trying to make sense of the facts. She must have been sketching his face since she was a little girl, creating one after another, totally fixating on him. How could this be? His mind whirled with possibilities. Was she clairvoyant or just seeing things? Perhaps it was a family trait. Her old man was supposedly able to tap into the Akashic field. Maybe she could too. They wouldn't be the first people he'd met who touted the clairvoyant ability. He wasn't sure what was going on and didn't have time to dwell on it. He folded the photograph in half before cramming it into the backpack. Ten minutes later, he made it to the top of the escape ladder and climbed down into the first section of a mine shaft. The tunnel was pitch black, except for a limited amount of light behind him, leaking out from the bunker below. He took one of the candles from the pack and lit its wick with the matches he'd brought along. The flame flickered and grew in intensity, allowing him to see about fifteen feet, but little more. The walls of rock on either side of him were nondescript, except for a pair of unlit exit signs hanging nearby. He couldn't see much else, but at least he knew the way out. Eventually, he'd catch up to Masago. He figured she was basking in the sunshine, admiring her victory over the unsuspecting intruder. He forged ahead, leaning on the modified bow in one hand while carrying the candle in the other. The crutch carried him through the dirt and rock one painful yard at a time until he traversed the first corner. His hand was throbbing from bracing himself up, so he took a break to let it rest and catch his breath. It worked. Where are you, girl? he whispered, wondering if he should call out for her. If she was still tracking the intruder, shouting might compromise her position. He decided to keep quiet and continue the journey, watching the shades of darkness peel away with every step. The tunnel could run for miles, or end around the next corner. There was no way to be sure, not until after he fumbled his way through the rocky maze. After another seven steps, the darkness ahead revealed something near its leading edge, the bottom of a shoe. It was lying sideways in the dirt. He pressed the candle higher, sending more light down the passageway. The rest of the shoe came into view, plus an attached ankle and leg. Masago, he yelled, realizing she was in trouble, probably hurt and unconscious. He raced ahead, pushing the crutch and his grip to their breaking points. Seconds later, he was standing over her. Her body was lying awkwardly on its side, with her right arm tucked underneath. A blood-soaked piece of cloth was wrapped around her upper thigh like a tourniquet. But that wasn't all. Blood was dripping from her forehead and running down her cheek. He wasn't sure if she'd been shot or beaten. Possibly both. At least her chest was moving, so he knew she was still alive. He maneuvered around her body, expecting to find her hunting bow and quiver of bolts. But they weren't with her. He sat down next to her with his injured leg outstretched to keep his swollen knee from bending. He removed the night vision goggles from her face, then rocked her shoulder gently. Masago? It's me, Lucas. Wake up. She didn't respond. Come on, girl. Talk to me, he demanded in a swift, strong voice. Again, she didn't answer. He put the candle down, then drizzled water from his canteen onto a handful of toilet paper sheets. He gently wiped her cheek and forehead with the makeshift swab, cleaning the blood and dirt to reveal a horizontal two-inch gash. It was oozing red from just above her eyebrow. Jesus, what the hell happened to you? Above him was a jagged edge of rock protruding from the wall. It was red and glistening, with a shape matching the cut on her head. He turned her over, freeing her arm and exposing her injured leg. His hands tore at the cloth to release the pressure from her thigh. Blood began to ooze from the hole in her pants, increasing in volume as her heart pumped through the seconds. His fingers worked quickly, wedging the material open so he could see inside, but there was too much blood. He wiped the area with a fresh wad of wet toilet paper, revealing a quarter-inch hole in her leg. It was perfectly round, with no jagged edges. She'd been shot. Shit, he said, putting the wrap back on her leg. He pulled the ends together until it cinched tightly around the wound, slowing the blood flow to a pulsating trickle. She moaned in pain and opened her eyes. There you are, he said, smiling. Her eyes brightened when she focused on him. What happened? Looks like you've been shot, and I'm pretty sure you passed out and hit your head on the way down. Who did this to you? Intruders. 
Outside, she said in a weak voice. Then I need to get you someplace safe in case they follow you here. She shook her head. I led them away, then doubled back once I was sure I lost them. After you were shot? It's not as bad as it looks. Not as bad as it looks? Are you kidding me? There's a frickin' hole in your leg and it's bleeding like a stuck pig. It's not the first time. Trust me, I'll live. We're gonna have to figure out how to get you back inside so we can take the bullet out. Won't be necessary. Why not? Bullet went clean through. Just need to disinfect and suture it. There's a med kit in the kitchen. Second drawer on the right. It has what you'll need. You want me to stitch you up? Here? In the dirt? She nodded. Don't worry. I'll walk you through it. Lucas held out his hands. They were shaking. I don't think you want Mr. Shakeopotamus working on you with a knife. I know I wouldn't. You'll work through it. I trust you. Now go, please. Lucas grimaced, then nodded, grabbing his crutch. He used it and the wall to stand up. Leave me the candle, she said, giving him the night vision goggles. He put the goggles on his head and took a quick look around. Every detail in the tunnel was now clear and visible, including the parade of exit signs covering the walls of the tunnel. They looked to be installed every ten feet or so. Your old man must have gotten one hell of a discount on signage. The kit, she asked, reaching out and smacking him. Sorry, Lucas replied. He made his way to the ladder, scurried down, and hopped through the bunker. He found the medical kit right where she said it would be, in the second drawer on the right in the kitchen. He returned to Masago, who was now sitting up with her back against the wall. He spent the next ten minutes closing her wound, carefully following her instructions. Blood flowed and she winced each time he penetrated the folds of her skin and pulled the thread tight, making his stomach turn flip-flops in the process. His hand tremors never stopped, but he managed to complete the last suture and tie it off without vomiting. There, that ought to do it. Nice work, Shakeopotamus, she said, laughing. She flexed her leg. Are you sure this was your first time? Yep, I'm not a virgin anymore. At least I didn't hurl chunks. Blood usually makes me queasy. Just ask my friends back home. She smiled. Maybe we need to change your nickname to Mr. Hurlopotamus. Lucas laughed, then pointed at the wound on her forehead. What about that? A butterfly bandage should do. There's one in the kit. He found a split-angle bandage and applied it to her head. The wound closed enough to stop the bleeding. You're good to go. We should get moving. He wrapped his fingers around her arm. Her grin faded into a scowl as she pulled away. Get your hands off of me. Hey, what's wrong? He asked. She pulled her knife out and pressed it against his throat. You've got ten seconds to tell me the truth. Chapter 7 What truth? What the hell are you talking about? He said, trying not to move. He could feel the razor-sharp edge of the blade starting to penetrate the first few layers of skin on his neck. The violent, sadistic men outside weren't just any men. They all looked like you. His mind went blank. Her eyes flared and her face turned beet red. No more lies, Lucas. Are you with them? Part of their gang? Tell me right now or I'll bleed you. Wait, wait, wait. Let me explain. You now have five seconds. Four? Three? He pushed the words out as fast as they'd go. They look like me, but I'm not with them. They're the bad guys, not me. I'm here to save the planet. I told you, no more lies, she said, pressing the knife harder against his throat. The truth, now. I am telling you the truth, but you have to let me explain. Please, just put the knife down, and I'll tell you everything. I'm listening, she said. He felt the knife's pressure ease a bit. What I'm about to tell you will sound a little crazy, but it's absolutely the truth. I swear to God. She didn't respond. Just keep an open mind. That's all I ask. I'm listening. He paused to formulate the words. He needed to soften the blow. Otherwise, too harsh a reality might send this chick over the cliff. But after running through a few choices, nothing sounded better than the truth. Do I need to restart the countdown? She said in a hurried voice. He decided to just let it fly. I'm from the future, sent back in time to stop something terrible from happening. Really? That's the story you want to go with? You said you wanted the truth. Do you want me to explain or not? Sure, go for it, she said with attitude, keeping the knife against his skin. This ought to be good. 
The first time I saw those men was when I arrived on top of the mountain. Yes, I know they look just like me, but they're not clones or twins or even brothers. They actually are me, versions of me, pulled here from 211 different universes by mistake. None of this was supposed to happen. She rolled her eyes. I've heard some whoppers before, but this one takes the cake. You don't seriously expect me to believe any of this, do you? Even my high-strung brother wouldn't buy this one. I know it sounds crazy, but consider the facts. When you found me in the desert, I wasn't wearing a climbing suit. It's called a smart skin suit, and it's made of advanced nanowire circuitry that allows me to travel across time and space with the help of a powerful machine on the other end. Earlier, when you asked me if I was in the military, I told you that I wasn't. Those helicopters weren't trying to rescue me. They were trying to kill me and all the copies of me. My copies and I had just arrived on Earth when General Alvarez and his men swooped down and started shooting. Until a few minutes ago, I thought I was the only one lucky enough to have escaped. Apparently not. Now I guess they're looking for me. She pinched her eyes and tilted her head, taking a few seconds to respond. Okay, I'll play along. Why? They think I'm responsible. For what? Bringing them here. Are you? W well, yes and no. My incursion brought them here, but it was an accident. And now they're pissed and want revenge. Or maybe they just want to go home. I'm sorry they hurt you. She hesitated again, then responded in a softer voice. One of the men was wearing the same outfit as you. That's a smart skin suit. We were all wearing them when we arrived. None of us could have gotten here without it. Or go home, I'll bet. Exactly. That's why I was upset earlier when I found out you cut a piece off and burned it. She nodded slowly, looking at the ground. Think about it. All the versions of me, the helicopters trying to kill us all, the smart skin suits, the copies showing up outside, all of it. It can only add up to one thing. She made eye contact with him, giving him a skeptical look. If what you're saying is true, why do they think you're responsible for what happened? Why not one of the other copies? After all, you all look alike and were wearing the same outfit. Remember those glasses I asked you about? Yeah. They are part of my time-traveling equipment, but I was the only person wearing them. That's why they think I'm responsible. I had the extra technology, you know, like on Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the others. I hated that show. You're not the only one. What are the glasses for? Basically, they're a head-mounted supercomputer that sees all and knows all. Plus, it allows me to communicate with my team back home. I must have dropped them somewhere when I tumbled down the cliff. If you help me find them, I'll prove all of this to you, I swear. But first, you have to believe me. I'm telling you the truth. Some of this is top-secret classified information. She shook her head. I don't know. It's all a bit much. I agree. It's a lot to process, he said in his most sincere voice. But if you step back and think about it for a minute, everything I'm saying lines up perfectly. Who would make up a story as ludicrous as this? She rolled her eyes. Maybe someone who fell down a mountain and cracked his face open, then went into a fever coma after a snake sunk its fangs into his knee. Okay, I'll give you that. Then again, all it would take is some paranoid lunatic to make up a story like this. The desert is full of crazy. Yeah, tell me about it. What does that mean? Nothing. Never mind, he said, wishing he could control his lips better. He searched for a better explanation, something that could shake her stance and make her believe. Let's start over. How many men did you see in the clearing? The ones that looked like you? Yeah. Twelve at first. What do you mean at first? Lucas asked, wondering how many of his copies had survived. If they were gunning for him, his odds of survival or success were dropping fast. Were some of them killed? No, not exactly. The oldest version of you disappeared into the sky. It was like he was folded up and then yanked to heaven. That's when I flinched and they noticed me watching from the bushes. What happened to him? I saw the same thing when I first arrived. I think the universe sent him home. Seriously? Lucas nodded, hoping to summon the proper words to make his theory sound plausible. It's a given there's a specific and finite amount of matter and energy in our universe. We also know that matter and energy get recycled, keeping the levels perfectly balanced. Now, if the other copies were from dimensions like ours, where the laws of physics are the same, it would mean that when they were pulled here, their universe was thrown out of balance. Since the imbalance was created artificially with technology, it left an energy trail that the multiverse could follow to locate the displaced matter. If that's true... Then won't they all be sent home, eventually? Including you? Maybe, but it's just a theory. 
it's just as likely their incursion point became unstable and they simply blinked out of existence. I think I like the first theory better. So do I. She exhaled, staring into space for a few moments. This is all pretty incredible. Yes, it is. But sometimes things happen that are a little hard to explain, but it doesn't make them any less true. Sort of like the drawings in the chapel. She gasped. You saw those? Yep. Imagine my surprise. You shouldn't go snooping around like that. Those are private. Sorry, I was just looking for supplies. He waited for her to say something, but she didn't. He thought she was about to start crying. It's okay, Masago. It really is. I found them by accident. I'm sorry. You must think I'm a freak, just like my dad. The knife blade tugged at his skin with each of her emotional trembles. He needed to keep her calm. I didn't say that. In fact, I think it makes you very special. You obviously have the gift of precognition. She nodded, lowering the knife. I've been seeing your face in my dreams ever since I was a little girl. That's why I draw it over and over, trying to get it out of my head. It's like you've been haunting me all my life. He was stunned, unsure what to say. Is that why you decided to help me? She shrugged. Partly, but mainly because it was the right thing to do. I think I'm starting to understand. That's what you meant earlier when you called it destiny. Yes, she said, as a tear dripped from her eye. I don't care what my dad says. I know in my heart we were meant to be together. He thought about telling her about his real mom and dad and their drug dealing exploits, but decided not to. She was already overwhelmed. She looked at him with soft eyes. So, you don't think I'm weird? Well, we're all a little weird in our own way. That's just the human race in general. What you are is special, and if your old man can't see that, then he's a bigger idiot than mine was. She blinked, but didn't say anything. Look, Masago, you have a gift you can't explain, but it doesn't mean it's not true. There are things in this universe that science can explain, and things it can't. Trust me, I've seen some stuff that would blow your mind. I should write a book about it, probably be a bestseller. She hugged him, wrapping the knife around his back along with her arms. Thank you for believing in me, Lucas. He waited until she let go of him to speak, wanting to keep the weapon where he could see it. You're welcome. But now, I need you to believe me. Can you do that? She nodded. I think so. Thank you. Truth is, all it takes for time travel is a little math, some advanced tech, massive amounts of power, and a big set of balls. It's really not that hard to do, especially if your name is Fuji. How do you know that? Know what? My last name. I never told you. Lucas's brain froze for a few seconds as the revelation soaked into his neurons. Your name is Masago Fuji? She smiled. So you think I have a big set of balls? I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about me. I'm the dumbass who took a leap of faith and risks his life by stepping into an untested time machine. What's that have to do with my last name? I have a friend in the future whose name is Master Fuji. He's a little spud of a man, but a brilliant mathematician. He's the one who built the powerful machine that sent me here. We call it the Incursion Chamber. Master Fuji? Really? Yep, and he was a proud member of the Akashic Field Guild, just like your dad. How about that? Do you think Master Fuji and I are related? If I had to guess, yes. Especially after everything I've seen and done, nothing surprises me anymore. If I'm right, it would explain a few things, he said, realizing his tiny friend must have known this before he sent Lucas back in time. He figured the monk learned of Masago's existence and her location after tapping into the Akashic field during one of his intense meditation sessions. That was why he chose the mountaintop as the landing point, so she'd find him. Back in the future, when they were on the remote outpost, Fuji did say this timeline thread was directly tied to Lucas, that it went through him and was affected by every decision he made. If that was true, then it stood to reason that it flowed through Masago as well, meaning their lives were entangled at the quantum level across time and space. Masago's intuition was correct. Meeting her was not some random event. It was meant to happen, and Master Fuji knew it. The monk must have seen it in one of his visions while tapped into the Akashic field. She tapped him on the arm. Hey, time-traveling Shakopotamus, you still with me? He snapped out of his thoughts and looked at her. Yeah, sorry. Just running through some stuff in my head. You were saying? 
if we're related, that would mean I'm his grandmother from another dimension, with a whole bunch of greats in front of it. Four hundred years worth, he said, letting the facts percolate a slew of possibilities. Damn, this just keeps getting stranger by the minute. Okay, I'll help you, she said with certainty. Then her face dulled. But please tell me I can trust you. You can, I promise. We're in this together. I could have walked right past you here and never stopped to help, but I didn't. That has to count for something. It does, but I do have one more question. Go ahead and shoot. I'll tell you whatever you want to know. Those evil men outside, if they're exact copies of you... He knew where she was going and jumped in to stop her. Just because they're copies doesn't mean they're the same as me. There are an infinite number of alternate universes, and not all versions of me are going to be law-abiding citizens. There are bound to be a few assholes and scumbags in the mix, just like the group who attacked you. Statistically, though, you'd think some of them would have been good men. Not with my luck. In fact, I should have expected it. Nothing ever seems to go as planned, or unplanned for that matter, he said, when a new random thought entered his brain. He wondered where the Lucas copies obtained the firearms. You said earlier that my copies were armed, right? Yep, all of them. That means someone must be helping them, because all of us arrived on Earth without weapons. Or they stole them. There are a bunch of prepper camps around here, and I'm sure all of them are well armed. I can't see them overpowering a trained force like that. It's more likely someone gave them the guns. Lucas, can I ask you something? Sure. It's a personal question. Fire away. Do you have a girlfriend back home? He wasn't sure how to answer her question. He didn't want to upset her, especially since she'd just agreed to help him. Take a neutral, disinterested stance, he told himself. I guess that would depend on what constitutes a girlfriend. What does that mean? Either you do or you don't, she said, with anxiety in her words. It's a long story. Then how about you give me the short version? Okay, sure. I almost had one, but then she died. It was right before I traveled back in time and met you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to pry. It's okay. You couldn't have known, he whispered into her ear. I lost a lot of good friends that day, including my brother. That's why I'm here, trying to undo everything that went wrong. I understand, she said, letting go of him. He stood on the makeshift crutch and held out his palm. You ready to go? She nodded, then took his hand. Lucas pulled her to her feet. Wait, she said in a loud whisper, leaning her head to the right. Do you hear that? Lucas stopped moving and listened. He could hear a smattering of sounds echoing from deep within the darkness ahead. They were footsteps, several pairs at least. Their volume and frequency were growing in intensity with each passing second. Three flashlight beams began to dance off the wall and ceiling at the point where the tunnel made a sharp left. Shit, they found us. We'd better jet, she told him. Lucas nodded, hopping his way to the top of the ladder with Masago close behind. He used the ladder first, planning to help her at the bottom. She climbed down after, taking a few seconds to close the hatch at the top of the opening before finishing her descent. What's the plan? he asked when she landed on solid ground. Evacuate and detonate. Detonate? Follow me, she said, limping her way to a steel bookcase on the left wall. He followed. Masago started yanking books from the top shelf, heaving them into an unorganized pile behind her. Lucas joined in and took care of the books on the second shelf. She emptied the third shelf and he the fourth. Once the bookcase was empty, she moved to the side of the shelving unit with her shoulder against the wall. Help me with this. Hurry. Lucas took position on the other side and together they dragged the bookcase away from the cement wall. Behind it was a man-sized, irregular-shaped hole. It looked like someone had used a sledgehammer to bust through the wall, then cover it up with the bookshelf. He assumed the hole was an afterthought in the design, certainly not part of the bunker's original schematics. He wondered if the secret passageway led to weapons or explosives. Maybe both, he mused. Where's that go? Shortcut, she said with a smirk on her face. She went through first, and Lucas followed. When he got to the other side, his heart almost stopped beating. Chapter 8 Lucas couldn't believe the size of the underground hollow before him. It was enormous, both in height and width. The irregular-shaped ceiling and striated rock formations of various colors and textures told him he was standing inside a giant magma chamber with honeycombed crevasses embedded into the ceiling. 
He knew the Catalina Mountains were part of a dormant chain of volcanoes that last erupted over 70 million years ago, but didn't realize the scope and density of its activity field. Only a massive volcano would leave behind an empty cavern of this size. Your dad bought this place? From who? Washington. Took him ten years of negotiating before they'd part with it, she said, limping ahead. He was struggling to maintain her pace. She was moving faster than he expected, with a bullet hole in her leg. Probably the adrenaline. This place took some serious cash to buy. What kind of scientist was he? He worked for the National Security Agency, Spec Ops Division. He developed gadgets and highly specialized tech just for them. That explains it. The NSA has an unlimited budget and unlimited power, all in the name of national security. My brother and I got paid dick by the university, Lucas said, taking a quick inventory of the man-made items stacked inside the chamber. Shrink-wrapped scientific computer equipment, row after row of boxes and crates, solar panels, and dozens of 50-gallon barrels labeled as diesel. However, what he didn't see were firearms and ammo. Where are all the guns? There aren't any. My dad hated them. Really? That seems odd for a prepper. I told you he was a survivalist, not a prepper. Right, sorry. He believes the government is planning to halt the sale of ammo to the public. That's how they plan to control guns and gun owners. Why else would Homeland Security and other domestic government agencies be purchasing bullets by the millions? They want to control the supply. Or they're preparing for something. Yeah, like civil unrest. If they're the only ones with ammo, we can't fight back. Maybe they're planning for an extra solar event, like an alien invasion. Why would you say that? Is there something you're not telling me, Mr. Time Traveler? Lucas didn't think it was wise to tell her about the impending Krellian invasion. She would find out soon enough, assuming he wasn't able to travel further back in time to keep this day and the invasion from happening. Time for a little spin control. There's always that possibility. After all, we're only a tiny speck on the ass of the universe. Statistically speaking, there has to be life out there, somewhere. Odds are some of them aren't going to be friendly. Maybe so, but either way, guns will be obsolete eventually. My father prefers edged blade weapons and bows. You never run out of ammo, and they don't jam in a firefight. Plus, they're silent. True. You can bet the NSA is tracking every single gun sale, every bullet, and every prepper's food supply order. When the feds are hurting for money and resources, they'll invade the homes of the people who have the ammo and supplies they need and take them without due process. That's why it's important to stay off the grid. They can't take what they can't find. That might be a little extreme, he said, wanting to change the subject. She was obviously passionate about her beliefs, and he didn't want her getting too emotional. He stopped moving for a bit when his nose detected a familiar aroma. Citrus. The scent was overpowering. I take it you have a few crates of oranges in here somewhere? Oranges? Yeah, can't remember the last time I peeled one of those. Um, sorry, no oranges in here. Are you sure? The smell is really strong. Trust me, no oranges. The closest orange tree is clear over by Mount Lemon. Remember that family who drove off the peak and landed in the trees of some huge commercial grove at its base? Sure, it was all over the news. One of the farm's trap cameras recorded the fireball. That's the closest source. Huh, he said, scratching his head. I must be hallucinating again. Sometimes I get these random whiffs of odors, and it's usually oranges. And you think I'm weird? At the far end of the supplies was an all-black, futuristic-looking off-road vehicle. When they got a little closer, Lucas noticed two ultra-wide tires up front and four sets of rubber-mounted ones across the rear axle. He recognized the sleek six-wheeler from the movie Batman Begins. Is that what I think it is? Sure is. The tumbler. Father bought it from Warner Brothers, then beefed it up with a few gadgets of his own. Did you know they built these for the movies right here in Arizona? I think the guy lives in Chino Valley, up near Prescott. I've always wanted to drive the tumbler, he said, limping ahead of her. He stood next to the vehicle and looked inside, admiring the suite of controls and technology spanning the width of the dashboard. I'll be the one driving, she said, nudging Lucas out of the way before jumping into the driver's seat. Then I guess I've got shotgun, he said, hopping around to the other side. He tossed the backpack and makeshift crutch into the area behind the seat, then slid his butt inside the car. He buckled the seatbelt. Why didn't we use this before? It's for emergency use only. I think this qualifies, don't you? Most definitely, she said. 
When she turned the key in the ignition, the motor roared, echoing off the walls of the magma cave. Each time she stepped on the gas to warm the engine, Lucas could feel the raw power of the impressive machine through its fiberglass and steel framework. He looked at Masago and considered her small stature. The top of her head was two inches below the headrest, and her size four feet barely touched the pedals, even with the seat pushed all the way forward. Are you sure you can drive this beast? Been training for years. Inside or out? Inside. There's no outside. So, what? You drove in circles? Yep, once a month. I'm very proficient at turning left. He rolled his eyes, suddenly fearing for his life. He looked at the area ahead. No exit. How the hell do we get out of here? She winked. That's the fun part. Huh? She opened a gray-colored plastic compartment built into the area between the seats. Inside of it were three pairs of padded earmuffs and a touchscreen computer that turned on almost instantly. Remember the exit signs in the tunnel? He nodded, wondering where she was going with this. Buried in the wall behind each sign is a powerful explosive charge. Father wired them strategically throughout the tunnel to collapse the ceiling instantly. Those men won't know what hit them. Good God. What about us? It's a one-way trip from here, she said, turning the headlights on. The solid wall of the cave ahead of them was now in full view. Lucas was correct. There was no exit. Instead, the wall was covered with explosives. Each brick was labeled with C4 and connected to the others by wire. Wait a minute. Let's talk about this. We'll be fine. Those are shaped charges. First the tunnel, then our exit, she said, giving one set of earmuffs to Lucas. You'll definitely want to wear these. She put one of the other sets on her ears and touched the control screen with her fingers, swiping through three instrument-style screens until the display showed only a single red-colored button in the middle of the display. It was labeled Evacuation Sequence. She pressed the button, activating a 10-second numerical countdown on the computer screen. Lucas gulped, grabbing the safety bar above his right shoulder with both hands. His seat began to shake when a powerful, ground-based rumble penetrated the chamber and reached his ears. The sound was coming from behind. Kiss the tunnel goodbye, she yelled, just before the wall ahead of them exploded outward in a cloud of dust and flying rubble. Sunlight beamed in, dancing across the vehicle's windshield and into Lucas's eyes. He put his hand up to shield his retinas. She removed the earmuffs, tossing them into the back seat. Lucas did the same. Time for 500 ponies, she said, with a mile-wide smile, jamming the clutch to the floorboard. She put the shifter into first gear and let the clutch slip as she hit the gas with a powerful thrust. The tumbler reacted instantly, screaming forward with impressive acceleration. Lucas watched in horror as the vehicle's speed continued to climb. A pile of dirt and rock was lying ahead of them, just outside the cave. Some of the debris chunks were too big to drive over. He pointed at the one directly in front of them. Look out! She swerved the vehicle left, then right to avoid the boulder, but never took her foot off the gas. The right side of the tumbler bounced and lurched sideways when its wheels hurtled over a grouping of smaller rocks. She kept her foot on the gas, navigating the remaining rubble using sharp angles and sudden turns. A few seconds later, they were clear of the devastation. She stomped on the brake pedal while turning the steering wheel to the left, sending a hail of pebbles and dirt into the air when the tumbler slid around to the right and stopped. Elvis has left the building, she yelled in a deep voice. He was speechless. You okay? she asked, like nothing unusual had just happened. He peeled his fingers from the grab bar above, flexing them to restore normal blood flow. Yeah, but I think I may need to go clean my shorts. I told you I could drive. You call that driving? We're in one piece, aren't we? Barely. Pussy, she said, turning her head back toward the mountain bunker for a few seconds. Then she looked at Lucas and smiled, showing a mouthful of perfectly white teeth. Only one thing left to do. She swiped the computer screen a few more times with her finger until the screen displayed a single green-colored button labeled Collapse Chamber. She pressed it. Wait! he yelled, looking back at the opening. A fiery explosion detonated inside the chamber, sending columns of red and black-colored smoke billowing out from the entrance. The heat from the blast traveled quickly, warming Lucas's forehead and cheeks as he watched the spectacular collapse of the chamber. Hey, Captain Destructo, what if we need some of those supplies, like the fuel? 
I couldn't take the chance any of your evil copies survived. Besides, this ATV is fully stocked with supplies and two tanks of diesel. It'll take us anywhere you want to go within a 600-mile radius. Just name it. Lucas spun forward and let his head fall back against the headrest. He figured she just wanted to blow some crap up. Not that he could blame her. Demolition was a total rush, just not when it's your only safe haven. He exhaled, but still didn't answer her, needing to let his heartbeat calm a bit. It did. Lucas? He wondered why every woman he met seemed to be carrying around a giant bag of crazy. Just once, he'd like to meet a normal girl, someone he could hang out with and not fear for his life every second they were together. Someone with a good head on her shoulders, and someone who wasn't buried with so much of life's baggage that she couldn't move or think straight. Was that too much to ask? Lucas, where do you want to go? She asked, revving the engine three times in succession. Come on, we're burning daylight. He looked at her, wanting to yank the keys from the ignition, but didn't. To the spot where you found me in the desert. We need to find my glasses. She put an arm into the back seat and pulled out a red motorcycle helmet with a visor. She gave it to him. What's this for? Lucas asked, worrying he might actually need to wear it. Safety first, she quipped, grabbing another helmet and slipping it on. A second later, her chin strap was snugly in place. Hang on a sec, he said, hoping he could put the helmet on before she took off. He cinched the strap under his jaw, then wrapped both hands around the safety bar. A microsecond later, she hit the gas. The tires spun with a powerful whirl, sending dirt and rock into the air behind them. The back end of the ATV sank into the loose surface until the knobby rubber gripped the hard deck below, sending the tumbler forward at breakneck speed. Chapter 9 Randall Larson kept an eye on the main entrance of the state's capitol building from the park bench he was sitting on 20 yards away. He felt fortunate to have found a spot in the shade with the bustle of citizens enjoying the bright Arizona sunshine around him. Everywhere he looked, someone was coming or going, while a few had stopped to have a snack or read the newspaper. He spun his head to the left when a rattle caught his attention. A tattoo-covered custodian was walking toward him with a trash cart and dirty coveralls. Larson slid over to make room, allowing the janitor to pop the lid of a waste bin open and drag it next to a plastic tub on his cart. The man strained to lift the overflowing container, but managed to dump the garbage into the central bin. A cloud of stench drifted Larson's way, along with a flurry of flies, making him reconsider agreeing to sit outside and wait for his brother-in-law to arrive. For a moment, he thought about getting up to leave, but decided to stay put. General Alvarez had been specific about where he wanted them to meet, and Larson didn't want to disappoint. The university attorney pinched his nostrils closed, then turned away to watch a pair of mimes performing in black-and-white colored tuxedos on his right. Two members of the pantomimes crowd were holding smartphones in front of their bodies, while the remainder of the audience laughed on cue, as if their reactions had been choreographed with every nuance of the street show. Larson wasn't sure why Alvarez wanted to meet in Phoenix instead of picking a location somewhere in their hometown of Tucson, but he didn't care. The National Guard commander said it was top secret, level one classified. Larson didn't need to be told twice. He dropped everything to get in his car and drive to Phoenix. Luckily, it was only a short two-hour trip from Tucson, and his Lexus was very fuel efficient, so it didn't cost him much in time or gas. He checked the time on his cell phone. Alvarez was ten minutes late. He couldn't remember the last time the general was tardy for anything. The career military man ran his life like he ran his men, with the precision of an atomic clock. Larson figured an urgent statewide crisis must have taken priority, given the location of their meeting. Must be with the governor, or perhaps the legislature. Either way, his mind bubbled with anticipation. He changed screens on his phone and found the audio recorder app. It wasn't as easy to operate as his standalone data recorder, but the phone's extra storage space and longer battery life made it a better choice. He decided to turn it on now, since he probably wouldn't have a chance to covertly activate it once his brother-in-law made his appearance. A few minutes of silence would be easy to erase before he cataloged and filed the recording in his cloud storage archive. Larson jumped when someone tapped him on the shoulder. He turned, expecting it to be the janitor. 
It wasn't. It was his brother-in-law, General Rafael Alvarez, in full uniform with three of his sharply dressed guardsmen. Enjoying the show? the general asked. What? The mimes? Larson answered, wondering if the general had noticed his use of the audio software. He slipped the phone into the front pocket of his suit with the microphone facing up toward his chin. Personally, I think their kind should be lined up before a firing squad and shot. Larson laughed. Put us all out of our misery. Thank you for meeting with me on such short notice. Not a problem. I would have been here sooner, but the governor was running behind schedule. Is everything okay? Walk with me, Alvarez said. Larson stood and joined Alvarez and the three men as they made their way along the sidewalk toward the afternoon traffic flying past on Washington Street. I just met with the governor and her chief of staff regarding a classified operation that took place yesterday in the Tucson area. There were a number of casualties, but the threat was neutralized. Threat? Terrorists? The details of the operation are classified and strictly on a need-to-know basis. Then why am I here? Alvarez waved a hand signal to his three military escorts. The men remained behind as Larson and Alvarez continued walking. Two minutes later, Alvarez stopped, turning his back to his troops. An hour from now, I have a video call with the chiefs of staff at the Pentagon regarding the incident. But before I go take care of it, I need to ask a favor. Sure, name it. This is strictly off book. Not a problem. My lips are sealed. Alvarez pulled two pieces of black cloth from his pocket. The material was covered with a maze of symmetrical gold lines. I need you to run this by one of your lab geeks. I need to know its composition and capabilities. I think I know just the man for the job, Larson said, thinking of his scientist friend Griffith. He took one of the stretchy swatches in his hand. Its smooth surface tingled the tips of his fingers. Is this from the attack? I can't reveal any more details. Like I said, it's classified. Let's just say the threat isn't over. Well, I might be able to pull a few strings, he said, using a coy voice, knowing the general was desperate. But it won't be easy. The man leaned in close, grabbing Larson by the shirt collar. The power of his grip cinched the material tight, restricting the flow of air into Larson's lungs. Alvarez stuck his jaw out. Look, you arrogant prick. Don't think for a second I don't know when someone's shaking me down. What the hell do you want? Money? No, oh, just a favor, Larson said in a weak voice, feeling his legs starting to go numb. What kind of favor? I need someone to disappear. Disappear, Alvarez said, letting go of Larson's clothes with a shove. Larson gasped a full breath. Just for a while. Alvarez glanced back at his men for a moment. Larson did too. The guards were still a good 200 feet away. The general's lips grew stiff and his tone intensified. Just because you're married to my sister doesn't mean I'm willing to conduct an unsanctioned rendition for you. Are you sure about that? Don't test me, Randall. Look, I wasn't born yesterday. Analyzing this material is obviously very important to you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking me to do it off book. Besides, who else do you know that has the means and the resources to do what you ask and keep it quiet? You are one manipulating asshole, Alvarez snapped. Hey, you came to me, remember? Quid pro quo, Raphael. It's general to you. My mistake, Larson said, hoping he could salvage the conversation. So, what's it going to be, general? Do you want my help or not? Fine. Who's the target? His name is Lucas Ramsey. I need him out of the way for a couple weeks. For what purpose? Does it matter? Alvarez didn't respond. Look, I'm not asking you to take him out. Just remove him from the equation for a bit. That's all I need. I'll handle the rest. Do you have a photo in last known location? Here's a photo of him from his security badge, Larson said, showing the man a portrait of Lucas on his cell phone. This is from his freshman year, so he's several years older now. He works in the science lab. He's one of Dr. Cleesby's crew. Alvarez took Larson's phone and studied the image on its display. A look of surprise dominated his face. Is this some kind of joke? What do you mean? This man's your target? Larson nodded, taking the phone back. He slipped it into his pocket, hoping Alvarez didn't notice the tiny icon at the top that indicated the voice recorder was active. He's always with his disabled brother, 
Just look for the geek in a wheelchair. Lucas will be at his side. They're inseparable. The general put a hand inside his uniform and pulled out three photos. You might want to take a look at these. You tell me. Anything look familiar? Larson took the photos and studied them. Each snapshot showed a young, red-haired man lying on the ground wearing a black suit with gold lines. Part of each man's lifeless body had been blown apart and were covered in blood. Larson compared their faces. They all looked like Lucas Ramsey, a man he knew was still alive and working on campus. What the hell? How can this be? That's what I'm trying to find out. Larson couldn't reconcile what his eyes were reporting. This it doesn't make sense. Did you notice what each man is wearing? The same gold-laced material? Some kind of uniform? Or advanced tech? Now you understand why I need to have it analyzed. Larson nodded, trying to put the facts together. These are the terrorists? Alvarez didn't answer. Larson was getting tired of the cryptic nature of this meeting. I think, at this point, General, showing me the photos puts us well past classified. You need to trust me if you want my help. I need to know what the hell is going on. Alvarez paused before answering. We received a tip about an imminent threat to the university. The target was your underground NASA lab. Larson's throat ran dry, making it hard to swallow. You know about that? The governor just laid it all out for me. I had no idea. You have to understand, if the university hadn't needed the money, President Lathrop never would have let them build the facility. I figured as much. It's always about the money. So what happened with the terrorists? We mobilized and stopped them cold. The intel was spot on. There were almost 200 of them. They were all versions of the same man. You're Lucas Ramsey. When you say versions, you mean clones. Some were older, and a few had slightly different physical characteristics, but my gut is telling me they were all the same man, copies of him. How is that possible? That's the million-dollar question. What about a DNA analysis to confirm? Already in the works, but I doubt I'll hear anything back from CID. If this is some type of advanced Russian or Chinese cloning technology, they're sure to swoop in and assume control, cutting me out of the loop entirely. I need to get ahead of this thing while I still can. Do you think someone is trying to replace Ramsey with an enemy clone? Anything is possible, but why send so many? It's easier to slip one by the goalie undetected, not a couple hundred. That's true. Must be something else, Larson said. Without a complete understanding of the material's composition and purpose, I'm afraid we're working in the dark. I'm sure my man can help. He's come through for me before. But I'll have to give him some baseline information. He's going to ask. Keep it minimal. The less he knows, the better. For all of us. Understood? Larson nodded. Were there any survivors? A few. We're in the process of tracking them down. Then the university is still at risk. I can post a squad, if need be. Larson's mind flashed through the ramifications of a strong military presence on campus. He shook his head. Let me handle it. If your men show up and take over, all hell will break loose with the students, the faculty, and the media. Everyone would start asking questions and we'd lose containment. Agreed, Alvarez said, sliding the photos into his pocket. I prefer to handle this quietly, at least until we know more. We don't have enough information yet. Your man better come through, and do so quickly. Once the feds get their hands on this, how long do we have? It'll take them some time to get the analysis done and coordinate the various agencies, but when they come, they'll come in force. I'd say no more than 72 hours. That shouldn't be a problem, but I need Ramsey out of the way tonight. Not going to happen. A clean snatch and grab takes planning. Otherwise, there are too many loose ends. Then I guess you can kiss the fabric analysis goodbye. You really are a prick, aren't you? Alvarez said. I don't know what my sister sees in you. Yes. I'm an asshole, but that doesn't change the urgency of the situation. It's simple, as far as I see it. You handle your end, and I'll handle mine. If we pull together, we can make this happen. All right, fine. Now get the hell out of my sight. Chapter 10 Dr. Griffith Davies opened the flaps on the back of his white lab coat, sat on the leather stool, then slid his body to the right until he was in front of the brand new Mach 2 spectrometer, his favorite machine in the lab. He took a pair of wire-rimmed reading glasses from his coat pocket and slipped them on, wondering how much time remained before the results would be ready. 
He looked at the machine's LED display. Ninety-four seconds remained. Damn, an eternity. He wished the university had purchased the bigger, more expensive Mach 3. Then the results would have been completed by now, and in Dr. Cleesby's hands. He'd already kept his longtime friend waiting, and didn't want to disappoint the professor any further. He studied his own reflection in the chrome-plated accent plate that decorated the upper section of the purring machine. He counted two more wrinkles and a new skin tag on his right eyelid. Father Time was not being kind, plus his toupee was uneven, again. He tugged at the side of his hairline, leveling the vanity rug. His wife Stacy had told him that very morning, as she had done countless times before, that he didn't need to wear the replacement hair. She loved his wrinkly, bald head. Despite her repeated assurances, he felt compelled to wear it. He had to, for his sake and hers. She was a young, stunning woman, and a major catch for any man, let alone him. It was a stroke of pure luck that a 25-year-old bombshell like her had fallen in love with him in the first place. She could have had any man on the planet, but she chose him. He still couldn't believe it, even after years of blissful marriage. Stacy seemed genuine and committed, but the last thing he wanted to do was take the chance she'd get tired or embarrassed of him and move on to someone else, someone much closer to her own age and someone in far better shape. His daily risk assessment told him what he must do. Keep her happy at all costs, never take a moment off, never take her affection for granted either. Those were the exact words he told himself every morning while standing alone in front of the bathroom mirror. Her grace and beauty were now part of every fiber of his being, committing his heart and soul to everything that was Stacy. He couldn't imagine not having her in his life, and certainly didn't want to start over. Not again. One divorce was enough. The chime on the spectrometer sounded a playful three-note tune that reminded him of his Maytag washer's chime when he turned it on. He stood to review the report on the flat-screen display, hoping the analysis provided the answers he was looking for. It did. He opened his flip-style cell phone and brought up the contact list. He skipped Stacy's number and his mother's, then pressed the third person on the list. Two electronic rings and a hello later, Dr. Cleesby was on the other end and listening. Griffith slowed his words, wanting to hide his excitement. I have the results, DL. Hot off the press. Is it what I thought? Yes and no. The material's made from layered sheets of one-dimensional graphene, all right, but it's not pure carbon like you'd expect. There's another substance bonded to its nanostructure. What is it? Some form of applied polymer built from a synthetic biosubstance I can't identify. The closest analogy would be exogenous XNA. Synthetic? Yes, I'm calling it X-graphite, for lack of a better term. Why would anyone fuse graphene with synthetic DNA? Possibly to control the angular momentum of exotic particles, which would come in handy if one were to supercharge the graphite. But that's just a guess. It's definitely a new type of exotic metamaterial. There can't be many uses for something like this. No, its use would be extremely specific and limited in scope, except for its elastic properties. It stands to reason that the hybrid XNA is responsible for the material's elastic quality, not just its containment properties. But beyond that, anything else is pure conjecture at this point. I would need several months and a suite of new equipment to run a more detailed analysis. I assume that's not an option. Not without a massive injection of university funding. What about the gold lacing? It's pure 24-karat gold, but it's not topically applied to the fabric as you would expect. It's fused with it, acting like a casing around the selected X-graphite molecules, forming some type of advanced nanocircuitry. It's unlike anything I've seen or even read about, for that matter. Its construction and symmetry suggests this fabric was built to channel and control an enormous electromagnetic field. How enormous? Massive. Probably beyond anything we can generate. In the USA? No, on this planet. I question its origin. Extraterrestrial? That would be my first guess, but without more study, I can't be sure. What would something like this be used for? Unclear. It's obviously part of a larger apparatus, but this technology is well beyond our capabilities. Several hundred years ahead, minimum, if one were to chart the geometric progression of technology advancement on this planet. Of course, that's assuming anyone on this planet could ever understand it, Griffith said, taking a moment to reflect. 
Then he remembered something. However, I did attend a seminar last year hosted by a blonde physicist from one of the Midwest universities. Minnesota, I think. Or perhaps it was Michigan. Nice-looking gal. Her theories were loosely related to what we are seeing with this material. She believed that attaching a quadrillion strands of DNA onto a thin plate of gold would allow her to detect dark matter. How? When the gold plate was struck by a molecule of dark matter, a single atom of gold would be released, sending it hurling into the hanging strands of DNA. The angle and trajectory of the destruction trail would indicate the direction and speed of the dark matter, thereby allowing her to backtrace its origination point. Fascinating stuff. Granted, it's not an exact replica of the composition and properties of the X-graphite material, but there are similarities worth investigating. X-graphite may be an offshoot of her research. I just wish I could recall her name. It was something like Karen Geese, but that's not right. I'm sure I can look it up if you want to bring her in on this discussion. No, we don't have time, nor the clearance. I understand, Griffith said, hoping he hadn't just upset his boss, the head of the department. Can I ask, where did you get this sample? I can't get into the specifics, but what I can tell you is that someone was wearing it. A uniform? Or a spacesuit? Or can't you tell me? Cleesby hesitated. You'll need to ask me a different question. Okay, maybe you can answer this. I'm going to assume that when you say someone was wearing it, you mean a humanoid? That would be a logical assumption then it's possible the synthetic XNA may have been genetically engineered to match a specific person's DNA. Why? To create a molecular containment field. Think of it as a DNA-specific biosuit, built for a single person. If I'm correct, it could be used to protect the subject at a cellular level from intense exposure to certain fundamental forces. Atomic? That, or gravimetric, assuming it was tuned and energized properly. What happened to the rest of it? Trust me, you don't want to know. If this material is from another world, then the owners probably won't be back for a while. The leaders of our military aren't the most gracious of hosts when it comes to uninvited visitors. A vision of a downed spacecraft near Roswell, New Mexico flashed in Griffith's mind. I understand. Do you want me to email the full report? I can send it to you now. No, a hard copy would be better. I'll send Bruno down to collect it when he stops in to retrieve the sample. I'll have them both ready for pickup. What about the electronic version of my analysis? It needs to be deleted. I'd prefer to keep the analysis and its results just between you and me. No one else can know about this. Not even your lovely wife. Not an issue. I'll destroy all copies, local and in the cloud. You have my word as a gentleman and a scholar. I knew I could count on you. You've never let me down, and I appreciate that. You're a good friend, Griffith, and a broken-down old man like me can never have enough of those. I've got to run to a meeting, but say hello to Stacy for me. I will, Griffith said, hanging up the phone. He took the micro-sample plate from the machine and carried it back to the work desk. He found the padded, letter-size envelope in which Bruno had delivered the sample. He opened it, then slid the plate next to the original piece of X-graphite material waiting inside, never bothering to uncouple the micro-sample from its mounting plate. He wanted Dr. Cleesby to know he was thorough and dedicated to secrecy by returning the entire sampling mechanism intact. It may have been overkill, but he didn't want any doubt to remain. He walked to his flat-screen monitor and used the touchscreen interface to delete the analysis folder stored locally on the machine. Then he changed screens, allowing him to access and remove the remote backup copy that had been auto-saved to the university's server network. Just like it never happened. He walked to the job board and reviewed the logbook. Next up was a fluid analysis, sample number L212. He looked inside the cold storage unit for a sample with the matching number. He found it, a sealed jar from the genetics department. He held the clear glass container in front of his eyes and shook it gently, making the yellow-colored liquid swirl around inside the glass. It looked unusually thick. This better not be monkey pee, he mumbled. He returned to the logbook, then took the red permamarker from his coat pocket and stuck the end of the pen with the cap in his mouth. He bit down on the cap, pulled the pen apart, and put a check mark next to the sample number on the log sheet. Then he brought the tip of the pen back to his mouth. He was about to put the two pieces back together when a sneeze rose up out of nowhere. 
His back arched and his stomach tightened as a glob of snot flew out of his nose. The jerky body motion caused him to miss the cap in his mouth with the pen. Instead, the tip of the red marker hit his chin and traveled up to his eye. Damn it, not again, he said, thinking about the last time this had happened. It was a month ago when Lucas Ramsey just happened to stop by for a visit from across the hall. He turned and looked at the lab door. He waited for it, but a knock never came. Whew, he said. Once was embarrassing enough. He put the sample jar on his desk and was about to head to the bathroom to try to scrub the ink off his face when his cell phone chimed. Inside the flip phone was a text message from his wife. His heart danced as he read Stacy's note. Hi, sweetie. Just wanted to tell you that I love you. I have dinner waiting, plus some tasty dessert. It's date night, honey. Don't be late. Otherwise, I'll have to start without you. Wink, wink. He typed his response into the phone pad. Love you, too. Hope you're going to wear the red outfit I bought you last week. I've been dreaming about seeing you in it all day. His finger hit the send button. A few seconds later, the phone chimed again. This time, a smiley face appeared on the message line. He looked down at his zipper, watching a bulge grow in his pants. Houston, we have liftoff. Just then, a double knock rang out from the lab door. Not now, he said, trying to push down on his erection, but it wasn't getting any smaller. In fact, his penis seemed to react to the added pressure, making it grow thicker and stronger. He panicked, grabbing the two closest items on his desk, a soldering gun and resin. He scrambled to the door, planning to tell whoever was on the other side of it that he was in the middle of an important experiment and they needed to come back later. If nothing else, he hoped to stall the visitor long enough to allow his hard-on to dissipate. He took a deep breath and opened the door. It was Cleesby's lead research assistant, Dr. Lucas Ramsey, from the lab across the hall. Hey, Lucas, Griffith said, as his brain sent a torrent of words streaming to his mouth. It's wonderful to see you. Do you need my help with something? Wow, you look especially handsome today. How's your project coming along? I hear you're getting a new lab tech tonight. How's your mother feeling? What were those marines delivering? They sure looked impressive in their uniforms, didn't... I'm fine. Project's fine. Drew's fine. We're all fine, Lucas said with an annoyed look on his face. If you're not using it, can I borrow your hand truck? Sure, go right ahead. It's right by my desk, Griffith said, hoping that Lucas wouldn't look down at his crotch and see his swollen penis pressing hard against his pants. Lucas didn't say anything, then turned sideways and took a wide berth as he scooted past Griffith. Lucas never looked down. Griffith sighed, then more words arrived on his lips. Do you need me to help? Did you know I work out regularly and can lift heavy objects? You should be careful with your back. Be sure to lift with your legs. Hernias can happen easily. Lucas still didn't respond as he walked to Griffith's desk. Griffith waited until Lucas put his hand on the dolly before he glanced down at his pants. His erection seemed smaller, but it was still noticeable. Keep talking, he told himself. Keep Lucas focused on something else. He pushed the soldering gun and resin near Lucas's face. I'll bet you're wondering what I'm doing with these. It's a funny story, really. Would you like to hear it? Lucas ducked his shoulder as he brushed past Griffith, pushing the dolly toward the lab door. Griffith tossed the soldering gun and resin onto his desk. Do you want me to get the door for you? Lucas turned and held out his hands while standing near the exit. Sorry, but this delivery belongs to Dr. Cleesby and contains classified material. Nobody else is allowed within 20 feet of it. Okay, I understand. Take your time. Just return the dolly when you're done. I won't need it for at least a week. When you stop by again, we should go to lunch. Lucas opened the door and pushed the hand truck outside into the hall. The door closed behind him. Damn, that was close, Griffith thought, feeling his penis finally go limp. He stood next to the lab door with his ear pressed against it. He could hear Drew Ramsey laughing in the hallway. Glad you're enjoying yourself, Lucas told his brother. Now let's get this shit inside already. Chapter 11 Masago turned the steering wheel of the tumbler hard to the left, then jammed on the brake, sending the all-terrain vehicle sliding sideways through the dirt until it came to a stop, just inches short of a 20-foot-tall, four-fingered saguaro cactus. Her heart was pounding, pushing her endorphins into overdrive. Do you have any idea how much one of them weighs? Lucas asked with his hands gripping the safety bar. Before or after rainy season, she replied, giving him a smirk. We could have been crushed. What? You don't like my driving? Not without downing a six-pack first. We're here, aren't we? And in record time. 
I didn't know we were in a race. She took her helmet off and put it on the dash, then shook her head to set her flowing hair free as it draped around the contours of her neck. She smiled at him. You gotta admit, that was one kick-ass ride. For you, maybe. You need to lighten up. Have a little fun once in a while. Besides, you were wearing a helmet. Okay, Danica in the number 10 car, Lucas said, breathing heavily. He let go of the safety bar and took the helmet off, tossing it in the back. But I'm gonna need a minute. You really need to find your big girl panties, she said, appreciating the comparison to NASCAR driver Danica Patrick. That's easy for you to say. You were the one driving. I was totally at the mercy of a crazy person. I swear to God I saw my life flash before my eyes. Twice. Masago rolled her eyes, then pointed to a stand of brush twenty feet ahead. That's where I found you, under those bushes. Lucas didn't respond. He didn't move either. Are you just going to sit there, or do you want to go find your glasses? Lucas looked to his right, leaned forward, then sat back in the seat before turning to Masago. Can you pull up a bit? I don't think I can open my door, not without getting a face full of spines. Masago released the brake, letting the vehicle idle forward ten feet until it was clear of the saguaro. Far enough? That'll do, Lucas said, releasing the seatbelt from its latch. The retractor drew the belt away and back to its home position. He opened the door and got out of the vehicle, then grabbed his makeshift crutch from the storage area behind the seats. I'm not sure my leg can make the climb. I can, she said, assessing the pain level in her thigh. It was manageable. What do they look like? Super high tech. You'll know it when you see it. It's loaded with electronics along the frame. When was the last time you remember having them? At the top. They were in my hand before I jumped. I must have dropped them on the way down. She looked up at the cliff, wondering how he'd survived. That's one hell of a fall. I managed to slide part of the way until my foot caught a rock and sent me flying. That's when my knee decided to pick a fight with the cactus. And lose. Badly. Thanks for the reminder. Any time, she said, surveying the wall of dirt and rock before her. I hope you're not in a hurry, because this is going to take a while. They could be anywhere. It shouldn't take that long, not with gravity, velocity, and acceleration working in our favor. It's just mathematics, really, especially since several variables are known, such as my starting point and my ending point, each with a velocity of zero, and of course my body mass. If I calculate gravitational acceleration in relation to distance traveled, I should be able to predict several probable landing spots. Of course, that's assuming I can accurately factor in the unevenness of the terrain, air resistance, the prevailing winds at the time, and Masago grabbed his shoulder. Never mind all that. How about we just find them the old-fashioned way, with feet and eyes, okay? Sure, but I was just trying to... Show off? No, limit the search area with a little applied physics. You really shouldn't worry about impressing me. I already know how smart you are. But I wasn't trying to... Yes, you were. Lucas paused, then sighed. You and your bad knee stay down here and search. I'll work my way up to the top. Hopefully I can retrace your steps. I'm sure there are plenty of tracks to follow. That's an understatement. Just look for the out-of-control skid marks and the pissed-off cactus. And be careful. I'd hate to lose my chauffeur. So you do appreciate my driving skills? I don't know if I'd go that far. Masago smiled, then walked to the rear of the car and opened the latch to the cargo area. She dug through the supplies stuffed inside until she found a rock-climbing harness. She clipped it around her waist and hips before securing the leg loops. She grabbed her stash of spring-loaded metal carabiners and fastened the oval rings to the side of her harness, then found her rope anchors and a few other essentials, including a 200-foot coil of braided blue-and-white climbing rope. One arm went through the center of the rope before she tucked it around her shoulder. She shut the trunk and went to the base of the mountain, trying to decide which climbing path would be safest. The first hundred feet looked doable if she used the staggered formations of rock as hand and footholds. After that, the sheer rock face was waiting for her, a challenging task indeed. Her left hand grabbed the front of a protruding edge above her, while her right foot found its way into a gap between two boulders about waist-high. She leveraged herself up, repeating the same maneuver with the other hand and foot. She looked down at Lucas. He was standing directly under her with his hands raised. His palms were just inches under her butt. What are you trying to do? Cop a feel? No, he said, yanking his hands back. His cheeks blushed and he looked petrified. I was just making sure... Relax. I was just kidding about the whole cop a feel thing. It didn't sound like you were kidding. I was. But seriously, don't worry about me. I can take care of myself. I do this type of thing all the time. I know. It's just that I'm not used to a girl who can... Kick your ass? 
No, take care of herself like you can. I don't meet a lot of women like you. I'm going to take that as a compliment, she said, climbing up another level. It was. Good, because otherwise I'd have to kick my ass. No, prove myself. I know how hard it is for a man to accept a woman with skills. Trust me, I think I know what you're capable of. Masago appreciated the vote of confidence, but she didn't like the direction of the conversation. Don't you have some searching to do? Wow, you're one of those girls, Lucas said with a serious look on his face. What does that mean? It means you don't like compliments, even though you were totally fishing for one. Masago didn't know what to say. Or was it because the compliment came from a man, Lucas said, with a touch of heat in his words. Masago kept her temper in check. Maybe you should start at the spot where you landed. Look, I get it. Your father was impossible to please. He wanted another son and was never satisfied with you. But that's no reason to take it out on me. I'm not like that. His attitude suggested otherwise, but she let it go. The pain in his knee was probably pushing his temper past the red line. I'd suggest working your way out from the center point in concentric circles. It's the most efficient search pattern. Fine, have it your way. But don't lump me into the same class as every other male on this planet, Lucas said, shaking his head. He wedged the modified hunting bow under his arm and hobbled his way to the left, mumbling something under his breath she couldn't hear. Lucas's reaction stirred something inside of her. It was a vision of her father, packing for his hunting trip. She closed her eyes, allowing the memory to fill the video screen in her mind. Her father zipped his backpack shut, then bent down and kissed her on the cheek. He pulled away, taking his warmth and companionship with him. I will be back in two days, he said, cupping a hand under her quivering chin. He slung the backpack over his shoulder, turned and walked out the door. She remembered the moment like it was yesterday. Her heart desperately wanted to call out to him, to tell him to be careful, to tell him that she loved him. But her brain took control, evaporating the words before they'd made it to her lips. The suffocating darkness took hold of her as she listened to the echo of her father's footsteps growing weaker and weaker until they disappeared. That painful goodbye was the last time she saw him. Masago opened her eyes and doubled her grip on the mountain, fighting to contain the pressure building inside her heart. She failed for an instant, allowing a single tear to flow from her eye before she regained control. She brushed the tear away with her shoulder, then sniffed once before looking down at her hobbling friend. He was facing the other way, busy moving dirt around with his makeshift crutch. She turned the memory of her father off and took a deep breath before continuing her climb. Her moment of weakness went unnoticed. Chapter 12 Randall Larson tipped the cocktail waitress, who was wearing a skimpy, neon-green-colored bikini, and took a sip of his first beer of the day. He watched her tiny, firm butt cheeks sachet from side to side as she walked under the glow of the overhead blacklights. He couldn't decide if the baby-faced server would be a good choice for a table dance. It was going to cost him more than double the going rate if he wanted that kind of personal attention from a rookie waitress instead of one of the club's established pole dancers. She couldn't have been more than 19 and was stunning and tight, the perfect combination. He took a moment to admire the table napkin's black and white logo before putting his beer on it. It was a hand-drawn caricature of an eye patch wearing pirate, holding a beer in one hand and a gun in the other. There were two buxom beauties on either side of him, wearing only a smile and oversized chests. A deadly symmetry, but the theme fit the club. The owners of Blackbeards knew how to rob people, and they did it with fake boobs, ear-pounding rap music, and ice-cold beer. An expensive proposition, but Larson accepted the illusion of it all. It was his only escape from the endless hours of bureaucratic bullshit that defined his legal position on campus. He wasn't allowed to look twice at the bright-eyed co-eds that blanketed the campus every day, let alone touch them. But here, at this secluded members-only club, he was free to do what he pleased, as long as he brought sufficient cash to back it up. When his lunch break ran out, or his money, he would have to return to reality. But... For the next 90 minutes, he was happy to be in the one place where he could be anyone he desired. For today's visit, he was Dirk, a former hockey player for the Central Hockey League. 
He knew the girls would be drawn to his alter ego, as long as he was stuffing tens down the front of their G-strings. Like most of the regulars, he had his favorite dancers, each of whom relied on his frequent visits to pay their rent. But since this was the last visit before he and his family left town for good, he decided to splurge on the beautiful blonde waitress who'd been teasing him for months. Time to go out in style. He waited until the current song ended, chugged his beer, and tipped the 40-something dancer on stage who was covered in racist tattoos. He whirled to the left and headed for the service end of the bar, where he planned to convince the server to join him for an hour-long session in the VIP room. However, his cell phone buzzed before he could reach her. He couldn't remember the last time his phone worked inside the club. The building's metal roofing made it damn near impossible to get a decent signal. But for some reason, today the cell phone was working, with two bars of signal strength. The screen said the call was from his wife, Nora. He couldn't answer the call, not with the sounds of pussy and alcohol permeating in the background, not to mention the ear-blasting music that would soon start for the next dancer due on stage. The DJ's voice rang out across the club speakers. Next up on stage is the gorgeous Paige. Jasmine, you're up in two. Paris, stand by. Larson made a sharp right heading up the stairs. A tuxedo-clad bouncer was working the front door, but never made eye contact with him as he ran outside to catch the call before his wife was sent to voicemail. Hi, honey. What's up? He said after taking in a deep breath to load his lungs with air. Where are you? She asked in her dominating New York accent. You sound winded. His mind froze for a moment until he decided how to handle her probing question. What's wrong, baby? Why do you think something's wrong? Because you never call me while I'm working. We had an agreement, remember? Yes, I remember. Then, what's wrong? President Lathrop from the university just called. He's looking for you. Where are you? Dr. Lathrop? Why? I don't know. He didn't say, but it sounded urgent. Where are you? I stopped for lunch. Why are you breathing so hard? She asked in a skeptical tone. It's noisy in the restaurant. I ran outside to take your call. Did you break your promise to me and the kids? No, baby. Just a root beer and a patty melt. No alcohol. I'm a man of my word. Why didn't Dr. Lathrop call your cell? Why did he call the house? I don't know. My phone was sitting right next to me, but it never rang. Maybe he couldn't get through. The cell towers might have been busy. Then he probably left you a voicemail. Thanks, honey. I'll check. The Stantons are joining us tonight. Texas Roadhouse at 8. I haven't forgotten. Don't embarrass me by being late again. I've cleared my schedule tonight. I'm all yours. That's good to hear. Your mother is watching the children, and you know how hard it is to get her to babysit. We never get a chance to go out, and I don't want to miss this opportunity. So you'd better be there. I will. I promise. Love you. Me too. Bye. He stared at the front door of the club, deciding whether to call Dr. Lathrop back and miss the rest of his much-needed playtime, or go back inside the club and see what kind of mileage his wad of cash would generate with the gorgeous young waitress. It was a given she'd go topless and grind her 95-pound figure on his lap, but would she let him touch her, and possibly more? Not knowing how far she'd go made the chase even more memorable. So did the dancer, who liked to break the rules and get freaky in the back room. He had his favorite booth in the secluded VIP room, where there was no coverage from the ceiling-mounted night vision cameras. He hoped it would be available, allowing him to fully enjoy the newness of her scent while she worked her magic on his ego. He'd never get this chance again, not with the planned exodus from Tucson looming in his future. Dr. Lathrop could wait, he decided, turning to head back inside to spend every last dollar in his wallet on the young talent. However, when he told his legs to move, they refused. Something else had control of them. Then, almost as if on cue, the vision of her sweet nipples entering his mouth disappeared and was replaced by his mounting guilt. That damned phone call. He couldn't believe the timing. His Viagra-inspired erection wilted, turning him around and sending him to his Lexus. He got in and drove west out of the parking lot. He decided to wait at least ten minutes before calling the president of the university back, just in case someone was tracing the call. With the recent terrorist attack and the urgent nature of the president's phone call, anything was possible at this point, especially with NASA's secret facility located directly under the campus. 
If Alvarez was right, the NSA was probably involved by now, so he needed to play it safe, even though this was his last day as a lawyer for the University of Arizona. That's assuming he could stop Lucas Ramsey and his experiment tonight. If successful, he planned to type his letter of resignation, sign it, and stuff it into the mail slot on the president's door before meeting his wife and friends for dinner. A last supper, he thought. After that, all he needed to do was pick up the rest of the money from the technology buyer tomorrow. Play it cool. You've got this. He needed to remember to stop by Griffith's lab to drop off the material sample for lab analysis. Otherwise, his brother-in-law would be pissed. He couldn't afford for that to happen, not with the way today was starting to spin sideways. Just then, a memory flashed in his mind. It was from a few minutes ago when he was walking out of the strip club. His memory replayed the sound of the DJ's voice blasting over the PA system, calling out the list of dancers due on stage. First up was Paige, then a girl whose stage name was Jasmine. General Alvarez had a daughter named Jasmine, a beautiful sportsaholic who attended the university, but Alvarez said she worked as a bartender for a different gentleman's club in town. Not this one. But he also knew young girls kept secrets from their fathers, especially from overbearing blowhards like Alvarez. Larson's heart skipped a beat, wondering if it could be her. Dancers and bartenders moved around constantly, so it was possible. Shit. Did his niece by marriage just see him drinking and carousing in the club? If she did, the general would soon find out, and so would Larson's wife. He thought about it a little more, but decided it couldn't be Alvarez's daughter. Why would Jasmine switch clubs and then decide to start pole dancing? Bartenders made great money, and they got to keep their clothes on and the customers' paws off. Plus, why would she dance using her real name and not a stage name? No, it couldn't be her. Must be a coincidence. He shrugged the idea off and shut down the paranoia. A minute later, his phone rang. It was the university president. Fuck, I can't catch a break today, he mumbled, pressing the call recorder icon to start the app. He pressed the answer button after the second ring. Hello? Larson, is that you? Yes, Dr. Lathrop. What can I do for you? I've been trying to get in touch with you for the last hour. Sorry, sir. I was at lunch and left my cell phone in the car by accident. I left an urgent message with your wife. Did you receive it? She just called. I was about to call you. Is there an emergency? You could say that. Something has come across my desk. Something that must be dealt with immediately. What is it? Not on the phone, Larson. When can you be in my office? I'm ten or fifteen minutes away, depending on traffic. Be here in ten, Lathrop said, ending the call. Larson terminated the audio recorder and put the phone on the console between the seats, wondering what the hell was going on. Maybe his boss knew about his proclivity for young strippers, or his drinking during lunch, or his selling of university secrets to the technology buyer. He slowed the car and changed lanes, turning into the parking lot of an apartment complex on the north side of the street. He cruised slowly, circling the lot, deciding whether to make a run for it now or continue west and meet his boss. What could Lathrop possibly know? Larson had been extra careful, but maybe he'd missed something. If he had, he'd better grab the wife and kids and disappear for good. He might have enough money saved if they lived frugally and off the grid somewhere. Alaska or Montana would work, as long as it was near water. But what if his boss didn't know squat and he left town for the wrong reason? He'd certainly be fired and lose his pension, all for nothing. Then he thought about the five hundred grand waiting for him in the morning. He couldn't pass up the bounty. Besides, he was much smarter than everyone else, so there was no chance he'd missed anything. They can't possibly know shit. It must be something else. He drove the car back onto Broadway and stomped on the gas pedal, heading toward campus. Chapter 13 Lucas rubbed his sore knee, trying to determine if its flexibility was getting better or worse. He wrapped a palm and three fingers around the swollen kneecap to measure its circumference. It was the size of a grapefruit, same as before. Based on Masago's claims and the lessening pain, he thought it should have been smaller by now. However, all the walking and bending probably wasn't helping with the healing process. Time to sit on a three-foot-tall rock and take a break, he decided. 
He studied the terrain along the side of the mountain, wondering how she was doing in her search. He'd lost track of her position fifteen minutes earlier, when she'd climbed past the sheer rock face near the midpoint. He was amazed at how quickly she'd traversed the mountain, taking very little time to select her path and work her way to the first mini-plateau. She was definitely one of those girls who thrived on adrenaline, rising to meet any challenge head-on. In a different life, he imagined her as a fighter pilot, high speed, low drag, dedicated to the mission and to her teammates. She may have been limited in size, weighing in at a hundred pounds dripping wet, but her fortitude and never-say-die attitude more than made up for her lack of stature. If he had to sum her up in one word, it would be survivor. Or maybe deadly warrior was better. Okay, both defined who and what she was, so why quibble? Other people, especially those who might never have taken the time to get to know her, might have prejudged her, labeling her as wacko or demented. While he could see their point, he could sense she was much more than a flamboyant recluse. There was definitely something stirring just beneath her facade, something genuine and pure, driving her to be more than she was. His mind drifted to the moments just before she'd started her climb, replaying the words he'd said in anger. They were harsh and vengeful, each one barbed and meant to hurt. He wasn't sure why his lips let them out. She didn't deserve it. It was almost as if... A whirling sound broke him out of the daydream. It was coming from above and rising in volume. A single beat later, a thud landed next to him. He turned. It was Masago, grinning from ear to ear. Did you miss me? She said, unhooking the climbing rope from her harness. She took her gloves off and flexed each finger. Holy shit, he said, peering up. The rope was dangling from somewhere near the top of the rocky slope. Fast roping is my second favorite thing. I'm tempted to climb back up and do it again. You should try it sometime. No thanks, I'll pass. I'm not a big fan of heights, or terminal velocity for that matter. Okay, but you don't know what you're missing. I'm a scientist, remember? I prefer to have my feet planted firmly on the ground at all times. Lucas, sweetie, you need to step out of your comfort zone once in a while and try something new. You know, get that heart pumping. It's good for you. He nodded, wanting to get something off his chest. Look, I'm sorry about how I acted earlier. I was way out of line when I snapped at you for no reason. You didn't deserve that. Sometimes my mouth gets the better of me. I wish I could blame it on growing up in foster homes, but the truth is, I can be an asshole at times. I don't know why, it just sort of happens. It's something I'm working on to better myself, but I'm afraid I'm still a work in progress. Already forgotten, she said, giving him a firm hug and a peck on the cheek. Guess what I found? He smiled. Seriously? She gave him the Google glasses. Someone must be looking out for you. Why would you say that? It was just dumb luck I found them. I sat on a rock to clear a few pebbles from my shoe when I happened to glance at the base of a scrub oak. Something reflected and caught my eye from underneath. I stuck my hand in and found them. Where? Thirty feet from the top. You must have dropped them as soon as you went over the edge. They probably bounced around and got wedged under the branches. I can't believe they were still there, he said, thinking of the machine guns tearing apart the plateau. Alvarez and his men must have scoured the place after the slaughter, looking for clues. She leaned in toward the glasses, inspecting the device more closely. Those would have been easy to miss. If I hadn't been sitting precisely where I was with the sun at my back and at that exact time of day, I would have never seen the reflection. It was a million to one shot I found them, seriously. You're right. Dumb luck. But that's not all I found. You went up top, didn't you? She nodded furiously, like a six-year-old waiting for a freshly baked batch of chocolate chip cookies. There were bloodstains buried in the dirt. Someone tried to cover them up, but did a crappy job, probably in a hurry. Anything else? That's it. Damn. Expecting something else? I was hoping for a few body parts lying around. Why? To gross me out? No, so you'd believe me. Of course I believe you, otherwise I wouldn't be helping you right now, she said with a tense look on her face. Don't forget, I gave up my way of life for you. I gave up my home and all my possessions for you. I gave up any chance of seeing my father again, just for you. So yes, I believe you. How can you possibly doubt that, not after all we've been through? I'm sorry, you're right, he said, fiddling with the glasses. He checked on the structural integrity of the frame, sensors, and technology. Everything appeared to be intact. He put the glasses on, hoping to activate the optics, but the heads-up display didn't power on. 
That figures, he said, taking the glasses off to inspect the unit. What's wrong? He opened the battery compartment. The electrochemical graphene cell was full of fluid, but its color had faded into a murky white. It should have been a bright yellow color. Battery's dead. Bouncing around on the rocks must have caused the internal sulfur-based cooling system to malfunction, draining the energy core. Can you recharge it? Not sure. This technology hasn't been invented yet. Not for another 400 years, give or take. Then how are you going to communicate with your friends? I can't, he said, thinking through his options. They were dwindling. I might be stuck here for good. She gave him another hug, this time wrapping herself around his arm, lingering a bit before she let go. That's not all terrible, is it? No, but I have a mission to complete. A lot of people are counting on me, more than you could ever imagine. You're a smart guy. You'll figure it out. He wanted to tell her about the massive energy domes that would soon appear in Tucson and spread across the globe, but he couldn't bring himself to say it, not when his younger self was responsible. At least he knew when and where they would appear. He could keep Masago out of the path of destruction until he could figure out a way to fix the glasses and travel back to an earlier date in history. Then he should be able to fix the timeline so everyone who was about to die wouldn't. He just needed to stay the course and get the glasses working, and the suit repaired. No reason to complicate things with the whole truth. I suppose I might be able to fabricate something if I had the proper tools and equipment. I'm sure there are several places in town that have what you need. My father left me a sizable emergency fund. I'm thinking it's time for a little power shopping. What do you think? Thanks for the offer, but I can't let you do that. What I need is very expensive. It would drain your account. Your father left the money for you, not me. I don't mind, really. The stash isn't far. I can take you to it. Stash? Yeah, a hidden stash. What were you expecting? A bank account? My father didn't trust the banks. Neither do I. Can't blame you there, Lucas said, when a vision of the professor popped into his brain. There's another choice, but I was hoping to avoid contact with him. Who? Dr. Cleesby, my boss who lives on campus. The University of Arizona or Pima Community? U of A. He's the dean of the astrophysics department. At least he used to be, assuming my incursion hasn't altered the timeline around that fact. What are the odds of that? Small, probably. Then again, when I first arrived and could still communicate with Fuji, he mentioned the possibility of ripples of time flowing backward. If that's true, there's no telling what's changed. But I have to believe, even if there were changes in both directions along the timeline, Cleesby must still be involved and in charge. His presence is too important and too prominent in this slice of space-time. See? Even you have faith. Well, faith in science, not the other stuff. That's a start, if you say so. I'm guessing all the extra Lucas copies didn't help the timeline either. No, certainly not. It might be beyond repair already. But we still have to try, right? We? Yeah, we. I'm in this now, to the end. Lucas didn't know how to respond. It would be better if she didn't tag along. But the more he got to know her, the more he realized she was one headstrong chick. Smoking hot, but stubborn. As far as his own history was concerned, she wasn't supposed to be directly involved in this timeline, not during its previous iteration. He took a few seconds to evaluate all that had happened, trying to calculate possible near-future outcomes, but he couldn't focus his thoughts enough to find a solution, not with her standing there watching him. Her gaze penetrated his defenses, reaching deep into his soul, exposing who he really was— a shallow, weak-minded man whose emotions lurked just beneath the surface, ready to take control away from his logic, sending him down a path of self-destruction and self-doubt. He wasn't sure what to do, a common theme lately. What if he made the wrong decision, and even more people died this time around than previously? The ripple effects of everything he'd done since arriving and everything he was about to do would have lasting consequences, especially now. He'd missed the chance for a simple meet-and-greet with his former self to nudge history along a different path, or to stop himself from running the experiment altogether. Changes to the timeline would have been much easier to control if he just could have popped in, made a small change, then popped out. All hope for a simple reversion was shredded, along with the Lucas copies, when Alvarez opened fire. Looking at Masago and thinking about his life up until now made him miss Drew more than ever. 
Sure, there was a younger Drew running around this timeline somewhere, but he needed his version of Drew, the one who'd been at his side since the beginning, the one person he trusted more than anyone else. Making solo decisions was not his strong suit, and he knew it. He was better in a group setting where he had the support of others, the support of people with more conviction than him, like Drew and Masago, hell, just about anyone else. It's not easy making choices when your failure rate runs high, haunting you from the shadows. Lucas, did you hear what I said? I'm in this now, to the end. Yes, sorry, I got lost in my head for a second. He gave her a firm ten-second hug, then let go. Thank you. Thank you for everything. I can't do this alone, especially not with this knee. How's it feel? Any better? Maybe, he said, flexing the leg. It was improving. Hard to tell for sure, but I think so. We should go see your boss, Professor What's-His-Name. Professor Cleesby. But I'm worried once he learns of my presence here, it'll further contaminate the timeline. She didn't say anything. Eventually, all these changes will have a compounding effect. If they reach critical mass, I don't know what's coming next. Doesn't sound like we have much of a choice. There's always a choice. I could choose to do nothing. Then your mission fails. He shrugged. Then I guess it fails. How can you just give up like that? Lucas shrugged. He knew there was no right choice. It was all just a guess. Masago slapped him on the shoulder with the back of her hand. My father used to preach to me that inaction breeds failure. He believed that in order to succeed in life, we have to act, not react. Otherwise, we have no hope of ever getting ahead. So, what's your point? There has to be a way. We just have to find it, she said in a firm tone. No, I'm not going to let you quit. You're a better man than that. At least you believe in me, he said, running his fingers through his short-cropped hair, thinking about Drew and his mother. They were alive in this time period, but there was a high probability that their fates were still on a collision course with horrible, untimely deaths. Part of him wanted to abandon everything and go see his mother before the Krellian energy domes appeared. His heart longed to hear her voice one more time, to get a tender hug and peck on the cheek, but... Deep down, he knew he couldn't. Masago was right. He had to try to complete his mission while there was still time. First up, get the glasses working and repair the suit. Then, travel back to an earlier date. Otherwise, his mother's death and everyone else's would become permanent. There, he finally made a decision, allowing him to breathe a little easier. Granted, it wasn't much of a decision, but it would have to do. Besides... Who's to say that Masago's help wasn't supposed to be part of this newly formed timeline? A slight smile grew on his lips. Maybe the professor will have some ideas? Masago asked. Lucas nodded. Worth a try at this point. Will you drive me to campus? Sure, anywhere you want to go. He flexed his leg. It may have been his imagination talking, but the range of motion felt like it was even better than a few minutes ago, and the pain was less. His thoughts shifted to the tumbler and their trip into town. If we're going to do this, we'll need a different ride. Why? Yours will attract too much attention. It doesn't exactly blend in. I see your point. Maybe my brother will loan us his truck. Is he close? Rocket's place is only a few miles away. Won't take long. You stay here. I'll be right back to pick you up. Lucas was thankful she didn't want him tagging along. There was little chance her brother would be cool with her hanging out with some dude she just met in the desert. The happy-go-lucky look on her face wilted. While I'm gone, you should start flexing that knee. You're way behind in your recovery. I doubt anything works that fast. This medicine does. Trust me. It's time to start pushing through the pain. It'll help loosen it up. You'll thank me later. Yes, doctor. Chapter 14 Attorney Randall Larson waited for the 250-pound secretary to open the door to the office of the university president, then waddle her incredibly huge rear out of the way. Her butt cheeks were wrapped inside laser-cut red spandex pants, highlighting every triple-sided roll of fat growing on her five-foot-two frame. Her buns flopped and wiggled with each step like an out-of-control waterbed. Her figure, if you could call it that, was a far cry from the bevy of perfect specimens he'd wanted to enjoy at the strip club earlier. Larson held back a comment swirling around inside his brain as he made his way inside the office, walking across the university's emblem, which was etched into the wood floor of the expansive office. 
He sat in the visitor's chair and waited for President Lathrop to finish reading a stack of paperwork in a red folder on his desk. Randall studied the body language of the 50-something president, the youngest in school history. Every move appeared to be calculated and measured, as if President Lathrop knew he was being watched. He was a confident leader, and Randall knew he'd better be ready for anything. He ran through a list of excuses in his head, making sure each one would hold up to scrutiny, depending on the direction and intent of the meeting. That's assuming this get-together was actually a meeting, and not an exit interview in disguise. His boss closed the folder and looked up, his face stiff and eyes focused. Randall took a deep breath. You wanted to see me, sir? Lathrop stood from his chair and slid the folder across the desk. It spun around twice before coming to rest an inch from the edge. We have a breach. Randall opened the folder. Inside was a photocopy of a magazine article from an issue of Astrophysics Today. It was several pages long and entitled, The Laws of Physics Are Merely a Suggestion. He scanned the first page of the article, trying to make sense of the scientific mumbo-jumbo coursing through the paragraphs. He caught the gist of it and recognized its significance. Who wrote this? His boss walked to the foot of the oak desk and sat on the leading edge, less than a foot from Randall's knees. He took his bifocal glasses off. Look on page three. Randall flipped the paperwork to the last page. He found the author's name, Lucas Ramsey. Where do you get this? It came in the mail today. Imagine my surprise when I read the byline. You subscribe to this rag? Randall asked, feeling the body heat from his boss wash over him. I went to MIT, remember? Randall nodded, scooting his chair back a bit so he could breathe. Every inch of extra clearance felt like a yard. He wondered why his boss was sitting so damn close. Probably some type of intimidation maneuver, he decided. He tried to ignore Lathrop's proximity, but couldn't. Lathrop continued, I find it helpful to stay abreast of things, especially when dealing with brilliant but arrogant academia types like Dr. Cleesby and Ramsey. Randall read through the last page. If I'm understanding what Ramsey is saying in this article, he's talking about the possibility of interdimensional travel. That's an accurate assessment. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Ramsey's project about anti-gravity? Lathrop nodded. Okay. Maybe I'm missing something. Granted, I'm just a lawyer who doesn't speak geek, but there's no mention of anti-gravity. Where's the confidentiality breach? Not confidentiality breach. Security breach. I just got off a call with Hudson Rapp, the director of NASA. He expects heads to roll. So does William Myers with Homeland Security. Homeland Security? Why? There was a recent incursion just outside of town. Fortunately, General Alvarez was able to deploy his forces and neutralize the threat. Apparently, NASA has been the target of recent terrorist threats, and Rapp's claiming this paper brought undue attention down on everyone. He believes this leak of information directly led to the attack. Myers with Homeland agrees with Rapp's assessment, and so do I. The evidence suggests the insurgents followed the money trail to Tucson and ultimately discovered NASA's secret installation on campus. From this paper? That seems like a stretch, boss. Lathrop inched a bit closer to Randall, still resting his backside on the edge of the desk. You know how much we rely on NASA's funding. That's precisely why I advised you not to allow them to build their facility beneath our property. Once they establish a foothold, they're bound to exert their considerable influence and demand certain concessions. They knew how cash-starved we were when they brought their original offer to us, and now they're going to use it as leverage every opportunity they get. That may be true, but at this point it boils down to one thing. And that is... If they're concerned about a breach, I'm concerned. And if I'm concerned, then it's your job to make it go away. So let me make sure I'm understanding correctly. Basically, you're suggesting I make up some bullshit against Ramsey and have it stick? It's not a suggestion. I could be disbarred for fabricating evidence. I wonder what would happen if the State Bar Association learned of your extracurricular activities on Broadway Boulevard. I'm afraid I don't understand. Do you really think I don't know about your visits to the strip club? You should be ashamed of yourself. You're a married man. Blackbeards? You know about that? As the president of this university, it's my job to know everything. And when I learn of something that can tarnish the reputation of this fine institution, I take action and deal with the problem head on. What I do on my own time is my business. So is my marriage. 
I advise you to tread lightly when it comes to my wife or my kids. Aren't you in recovery? Again, that's a private matter. Last time I checked, beer is still considered to be an alcoholic beverage. Driving a motor vehicle after several rounds of Fosters in an hour is considered a DUI in this state. You son of a bitch. You had me followed. You left me no choice. Several staff members complained of alcohol on your breath. I was forced to launch an inquiry. When? Last year? And yet, you waited until now to throw this in my face? He who has the knowledge has the power. That's the key to success in any endeavor. Of course, it's even more important to know precisely how and when to use it. I'm sure your wife would be disappointed if she learned where you've been spending your lunch hours and with whom. So now you're gonna blackmail me. Blackmail is such a distasteful term. I prefer to think of it as focused motivation. Randall was about to release his temper when something occurred to him. He could use Ramsey's article and its security breach as an excuse to halt the experiment tonight, then collect the bonus payment from the buyer tomorrow. It was a gift from heaven. His rage evaporated. What do NASA and Homeland Security want? Terminate Ramsey's experiment. He held back the smile tearing at his lips. That can only be sanctioned by the advisory committee, which won't be easy. Cleesby has a lot of friends on that panel. I have every confidence you'll find a way, now that you're properly focused. Why don't you simply pick up the phone and have it shut down? After all, you are the president. I'm sure the board of regents would agree with your decision. Lathrop shook his head, looking at the floor for a moment, and then back at Randall. He stood and walked around the desk, taking a seat in his high-back leather chair. I need you to handle it. I can't be involved directly. You really are a son of a bitch. I'm sure there are those who would agree with you, but I'm just doing my job to protect this institution. Yeah, from the shadows, Randall said, feeling this was a personal vendetta. It was clear he was being used to carry out some underhanded tactics. As a litigation attorney and a former Marine, he loved a good fight and normally would stand his ground, but not today. Not now. He needed to defuse the situation and use it to his advantage. He didn't want to tip his hand. Larson exhaled, taking a good ten seconds to let the air out. You're right. I have a problem. For whatever reason, I can't seem to stay away from the club. We all have weaknesses, right? Once we're through this crisis with NASA, I'll expect you to check into rehab. You need to get clean and sober. Then we'll find you a counselor who can help with your stripper problem. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your support. Once the experiment is shut down, I need you to confiscate the E-121 material and have it delivered to NASA. That's what this is really about. The E-121? They want an exclusive. Cleesby would never allow it. I'm pretty sure he secretly funded its recovery from Mexico through one of his offshore holding companies. He won't have a choice. The situation now falls under the purview of national security. We can't allow anyone to leak information that incites terrorism, especially a junior researcher like Dr. Ramsey. No, I suppose not, Randall said, thinking through the ramifications of this meeting and how it might affect his standing within the family. If I do this, when you do this, yes, when I do this, General Alvarez can never know about my lunchtime activity. You do know I'm married to his sister, right? Maybe you should have thought of that before you decided to dip your wick into the forbidden fruit. Look, judge me all you want, but consider the fact that my brother-in-law despises me already. He's just looking for a reason to put a bullet in my head. If he learns of this, you'll never find my body. That certainly won't help you with NASA or the feds. You know as well as I do that Cleesby won't go down without a fight. You're going to need me to carry out more of your legal dirty work. And that can't happen if I'm buried in the desert somewhere. I see your point. Then we have an agreement? For now? Good enough, Randall said, sliding the folder back across the desk. It landed in the president's lap. Be sure to shut the door on your way out, his boss said. Randall stood and walked away without a response. He took the cell phone from his coat pocket and deactivated the recording software before he made it to the door. He was going to be up late tonight, sorting through the day's audio files on both devices after he returned home from his wife's dinner party. He walked past Lathrop's secretary without saying a word. Not that she noticed. She was busy reading an issue of Weight Watchers magazine while snacking on a king-size Snickers bar.
Half an hour later, Larson slipped through the revolving doors of the science lab carrying his briefcase and made his way to the security desk where Bruno Benner was talking to a group of students. Randall made eye contact with the friendly guard, giving him a head bob to get his attention. Bruno moved out from behind the station and walked to Randall's position, ten feet away from the waiting students. Good afternoon, counselor. What can I do for you today? I need a pass. May I ask the nature of your visit today? I need to speak to Dr. Davies, then Dr. Ramsey. Bruno checked the iPad in his hands, scrolling through several screens of information. I don't see your name on the list. When has that ever been a problem? Sorry, no unscheduled visitors today. Dr. Cleesby's orders. Why not? He didn't say, but all visitors must be pre-approved and then escorted by security personnel while they're on site. This is an outrage. He can't deny me access. I'm sorry, sir, but I have my orders. Is Cleesby here? I need to speak with him, at once. He stepped out for a meeting, but you could try him on his cell. Better yet, why don't you do your fucking job and stop wasting my time? Walk your fat ass over to that little security station of yours, pick up the goddamned phone, and call him. I'm certain he'll authorize access, especially after you explained to him that the university president has ordered a complete investigation into Ramsey's project. There's been a security breach, and I've been tasked to lead the investigation. Security breach? How? I'm sorry, but that's above your pay grade. Are you going to make the call, or do I need to get President Lathrop involved? No, 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 that won't be necessary. Wait here, Bruno said, before he turned and walked to the security station. He picked up the phone and spent a solid minute talking on it before returning to Randall. I spoke to Dr. Cleesby. He's cleared you for access, but asked that you return in one hour. Why? Neither Dr. Davies nor Dr. Ramsey are currently here. When will they be? In an hour, when their shifts are scheduled to begin? So, you're seriously not going to let me pass. Sorry, Counselor, but I have my orders. We all answer to someone. This is fucking ridiculous, Randall said, checking the time on his watch. He turned and stormed for the entrance, banging his shoulders on the revolving glass doors as they carried him outside. Chapter 15 Masago tore through one curve after another, pushing the front suspension of the tumbler to its limits as she flew across the washboard terrain of the open desert on her way to her brother's secluded compound. The thick layers of sand and gravel should have been making the vehicle skid from side to side with each nudge of the steering wheel, but the virgin off-road tread on the jumbo tires was gripping the surface as if it were dry pavement. Let's kick it up a notch, she said, stomping on the accelerator, hoping to force-feed her chest with more adrenaline. It worked. The back end of the tumbler was now fishtailing wildly as she navigated a series of switchback bends in the trail. If Lucas had been along for the ride, she imagined he'd be screaming by now. Roads? Who needs roads? She said, pushing a smile through her clenched lips and stiff jaw. She aimed the front tires at a four-foot-tall swell of dirt, sending her and the vehicle airborne. Oh yeah! She screamed, waiting for the back end of the tumbler to make contact with Mother Earth. It did, clearing a swimming pool-sized spread of river rock in the process. Then she saw it, the teetering, double-stacked, red-colored mailbox. It was about a hundred feet away, marking the last mile of dust to nowhere. Well, not nowhere exactly. It was the home stretch that would take her to the razor wire fence protecting Rocket's prepper camp. She turned the wheel ten degrees to the right, scanning the area ahead for changes to the landscape since she'd last traveled this route. She didn't notice any, but then again, it had been ten months since she'd made this trek. Plus, the previous visit was made on foot, not while four-wheeling at high speed. She heard a whistle of static and then a man's voice crackle with electronic tones and sequels. A leak before I have to head to the shop for my shift. This is Jesse, by the way. Ugh, over. Masago scanned the interior of the vehicle for the source, but didn't see it. She felt the tumbler drift wide on its own, refocusing her attention. She corrected the car's path, keeping it from heading for a boulder or cactus. Her eyes checked the rearview mirror, more so out of habit than need. A massive dust cloud was forming behind her, billowing out and up to mark where she'd been. She decided to slow down to reduce the dust. Someone could easily spot it from a distance, like the armed guards stationed at Rocket's front gate. They wouldn't know it was her, not in the tumbler. It looked military, a threat. 
If they opened fire, then it hit her. She knew the source of the voice. The tumbler was equipped with a proximity sensor, and it must have been activated by the car's built-in communication system, one of her brother's inventions. It meant she was getting close to her destination. She felt around the dash for the microphone while keeping her eyes on the road, but it wasn't there. Crap. She'd left it in the rear cargo area, stuffed inside one of the bug-out bags she and Lucas had thrown in earlier. Jesse who? Another man answered across the radio. She recognized the voice. It was her brother's. Jesse Donner, sir. Over. I was kidding, dumbass. This is an open channel. Use proper radio procedure or pack your shit and leave. Sorry, Rocket. Sorry, uh, this is Cannibal at Station One. Hold on, something is ha- A few seconds of radio silence passed before her brother responded. Nighthawk to Cannibal, repeat your last and stop using my name. This is your last warning. Over. Masago didn't know Jesse Cannibal Donner. He was obviously new and inexperienced. She'd met some of the other members of Rocket's team, but not this clown. Rocket must have been busy expanding his ranks, taking in supplies, labor, and muscle in exchange for advanced weapons and tactical training. New members had to be vetted and pass extensive training to prove their worth before they were granted right of entry and protection when the time came. Her brother was a freak when it came to security and preparedness, training his team for every contingency, including government meltdowns and coronal mass ejections. Rocket was a bit intense, especially when it came to his beliefs. However, they weren't half as intense as his short fuse. His temper was legendary for all the wrong reasons. But she couldn't blame him. Those were family traits passed down from their eccentric, missing father. Her foot found the brake pedal, slowing the tumbler to one mile per hour. The trailing dust storm caught up and drifted past, dissipating into a wandering memory. She'd expected to see two guards at the fortified iron gate with razor wire across the top, but there was only one. He was a tall behemoth, with stringy black hair that had been slicked back across his head and down the back of his neck. A ball cap was in one hand, and a pair of triangular-shaped binoculars in the other. She assumed the muscular beast was Jesse Donner, the rookie her brother had just scolded across the radio. The guard put his cap on, then put the binoculars to his eyes, aiming them at her. About time, she said, wondering how the man hadn't seen her earlier. The dust cloud should have been visible for at least the past five minutes. She recognized the unique shape of the binoculars Jesse was holding in his hands. Their father had invented them long ago, but an earlier version. Rocket had taken the old man's design and increased the range tenfold and added a heads-up display for range and direction. Masago had meant to borrow the pair during her next visit, but not today, she decided. She needed to talk Rocket out of his truck. One thing at a time, she reminded herself. Don't ask for too much all at once. The radio in the car woke up from its short slumber. Nighthawk to Cannibal, respond, over! She caught a glimpse of the AK-47 on Jesse's back when he turned slightly. It hadn't moved from its stored position, but she figured it would soon. Station one, report, Rocket said. Jesse let the binoculars drop from his hands, dangling down the front of his chest by a leather strap wrapped around his neck. He put his chin down, angling it toward the radio stuck to the left side of his vest. The vehicle's comm unit crackled again, opening the frequency for another transmission. She heard a man clear his throat, then take a deep breath. The sounds matched what she was seeing with Jesse. She stopped the car and put the transmission into park. We have a visitor. Over, Jesse said, unshouldering his AK-47, pointing it at Masago. She got out of the car, slowly, with her hands up, not wanting to make any sudden moves. She took a deep breath, allowing her to shout across the clearing. Don't shoot! My name is Masago! I'm Rocket's sister! The radio ignited once again. Cannibal, describe what you're seeing! Over! Rocket? Uh, Nighthawk? There's a girl. Beautiful and Asian. N no offense, I'm just saying. She's an Asian chick in a military assault vehicle or something. She's at the gate and says she knows you. What should I do? Masago wondered where Rocket had met this slug, and why was he stationed at the main entrance, alone? Did she identify herself? The voice on the radio asked. Melody or, or something, sir. Not sure. She says she's family. Orders? 
A moment later, a mosquito buzzed Masago's face, which was odd, since it was December. Mosquitoes are rare in the arid southwest, and even more rare in the dead of winter. Then, she saw a glint of light reflect off the bug's metallic wings. She tried to follow its path as it changed direction every half-second, finally zipping above her head and into the cover of the burning sun. Adjusting buzzer cam, Rocket said over the radio. The buzzing device circled around in front of her, this time taking a hovering position three feet from her nose. That's my sister, asshole. Stand down. Let her through. Yes, sir. Sorry. Masago jumped into the tumbler, pulled forward, and approached the gate, then waited as Cannibal rolled it aside. She drove past him, maneuvering the vehicle across ditches and ruts that formed a trail past an array of dormant garden boxes. She recognized the group of four mobile home trailers stationed to the right. One was used for reloading ammo, while the others were tasked as squad quarters and storage. Construction framework was in progress for several permanent structures across the west side of the property, not far from the homemade shooting range and tactical training courses that covered much of the remaining acreage. At last count, Rocket had 17 people living on and working the compound with him. He earned money teaching survival skills and defensive tactics, and by offering firearms and explosives training to the public. His team also reloaded and sold ammo as well as made homemade knives and other unique weapons. She passed a few more people, none she recognized, each one staring at the familiar movie vehicle rolling by. The sunlight dimmed after she drove under the camouflage netting strung across the center of the property to foil satellite surveillance. Next, a rickety barn came into view as she pulled the tumbler around and parked behind the trailers. Her plan was to head to the barn, where she figured Rocket was busy at work. It was his playground, his sanctuary, the place where he spent most of his free time tinkering and inventing gadgets like the flying mosquito cam, another skill he learned from their father. Gunfire erupted beyond the barn, and Masago gripped the wheel out of instinct. Her eyes darted to the left and found at least ten men, women, and children standing side by side, a few feet apart, wearing ear and eye protection as they fired automatic weapons at metal reactionary targets scattered along the shooting range. Many of the bullet-riddled targets were in the shape of people, but some were designed to resemble vehicles, including two painted like police cars. Most of the shooters held AR-15s, but three of the men were holding Glock pistols, probably Model 30s, 45 caliber short frames, her brother's handgun of choice. Reliable, simple to operate, virtually indestructible. Masago scanned the group, but didn't see Rocket. She thought they might be members of one of his public shooting classes. A blur of motion next to a leafless tree on the right drew her attention. A man's face appeared. It was Rocket. He raised one hand above his head and waved for her to join him. She took the keys, crawled out of the hatch, closed it, and walked over to him. He used two fingers in the corner of his mouth to whistle sharply at the shooters on the range. They turned their heads. He drew a finger across his neck. The trainees put their weapons down and huddled together to reload their magazines with more rounds. Rocket Fuji was several inches taller than Masago and noticeably thin, too thin, she was shocked by how much weight he'd lost. Obviously, he was too busy training to eat properly. His jeans and baggy t-shirt were marked with holes and smears of dirt. Apparently, laundry was not on the top of his list either. His dark mullet had grown several inches in the back and stood bushier on top since the last time she'd seen him. He looked like a backwoods Asian redneck who doubled as an Elvis impersonator, though Rocket couldn't carry a tune. Rocket smiled and hugged her with a notebook-sized device in one hand. She caught only a glimpse of it, but thought it was a hybrid device, a cross between a touchscreen iPad and an old-school control unit for a remote-activated toy, complete with twin toggle switches and analog lights. He needed a bath, too. The smell of perspiration and chemical fertilizer was overpowering. Rocket let go and took three abrupt steps back, staring at the tumbler, then at her. What's wrong? Masago swallowed. I need a favor, bro. Rocket narrowed his eyes. Does this favor involve a body? Maybe two? She shrugged, thinking about the men she'd buried with the detonation of her home. None you need to be concerned with. That's my sister, he said, smiling. Can I show you something first? I'm kind of in a hurry. Can it wait? It won't take long. 
If it's the mosquito camera, I saw it at the gate. That's the smallest long-distance drone ever invented, if you can believe the propaganda coming out of Washington. Who knows what the government isn't telling us, right? Rocket asked with a quick pace to his words. He nodded. But no, this one is live right now, so it really can't wait. Looks like your classes are getting bigger, Masago said, pointing at the range. One of those girls looks pretty young. She's five, same age as when Dad started training us. I barely remember that. She's Zed Bradshaw's daughter. You met him once, I think. Oh yeah, the neat freak. That's not a class, though. It's membership practice, ever since the activity started. Activity? Haven't you heard? The military lit up the Catalinas, three Apaches from what I've been able to gather. Military training happens all the time in the desert. I don't see what's the big deal. It wasn't practice. It was a live op. I know the difference. Attack choppers opened fire, raining down hell across the terrain. It's all a lie, I tell you. A damn lie. Don't believe anything they tell you. Not a fucking thing. Did you go check it out? Nah, it won't matter. I'm sure the feds sanitized the area as soon as it was over. That's SOP. Masago didn't respond. He was just rocket being rocket. There've been reports of other skirmishes, too. The Marino Brothers compound was hit and weapons were stolen. Really? That close? Yep. No survivors. I tried to warn those amateurs about the gaps in their security net, but no one ever listens to me. You try to help some people, but they just roll their eyes and mumble crap under their breath. I always listen to you. Yeah, sure. In your dreams, maybe. I do. You just don't remember. Uh, well, whatever. Anyway, I thought it best to activate our membership and have everyone check in. Time to prepare. Something is going down. I can feel it in my bones. Then why is the rookie out front? We're working on it, but not everyone's here yet. He's a liability. Cannon fodder would be a better handle than cannibal. Does the fact that you're driving the tumbler have anything to do with all of this? Masago rolled her head around her neck, trying to loosen the knot forming on the side. It seemed to work. Why would you think that? Because you're driving it, in public. Wasn't that dad's rule number 11? Maybe I just wanted to visit my brother. Did you ever think of that? That would be a first. Masago cleared her throat. So, this thing you wanted to show me, better than the mosquito cam? His face lit up, pointing at a lonely tree with a twisted trunk 50 feet away. See that ugly tree just beyond the razor wire? Masago smirked at her brother. Wow, you invented a remote control tree. OMG, the world will never be the same. Funny sis, Rocket said, flipping her off. He thumbed the power switch of the remote control unit. You see the white coffee can, third branch, halfway up? Masago squinted, seeing the rusted curve of the can's lid. It looked like the top was strapped on with rubber bands. The number 212 had been stenciled on the side of it in white paint. Not really. I could sure use a good pair of binoculars. I wonder where I could get a pair. Hmm. I think Cannibal isn't using his. Rocket sucked in a long snort through his nose, and then spit up a wad of snot into the dirt at her feet. Depends. Why didn't you use the comms in the tumbler? Did you lose the mic? No, it's in the car, I promise. Why didn't you radio in instead of driving up unannounced? Masago bit down on her lip. Really? You're going to grill me about procedure? He nodded. She pointed at the can in the tree. What does the number 212 mean? So, you can see it, he asked in a sarcastic tone. Well, maybe a little. Rocket sighed. It's the attempt number. You've blown up 211 trees so far? Rocket waved the glowing remote at the fence line. No, we used it for blasting when we extended the fence line. What's in it? C4? Nah, government won't let that shit out of their sight. I used a unique concoction of household chemicals, stuff you can get anywhere. Wait till you see the power. That tree is creepy. I feel like it's staring at me. Yeah, I hate it too. Time for it to go, he said, fiddling with the control unit. Don't you think we should stand behind some kind of blast shield? This is how rednecks die, you know, blowing stuff up. Rocket belted out a laugh. Only when they turn to the camera and say, Hey, watch this! Then you know body parts are about to get mangled. She laughed. No, seriously. This is a focused charge. It'll only destroy what I want it to. The tree, not the surrounding area. It's a surgical, low-shrapnel-shaped charge. Pretty cool, don't you think? She shook her head. Boys with toys. Besides, if anything is going to get me killed, it'll be my crazy-ass sister. Crazy-ass sister? We have another sister? Is she cuter than me? Rocket stuck out his tongue, then lifted the remote and pointed the front of it at the target. He licked his lips. Time to say goodbye, Mr. Tree. He dragged his finger across the screen and flipped one of the switches. Nothing happened. Masago rolled her eyes. Now that's the most awesome thing I've ever seen. Way to go, brother. You need to get a patent in place before someone steals the tech. He shook the remote and tried again. Nothing happened. She put her hands on her hips. 
Are we done now? Must be a transmission error, or a mixture problem. Maybe you should have tested a smaller charge first? I did! Worked fine! That's a cool remote control unit, though. Maybe you can sell it on eBay. I'm sure someone would buy it. Now you're just being a BITC. Before Rocket could finish spelling the word, an explosion ripped the air, sending dirt, sand, and tree parts everywhere. Holy crap! she screamed, covering her ears and ducking for cover behind Rocket. Exactly, he said, reaching up to sweep the ends of his mullet behind his ears. Now that's what I'm talking about! That was awesome, bro. I know, right? An odor drifted into her nose, but it wasn't the smell of burnt carbon like she had expected. She sniffed again, thinking her senses were confused. She stared at her brother. He tilted his head. What? Almonds? But you said it wasn't C4. Rocket looked at the crater where the ugly tree had stood. My own special derivative. It's amazing what a little redneck chemistry can do. What'd you use? He smiled. One of the components was detergent. I figured that when you said typical household items. What else? That's my ace in the hole. If nobody else knows about it, then they'll never see it coming, nor will they know how to defeat it. You're not going to tell your own sister? Not until it's perfected, then maybe. Masago looked toward the sky and shifted into her coy, I need something and you can't say no mode. So, I was thinking I could temporarily trade vehicles with you. Your truck for the tumbler. She dangled the keys in front of his face. I know you wish Dad had given it to you instead of me. Now's your chance. It's a total blast to drive. Does it still work? What? I've seen you drive, sis. Ford Motors is going to need more crash dummies. She lowered the keys, feeling them touch her thigh. Are you saying I'm a bad driver? No, I'm just worried about Junior. I need my truck back in one piece. Is that a yes, then? It's a maybe. I promise to take really good care of him. I'll drive just like you, slow and sloppy. He laughed. I'll believe it when I see it. I promise nothing bad will happen to Junior. You still haven't told me why. She hesitated before answering. I need to go into town, and I don't want to drive something everyone will recognize. The gawkers will never leave me alone. The tumbler doesn't exactly blend in. He just stared at her and blinked, not saying anything. That's the absolute truth, I swear. It might be, but my gut is telling me there's more. For once, can't you just trust me? Trust is a two-way street, little sis. Why go into town? It's personal. You know you can tell me anything, right? She nodded. It's a woman thing, you know. A monthly thing. He shook his head and diverted his eyes. Oh, that. Got it. So can I borrow your truck? I really need to jet. Fine, but no Baja 1000s. Agreed? I promise, she said, wrapping her arms around him. She hugged him extra long and tight. That felt like a goodbye hug. Permanent, like. No, I just miss you, that's all. That wouldn't be the case if you lived here instead of in that hole dad bought. I know, maybe someday. He pointed at the tumbler. Why don't you back it up to the barn and I'll get my keys. I'll need a minute to say goodbye to my baby. Masago left the hatch open as she drove the tumbler backward through the ruts, then shifted forward, parking a few feet outside the doors of the barn. Rocket kicked the doors open, revealing his pickup truck standing high on its massive lift kit and tractor tires. She pulled the bags out of the tumbler and set them on the ground next to the truck. She held out her hand. Keys, please. He put his hand in his pocket and left it there. Are you going to make me beg? There's one condition. I know, I have to drive safe. No, something else. Now you're just trying to push my buttons. His hand came out of the pocket, placing a homemade accessory in her hand. It was two inches wide and circular, made out of weaved paracord using an over-under braid pattern. A compass had been surface-mounted to it. Masago narrowed her eyes at him. A bracelet? Survival kit. Inside are all sorts of goodies to help keep lead-footed sisters safe while they're on a secret mission. Just clip it to your wrist and leave it there. Masago did as he asked. It was snug around her wrist and a bit uncomfortable. The dial on the compass spun around to point north. What's in it? The wrap unravels to 15 feet, giving you plenty of cordage to use for just about anything. Inside it are foil, snare wire, needle, thread, fishing tackle, waterproof matches, and char cloth. Nifty. Nifty? Now who's pushing buttons? She held out her hand again. I love you too, brother. Keys? Rocket pulled the keys from his pocket and jiggled them in front of her face. I really don't like the idea of you being on your own, out there in the world with all the nutbags, not with all that's happened recently. I've got a bad feeling about this. You always say that. But this time I'm right. 
I'll be careful. You know I can take care of myself. Yes, you can, but there's a million deranged people living down there in that cesspool they call Tucson. That's a lot of crazy to handle on your own. If anything goes wrong, I want you back here, on the double. This is the rally point for everyone, our Alamo, when it starts. But remember, my responsibility is here, to protect everyone, not just you. I won't be able to come find you if the shit hits the fan. She grabbed the keys from him and snatched her stuff from the trunk. Everyone died in the Alamo. You know what I mean. Roger that, she said with a sharp tone. She dropped her bags into the back of the truck and opened the driver's door. Try to eat something. You need to keep up your strength. No one here can cook like you, Rocket said. That's because I spoiled you, she said, rolling the window up. Her fingers put the keys in the ignition and started the V8 engine. It roared with the power of 400 ponies. A moment later, the gear shift was in drive and she sped off, feeling the overly stiff suspension hit every bump on the property. Lucas was sitting on a chair-sized rock, flexing his knee, as Masago told him to do, when he felt a strange tingle on the lower part of his left leg, just above the ankle bone. He yanked his pant leg up and saw a hairy, three-inch-long centipede slinking along, using his red leg hairs as a stepladder. He jumped from the rock and shook his leg like it was on fire. The poisonous crawler flew into the air, bouncing and skipping its way across the desert floor until it landed in a patch of loose dirt ten feet away. The all-black creature struggled to right itself, eventually flipping over to its belly, then slithering away using a zigzag escape pattern. Shit, that was close, he said with panic-filled breath. A distant memory flared from an earlier timeline, taking over the projector in the back of his mind. He remembered the hockey puck-sized scorpion crawling into bed with him back in his apartment, right after Drew had finished his shower. The sight of the arched stinger caused the same all-out adrenaline rush he'd just experienced from the centipede. Of course, in the apartment, he was able to smash the creature flat with his shoe before flushing it down the toilet. Then something occurred to him. Something about his past. The bed-crawling scorpion event took place about now in his former timeline. He couldn't remember for sure, but he thought it may have just happened yesterday or the day before to his younger self. At least it should have, if the current timeline held true to the past. He wondered if his younger self smashed it with the same shoe or took a different approach. How close would a rerun of a past timeline event hold true? He took a few deep breaths through his nose, more so out of instinct than anything else, calming his nerves and letting his mind flush the thoughts. A faint smell drifted across his senses. Oranges. Again. That strange lingering citrus scent that seemed to rise up out of nowhere. It didn't matter where or when he was, it seemed to follow him everywhere. It didn't make any sense. But then again, there are hundreds of billions of nerve endings firing in one's brain at any second, so there's bound to be a few that misfire on occasion. Just then, the roar of a straining engine echoed across the warming desert terrain. The torque-driven whine was coming from his left. He looked, but couldn't see anything except a billowing trail of dust drifting across the landscape, floating aimlessly above the endless hedge of desert brush. Lucas estimated it was a half a mile away, and worried it wasn't Masago. With his luck, General Alvarez and his band were coming to dig six-foot-deep holes for a few body dumps. Then again, it could be some four-wheeler out for a joyride. Whoever it was, Lucas was a sitting duck, unable to escape with a bad knee. Actually, a better term would have been lame duck. The motorized sound grew louder until a high-profile red-and-white Ford truck came flying over a steep rise in the trail. It was an F-250. The truck's tires left the ground for a few seconds as its speed sent it airborne over the incline. Its horn sounded just after it hit the ground, but it wasn't a honk like Lucas expected. Instead, the F-250 played a 12-note melody from the song Dixie. It was the same playful tune that the 1969 Dodge Chargers horn played in the TV series The Dukes of Hazard. Apparently, someone forgot to tell the Ford's owner that the General Lee in the show was a car, not a three-quarter-ton super-duty truck. A vision of Daisy Duke and her incredibly tight short shorts filled his head. He smiled. If only. All eight of the powerful spotlights mounted to the truck's exterior roll bar turned on as it raced toward him. Seconds later, the brakes stopped the tires from turning, just as the front wheels angled sharply to the right, sending the vehicle sliding through the dirt as it made its way closer to Lucas. 
He covered his face as a shower of dirt and pebbles were sent flying his way. He waited for the shards of debris to finish pelting his hands and arms, then looked up. The truck was sitting sideways, perpendicular to his position, less than six feet away. The driver's blacked-out window rolled down in uneven spurts, indicating a manual crank. It was Masago. She smiled. Did you miss me? He coughed after inhaling a mouthful of dust. Up until just now. She blew him a playful kiss with only a pucker of her lips. He ignored it. I'm starting to think you get off on scaring the crap out of me. Quit complaining and get in. We've got work to do. Lucas hobbled to the far side of the truck, realizing the discomfort in his knee was much less than before. He could now walk with only a marginal limp. The last half hour of flexing had helped tremendously, though he didn't want to admit it to Masago. He was still pissed at her for the dangerous entrance she'd just made, so he faked a limp to the passenger door. He opened it and put his right hand on top of the door frame, with his good leg standing on the door's threshold. He pulled himself up a good two feet, then slid his butt into the seat. He slammed the door shut to make a point. She rolled her eyes, then hit the gas before he could get the seatbelt on, giving him a mini case of whiplash. Chapter 16 Three armored military Humvees crept forward in a single-file procession at two miles an hour, winding their way through a gauntlet of private security personnel and vehicles guarding the biotech facility on the south side of Tucson, Arizona. General Alvarez kept a close eye on his replacement driver from the back seat, making sure the young private followed the lead vehicle precisely as the motorcade navigated the narrow corridor of barricades and parked near the main entrance. A four-man team shot out of the lead vehicle, sprinting to take defensive positions around the front of the general's ride. Alvarez was tempted to look back over his shoulder to check the deployment of the follow team, but decided against it. He was confident his men had used their training and were in position to protect against a rear assault or a sniper attack. General Alvarez waited for Private Stetson to walk around to the passenger side of the Humvee and open the door for him, which he did, though it took him much longer than it should have. Alvarez stepped out of the transport and put on his cap and sunglasses, ignoring the salute from the driver. A man approached the general from the main building, wearing dark-rimmed glasses and a tailored business suit with a red and yellow striped tie. Welcome, general, the businessman said with confidence energizing his voice. Good to see you again. The general recognized him. Where are they, Shelby? They've been secured in quarantine, Shelby answered, extending his hand in the direction of a massive industrial complex about 30 feet away. I'm assuming that's where you want them held. It's the most secure area of the property. Airtight, shielded, and incursion-proof. Lead the way, Alvarez responded, appreciating the efficiency of his former second-in-command. He could hear the clatter of equipment and footsteps closing in around him as his eight-man security team covered his movement. Shelby walked toward the entrance to the sprawling five-acre network of interconnected buildings. The property was owned by a privately funded bioengineering company called Micromatter, founded 20 years earlier by world-renowned biochemist and world record holder for the ugliest beard and mustache, Dr. Charles C. Starling. The general followed his escort into the reception area, just beyond the all-glass main entrance. Four members of his team remained outside, while the remainder of his unit joined him inside. Alvarez took his sunglasses off after walking through the front door. Has the bearded wonder sent everyone home for the day, management included? Yes, sir. Dr. Starling carried out your orders to the letter. I made sure of it. Excellent. But you don't need to call me sir anymore, Alvarez said, as Shelby led him across the marble-floored lobby toward the first hallway on the left. Sorry, sir. General, force of habit. Where are the rest of your team? They're en route. They were engaged in another op when Starling called for assistance. The interior was just as Alvarez expected clean and sparsely appointed. The white walls, white ceiling, and white floors were almost too white, making him rethink his decision to remove the shades. It took a minute for his eyes to adjust to the overhead lighting and the whiteout effects. What's the status of your security team? He asked Shelby. Three of the four responsible for capturing the insurgents are standing guard in quarantine. One was critically wounded. He's on his way to Arizona Medical Center, but he's not expected to survive. Losses are inevitable. Yes, they are, General, but it doesn't make it any easier. Your man knew the risks when he accepted this duty. Shelby nodded. 
We all know what's at stake. I'm just not sure what to say to his wife. That's always the difficult part. It's a burden that all leaders must carry for the rest of their days. Hopefully he pulls through, and then you'll be able to deliver positive news. If not, just keep it short and on point. She won't hear most of what you tell her anyway. What about the captives? They're conscious, but I don't recognize their strange-looking uniforms. Must be part of a new paramilitary organization. Is Starling with them? The director hasn't left his office since the incursion began. Why? Emergency meeting with the board of directors? You said management had evacuated. They did. It's a video conference call. Starling is alone in his office, as usual. He rarely accepts visitors. Is he still wearing sunglasses and the ball cap everywhere he goes? Shelby gave him a single, efficient nod. A bit of a recluse, I suspect. Not your typical CEO. No, he hates the limelight. I think that's why the board meetings are all done online. He prefers to be left alone. At least it keeps him out of your way. Yes, he lets me do my thing. Makes my job a whole lot easier. Have you done a floor-by-floor -floor search? There may be additional intruders. The rest of my team completed their sweep less than ten minutes ago. We only found the six men. Have you been able to extract any information? Nothing. Not their names, ranks, or serial numbers. That will change soon. Shelby pulled a thin, black metal box the size of a cigarette pack from his front pocket. Starling instructed me to deliver this to you personally. Alvarez took the container and opened it. Inside were six vials of a neon blue colored substance. Just as agreed, Shelby told him with authority. Six perfectly balanced doses of Protocol 5. Time for activation. One minute, 21 seconds after injection. Excellent. Some last minute adjustments brought it down from 212. Starling figured you'd be pleased. Alvarez ignored the obvious fishing attempt by his former and snapped the container shut. He slid it into his pocket. What about the control unit? It's waiting for you in quarantine. Dr. Starling prefers not to keep them stored together for obvious security reasons. Sounds like he finally solved the cohesion problem. Yes, three days ago, after a complete remapping of the viral receptors. It only took him 30 years to finally get it right. Good timing, wouldn't you say? I wondered the same thing. Out of nowhere, he ordered the development team to work triple shifts. Almost as if he knew something was coming, Alvarez added, reaffirming his gut instinct not to trust the bearded recluse. It's not the first time his instincts have proved correct. Shelby turned right, heading down the next corridor. Interrogation of enemy combatants will never be the same after this. No doubt, Alvarez said. How did you manage to convince him to let you administer the first live trial? Actually, it was his idea after he came to me with another one of his incredible predictions. Turns out his intel was spot on. He saved a lot of lives. He'll be glad he came to you, General. You're the finest commander I've ever had the pleasure of serving. Alvarez appreciated the compliment, but didn't acknowledge it. Doing so would have broken one of his own rules as commander. He had a reputation to uphold, and affirming a subordinate's narrow platitude was a waste of time and energy. But then, the softer side of his psyche spoke up and reminded him that even though Shelby wasn't part of his command anymore, the man had earned his respect and deserved a modicum of civility. Alvarez agreed with himself and decided to loosen the grip on his own arrogance. Are you sure I can't convince you to rejoin the unit? I appreciate the offer, but I can't afford to give up this high-paying gig. There's always a place for you, Shelby, if you should decide you miss the action. I do miss it, but military pay just doesn't cut it, not with nine mouths to feed. The general was pleased Shelby took his advice and had settled into his role as a family man. Sounds like you've been busy. You could say that. If my wife even thinks about sex, she gets pregnant. Feel fortunate there's still plenty of lead in your pencil. Trust me, that won't always be the case. Shelby smiled. I wish I could take all the credit, but Starling's new fertility drug added five to the mix all at once. The all-night feedings and diaper changes are wearing me out. Enjoy the chaos while you can. Someday, you'll be a relic like me and miss the blissful insanity of little ones. There's really nothing quite like it. Find some time to take it all in. These days will never come again. Before you know it, they'll be heads down buried in their iPads and Facebook, forgetting they once idolized you. Roger that, Shelby said, turning another corner. How's your daughter doing? Is Jasmine still living in Tucson? Still here. She's been working and studying a lot. I rarely hear from her, but that's to be expected when you're busy putting yourself through medical school. She's not afraid to work hard for what she wants, but sometimes she forgets there are people who miss her and need to know how she's doing. I just wish she'd let me or my ex help her financially, but she says she wants to do it all on her own. 
She's stubborn and independent that way. She texted me a couple of months ago and told me she landed a high-paying job working as a bartender at a popular club, so she quit her cafeteria job. Higher pay means less hours, more time for studying, but never any time for her old man. Which club? Maybe I've been there. He didn't want to share the name of the strip club, fearing Shelby would think less of his daughter, and less of him by extension. It's one of those new dance clubs on East Broadway, but I can never remember its name. But which club it is really doesn't matter. I'm just happy she's healthy and happy. That's all a father can ask. She has a good heart. She'll make a fine doctor someday. The general couldn't hold back the prideful smile that took control of his lips. Shelby stopped walking when he came to a double swing door leading to the next section of the building. He propped the right half of the door open with his foot and pointed to the far end of the hallway. That door leads to the medical bay. Just beyond that is quarantine. Alvarez squeezed past him. We'll take it from here. You're dismissed. I should accompany you, General. That won't be necessary. My men and I have it covered. I prefer not to get you involved. Plausible deniability? The General put his hand on Shelby's shoulder. It's hard to put food on the table when you're rotting away in a jail cell. Civilian authorities don't have a sense of humor about these things. Should I remain here as secondary support? You and your men are to take the rest of the day off. Spend time with your families. You've earned it. Sorry, General. I can't leave the facility unsecured. Starling would have my ass. When the rest of my team arrives, they'll establish a secure perimeter and lock down the complex. If Starling has an issue, remind him that he called me. This facility is now under my jurisdiction. As you wish, General, Shelby said, handing a security access card to Alvarez. Today's access code is Charlie Zulu 4985 My men will need a building schematic and access cards. I'll make sure your team has everything they need. Do you need me to walk through administering the substance or operating the control unit? Starling walked me through it over the phone on my way here. Then my job is done. Good luck, General, Shelby said, walking away. A minute later, the general was halfway through the medical bay when his radio squawked. He answered it. This is Alvarez. We're on site, general, said his unit commander, Thomas Church. Secure the perimeter and establish checkpoints at all access points. No one in or out. Shelby's on his way to your position. He'll provide a building layout and access cards. Shelby Murphy? Affirmative. I'll send the rest of his security detail your way once we're in position. Make sure they find their way off site. 10-4. Once your men are briefed and deployed, meet me in quarantine. It's on level one past the medical bay. Just follow the signs. Copy that, Church answered across the radio. Alvarez out. Chapter 17 Masago checked the left side mirror of her brother's F-250 truck to make sure no vehicles were next to her in the westbound lane of Speedway Boulevard. There weren't. She flipped the turn signal on and angled the lumbering gas guzzler to the left, expecting to turn at one of the next two traffic lights. You want me to take Campbell or Mountain? She asked Lucas. Actually, turn right on Park Avenue. But campus is a left, she said, fidgeting with the new bracelet on her wrist. The itch from the homemade trinket was getting worse. We're not going to campus. Why? Let's park off campus and walk. We can't be seen in this thing. But it's less conspicuous than the tumbler. Barely. I still don't want to take any chances. What about your leg? Can you walk that far? It's feeling better. Did you flex it while I was gone? Yep. I figured as much. You can thank me now, she said, scratching the skin under the bracelet. Lucas didn't answer. Instead, he stared straight ahead. She hit him on the shoulder with a firm jab. Come on, admit it. I was right. You needed to stop babying it. Lucas paused, then looked at her. Yes, you were right. I was wrong. There. I said it. Happy? I'll bet that was painful. You'll never know. You men are all alike. Heaven forbid the woman is right once in a while. Didn't you live with two men all your life, and you act surprised? No, I should know better. You're all just sweaty, sex-starved cavemen with a few table manners. And math skills. She laughed, thinking of her brother. For some, that's a stretch. Lucas grinned, giving her a sly look. I guess it all depends on the level of depletion in the family's gene pool. She couldn't stop her eyes from rolling. I'd settle for a man who's not too stubborn to admit he was wrong, or read the directions first before trying to put something together. Is that too much to ask? You're asking the wrong person. But for what it's worth, I never read the directions. I don't see the point. They're usually written in Japanese first, then translated to German, then to Swahili, and finally to some form of English. By then, they're impossible to follow. Why am I not surprised? Are you saying I'm predictable? No, just that you fit the mold perfectly. 
if you say so. But trust me, women are complicated too. All those hormones and emotions getting in the way. Masago knew he was right, but she didn't want to admit it. Once, a long time ago, back when my mom still lived in Tucson, I overheard her telling one of the neighbor girls that the secret to a long and happy marriage was for the woman to get used to saying two simple words. Which two? Yes, dear? Lucas laughed. Is that the same mom who ran off with the bailiff? I guess it wasn't so simple, now was it? You have a point there. We're all a little more complicated than we'd like to admit. We're all a little more nuts would be more accurate. The fact that any two people get along for more than five minutes on this planet is a miracle as far as I'm concerned. We're genetically predisposed to antagonize and compete with each other. Nothing is supposed to be easy. I never thought of it that way. You may be right, she said. Lucas pointed at her new bracelet. That's cool. She smiled. Rocket made it. He gave it to me before I left his compound. It looks like woven paracord. Yes, type 3, 550 pound test, but it itches. I can't seem to stop scratching. Why paracord? It's not meant to be worn. It's a prepper's bracelet, she said, holding her arm out for him to get a better look. See, it has a compass built into it. He spun the bracelet around on her wrist with the compass facing his direction. That's pretty slick. Inside is a bunch of survival gear. Aluminum foil, snare wire, needle and thread, fishing line and hook, waterproof matches, and char cord. You can even loosen the paracord wrap and use it for a rope or tie-downs. It's 15 feet long. You'd never know all that was inside it by looking at it. Impressive. Rocket is a genius. Takes after Dad, I guess. Apparently that family gene skipped me. We all have our skills. Mine seems to be making a total mess of things. Your brother didn't happen to make you an extra one, did he? No, just this one. I suppose you didn't mention anything about me. No, I didn't see the point. He'd just worry about me more than usual, she said, glancing at Lucas. He's my protector. Didn't he want to know why you needed his truck? He knows better than to ask. Sibling dynamics. I know it well, he said, with a detached, fading tone to his voice. She figured he was deep in thought, missing his family. She used a knee to control the steering wheel while unclipping the clasp on the bracelet. She tried to give it to Lucas, hoping the gesture might cheer him up. He threw up his hands. No, no, no. Rocket made it for you. I can't wear it. It's giving me a rash. Besides, I want you to have it. Lucas hesitated, then took it from her hand. Thanks. He adjusted the fit and put it on his wrist. It's more comfortable than I expected. He should start making these and sell them on eBay. There's an endless supply of preppers out there who think the fabric of society is on the verge of collapse. If it does, it could happen overnight, maybe even tomorrow. Now you're starting to sound like my father. He's right. Tragedy often strikes at the most inopportune time. You never really know for sure until it's too late. That's why they call them preppers. Lucas held his wrist chest high with the compass facing up. He moved his arm in several directions, checking the compass after each movement. They'd snap these up in a heartbeat. He'd sell a gazillion of them. Probably, but that would mean he'd have to own a computer and be on the grid. He'd never do that, not with the NSA watching everything we do and say. I understand, and frankly, I don't blame him. I wish I'd lived off the grid and never got involved in science. Then I wouldn't be in this situation, neither would the planet. But either way, thank you for the gift. I'm sure it'll come in handy. I'm glad you like it. Maybe it'll remind you of me, so you won't forget me. I'd never forget you. How could I? Lucas said, pointing his index finger straight ahead. See that street on the right? Take it. Then go two blocks north and hang another right. There's an apartment complex on the corner. Pull in and park around back. Okay, got it, she answered, letting his words about not forgetting her warm her heart. The feelings swirling around inside of her were growing by the minute, making it difficult to keep her emotions in check. The heart wants what it wants, and living alone all those years had compounded the effect. Two minutes later, Masago saw the apartment complex. It was on the corner, just as Lucas had described. However, both of the entrances to the parking lot were blocked with barricades, yellow safety tape, and construction dumpsters. There was a ten-foot-wide sign stuck into the ground on a pair of wooden posts with a large placard in between. It said, Renovations by BTX Enterprises. Completion date, December 2013. What the hell? Lucas said. Looks like both entrances are closed, she said, slowing the truck to park along the front sidewalk. Lucas shook his head. This isn't right. Not what you expected? Not even close. What is this place? My apartment. This is where Drew and I lived. So did Dr. Cleesby and our lab assistant Trevor. Not anymore. At least not for another year by the looks of it. 
Who is BTX Enterprises? It's the professor's real estate development company. They're working on stuff all over the state. At least they used to be. He must be loaded. He does all right, though you'd never know it by the way he dresses. You should see the piece of crap he calls a car. He sounds cheap. Not cheap, exactly. Just selective in how and where he spends his money. He does everything with a specific purpose in mind. And complicated. Yeah, that's one word you could use. A total pain in my ass would be another. I'm sure it'll be nice once he gets it all done. Maybe, but this isn't how it's supposed to be. There were never any renovations. This place was a total dump. We should have been able to pull in back and park by the professor's old Volvo. It's always parked there. Lucas sat in the back seat, resting his skull on the headrest. I wonder what else has changed. There's no reason to worry about the stuff we can't control. You don't get it. The timeline keeps changing. I get that, but it's just an apartment complex, so you live somewhere else. What's the big deal? It is a big deal. My presence here has affected fundamental details. There had to be some changes, right? So this isn't totally unexpected. No, but not to this extent. I'm starting to wonder if the timeline is fracturing more and more as we move forward through this time thread. I may be a threat to my own past. Everyone's past. She put her hand on his thigh and squeezed gently. Don't worry. We'll get through it, together. Damn it. I never should have listened to them. I knew this was a bad idea. Mom, Drew, Trevor, Carrie. It'll be okay. We just need to figure out the next step. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Lucas pounded the dashboard with his fist in rapid succession. She yanked her hand back from his leg. Lucas, stop. Please stop. You're scaring me. He punched the dash four more times, then stopped his assault with a fist throw in mid-motion. He lowered his arm, unclenched his fist, and grabbed the top of the dash above the glove compartment with both hands. His cheeks burned a deep red color, and his chest was heaving as he leaned forward to lay his head against the now-dented thermoplastic. This isn't how it's supposed to be, he said over and over, each time with less volume than the last. Then he stopped talking altogether. He took a series of deep, slow breaths that spanned a full minute before he sat back in the seat. The redness in his cheeks had faded into a soft pink glow. Are you done now? she asked, driving her point home with a strong, placating tone. The entire scene reminded her of Rocket and his sudden tirades when things didn't go his way. Lucas spoke after releasing another deep inhale. I'm sorry, but I just had to let that out. A guy can only take so much. Still, that's no reason to wreck my brother's truck. I'm sure it'll pop out, he said, rubbing the newly formed dent in the dash. If not, tell your brother I'll pay for it. What about your hand? It's fine. I'm not worried about that. Trust me, we have bigger problems. I do trust you, but you can't just flip out when things go wrong. I need you to chill and explain this to me, okay? He nodded, running his hands through his red hair. He looked at her with soft, watery eyes. I didn't mean to scare you. Sometimes my temper gets the better of me. It's something I've had to battle all my life. My inner demon. We all have those. Yeah, but still. There's no excuse. It's already forgotten. Just don't do it again, or else I'm leaving. Fair enough, he said. I promise, it won't happen again. Now, explain it to me. Calmly, please. You were correct earlier when you said some changes were to be expected. They were, but little things. Not important facts like Drew and me living in this complex. Several critical events took place here over the years that simply couldn't have happened anywhere else, not without altering history in a major way. Since those events never happened, it means critical changes in the timeline have occurred. Fractures could be forming in the timeline ahead, and each could have a compounding effect on the next. I was planning on using my knowledge of what occurred the first time around so I knew exactly where and when to be. Now, I don't know anything. Meaning? Meaning, we may not have time to implement my plan to fix things. That's assuming my plan is still valid. Something incredible was supposed to happen tonight. Is that bad or good? All depends on how you look at it. I'm pretty sure it has to happen in order for me to be standing here with you right now. So that tells me it does happen. The question is when. Now that things keep changing, the universe could have the event scheduled for 10 minutes from now, sometime tomorrow or next week. What about never? Never would be good, but I can't see it working out that way. It rarely does. Not for me, anyway. It's like some demented asshole wearing a hoodie is sitting at a desk in a secluded mountain cabin in northern Arizona, scripting out my life on a notepad, making sure nothing goes according to plan. We all feel like that from time to time. It's called fate. 
Yeah, maybe. But for me, it's a constant battle. Ever since I was born, I feel like a helpless puppet in some sick, twisted play. Someone out there gets off on torturing me every chance he gets. He? He, she, it. Not that it matters. It's just an analogy. But still, I can't shake the feeling he's looking at me right now, just thinking of ways to fuck with my life. You know that sounds completely demented. I'm just trying to be honest and get in touch with my inner feelings. That's what girls want, right? Yes, honesty is good. While we're on the subject, tell me, are we in danger? See, that's the point. I used to be able to answer that question with baseline certainty. Now I'm in the dark about what's coming, just like everyone else. Are you saying what I think you're saying? Yeah. If half of what happened the first time around occurs again and does so out of order, then we're totally screwed. So is this planet. Chapter 18 General Alvarez let his second-in-command, First Sergeant Thomas Church, finish latching the restraints around the first captive and apply a tourniquet to his arm before stepping forward to the medical table with the first injection in his hand. The other five prisoners were on their knees, hands behind their heads, fingers interlaced, being held at gunpoint by the rest of his loyal squad. A stack of six civilian Bushmaster AR-15 rifles were leaning against the wall in the back of the quarantine lab. Their 30-round clips had been removed from the weapons magazine wells and were sitting in an organized pile on the floor next to them. None of the detainees were wounded, though four of them had a series of fresh bruises and cuts on their face. Alvarez held the Protocol 5 syringe in front of the man's eyes, waving it from side to side, making sure the insurgent had a clear view of the neon blue substance inside. The humane side of the general wanted the man to talk, while the other side of him, the sadist, hoped for the opposite. He couldn't wait to see the new interrogation compound in action. The bound man stuck his chin out, shaking his head with conviction. I'm not telling you shit. That remains to be seen. The hostage didn't respond. I'm sure you're thinking this is some form of truth agent such as sodium pentothal, sodium amytal, or possibly scopolamine. Under normal circumstances, you'd probably be correct, Alvarez said, tugging at the scarred man's skin-tight bodysuit. He admired the stretchy fabric's tightly woven pattern of intricate gold lines. He continued, While I don't recognize your uniform, I have seen it before, recently, as it turns out. However, that encounter didn't end well for most of your compatriots, and let me assure you, it won't end well for you either not unless you start telling me what I want to know. Now I'm betting you and the rest of your assault team have had formal training to resist various interrogation techniques. However, I'd advise you to look around and factor in where you are at the moment. This may look like a typical biotech installation, but trust me when I say it's not. Far from it. This is an off-book, black-ops substance farm where exotic compounds are conceived by some of the most creative and ruthless scientists on the planet all working toward the same end game, the end of terrorism. Of course, when you're working with experimental pharmaceuticals, some will work as planned, while others will have disastrous, potentially lethal consequences. And just to be clear, I'm talking about the type of side effects you'll never hear mentioned as a qualifier in a TV commercial, and certainly never disclosed in any medical journal. Some leaders might classify them as heinous, evil drugs, something that should never be used under any circumstance. I am, thankfully, not one of those men. The general paused, looking for a sign the captive might volunteer information, but the man only blinked. Alvarez continued his one-sided conversation as he tapped his prisoner's right arm to raise the basilic vein, then inserted the hypodermic needle. The man's upper body squirmed in a failed attempt to resist, but the intruder remained silent. Alvarez took a deep, silent breath and released the air slowly, allowing his adrenaline to cool. He pressed the plunger with even pressure, watching the blue liquid leave the barrel of the syringe and disappear into the subject's arm. You, my friend, have the honor and distinction of being the first live test subject of the human variety. After 30 years of expensive research, we're finally ready for deployment. The warm sensation you're feeling coursing through your veins is a new multi-vectoring viral agent we call Protocol 5. 
The first four incarnations of this amazing invention failed to produce the anticipated level of command and control, but then batch number five was created, and from what I've been told, it's magnificent. Alvarez removed the syringe, unsnapped the tourniquet, and gave them both to church, who tossed them into a waste bin sitting on the floor next to a work table covered with instruments and equipment. Now, before we get started, I'd like to offer you one last chance to cooperate, because in less than two minutes, you'll wish you had. He leaned in close to the man's ear and whispered, I'm about to target the most sensitive nerve clusters in your body and set them on fire from the inside out. It'll ignite every one of your pain receptors to a level beyond imagination. All the while, your adrenal gland will be stimulated to work overtime, keeping you awake and alert through the entire process. So it's your call, asshole. What's it going to be? The man closed his eyes and sucked in a deep, uneven gulp of air, but didn't respond. The control unit, Alvarez said to Church, who promptly handed him the ten-inch-long device. It looked like a thick, oversized TV remote control with a raised rectangular area at the end of it. Alvarez checked for a power button on the sides and on the back of the apparatus, but didn't see one. The screen, sir. It's probably touch-sensitive, Church told him. Alvarez ran his index finger across the four-inch-wide plasma display, swiping it from left to right. The screen lit up with power, then proceeded to run through a quick self-check diagnostic routine before displaying the word, Ready. You can't feel them yet, but inside your cardiovascular system are millions of tiny bio-machines swirling around, looking for a target to attack. They are wrapped inside a viral delivery system that I control with this mechanism. Alvarez pressed a few icons on the device, switching screens and settings until the display indicated it was set to one-quarter power. If I hold it to your arm like this, Alvarez said, aiming the device at the man's left elbow, and press start which he did, holding the button with his finger. Then the fun begins. A pulsating white light emitted from the underside of the gadget, illuminating the skin on the prisoner's elbow. The insurgent's eyes lit up and he screamed at the top of his lungs, writhing in pain on the table. Alvarez expected the reaction to be intense, but even he was surprised at the explosive nature of the pain now invading the hostage's body. Four seconds later, he released the button. Almost instantly, the prisoner's body stopped convulsing, and his deafening screams fell silent. That, my friend, was a precursor of what's to come. The pain you felt was from a swarm of microscopic devices joining together at your elbow joint to consume your cells like an angry pack of piranhas. The prisoner mumbled something, but the words were too weak for Alvarez to hear. What was that? You want more? No. That's not what I said, the prisoner said, this time in a full voice. He opened his watery eyes and looked at Alvarez with fury-charged pupils. Then please, by all means, enlighten me. I said, it's a school of piranhas, not a pack, you dumb son of a bitch. The general's face tightened as he glanced around the room, making eye contact with several members of his team. His temper fumed. Do you hear that, men? We have ourselves a college boy who thinks he's smarter than all of us. Maybe it's time we teach him a lesson on manners and what it means to be at the mercy of another. I wonder what would happen if I increased the power level from 25% to 50%. He slid the digital power level control indicator to the halfway point, then pressed the start button. The pulsating light of the control unit doubled its intensity and speed. Again, the prisoner let out a blood-curdling scream, though this time his body shuddered with much more intensity than before. Alvarez wondered if the metal table and the leather restraints would hold as the man's upper back, legs, and arms pounded at the surface underneath. Alvarez took a half-step back, but managed to keep the light focused on the target area. The skin under the glow rose up like a silver dollar-sized blister and started to bubble when its color changed to a deep red. It looked like a swollen hickey ready to pop. Stop this, someone yelled from behind him. Alvarez turned. It was the bald prisoner standing ten feet away. You're killing him. The general looked at the hairless man. I'll stop when you tell me what I want to know. Who do you work for? We don't work for anyone. 
Wrong answer, Alvarez said, touching the controls again. This time, he slid the power level indicator to the right, increasing the setting to 75%. He held the engage button down with his finger and waited to see the results. As before, the pulsating light quickened its pace and became brighter. Almost instantly, the skin near the center point of the blistered area split open and out crawled countless flea-sized silver-colored orbs spreading across the man's arm like an army of ants. The amazing eating machines consumed the man's flesh, blood, and bone, cauterizing the ever-shortening stump with flashes of energy as they went. The general expected to see them grow in size after ingestion, or possibly discharge some type of organic waste product, but they didn't. He realized the man's tissue was being converted into pure energy to fuel their cannibalization efforts and to generate the electrical charge needed to seal the flesh. Within seconds, the entire arm was gone, devoured by the swift-moving horde of microscopic invaders. Alvarez released the button, telling the machines to discontinue their assault on the prisoner's body. The victim's screams stopped a moment later, then his head slumped down, pressing against his chest. His lungs sucked in one harsh breath after another as blood dripped from the corners of his mouth. He must have bitten his tongue. Holy shit, Church said from his position on the right. Alvarez smiled. Starling's men outdid themselves this time. That's an understatement, sir. What power level did you use? That was 75%, Alvarez said, holding the unit up for closer inspection. I think it's time to test full power. You might want to rethink that idea, an unfamiliar voice said. Alvarez swung his head around. It was Dr. Starling. He was standing in the doorway, wearing a white lab coat, a faded, sweat-soaked New York Yankees baseball cap, and his legendary beard and handlebar mustache. He was holding a file folder in one hand and a black magic marker in the other, moving toward Alvarez with a severe limp in his right leg. So, I see you decided to finally join us, Alvarez quipped. Can't hide in your office forever. Starling walked to the table that was restraining the hostage. Using full power would most likely overload the MB's communication array, causing a reset to default mode. MB's? Church asked. It's short for microscopic biomachines. It's what we labeled them on the medical patent. Doesn't look very medical to me, Church said. That's the cover story, to target and eradicate cancer cells in the patient's body. What's their default mode, Alvarez asked. Self-preservation? Instead of focusing their efforts on the highlighted area, they'll band together to form a climbing chain and attack the source of the light to stop it from causing further damage to their internal systems. They'd consume the control unit, Alvarez added, nodding his head. Metal? Not just flesh and bone? Church asked. They're designed to ingest their target, whatever that may be, and convert its molecules to pure energy. What happens if we don't have a control unit? Alvarez said. We'd have a runaway situation. What about us? Church asked. We'd be converted to fuel, along with everything else. Seriously? I'm sure you've built more than one control unit as backup, Alvarez said, with certainty in his voice. Eventually we will, but the first priority was proof of concept. We needed to perfect this version of the product before allocating funds for deployment. So that means no, Church said. Starling didn't answer. Church rolled his eyes. There has to be another way to stop these things. If they ever got loose, what about an EMP? The MBs would detect the incoming electrical wave and transform themselves into a Faraday cage to absorb and channel the energy around their internal systems. We built self-preservation safeguards into their base programming, allowing them to survive, among other things, a nuclear detonation in the atmosphere. Like cockroaches, we calculated an 88% chance our enemy would try to use an EMP as the first line of defense against this new weapon— or wait until they ran out of fuel and deactivated themselves, Alvarez said. That won't happen, not until the entire planet has been processed. Church shook his head. Who thinks of something like this? We were asked to design a new type of interrogation protocol, something untraceable that could be controlled and deployed with utmost efficiency and guarantee success. I'm sure you'd agree we achieved the goals of this project. Untraceable? Starling nodded. The control unit has the ability to send a terminate signal, 
Once received, the MBs would instantly deactivate themselves, rendering them inert. The subject would then pass them through the urinary tract, leaving no residual trace behind. Church stared at Alvarez. He looked dumbfounded. Then 75% is the max, Alvarez said, holding the device over the prisoner's left thigh. I wonder if there are any cancer cells in his leg. Stop! Stop! I'll tell you what you want to know, the bald insurgent said from his kneeling position behind the general. Chapter 19 Lucas studied the dirt, grime, and bug remains dotting the windshield of Rocket's pickup, wondering how often Masago's brother washed the mammoth truck. Then again, perhaps it wasn't about failing to take care of a possession, but rather a result of living in the desert, where dirt and dust are a constant problem. It wouldn't make much sense to try to keep a vehicle clean, because the minute you took off after a wash, the truck would be dirty again. He rolled his head to the right, looking at Cleesby's taped-off apartment building and the safety barricades protecting the property. He scratched the skin on his neck just underneath the collar of the smart skin suit hidden under his clothes. You're stalling, Masago said in the driver's seat next to him. You need to make a decision. We can't just sit here all day. Lucas used his right hand to spin the paracord bracelet around on his left wrist like a number wheel at a carnival. I'm not sure it's worth the effort. It'll only take a few minutes. Look at the place. Nobody's here. How can you possibly know that without checking? Simple logic. We're here already. What's it going to hurt? A flash of memories danced in his mind. He pictured his earlier life with Drew in their humble, scorpion-riddled abode. His heart began to ache, wondering if going inside the apartment was going to make matters better or worse. My brother and I spent a lot of time in there over the years. I'm not sure I can handle it. Masago put a hand on his shoulder and rubbed it gently. I know it's painful, but we need to finish what we started. We came all this way, so let's go inside. Maybe it won't be as painful as you think. Maybe there are clues to where you live now. We have to check. Lucas made fists, pressing them down on his bent knees. Okay, but if we don't find anything in the first ten minutes, we leave. Whatever you need, baby, she said, pulling Lucas in for an unexpected kiss. He thought about pulling away, but he couldn't, not after her tender, quivering lips met his for the first time. She gave him a series of short, tender pecks on the lips before full contact was made, adding more heat and pressure. She moaned as her tongue penetrated his mouth. It found the tip of his, circling and dancing in a playful way. Then, in an instant, she backed off and looked into his eyes, as if she were about to ask him a question. What? he said. Was I doing it wrong? I'm here for you, every step of the way. You know that, right? He nodded. If terrible things are about to happen, like you say they are, then we might never get this chance again, she said. I've waited all my life, and I don't want to wait another minute. Okay. But here? Right now? In broad daylight? He said, looking around, trying to get a handle on the moment. What if someone sees us? She shrugged, grabbing his hands and tugging slightly. I don't care about anybody else. Only you. Something took control of his body, making him lean in close to the beautiful creature sitting beside him. Her eyes seemed to grip onto his as their minds became one, latching on to the same carnal thought. He wrapped his arms around her back, closing his eyes and kissing her with the passion of two lifetimes. The fingers on each of his hands spread out, allowing them to embrace the fullness of her soul. He could sense the strength of her sexual conviction invigorating his body. His breathing intensified, and so did hers, pushing him further and further into the heat of the moment. Her fingers played with the hair on the back of his head, then moved down across his shoulder blades, sending a charge across his body. The narrow line between logic and emotion was now a blur, allowing him to forget his troubles and his location. A flicker of logic crept into his mind, telling him to stop. There was work to be done, but his lust chased the fleeting thought into oblivion. He knew the twisted hands of fate were lurking around the next corner, and this moment, this right here and now, might be his last chance to feel the warmth and passion of a beautiful young woman. Her hands were trembling as they began to explore his body, squeezing and rubbing as they moved. She brought them around to the front of his pants and found his belt. She pushed the end of the belt back through the buckle and tugged it open, releasing its grip. 
He arched his back, allowing her to pull the leather from the belt loops and toss it to the floor of the truck. Her fingers moved to his zipper, making easy work of the vertical sentry device as she pulled it south to grant herself access. She put her hand inside his pants, reaching down to find his throbbing penis, which was trapped beneath the stretchy gold-laced time travel garment constricting his body. She broke their kiss, but pulled away only an inch, mumbling a soft command into his mouth. The suit needs to go. Right, he said, leaning back on the seat and racing out of his shirt, his shoes, his pants, and then the smart skin suit, tossing all of them into a ball on the floorboard of the truck. He looked at Masago, expecting to see her naked as well, but she hadn't removed a single item. What about you? he asked, feeling a penetrating draft from the cool winter air outside, working its way into the vehicle like a traveling fog. Her playful gaze, now fixated on his throbbing member, sent a shiver of embarrassment down his spine. He covered his penis with his hands. She smiled. I didn't want to miss a single moment. Now it's my turn. She grabbed the lower edge of her top with both hands, pulling it up and over her head with a steady, even pace. The strands of her hair made a crackling noise when they let go of the material brushing past them. Her bra was pink-colored with a fancy border of lace decorating the edges. Her breasts were ample and pushed together, forming a deep recess of cleavage that seemed to go on forever. Like what you see? she asked. He nodded quicker than he'd ever nodded before. His mouth ran dry, making it hard for him to swallow. She smiled, putting her fingers on the front clasp. She unhooked it and pulled the bra open to reveal the fullness of her chest. Her areolas were larger than he expected, and so were her erect nipples. He put his hands out, wanting to caress them, but she stopped his advance. I'm not finished yet. He yanked his hands back, pressing them into his lap. She continued the gradual strip tease, peeling off one article of clothing after another, tossing each onto the same pile growing on the floor. The clock seemed to tick slower after each item was removed. It became difficult to contain himself. His Christmas present was unwrapping itself, revealing more beauty than he could have ever imagined. Every neuron in his brain was on fire, screaming at him to take her right then and there. But he managed to restrain himself and wait as she removed the last piece of clothing. She tossed her panties aside and then sat back in the seat, resting her back against the driver's door, keeping her legs pressed together at the thigh. Her eyes never left Lucas's, seemingly content to watch her own naked reflection in his lustful pupils. Lucas surveyed the stunning creature laying before him, taking in the perfection of her femininity. He memorized the subtle contours of her muscular, toned physique. Each curve and slope of her body flowed magically into the next, revealing a captivating work of art. His heart was hammering at the walls of his chest, sending pulsating waves of thumps from his chest to his eardrums. She put her arms back, laying them against the glass of the driver's side window. She closed her eyes, took a deep breath, then opened her legs. He didn't hesitate, moving forward to position his trembling body over the top of hers. He lowered himself, aiming his fully erect penis just below the tiny, heart-shaped mound of pubic hair. The tip of his penis touched her delicate opening, making his mind run wild with expectation. She brought her hands down from the glass and wrapped them around the sides of his waist, pressing slightly against his back. Go slow, she said in a soft but welcoming voice. This is my first time. I will, he said, not thinking about the significance of her gift. His inner caveman was now in control, pushing decorum and logic aside. She let go of his skin, putting her arms down to her side. I love you, Lucas Ramsey. Chapter 20 Randall Larson checked his watch for the third time in the past ten minutes as he entered the science lab. He shortened his stride, shuffling his feet through to the other side of the revolving doors. He let go of the door handle, angling his body forward to avoid getting smacked in the ass. It worked. His eyes found the security station twenty feet ahead, where Bruno Benner was standing behind the counter watching his four-man team process a college-age couple through the full body scanner and metal detector. Around the lobby, there were a half a dozen non-security personnel milling about, but nobody was standing in line to check in at the security desk. 
Larson increased his pace, wanting to be first. They'd better let me through, he thought, desperate to meet with Dr. Griffith Davies and have the swatch of material from the insurgent's gold-laced uniform analyzed. The day was winding down, leaving little time to get the results back to his brother-in-law, General Alvarez, and then inspect Ramsey's anti-gravity experiment to determine if he could discover some sort of safety violation or other deficiency that would legally allow him to terminate the project. If not, he'd have to fabricate evidence to complete the task, as President Lathrop had blackmailed him to do. Bruno met him with a smile from behind the check-in desk. Welcome back, Counselor. Are they here? Bruno stroked his neatly trimmed goatee with his fingers. Yes, sir. Both Dr. Davies and Dr. Ramsey arrived for their shift 15 minutes ago. Are you going to let me through this time, or are we going to have issues again? You've been cleared for entry. That's refreshing news. Bruno held out his hand. Just need to check your briefcase. Isn't that what the scanning equipment is for? Dr. Cleesby wants all personal items hand-checked from here on out. Why? I'm not at liberty to say. Your briefcase, please. Larson gave him the case, trying to remember if he'd scrambled the numerical tumblers on the lock. He wasn't sure. Bruno put the satchel on the counter, then fiddled with the central clasp, but the case didn't open. I need to check inside. Larson shook his head. I'm not giving you my combination code. I don't share that with anyone, not even my lovely wife. Two additional security guards arrived seemingly out of nowhere and stood behind Bruno with their arms folded across their chest. Larson had visited the science lab a dozen times before, but didn't recognize either of them. They looked like Russian mountain men, easily six foot five inches tall and well over 200 pounds each, Olympic wrestler size. Their dark hair, Hulk-like physiques, and prominent facial features looked similar. Perhaps they were brothers. He could feel the intensity of their gaze weighing him down, compressing the layers of his skin and bone together. He cleared his throat, wondering if this was a planned maneuver, something put in place for his scheduled arrival. He wouldn't put it past Cleesby, not with their long history of heated exchanges in the president's office. You guys twins? he asked. The men didn't respond. Bruno swung the case around. I need you to open it. Larson hesitated, considering his options. There weren't any, not if he wanted to get past the imposing security detail and their bigger-than-life attitudes. He adjusted the tumblers until the numerical code was in the correct sequence, 9876. A second later, he opened the case, reset the tumblers to hide the code, then spun the case to face Bruno. Bruno put his hand inside, but Larson couldn't see what he was inspecting, not with the lid blocking his view. He studied the guards' faces, waiting for the overweight man to respond with questions about the contents, primarily the piece of fabric. He didn't. Instead, Bruno closed the attaché, spun it again, then slid it across the countertop to Larson. You're all set, he said with exactness, motioning to one of the towering guards. Escort him back. Make sure he doesn't get lost. Larson took the tote by the handle, fixed the tumblers, closed the case, and scrambled the locks again before dragging it off the desk. He made eye contact with the guard who had just walked around from behind the security station and stood next to him, only an inch away. Larson couldn't help but stare at the man's sprawling neck tattoo. The colorful artwork looked like a USA flag tearing a hole through his skin from underneath. The letters USMC were stenciled down the middle of the stars and stripes, horizontally, with the phrase Band of Brothers written above it. He checked the man's uniform, but didn't see a name tag anywhere. Must be a new member of the team, he decided. Semper Fi, Larson said, hoping to break the ice with the former Marine. The man only grunted through the corner of his thin-lipped mouth. Larson pulled his shirt sleeve up to reveal his faded Marine Corps insignia. Force Recon, Camp Pendleton, hua. Force Recon is for pussies, the man replied. Larson didn't expect that response, not from a fellow Marine. He swallowed hard, feeling heat rise within his chest. He turned to face the giant. Bruno reached across the security desk, putting his arm in between Larson and the guard. I think it's best if I escort you back, Counselor. Larson nodded, never taking his eyes off the man. That's been the procedure before. No reason to change it up now, he told Bruno. Bruno grabbed Larson's arm, tugging him toward the security equipment a few yards away. Larson emptied his pockets into a plastic bowl, all the while keeping watch on the men around him with his peripheral vision. 
He stepped onto the scanning platform of the full body scanner and put his arms over his head. His chest was pumping air at a high rate, making it a challenge to hold his position while the scanning arm swung around inside the device, using a steady left-to-right motion. The machine beeped a few seconds later, then reset itself to the home position inside the glass-encased scanner bay. You're clean. Step through, Bruno said. Larson put his arms down and moved off the platform. He stood next to Bruno, looking back at the Marine who'd raised his ire. The brute's facial expression and piercing stare hadn't changed either. What's the story with that guy? Larson asked Bruno. I apologize. He's usually not this cranky. Cranky? That's what you call it? He's going through a rough patch at home. His wife really did a number on him. Hey, we all have issues, but that's still no excuse. Does he know who I am? Bruno nodded. I'll have a talk with him. I should hope so. Otherwise, things will get much worse at home when he finds himself without a fucking job, he said, finger combing a few strands of blonde hair over his ear. Imagine what would happen if he acted like that toward President Lathrop. Heads would roll, yours included. Trust me, it won't happen again. You have my word. Fair enough, Larson said, trying to decide if he should ask the new guard's name. He'd need it to file a formal complaint. Then he remembered something that had been tucked behind his full-charging ego. He was leaving town for good once he completed his to-do list and collected his bonus payoff from the buyer. There was no point in filing a disciplinary report when he wasn't going to be around to enjoy its enforcement. He decided to focus his thoughts on Dr. Davies. Did you tell Griffith I was planning to stop by? Bruno stopped walking and turned. Was I supposed to? No, just curious, Larson said, never breaking stride. Hopefully he'll have time to meet with me on such short notice. Bruno resumed his march down the hall, catching up to Larson with a quick shuffle step. If not, I'm sure we can arrange another day and time for you to meet, though he is a very busy man. Larson took that comment as a bit of a slight. I'm sure he'll make time for me. He and I go way back. In fact, Dr. Davies owes his entire marriage to me. I introduced them. Bruno didn't say anything. Ten minutes later, they arrived at Dr. Griffith's lab. Bruno stepped forward and slid his security card through the door's access scanner and started punching numbers into the keypad. The first two numbers were a seven and a four, but Larson couldn't see the rest after Bruno slid his considerable backside in the way. What? Don't you trust me? Bruno didn't answer. He continued entering numbers, making the sentry unit beep each time his finger made contact. A few seconds later, a chime sounded. Then Bruno pushed the door open and held it ajar. He looked at Larson with tightly focused eyes, but his lips never moved. I was just kidding, Larson said. Lighten up. I'll return in 15 minutes, counselor, then escort you to next door. Is that sufficient time? That'll do, Larson said, walking past Bruno and stepping inside the lab. He heard the lab door click shut behind him. He looked around for Dr. Davies, but didn't see him. Chapter 21 Davies, are you and your saggy ass in here? Griffith heard someone yell from across the lab. He flinched, sending the top of his head into the underside of the work table hovering an inch above his toupee. His skull made a ringing clang sound when it smashed into the metal. A millisecond later, the pain seemed to take on a life of its own, entering his body through the tiny hairs on the back of his neck and traveling down along his aging spine, where it took root in the small of his back and exploded from there. Two glass beakers fell from the table and hit the floor next to him, sending a spree of shards across the concrete and a few his way. His legs were already tingling from a lack of blood flow while seated in the crouched position, but when his vision filled with stars and the dizziness started, he couldn't help but think he should have scooted the table out of the way to retrieve the marker pen he'd dropped earlier. Only a moron crawls around on the floor like a two-year-old. He took a few moments to gather himself before answering his unexpected guest. Hang on a sec. I've got to unfold myself from under this station. He flicked two pieces of glass away to the corner, clearing a path to safety. He stood, rubbing the back of his head, checking for blood. There wasn't any, but a nasty lump was forming and starting to throb. He hated the idea of being injured and unable to perform tonight during his scheduled date with Stacy. His wife had been planning the bedroom festivities all week, and he couldn't bear the thought of disappointing her. He made a mental note to find aspirin and a bucket of ice as soon as he was done with whoever just interrupted his work. 
He was about to take a condescending tone with the visitor, but decided against it when he saw the university's lead counsel standing just inside the lab door. Randall, Griffith said, using his most pleasant voice. Jerking off again, Davies. What? No, never. I was fine-tuning some equipment I knocked out of alignment. Like I said, jerking off. I've never heard anyone call it fine-tuning his equipment before, but whatever. Next time, lock the door, or do it in your car. None of us wants to be a witness to that. I'm sure there's a rule or two somewhere in the bylaws of this fine institution about being a perv on the state's nickel. Griffith felt his face flush with embarrassment. He didn't know what to say. Relax, I'm just fucking with you, Larson said with a half-smile on his lips. Damn, Griff, you really need to take some time off once in a while. Spend it with that beautiful wife of yours. You're wired so tight that if a fly landed on you right now, it'd start a chain reaction and you'd shit blood. I don't know what that means. It means, don't take everything so damn serious all the time. Why are you here, Randall? I have a job for you. Do you have a work order? I need authorization. It's for the university. Griffith fiddled through the items on top of the table and sorted them back into place. Everything I do is for the university, but I still need authorization. There are procedures in place. President Lathrop sent me down here with this, Larson lied, taking a swatch of fabric from his case. He crossed the room, weaving between the setups around the lab. He put the material on the table. Griffith's eyes widened when the fluorescent lights glistened off the gold circuitry covering the fabric. He backed away, bumping into the same table he'd smashed his head against, sending more equipment falling to the floor. This time, though, it didn't sound like anything shattered. For a moment, he thought it was the same sample Professor Cleesby had sent down for him to test earlier. He pictured the envelope he'd given to Bruno and couldn't remember if he'd sealed it properly. Had the swatch fallen out accidentally? Somewhere in the hallway or on campus? Was he responsible? Cleesby would be pissed and have his job. His career could be over. Stacy would leave him. He'd die alone, broke and miserable. Panic was about to take control of his mind and body when a calmer version of himself rose up after realizing that the shape of Larson's material was slightly different than Cleesby's sample. This one had a denser circuitry pattern near its perimeter, and one of its corners was cut at an angle instead of being squared off at 90 degrees. Larson shook his head. What the hell is wrong with you, other than the usual geek stuff? Get it together, man, it's just a piece of cloth. Griffith nodded, wiping a bead of sweat from his forehead. Where did you get this? That's really not your concern, now is it? Larson put one finger on the center of the swatch, pushing it closer to Griffith. Let me make this simple for you. I need to know what it is, what it's made of, where it came from, and what it's for. That's it, Griffith said with his most sarcastic tone. And I need it yesterday. I mean, President Lathrop needs it yesterday. This needs to be kept absolutely quiet and is on a strictly need-to-know basis. That includes your wife and those two eggheads across the hall. You read me? Griffith nodded. When can you have the results? I don't think I can. Larson squinted and tilted his head. Have you forgotten you owe me big time? No, I remember, but this is my job, my career we're talking about. There are rules. Well, you're going to have to find a way to make it happen. Rearrange your schedule, prioritize your action items, think positive, say ten Hail Marys or whatever, but you need to do what I'm asking, what the president is asking. We're in a hurry, and this is more important than anything else on your to-do list. Trust me. Griffith stared at Larson for a moment, trying to decide if he should break protocol and run the analysis without authorization. Then, he remembered the promise he'd made to Dr. Cleesby. He owed Larson, but he'd already given his word to the dean of the department. You of all people know how hard it is for me to refuse, Griffith said, hating himself for never having the backbone to say no to anyone. Then don't. Just do what I ask, and we're square. I'll never ask you for anything ever again. Griffith's skin tingled along his ribs, sending a rush of resolve into his soul. He clenched his fists and took deep breaths. I want to help, Randall. I really do. But I can't. I'm sorry. Not without full authorization from Dr. Cleesby. I can't risk my job. Griffith saw Larson's eye start to twitch and the artery in his neck expand. He knew the look and knew what was coming. You owe me, Griff, and I'm here to collect... 
All you need to do is turn on your little machines and work your nerd magic. Nobody will ever know. Griffith shook his head. Larson rammed his fist into the table, sending several of the instruments into the air with its recoil. Just run the tests, damn it! I'm sorry. I can't help you, Davies said, wondering where the words of defiance were coming from. You smarmy little shit! I need you to leave before I call security, Griffith said, fighting the urge to run. He needed to stand his ground and not cave, just this once. Hmm... I wonder what President Lathrop or Cleesby would say when I tell them how you met your wife. You wouldn't. Oh, yes, I would. I'm sure they'd love to hear how smoking hot Stacy looked when you first saw her working that pole on stage, how she took you into the VIP room and unzipped your pants to take your mind off your problems. I'll bet she swallowed, too. Griffith felt his throat tighten. I was going through a rough divorce back then. I was drunk, and you forced me into going. That's not how I remember it. Imagine what the rest of the faculty will say when they learned you married a slutty, sex-crazed stripper who sold herself for money. She wasn't a prostitute. She was an aerial dancer. That's how you want to spin this? So, tell me, what did that blowjob cost you in the VIP room? A hundred? Two hundred? That's sex for money, Doc. Illegal and grounds for immediate dismissal. Why are you doing this? Because I can. Because you owe me. Because you never would have met your wife if it weren't for me, Larson said, walking the room like he was preparing to do battle. You don't know this, but I used to take Stacy into the back room at the club at least once a week. Yeah, that's right. Me and her, in the dark, alone. And let me tell you, she took really good care of me. And I'm not just talking about a little knob polishing. Every regular knew her deal. All you needed to do was pump a few shots of Patron into her, and damn, she really cut loose and broke all the house rules. Imagine how many other men over the years took her in the back and changed her oil, probably while you two were dating. All strippers lie and slut around, Griff. It's their nature. Stacy was no exception. That's my wife you're talking about, Griffith yelled. His lips wouldn't stop quivering. Shit. Before she sat on your lap that night and started rubbing your cock to work another 20 out of your wallet, I'll bet she was in the back room humping half of Tucson. Stop it! I'll stop when you agree to run the analysis. Griffith sucked in his lower lip, throwing the swatch of material at Larson. No, I'm not helping you. Get out of my lab and take whatever that is with you. I don't care what you say or who you say it to. My wife and I love each other. It's genuine. It's forever. And nothing you or anyone else can say will ever change that. Don't test me, Davies. Tests are over. Get out, now, Griffith said, walking away. He pulled out his cell phone and held it up with his finger on the number one button. How about I call Dr. Cleesby right now and report you? I don't believe for a second that President Lathrop authorized any of this. You're the pervert, not me. You're the one who gets drunk every day. Everyone knows where you go at lunchtime. Maybe I should call your wife? I'll bet she'd love to hear all about our trip that night to the club and what you were doing with that chubby dancer. What was her name? Chastity? Fuck you, Davies. You're going to regret this, Larson said before he stormed out the door. Griffith's knees gave out, and he dropped to the floor, shaking and hyperventilating. He felt vomit threatening to erupt, but he managed to keep it down. He took a series of deep breaths, then dialed Stacy. Hello? she said. Griffith burst into tears. Stacy? Honey? Are you hurt? What's wrong? Talk to me. I love you. Griffith managed to speak through the snot running out of his nose. Larson was just here. What happened? Tell me. He said you had sex with him in the VIP room every week and whored around with half of Tucson. He's a liar. Don't listen to him. None of that is true, Stacy shouted into the phone. I never did any extras in the VIP room like the other girls, and definitely never with a disgusting creep like him. He's total scum, sweetie. Don't believe him. I swear, I'm telling you the truth. Griffith took a deep breath, letting the tears slow. I believe you, honey. I love you so much it hurts. I'm sorry I ever doubted you. I'm sorry he hurt you. I love you and always will. Don't ever forget that. Me too. Damn him, Stacy said in a wicked tone. He won't get away with this. I promise. Griffith struggled to his feet, using the desk as a brace. What does that mean? Don't worry about it. Just come home now and let me take care of you, okay? It's date night. Okay, 
I'm on my way. Chapter 22 Lucas stood in the center of his campus lab, next to the three transport containers of E-121 sitting on Griffith's dolly, trying to decide if he should do as he was told and wait until Cleesby arrived to open them, or ignore the orders and inspect the contents now. He didn't want to disappoint his boss, but his curiosity was nagging at him to peek inside to get a head start. He bent forward at the waist and made a series of slow, rotating circles to stretch and flex his back muscles. The unexpected apartment move earlier in the week hadn't helped his spine. Cleesby didn't give them much notice, citing the sudden need to gut and renovate his aging apartment complex just north of campus. Lucas decided not to complain to his boss after he learned the new place they were moving to was much larger and 50 years newer, and still free of charge. Plus, there were no scorpions at the new pad, and the HVAC unit was brand new, a welcome bonus when the blazing summer rolled around. Maybe I should unpack these crates to make some room? He asked Drew. No, you can't. The professor told us to wait. How long? An hour, maybe? He said it couldn't be helped. He needed to handle something urgent that just popped up. But they take up so much damn space. It's getting difficult to move around in here, he said, resting his hands on the top crate. Try it from a wheelchair, then complain. Right, sorry, sometimes I forget. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not, Drew said, pushing his wheelchair back casually with his feet. You know I don't see you that way. I appreciate that. You're about the only one, other than maybe the professor. Everyone's always staring at me like I'm helpless. Oh, the poor little crippled boy. Sometimes I just want to scream. I hear you, bro, Lucas said, pawing at the topmost box. Looks like all we need to do is cut the security tape and pop these latches. It'll only take a minute. What do you think? Want to see what's inside? We already know what's inside. The E-121 modules. Yeah, but don't you want to see what they look like? I do. It's killing me not to know. Why don't you move them to the corner so they're out of the way? The professor will be here eventually, so let's just do what he said and not make waves. You sure know how to be a buzzkill. No, what I know how to do is what I'm told, thank you very much. The combination of the sharp ache in Lucas's back, the medical bills piling up from Mom's stint in ICU, and the fear of blowback from the paper he'd sent to Dr. Green had left him more on edge than usual. Where's Trevor? He snapped at Drew. He's usually here by now. Drew didn't answer. His head was buried in the operations manual for their experiment. Ten seconds later, he looked up. I'm sorry, what did you say? Where's Trevor? Probably in the cafeteria, eating. There's a shock. He's a big man. It takes a lot to fuel that engine. I take it Cleesby changed the schedule and assigned him the late shift tonight? I think so, but he told me yesterday he might come in early today. Something about fixing the bug in his coat? Hey, I have an idea. Let me guess. You want to have Trevor move the containers for you? Lucas smiled. Great minds think alike. It would save your back. Exactly, Lucas said, letting the smile grow. What's the point of having a disgraced Olympic athlete on the team if you can't order the brute to move your E-121 samples, and possibly your sofa, maybe even clean the toilets? Drew recoiled visibly. I can't believe you just said that. What? That was mean and spiteful, even for you. What's wrong with you lately? Lucas rubbed his temples. Sometimes his mouth spoke without thinking. Just tired, I guess. I get a little cranky when I'm stressed. Haven't been sleeping well the past few nights. Crankopotamus would be a better term. That's easy for you to say. You sleep like a rock. That's because I have no regrets. What does mom preach to us? Treat others as you'd like to be treated. Yeah, heard that one a million times. Well, it's true. Enough with the Bible shit already. Drew rolled closer in his chair. Trevor's all tough on the outside, but I think he's really sensitive about what happened to him in the Olympics. It wasn't his fault the samples got switched. I know, I'm sorry. I would never say that in front of him. He's a good friend, and we need him on our team. How would you like it if your lifelong dream got taken away by one simple mistake? An image of Dr. Green reading his thesis and blasting him publicly across the internet flashed in his mind. It was a joke. I was kidding, Lucas said, wanting to change the subject. He pointed at the operations manual. What's so fascinating? I think we need to check the calculations again. Lucas rolled his eyes. You've been over them a thousand times. They're perfect. Nothing's changed. Yes, it has. The power yields are lower. Someone tweaked my calculations. The security scanner buzzed. Lucas turned around. What now? Maybe it's the professor. About time. 
The door swung open. It was Bruno and another man, who was dressed in full business attire. The visitor's trim-fitting suit barely drew attention away from the acne scars covering his face. The surface of an asteroid had less damage than this man's complexion. His tie was a touch off-center, and it looked like he was hopped up on caffeine based on the way he was fidgeting and moving through the door. Lucas waited for Bruno to introduce him, but the security guard closed the lab door and disappeared without saying a word. Lucas cleared his throat. Can I help you? The man squared his shoulders and stared at Drew for a few moments before turning his attention to Lucas. Dr. Lucas Ramsey, I presume. And you are? Randall Harrison Larson III. Well, good for you. Lead counsel for the advisory committee. Didn't Dr. Cleesby mention I was going to stop by? Nope. But then again, we're usually the last two people he informs about anything. He should have told you I needed to perform an inspection. Of what? Larson's face changed from a pasty white color to a pinkish red color. Liability. We must mitigate potential exposure for the university. Our experiment? Yes, Larson said, putting his briefcase on the floor to feel around his pockets. Damn it. I forgot my pen. Then he threw his hands up in the air. Shit. And my clipboard. Are we having a bad day? Drew asked in a tone that made him sound like a smartass. Lucas felt awful, realizing his temperament was rubbing off on his normally sweet foster brother. He sneered at Drew, hoping to stop him from saying anything else that might add more fuel to the attorney's fire. I'm sorry, what was that? Larson asked Drew. I was just wondering if you're having a bad day. Larson's face burned a deeper shade of red. That's really none of your concern, son. I'm not your son. Lucas moved a step closer to Larson, sensing the tension mounting in the room. I assume you have clearance for a detailed inspection? Access to this project is restricted to authorized personnel only, as prescribed under Article 2, Section 12 of the University's Research Guidelines and Confidentiality Act of 2010. And who do you think wrote those guidelines? I take it you did? Larson grinned. Then you must also know we have the right to ask for proof of authorization before we show you anything. I'm here under direct orders from President Lathrop. That isn't proof, Drew said. No, it's not, Lucas added. I'm not showing you dick without the proper paperwork. The strength and tone of Larson's voice changed to a higher level. You think you're pretty smart, don't you, Dr. Ramsey? Lucas blinked, clenching his fists. Smart enough. Otherwise, the university wouldn't have hired me to run this project. What's your point? The lawyer walked the perimeter of the room, circling around to the chamber's control station. He looked through the observation window, then turned to Lucas. Yes, the university hired you, just like they did me. Which means, ultimately, we both work for President Lathrop. Can't argue with that. You have a job to do, and so do I. That's why President Lathrop sent me here, to do my job. And what do you think that job is? To be a total pain in my ass, Lucas quipped. Drew laughed. Larson didn't. I'm sorry you feel that way, but that still doesn't change the fact that all of your safety protocols and material handling procedures need to be reviewed to ensure this is a safe working environment, not only for you and your brother, but for everyone else in this building. Am I making myself clear? I hear your words, but the answer is no. Hell no. Lucas stepped around the crates to position himself better. Excuse me. Not until Professor Cleesby tells me himself that I should cooperate with this Gestapo bullshit. He's the dean of the astrophysics department, and I answer to him. Not to you, not to President Lathrop. I speak for the advisory committee, and Dr. Cleesby answers to them. Therefore, I don't need Cleesby's or anyone else's permission. Actually, that's not true, Drew mumbled. I thought you were here on orders from President Lathrop, Lucas said. The advisory committee reports to the president, so both statements are true. Larson's voice cracked. Sounds like lawyers speak to me, Drew said with heat in his words. I need to review your operations manual and have you walk me through the protocols, step by step, Larson said, walking back from the control station to where he'd left his briefcase earlier. He stood at the intersecting point between Lucas, Drew, and the lab door. Lucas folded his arms across his chest and didn't answer. He drew in a deep breath and held it, pushing his chest out and letting his jaw stiffen. Are you denying my request? The attorney asked. Lucas nodded. If you won't cooperate, then you leave me no choice. I'm shutting this project down pending a formal review. You can't do that, Drew snapped. I just did, Larson said with confidence. Lucas exhaled slowly to control his temper. 
It worked. He gritted his teeth and pointed at the lab door. There's the exit. I suggest you use it. Don't let the door hit you on the way out, Drew said, looking at Lucas, then at the attorney. The attorney turned to Drew with fire in his eyes and raised a fist. Crippled little boys in wheelchairs need to keep their goddamn mouths shut. Lucas charged the attorney and let a punch fly without thinking. His fist landed a hard, sharp blow across the lawyer's chin. Larson staggered backward, falling toward the wall next to the door. His ass hit just short of the wall at an angle. Then the back of his skull made impact. The man flopped to the ground with eyes closed and chest heaving. Lucas, Drew yelled. Damn, that felt good, he answered, shaking his hand to disperse the pain. He picked absolutely the wrong day to threaten you. I suppose you had it coming. Yeah, big time. Nobody raises a hand to a Ramsey. Nobody. Thanks for standing up for me. That's my job, Lucas said, grabbing Larson's limp body by the back of the pants and the collar of the suit. Get the door for me, he told Drew, pulling Larson's frame across the floor. As soon as Drew had the door open, Lucas drug the lawyer into the hallway, head first. He deposited Larson at the feet of Bruno, who had just entered the hallway from inside Griffith's lab door across the hall. Bruno's mouth flopped open. Drew smiled, tossing the lawyer's briefcase on top of his body. Well, if Randall Harrison Larson III wasn't having a bad day before, he sure is now. Lucas laughed and looked at Bruno. You need to call building services and tell them the trash is piling up in the hallway. Chapter 23 Lucas felt the F-250 rock when he collapsed onto Masago's chest after his orgasm released. Her feet, legs, and arms were shaking in powerful spurts, rattling the muscles of both her body and his. He felt a cold draft rise up from the passenger door and wash across his toes, which were dangling from the end of the truck's bench seat. He unhooked his right arm from the bottom of the steering wheel and brought his hand up to her face, tucking a clump of disheveled hair behind her ear, and then spoke softly to her. That was amazing, she said with glazed eyes and rapid breath. Totally amazing. I've dreamed of what it would be like with you my entire life, and it was wonderful. He wasn't sure how to respond to her unexpected confession. He wanted to thank her and make her aware of how special her gift was to him, but none of the words in his mind sounded appropriate. She seemed content, so he decided to just leave it at that. He slid his body away and against the back of the seat, taking weight off her tiny frame. Next time, though, let's pick a more comfortable place. I feel like a pretzel. She smiled as her eyes rolled back into her head, revealing the whites of her eyes. I feel wonderful. Lucas heard the sound of an engine roar past the truck before brakes squealed and a couple of thuds rang out. Somebody hit something, he thought. A moment later, a creaky car door opened and slammed shut. Who's here? She whispered after her eyes returned to their normal position. Let me check, Lucas answered quietly. He stuck his head up until he could see over the dash and through the windshield. A blue-colored sedan was parked ten feet in front of them, with two of its wheels sitting on the curb. Cops? she asked. No, but some blind person just parked in front of us. Lucas read the manufacturer's name on the trunk. It's a Volvo, but I don't see anyone inside. The professor's Volvo? Wrong color, and it's in way too good of shape. Oh my god, did someone see us? Are you serious? They'd have to be ten feet tall to see in here. Don't be a smartass. You know what I mean. Don't come a-rockin' when this truck is a-rockin'. He laughed. No, I don't think so. Looks like the driver was in a hurry. Drove over the curb like a drunken sailor, he told her, scanning the area. He didn't see anyone. Might have gone inside. Grab my clothes. Hurry, she said. He sat up and moved to the end of the seat, untangling his clothes from hers. The two of them got dressed in a flash. We should leave, she said. Lucas rolled the window down. No, drive to the end of the street and turn around. I want to get a better look at that Volvo. She turned the key in the ignition and fired the engine, then put the gear shift into drive. The truck crept forward. Lucas studied the car while they inched past the visitor's four-door Volvo. He noticed two spots on the driver's door where chunks of blue paint had chipped away, revealing a faded yellow color underneath. He looked at the windshield. It was covered with dirt and bug carcasses and had a prominent zigzag crack running horizontally from one end to the other. Wait, he said. Stop. She jammed on the brake. He rocked forward. 
That's the professor's car. He must have fixed the dents and painted it blue. I can see the piss-yellow paint bleeding through. Are you sure? It even has the same crack in the windshield. Oh yeah, this is definitely his car. Want me to back up? No, keep going, he said, pointing down the street. Just flip around and park over there by the mailbox. She did as he instructed. Now what? Time for a face-to-face, -face, he answered, opening the passenger side door. I'll be back in a flash. No, I'm coming with you. It's better if you stay here. He got out and shut the truck door quietly, not wanting to alert anyone to his presence, at least not until he could assess the situation to make sure the driver was actually the professor and that it was safe. His copies could be around somewhere, waiting in the shadows. She leaned over and lowered the window on the passenger side with the hand crank. We're a team, remember? I go where you go. That's the deal. He stood on the running board and stuck his head inside the opening, resting his elbows on the window frame. He spoke softly, not wanting to upset her. We don't know what we're dealing with here. Bit paranoid, aren't we? It's just your professor. We don't know that for sure. How so? Think about it. If he knew to come here, then my copies would too. They could already be here, waiting to ambush. Then you're going to need my help either way, as backup. Lucas checked the area behind him, scanning the apartment complex and its surrounding neighborhood. He didn't see anyone, and it looked quiet. Maybe too quiet. He looked back at her. It's too dangerous. She shook her head with a determined look on her face. Whether you like it or not, I'm going. Your knee's not exactly at 100%. Well, neither are you. Her face tightened and her lips pinched. No, I'm not letting you out of my sight. End of discussion. His head slumped, resting on his forearms. He paused, letting the frustration drain from his body. His eyes locked onto hers, hoping he might see a crack in her resolve. He didn't. Fine, but I make all the decisions and do all the talking. Agreed? She nodded. He stepped back. She rolled the passenger window up before hopping out of the truck and joining him on the sidewalk. Where do you think he went? Either his apartment or ours, or maybe the manager's office, or possibly Trevor's place. So, basically what you're saying is you really have no clue. I do know, except there are multiple choices. We'll have to eliminate them one by one. She stuck her tongue out at him. Let's start with my old place, at least where it used to be. It's on the third floor. Stay behind me and keep quiet. Not a peep, got it? She pushed at his shoulder. Now that we're a couple, you really need to treat me a little nicer. A couple? Because of what we just did? She nodded. He rolled his eyes. Just so you know, this is me being nice. She smacked him again, this time on the back of the head. We'll have to work on that. Lucas put his hand out, palm up with fingers spread. She took his hand, interlacing her fingers inside of his. She smiled, then brought his hand to her mouth and gave it a series of short kisses. He knew he had a five-alarm clinger on his hands, but the sex was amazing, and she was gorgeous. Consider yourself lucky, he scolded himself. Beautiful women aren't exactly falling at your feet, so man up and be the kind of boyfriend she's expecting. Otherwise, what just happened in the front seat will be a one-and-done event. Masago, sweetie, I need you to be as quiet as a mouse. Can you do that for me? Pretty please? He shook his head. There. Is that better? Yes, much. Now that wasn't so hard, was it? He felt a bit emasculated, but decided to let it go. He turned forward, moving along the sidewalk with her in tow, heading for the stairwell at the end of the apartment complex, where a multi-story scaffolding rig was standing. The construction dust was thick in some areas of the property where it had accumulated from the wind. It crunched under their feet as they walked to the base of the stairwell and began the climb. A few minutes later, they were on the catwalk of the third level. Which one is it? Masago asked. He pointed. Second door from the end. I wanted a first floor apartment with Drew's wheelchair and all. Wheelchair? Yeah, car accident when he was little. He survived, but his mom didn't. That's how we both ended up in an orphanage and were adopted together. How do you get Drew down the stairs? She asked in a whisper. Elevators just around the corner. Handy. Yeah, when it worked. That's why my back was always sore. I had to carry Drew somewhere at least once a day for one reason or another. Not every building is handicapped accessible, let alone handicapped friendly. You must love him very much. He's my brother. Someone had to help him. She hugged his arm, squeezing it tightly. Family is important. Yes, it is. That's why I made this trip, Lucas quipped, moving slow. He took a few seconds to lean around and look inside the front window of each apartment as they moved. The rooms were vacant, with drywall patches and tape seams exposed on the walls and the ceiling. Looks like they're working on this floor. He kept walking until he was standing next to the window of his old apartment. 
He peered around the frame to see inside. The walls were covered with in-process drywall work like the others, except here, two ladders sat in the center of the room near a well-used drop cloth, a two-wheeled paint sprayer, and four paint buckets. The edges of the kitchen cabinets next to the wall were covered with blue masking tape. That figures, he said. What? Painters, working on my place right now. Do you see anyone? He scanned the interior, looking for signs of movement or recent work. Must have the day off. Try the door. He did. The knob turned and the door opened. He walked inside with Masago. This doesn't look so bad, she said, tilting her head. Kind of cute. You should have seen it before. Of course, we didn't always take good care of the place either. Who was the slob? You or Drew? Or both? Definitely me. Drew was totally anal and obsessed with neatness. Everything had to be just so, or else he couldn't function. He'd scoot around in his chair, picking up after me. Must be nice, your own personal maid. It wasn't like that. We each had our own household duties. That was his. Mine was everything else, so it all balanced out in the end. She stared at him, but kept her mouth closed. Really, I'm not that bad. She still didn't respond. Lucas didn't know what else to say. Either she believed him, or she didn't. Not much else he could do. He followed the footprints in the floor dust that led around the ladders and through the paint buckets, making his way to the kitchen. He let go of Masago's hand and stood in the opening where the fridge used to be. Brings back a lot of memories, he said, feeling a swell of emotions building in his throat. You okay? Yeah. Just seems like a lifetime ago when I lived here with my brother. Shit. If I'd only known, I could have stopped it and he'd still be alive. She rubbed his back and shoulders but didn't say anything. Lucas decided to open the cabinet door on his left and look inside. He wasn't searching for anything in particular, it just felt like the thing to do. The cabinet was empty except for a used wrapper from a straw and some lingering drywall dust. He checked the drawer below it. It had a smattering of miscellaneous items, rubber bands, paper clips, chewed pencils, a nearly empty roll of tape, two empty key rings, a nine-volt battery, a layer of cookie crumbs, and a loose collection of coins, a dollar twenty-seven to be exact. Looks like we left in a hurry. There's no way Drew would have left cash lying around. He thumbed through the junk and picked the coins up, putting them in his pocket. Masago pinched her eyebrows. You're just going to take the money? Why not? Technically, it belongs to me. No way I'm leaving it for the painters. He walked to the center of the family room and craned his neck to look at the ceiling. He pointed at the smooth surface above him. See that? See what? There's nothing there. Yes, exactly. Huh? There should be a bunch of dents from the end of a broom handle. It's how we signaled Trevor to come down for a visit. This just isn't home anymore. Crash, clang, bong. Masago flinched. What was that? It came from outside, Lucas said, hurrying to the window. He looked outside. A man wearing coveralls and a flannel shirt was struggling to carry three full-size metal garbage cans with lids past the manager's office on the first floor. One of the dented lids fell to the ground and tangled with the man's feet, sending him tumbling on top of the other trash bins sitting nearby. The closed container caught his belly at the midpoint, serving as a fulcrum, keeping his well-fed figure off the ground. His hands and feet flopped wildly, moving in opposite directions from one another, keeping him centered and balanced on top of the bin. Ladies and gentlemen, I now give you the flying Cleesby, Lucas said, laughing. She giggled. The professor? Yep, my boss, Mr. Coordinated. You don't see that every day. Cleesby grabbed the sides of the garbage can and managed to roll himself off without falling. He stood upright and looked around, then ran his hands across the front of his clothes before replacing the lid on the receptacle. He stacked all three cans next to the door to the manager's office and went inside. He really could have hurt himself, she said. Damn lucky, Lucas said, checking the rest of the area he could see from the window. I don't see anyone else. Let's head down and have a talk with him. I'm thinking we should probably not mention we witnessed his belly flop trapeze act. My lips are sealed. A few minutes later, Lucas and Masago were standing in front of the manager's office on the ground floor. Lucas made a fist and was about to knock on the door, but stopped when he heard a man's voice inside, yelling a series of questions with silence between each phrase. It was Dr. Cleesby, and he sounded upset. He did what? Why? That's no excuse! When did this happen? Is he going to press charges? Lucas took a step back from the door and spoke to Masago in a whisper. We should come back later. Let him cool down. It's never wise to interrupt my old professor when he's pissed. She grabbed his arm and pulled him back to the door. We're not leaving until you do what you came here to do. 
Lucas wriggled out of her grip. All right, all right. I know you're trying to help, but I need to do this a certain way. He's my boss, and I know what makes him tick. Masago nodded, folding her arms across her chest. She tapped her foot. Lucas bent forward, pressing his ear against the door. Cleesby continued his one-sided tirade. Is he there with you? Put him on the phone. Yes, now. Do you have any idea what you've done? I don't care what he said. You just can't go around assaulting people any time you feel like it. Look, it's too late for apologies. You poked the bear, and there will be consequences. I can only protect you from him to a certain extent. Lucas looked at Masago and back at the door. I don't know what to say to him. He was dead last time I saw him, and then he wasn't once I arrived here. I certainly wouldn't lead with that. No, probably not. I also can't tell him his wife didn't wait for him to return from an alternate universe and moved on without him, marrying someone else. You'll figure it out. Just take it one step at a time. I'm not sure this is such a great idea. Ripples in time are changing everything. Anything I tell him could make the situation worse, and I can't be responsible for- Masago cut him off by beating her hand against the door. Thump, thump, thump. See how easy that was? She said with attitude. Lucas put his ear against the door. Hang on, Cleesby told the caller on the phone. Someone's here. Footsteps approached and the door opened, revealing Dr. Cleesby, who was holding a wireless office phone in his hand. The professor's eyes flared. Then he glanced at Masago and back at Lucas. He swallowed hard and brought the phone up to his ear. Um, I'm going to have to call you back. Something unexpected just came up. He went to tuck the phone into his shirt pocket but missed. It hit the floor with a crack, then bounced to the right. Masago gave the professor a hug. Nice to finally meet you, Professor Cleesby. I'm Masago Fuji. He didn't reciprocate. She stepped back. Who the hell are you? Cleesby asked. I told you, I'm Masago Fuji. Weren't you listening? Not you, the professor answered. He pointed at Lucas. Him! Lucas took a second before responding, working his way through the confusion. Had he caused so many changes to the timeline that his boss no longer knew who he was? If that was true, he was totally fucked. Um, I'm Lucas Ramsey, your longtime friend, Drew's foster brother. I don't know who you are or what you think you're doing here, but I can tell you with absolute certainty and clarity of thought, you're not Lucas Ramsey. Yes, I am. It's not possible. I was just talking with him on the phone. You can't be in two places at once. You're one of the insurgents from the mountaintop, one of the lookalikes. You know about that? Oh, yes, he said, pointing at Lucas's chest. And I recognize that suit you're wearing, too. What, this? Lucas said, tugging at his open shirt collar. He pulled it closed to cover up as much of the suit as he could. It's some type of advanced metamaterial, the professor answered, holding his hands out as he stepped back from the door to reveal office furniture covered in plastic and crates scattered about the room. He grabbed a long-handled screwdriver from the top of one of the crates and held it in a defensive position, like a knife. Stay back. I don't want any trouble. You know about the smart skin suit? That's what you call it? Look, we're not here to harm you, Masago said. We need your help. Who's she? Cleesby asked Lucas, pointing the screwdriver at the girl. My friend. Masago flared her eyes at Lucas and smacked him on the shoulder. Uh, I mean my girlfriend. Cleesby aimed the makeshift knife back at Lucas. Lucas Ramsey doesn't have a girlfriend. Well, this version of him does, thank you very much, she said. In fact, he doesn't have any friends at all. Hey, wait a minute. That's not true. I have friends. Masago stood next to Lucas, wrapping her arms around him. Why are you here? What do you want from me? Cleesby asked, looking at Lucas. I need your help. For what? To help me fix everything that's happening. I just need to contact my friends back home. Home? Where? The future. Cleesby paused. Come again? I don't think I heard you correctly. The future. The professor's eyes blinked rapidly. What are you saying? Time travel? Yes, Professor, Lucas said, unbuttoning his shirt down to his belt line, exposing a large section of the suit. This suit is part of an incursion chamber system that you helped me build in the future with a friend of ours. I came back in time to set things right, to fix the timeline. Bullshit. Time travel is impossible. Yet, here I am. What about the others? The others like you? Pulled here by mistake from alternate dimensions. Do you really expect me to believe any of this? He's telling you the truth, Masago said. He really is from the future and needs your help. Otherwise, we're all going to die. I seriously doubt that, young lady. 
I can prove who I am and where I'm from, Lucas said, unwrapping Masago's arm from his body. Just give me a chance to explain, but I need you to put the screwdriver down so nobody gets hurt. Cleesby looked at his hand for a few moments, then back at Lucas. He shook his head. I'm no fool. Masago laughed. That's not what it looked like when you landed on top of the garbage can earlier. Lucas sneered at her. You're not helping. He's starting to piss me off, she snapped back. Your girlfriend has quite the temper, Cleesby said. Lucas stared at the screwdriver, trying to decide how best to defuse the situation. Can we come in? You can stand in one corner and we in another. There's no threat here. I just need a minute, that's all. Cleesby backed away, moving to the far side of the manager's desk, still holding the tool. Lucas entered first, then Masago. Lucas stood ten feet in front of his boss with the desk between them. That's close enough. Now let's hear it. You've got exactly one minute before I call the authorities, Cleesby said, putting his hand into his shirt pocket. A moment later, his face lit up with panic. Looking for this, Masago said, holding the office phone in the air. Your aim sucks, Professor. She shook it, holding it against her ear. Hmm, sounds like a few loose pieces inside. I wonder if it still works after you smashed it against the floor. I need that back. Lucas put out his hand, palm up, shaking it in front of Masago. The phone, please. She shook her head. Trust me on this. She hesitated, then gave it to him. Lucas turned to Cleesby. The professor I know would never call the cops or involve anyone from the government. He'd call his longtime friend and biotech's replica, Bruno, or one of his biotech's guards who survived the crash of the starship Trinity way back in the 1960s, just outside of Chicxulub, Mexico. I also know the secret of Gene Roddenberry and the Star Trek franchise, and about the biotech's activator enzyme. The professor lowered the screwdriver a bit. His face seemed to freeze. Lucas continued... I know you're building a second reactor in one of your silos, much like the reactor my younger self and Drew are building in the science lab. Only your reactor isn't for changing the laws of gravity. It's to communicate with your people back home, in your universe. I know about the E-121 power modules, the rift-slipping device, and the sadistic Krellian Empire, who've been hunting you forever since you accidentally crossed dimensions and landed here on my Earth. Krellian Empire? Masago asked. I'll explain later, he told her quickly, never taking his eyes from his boss. Cleesby lowered the weapon a few more inches. I know about your longtime desire to get back to your wife, Caroline, and your son, your first son, not the surrogate son who works with the younger me in the lab and who's been forced to live his life in a wheelchair. I know about the network of underground bases and the jump pads and how you seem to know exactly what to invest your money in and when. And last but not least, there's sticks and your love of classic rock. As you can see, Professor, I know everything, and we both know there's only one way for that to be true. Lucas, Cleesby said, pulling the office chair under his body and sitting down. He put the screwdriver on the desk in front of him. Yes, it's me. Your face is different. Battle scars from what happens next, at least what happened in the previous future. How is this possible? It's a very long story, Lucas said, putting the phone on the edge of the desk and sliding it to his mentor. But I don't have time to go into it all, so I'll need you to take a leap of faith and trust me. The future of humanity depends on it. The professor hesitated, obviously running through everything he'd just heard. Then the emotion wilted from his face and his eyes focused. Okay, what do you need? Chapter 24 Bald Lucas took a running start and rammed his shoulder into the plexiglass door of the holding cell in the basement of the micromatter facility, ignoring the faint reflection of his smooth head looking back at him, the hinges held firm, sending his body back across the cell the way it came. He tried again, this time hurtling his body into the air, but the door never budged. Do you know what the definition of the word insanity is? Dr. Charles Starling asked him, moving a step closer, limping on his right leg. Don't patronize me, Lucas said, rubbing and flexing his shoulder. Repeating the same procedure over and over and expecting a different result. A quote from Albert Einstein. So what's your point? Unless you intend to sprout horns and morph into a creature with 1,500 pounds of body mass, you're not going to deliver sufficient kinetic energy to breach that door. I designed our cells to be escape-proof. Nothing is escape-proof. Trust me, these are. I think the bigger question is, why would a biochemical research facility need holding cells in the first place? Yes, why indeed? Eleven of them, no less. Starling pulled at his handlebar mustache, twisting it with his fingers. 
Yes, it appears that I may have overestimated the need. Interesting. I have an idea. Why don't you step inside and join me? I'd be more than happy to knock those sunglasses off your face, then take that Yankees hat and shove it up your ass, bald Lucas said, pacing the floor. Then again, maybe that's why you designed this prison with plexiglass doors instead of bars. That way, your detainees can't reach through the bars and grab a hold of that cheesy Wyatt Earp mustache of yours and rip the damned thing from your face. You do know those went out of style back in the 1800s, right? Now there you go, answering your own question. Never underestimate the temper of a Ramsey. Go fuck yourself, Starling, Lucas snapped. Then he thought about Starling's comments and realized what the man was hinting at. Are you saying you built these cells specifically for me and my crew? Expecting eleven of us to be caught breaking and entering into your facility? Certain outcomes can be predicted, given the accumulation of a sufficiently large enough data set and the proper warning. You couldn't have anticipated we'd end up here and then had enough time to build holding cells for all of us. Hell, we didn't know until an hour before we arrived. So how could you? We only picked this place because of its proximity to campus and the expected technology assets that might allow us all to build something we could use to... Lucas said, stopping himself from telling the man any more. Get home, Starling added. Home to your respective universes. Lucas was stunned. Starling knew. How could he? I wasn't going to say that. Sure you were. That's insane. You should have a little more respect for the person responsible for putting a stop to the General's Protocol 5 injections. I just saved your life. A soldier is always prepared to die in order to save his men. That's true, but we both know you're not a soldier. How the hell would you know? You don't know me. You don't know where I'm from or what I'm capable of doing. Shit, I could be a paid assassin for all you know. Oh, but I do know, Lucas Ramsey. I suspect that I know you better than you know yourself. Now you're just trying to piss me off. I did just save your ass. Yes, you did. But why exactly? Why didn't you just let me die along with the rest of my team? Do you prefer death? Yes. Anything is better than rotting away down here with only your ugly mug to look at. No food, no water, no place to take a shit. What kind of fucking moron builds a jail cell like this? Lucas, you really need to temper your anger. It will be your undoing. My temper is just fine, thank you very much. Sometimes a man needs to marshal his inner demons when the circumstances dictate the need for it, like now. So I ask again, how about coming inside and facing me man to man? You should have told Alvarez what he wanted to know. He never would have continued with the injections, leaving your team alive. There was nothing to tell. I guess I could have simply fabricated a lie. That would have been one solution, but then again, I know as well as you do, there are more of you. You mean the rest of my crew? They're all dead. You were there. Alvarez made sure of that, melting them from the inside out with that compound. No, the others who are still unaccounted for after the incursion on the mountaintop. Lucas didn't know what to say. We know there are several others like you. What are their plans? Where do they intend to strike? How the hell should I know? I guess your sufficiently large data set doesn't provide you with all the answers, now does it? You arrogant prick. So, tell me, Starling, why would a sadistic fuck like you stop another sadistic fuck like Alvarez from injecting me to finish the job? Perhaps I have a deep respect for human life. I seriously doubt that. What kind of sick, twisted asshole invents something like Protocol 5? You're a scientist, for God's sake! Its primary use is for the treatment of cancer cells, something I've been focused on for decades. That's a load of crap. It's a weapon. That's what it's designed for, plain and simple. It's men like you that give science a bad name, Lucas said, shaking his head, trying to contain the hate fuming inside his gut. Let me assure you, given the proper motivation and the right circumstances, even the great Dr. Lucas Ramsey would succumb to the pressures of the moment. There are times when sacrifices must be made and steps must be taken, steps to ensure survival at all costs. Never in a million years. There are some lines even I won't cross. In time, you'll come to understand. Not everything is as black and white as you purport it to be. Is there a point to any of this? Why did you come down here? Lucas said, feeling his temper boil his blood. To observe and study. I'm a scientist, remember? So what am I? Some kind of lab rat? Starling didn't answer, only tilting his head and narrowing his eyes before he turned for the door. 
Hey, wait a minute, Lucas snapped, running his hands across his smooth head. Starling didn't answer, continuing his march for the door with a hurried limp. Lucas couldn't contain his anger for another second, letting loose with a roundhouse left, punching the glass door, shattering his little finger in the process. He grabbed his hand and doubled over in pain, keeping his mangled finger close to his body. It was sticking out sideways at the second knuckle, swelling around the impact site. He yanked on it, bringing the bone back into alignment. He screamed when a wave of intense pain traveled from his hand to his brain. Lucas looked up and saw Starling standing in the doorway, looking back at him. Oh, and one more thing, Dr. Ramsey. Remember these words. When you see the rubber spray of red, your destiny awaits in opposition. Seek the first level, and you shall find your way home. With that, Starling turned and disappeared beyond the door. Rubber spray of red? Destiny? What the hell does that mean, you crazy bastard? Come back here, Starling, you asshole! Don't leave me down here like this! Starling! Chapter 25 A sense of wonder washed over Lucas when Masago turned the truck onto Park Avenue from Speedway Boulevard, heading through the north entrance to the sprawling campus of the University of Arizona. He'd been away from college life for so long, he'd forgotten what it meant to him to be on the property and part of the hustle and bustle of young minds still walking through life with eyes wide. He felt relevant again, alive. He was home. Cleesby leaned over Masago's shoulder from the back seat and pointed. Take the next right and pull into the faculty-only lot. It's just before the building with the telescope mounted to its roof. That's your lab? she asked. Our home away from home, Cleesby answered. Fancy. That's not how first-time visitors usually describe the place, but I guess I see your point, Lucas said from the front passenger seat. I've always imagined this would be the kind of place my dad used to work at, she said. You never visited him at work? Lucas asked. Not without security clearance. Family visits weren't allowed. I've worked at a few of those establishments in my day, Cleesby said with a slow delivery. Lucas could relate. Then again, it's not like my mother ever dropped by to surprise Drew and me and take the nickel tour. You know she's always welcome. I've offered to have Bruno drive up there and get her for you. Technically, Professor, I think the correct statement would be she was always welcome. The future is not kind to her, or Trevor for that matter. I'm sorry, Lucas. I didn't know. How could you? But she's still alive now, right? Masago asked Lucas. Yep, in Phoenix. I'd love to meet your mom. Maybe if we have time we can go for a visit? And when she sees the changes to my face and wonders why I'm a couple years older, then what? Tell her the truth, that I'm from the future, and Drew is, he said, stopping himself. No thanks, I'll spare her the drama. He leaned to his left, looking at Cleesby in the back seat. She still has heart problems, right? Cleesby nodded. She's home recuperating from surgery. His mom's condition was one of the few things that hadn't changed. He wasn't sure if it was a good thing or not. That figures. It seems like the best parts of the timeline have been erased, but the worst aspects haven't, almost like the universe won't let them, wanting to keep us on a path of annihilation. Cleesby didn't hesitate. Time finds a way. I knew you'd say that. You always do. In the future, that is. It's good to know I'm still alive. Old dogs like me are hard to put down. Masago drove through the entrance to the lot and parked the high-profile monster two rows from the front walkway. She put the transmission lever into park and turned the ignition off. Lucas got out of the front seat of Rocket's truck, pulling at his shirt collar to conceal the top of his smart skin suit from any students and faculty they might come across. He walked around the hood to the driver's side where Cleesby was standing, holding the door open for Masago. She slipped out of the vehicle, dropped down, and landed on two feet. I can't wait to see your lab, she said. I'm not so sure that's a good idea, Cleesby said. I agree, Lucas said. In theory, we should avoid my younger self and Drew. The less contact we have with people from this timeline, the better. Of course, that's assuming any of that matters at this point. We could already be in the midst of a cascading bidirectional paradox. Cleesby grinned. What? Lucas asked him. So you were paying attention in class? Yeah, most of the time. But I have to tell you, sometimes it wasn't easy. Fair enough, Cleesby said. What's next, Dr. Cleesby? Masago said, with a hint of impatience in her words. We'll need to read Bruno in, and of course, Griffith. No choice there, but the last thing we need is my younger, more volatile self to get involved. More volatile? Masago asked. Yes, more. I had a bit of an edge back then. I'll bet that's an understatement, she said, smiling at Cleesby. 
You could say that, Cleesby told her. Yeah, yeah, kick a guy where he's vulnerable. I'm a work in progress, I know. But at least I'm willing to admit it. That has to count for something. Cleesby sighed. We'll need to keep an eye out for Larson. I'm sure he'll be back to deal with your assault. Lucas shook his head. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't punch him, though I distinctly remember wanting to a couple of years ago in my timeline. Well, this time you did. Do you think it's going to matter if he sees you? Lucas is Lucas in his feeble mind. If I know him, he's seeing blood in the water by now. The three of them made their way to the entrance of the science building and went inside, with the professor leading the way. Bruno stepped from his station and approached them. He stopped, keeping his eyes solely on Lucas. Lucas cleared his throat. Hey, buddy. Well, butter my butt and call me a biscuit. I never expected to see you again, not after I cleared you and your brother for entry less than an hour ago. It's a long story, Cleesby said. I'll bet, sir, the security chief said, staring at the cheek scars on Lucas's face. I'm guessing this is all on a need-to-know basis. Cleesby nodded. Strictly. Bruno looked at Masago. And who might you be, miss? I'm Masago Fuji, Lucas's girlfriend, she said. Bruno smiled and slapped Lucas on the back. Well, how do you like that? The tick found the woodpile. I was starting to wonder if it would ever happen. Now we just need to find someone for your little brother, and for the other you, if I'm reading the situation right. Lucas smiled. You are? Is Larson still here? Cleesby asked. Bruno shook his head. Left earlier. Cleesby nodded. We're in a hurry. I need you to wave us through. Bruno called off his guards manning the security station. He brought the trio around the scanning equipment and into the main hallway of the science lab. Do you need me to escort you, sir? Won't be necessary, but I do need you to go to my office and fetch the material pouch from earlier and bring it to Davy's lab. On the double, have your men call me if our attorney friend shows up, or anyone else for that matter. Anyone who isn't cleared, Cleesby said, putting his hands on the backs of Lucas and Masago, pushing them forward. Roger that. See you kids later. Good to see you, old friend, Lucas told Bruno, before he sprinted through a connecting hallway and disappeared from sight a short minute later. He seemed nice, Masago said. That guy makes me laugh. I forgot how much I missed him. I take it something happens to him? Cleesby asked. However, before Lucas could answer, the professor continued. Wait, wait, don't answer that. The less I know, the better. Things need to unfold how they're supposed to. Yeah, whatever that means at this point. The farther I travel into this thread, the more it seems to veer off course. They scurried around several corners and down a handful of corridors, then arrived at their destination ten minutes later. Cleesby stepped forward and swiped his access card through the security scanner protecting Griffith's lab. Where's your lab from here? Masago whispered to Lucas. Lucas pointed at the lab doors behind them, across the hall. That's where all the magic happens. Cleesby entered his code and the door latch unlocked. So you and your brother are inside right now? Lucas nodded. If they only knew. Davies better not be on break, Cleesby said, pushing at the door. Lucas stepped to the side of Cleesby and saw Griffith holding a metal rod above his shoulder like a baseball bat. Cleesby held up his hands. Easy there, Ty Cobb. It's just us. Griffith put the rod on the table beside him. I'm so sorry, Dr. Cleesby. I thought you were someone else. The rod rolled off the table and bounced on the floor with a reverberating set of pings. Apparently, Lucas said, bending down to grab the club rolling his way. I think I'll hang on to this for a while. Who were you expecting? Cleesby asked. Griffith paused, biting his lip. Never mind. It's not important. Masago stepped forward and stood next to Lucas, wrapping her fingers inside of his. Whoa, Griffith said. I mean, hello. I'm Masago, she said with redness filling her cheeks. She put her free hand out for a shake. I've heard a lot about you. All good, I hope, he said, taking her hand and kissing it. She took her hand back and looked at Lucas. Wow, a true gentleman. Griff, you're making me look bad. So, you two are... Together? Lucas smiled. Just goes to show you that even a blind squirrel can find the acorn, Griffith said. Why does everyone keep saying things like that? Lucas asked. Can we get down to business? Cleesby said. Griffith's face ran stiff. I assume you're here about the metamaterial? Not exactly, Cleesby said, motioning to Lucas. Lucas unbuttoned his shirt and took it off to reveal the smart skin suit. He popped his shoes off and removed his pants. You found the rest of the X-Graphite material, Davies snapped. And more, Lucas said. He's from the future, Masago added. What? The piece of material I gave you earlier to analyze is from what's called a smart skin suit, Cleesby told him. 
It's part of our incursion chamber, which is used for interdimensional time travel, Lucas added, wanting to move the conversation along. Davies looked at Lucas. From the future? I already said that, Masago snapped. Griffith's eyes lingered on Lucas's face. Yes, I can see a difference. A few years, I'd estimate. Eighteen months and a handful of days, plus or minus, though I've sort of lost track. It's not easy when you're bouncing around the cosmos like a stripper working a stage. Stripper? Masago asked. It's just a saying. Doesn't sound like it. Griffith tugged at the fabric, rubbing it between his fingers. Given the exotic properties of the X-graphite sample, I'm guessing that a massive electrical charge is used as a catalyst for the process? Lucas nodded. How does it work, exactly? We don't have time for explanations, Cleesby said. Right, sorry, Griffith said, looking at the missing section of material around Lucas's knee. He was injured when I found him. Snakebite, Masago said, with a sense of pride in her voice. The size and shape of the missing section indicates the earlier sample I analyzed was from a different suit, Griffith said. Am I right? Correct, Cleesby answered. How many of them, of you, are there? In total, there were 212. Were? General Alvarez and his men, Cleesby said in a matter-of-fact way. Right, right. So what do you need from me? We need you to repair the suit. Me? Cleesby nodded. I need it working to contact my people back home, in the future, Lucas said, handing the Google glasses to Griffith. We'll also need to figure out how to recharge the power core in this communications device. Griffith studied the glasses. This looks like a Google Glass device, several generations from now, though. The name has changed to Google Glasses after a relaunch. I think the rebranding effort stems from the fact that the nickname Glass Hole catches on, referring to anyone wearing the controversial tech in public. I see, Griffith said, giving the device to Lucas. But I can't fabricate the missing material, not without full manufacturing specs, if it's even possible with today's technology. We've got that covered. Bruno's on his way down with a sample from my office. Excellent. I'll need my original analysis as well. It's in the same envelope. Can you patch it? Lucas asked. Possibly. It'll take some time to do, Griffith answered, then looked at Cleesby. I should probably mention that Mr. Larson was here earlier. What did that weasel dick want? Masago laughed, looking surprised at the professor's colorful choice of words. He had a sample of the X-graphite, a different sample, and wanted it analyzed. What did you tell him? I told him no, not without proper authorization. He got violent with me when I told him to leave. Then he threatened my wife. He had no right, I say, no right. What a douche, Lucas said, turning to Cleesby. And you wonder why my mini-me punched him? You struck him, Davies said. I mean, the other you? Decked his ass from what I hear. Griffith threw a pair of fake punches in the air. He smiled. That must have felt empowering and satisfying. I wouldn't know. Though, I did get to crack his head open with a fire extinguisher in a previous timeline. How many times have you lived this day? This is number two. Interesting. So you have cognitive retention across incursions? Lucas nodded. A triple knock rang out from the lab door. Everyone turned. Bruno? Lucas asked, waiting to see who came through the door. The door didn't open. Why would he wait? He has a master access card, right? He wouldn't. He'd come straight through. I told him it was urgent, Cleesby responded, looking at Griffith. Griffith adjusted his glasses, pushing them up his nose. It might be Lucas, the other Lucas, returning my hand truck. He borrowed it earlier. Lucas pinched his eyebrows. Already? That wasn't supposed to happen yet. He can't see you, Cleesby told Lucas. Lucas ducked behind one of Griffith's lab stations, taking Masago down with him. I'll get rid of him, Griffith said, walking to the door. Chapter 26 Bald Lucas put his smooth head against the door of the holding cell in the micromatter facility, pressing his ear against the cold, transparent surface. He couldn't hear any sounds reverberating through the walls from outside. Starling had left him there, alone in the cell, to die of starvation. Wait, scratch that, he told himself. Dehydration would happen first. Two days, if he chose not to drink his own piss. Three or four days, max, otherwise. First, there would be extreme thirst, then dry mouth, followed by sticky saliva. He'd begin to feel faint and unable to stand or sit. Severe cramping would overwhelm his gut and spread to his arms and legs as the sodium and potassium in his system rose to critical levels, unable to be flushed from his body due to the massive fluid drop. 
His lips and skin would wither and crack, and his tongue would swell to the size of an avocado. He'd start dry heaving when his stomach and intestines ran dry, leaving him in severe pain and unable to cry a single tear. Then the endless nosebleed would start as his mucous membranes dried out and cracked open. Finally, his brain would shrink and seize from lack of water, sending him into a coma with intense convulsions as his metabolic processes broke down. When death arrived, it would be served with a major heart arrhythmia and the dark aftermath. The lights across the floor flickered for a moment, then blinked out, plunging the holding cells into darkness. He heard a two-second squeak of metal, telling him the door leading into the security area had just opened, probably a few inches by the sound of it. He tried to detect movement through the blackness, but couldn't see anything. Hello, he said, waiting for someone to answer him back. There was no response. Starling, is that you? The emergency lighting system kicked on in the hallway beyond the door, providing a halo of red-colored light. He squinted, checking to see if anyone appeared. No one did. The door moved again, opening wider with the slow screech of its complaining hinges. Lucas took a step back from the containment glass. A figure jumped through the opening and crouched inside, like a commando entering an unsecured room. The light from the hallway backlit the person, showing a silhouette. Lucas couldn't see the person's face, but the visitor was short and wiry, possibly a teenager. The figure's head turned from side to side, revealing shoulder-length hair, the distinct outline of a gas mask, and something jutting out from the area around the eyes. Lucas thought it was a woman wearing night vision goggles, maybe five foot four inches tall, carrying something in one hand. Lucas swallowed and stayed silent. The shadow took a step forward, checked its wrist, removed the goggles and gas mask, then stopped again, remaining in a squat. A dim light appeared in the person's hand. It was an LCD screen on a device. Lucas caught a glimpse of the stranger's face. It wasn't a woman or a teenager. It was a man, wrinkled and aged, Asian with long stringy black hair that desperately needed to spend an hour with a brush. The man ran to Lucas's cell and spoke. What are you waiting for? Huh? Lucas said, rubbing his baldness out of habit. Who the hell are you? Where are the others? What others? Look around. Do you see anyone else? You're a Ramsey, right? Part of the insurgents? Where are the others? There's not much time. As I said, I'm here alone. They killed the others, tortured them first, and made me watch them die. Who are you? You'll have to do then, the man said, taking something from his pocket. It was a small, slender container, maybe half an inch in diameter and three inches tall. He popped its lid off, showing a button trigger at the top. He brought the canister up and aimed it forward at the upper right edge of the door, pressing the trigger button to release the contents. After coating the first hinge, he moved to the other hinges. The man stepped back when the trio of hinges began to smolder red and then melt in long drips of smoking material. Seconds later, the door's weight took over and broke itself free, sending it crashing to the ground. It toppled inward, landing at Lucas's feet. Are you just going to stand there? The short man asked. I'm not going anywhere until you tell me who the hell you are and what you want from me. I'm Riku. I'm here to rescue you. Who sent you? We don't have time for this. We need to leave now. Lucas didn't move. Look, I took a huge risk coming down here. It won't be long before they realize someone cut the power and gassed the guards. Do you want to get out of here or not? Lucas stepped on the severed door and walked across its surface. Why are you helping me? Riku grabbed Lucas by the arm and dragged him forward. Lucas didn't like being manhandled and reacted, jerking his arm away. Riku turned, craning his neck to make eye contact. The soldiers are going to recover soon, and we need to be gone. Recover from what? A little something I cooked up in the lab when they weren't hovering over me, watching my every move? Aerosol gas? Riku smiled. What is it with you people? Lucas asked, not expecting an answer. He decided to deck the guy and get away on his own. He raised his fist and was about to strike, but Riku stepped back with both hands up and away from his body. Lucas stopped his punch. He didn't know why, but he did. There was something in Riku's expression, a calmness. No, that's not right. It was something else. Sincerity. Riku's voice was smooth and controlled. 
I am not one of them. I am a prisoner and a scientist, like you. I've been held against my will for two years, forced to work on Starling's tactical projects. The distraction of your capture gave me the opportunity to launch my escape plan. I was hoping there'd be more than one of you remaining, but it is what it is. I'll answer all your questions, but first, we need to get moving. Can we do that? Lucas nodded, sensing Riku spoke the truth. He took a step forward as Riku turned and ran through the door. Lucas followed, struggling to keep pace with the old man. Riku was fast, damn fast, leading Lucas down the first hallway. Riku stopped at the first corner and leaned around the wall, then looked back. All clear, he whispered. What about the gas? In an air-controlled environment like this, its effect dissipates in just under seven minutes. We're safe. Try not to step on anyone. We don't need them regaining consciousness before we make our escape. I'd like to make it home to my family in one piece, Riku said, leading the way through the next corridor. This time, he moved slower, with his back against the wall, making it easier for Lucas to keep up. Riku stepped over two bodies lying close to the wall. A prisoner? For two years? Lucas asked in a soft voice, running through the facts he'd just heard. Any kids? Yeah, a boy and girl. They must think I ran off or I'm dead by now, Riku answered, working his way in and out of the light emanating from a series of emergency lights mounted along the walls. The future rarely holds true, not when actions are predicated on lies from the past. Lucas let the tiny man's words ferment in his thoughts, hoping they'd come together and make sense as seconds flew by, but they didn't, just more random insanity from an ever-growing list of nutjobs. He wondered how Riku knew about the other copies, then his mind shifted and replayed the string of odd comments Starling had made earlier, his statements about overestimating the number of holding cells needed and telling him about the rubber spray of red and his destiny in opposition. At the time, he thought it was pure gibberish, but now he was starting to wonder if it was some type of prognostication. Everything about Starling and his choice of words was more than a little off. His beard, the hat, the glasses, his mannerisms, the phrases he used, the inconsistent limp. The lies of the past? The future rarely holds true? Riku's comments brought in a new revelation. He was now starting to think Starling knew the Lucas copies were coming to breach the facility and he'd been waiting for the event to happen, trying to keep a low profile for some reason. It was also possible that Starling knew the copies were about to arrive on the mountaintop and had alerted Alvarez, which is why the gunships showed up almost immediately upon the group's arrival. He stayed low behind Riku and took a couple of deep breaths while he worked through the rest of it in his head. Hundreds of copies of the same person had been yanked into this universe, each with slightly different histories and physical characteristics, though he didn't get a chance to verify many of their backgrounds, not before this timeline's version of General Alvarez had opened fire and butchered most of them. Yet, despite all the copies of himself, he was the only copy who was bald. A genetic anomaly? Or was it something else? He didn't know but at least he had all of his body parts and his youth. He couldn't say the same thing about some of the others that shared his DNA across space-time, though history had changed each of them to fit its undisclosed purpose. The copy he'd seen standing alone in front of the group wearing the extra eye tech was most likely responsible for bringing them here, to this place and time. Made sense, he thought. The tech. That's the piece he needed. If it brought them all here then maybe it could send them all home, too. He just needed to find that version of himself, assuming he was still alive. He decided to call the man Lucas Prime, the one responsible for everything. Then, Lucas remembered the copy of himself that had been yanked away moments before the helicopters started gunning them all down. That's it, he told himself, as an idea came unbidden into his thoughts. The copy pulled into the sky. He must have been yanked back in time. Suddenly, all the pieces lined up. Starling's one of us. A Lucas, I mean. The one that disappeared when we first arrived. So that's when it happened, Riku said in a matter-of-fact way. That's how he knew. He was sent back in time, right? Riku nodded. I knew you'd put it together, eventually. The universe is correcting itself, realigning events and redeploying matter to compensate. How do you know all this? It's called investigative research. You remember what that is, right? Yeah, but that still doesn't explain why he wouldn't let General Alvarez finish me off. Why torture and kill everyone but me? 
I wasn't sure either. However, now that we know when Starling was sent back, we can extrapolate from there and try to determine his endgame. Lucas agreed. If we're correct, then all Starling knows is that we arrive as a group on the mountain, then he goes back. Anything after that moment in time would be undiscovered territory to him. It's pretty clear he wants you alive, or he had a change of heart. I doubt compassion or guilt is part of his DNA. No, I suppose not. Not after everything he's done. One thing I can guarantee you is that Starling has a plan. He wants you locked up down here for a reason, so I'm breaking you out. Seems like the logical thing to do. Screw him and his plans. Lucas nodded, letting the revelation of Starling's identity soak in as they continued their escape, making their way down another hallway. It does explain the mustache, sunglasses, and hat. He's hiding his identity, knowing we were going to appear on the mountain, and didn't want everyone to know who he really is. But why build 11 holding cells and then let the general take most of us out? Perhaps he didn't expect Protocol 5 to work, or he figured you'd talk sooner, leaving more of your crew alive. Another corner came and went, taking them into another corridor. I can see why you'd think that, but if he went back in time, immediately after our arrival, how could he have known to do any of this? No, it just doesn't fit. Besides, he got off on the torture just as much as Alvarez. I could see it in his eyes. I know that look. Trust me, Lucas said, taking more time to think. And why would he tell me about the red rubber of destiny and all that crap? Just random gibberish? Or is something supposed to happen in the future? Maybe someone else traveled back and ran into Starling in the past, filling him in on the details he missed. We can't assume the universe will make only one correction. Lucas nodded. Then that person must be me. Yes, that's it. That would explain why he stopped the general and wanted me alive. I'm not following. He needed me to survive in order to bring back the info he needed to set a course to his future. It's what leads up to this point. Without it, the past he knows never happens and his empire never builds. Damn, I never thought of that. Well done. At least now I know I survive all this, or at least I did the first time around. That was quite a gamble then with the Apaches. He must have instructed Alvarez to let me live, Lucas said, rubbing his head. Then he smiled. I never thought I'd say this, but thank God I'm bald. This dome is pretty easy to spot from the air. Chapter 27 Several hours later, Lucas paced the floor in Griffith's lab with Masago following, stopping occasionally to bend his knee and test the integrity of the smart skin suit. Every time he did, he expected Griffith's patch job to rip loose, but it held secure and conformed to his body just as it should. In fact, if he hadn't already known about the repair, he wouldn't have been able to tell. Griffith's work was impeccable, using an impromptu microfusing technique to connect and blend the nanopathways masterfully between the original material and the new piece. Well, Masago asked, holding Lucas's street clothes over her arm. How is it? I'm impressed, Lucas said, then looked at Griffith. Well done, Griff, just like new. Masago smiled. You look like an Olympic bobsledder, a sexy bobsledder. Griffith laughed. Don't encourage her, Lucas said, squinting at him. Is that what it feels like when you travel through time? A bobsled racing down a hill? She asked in a playful voice. No, not exactly. It's hard to explain. But imagine every cell in your body being warmed and tickled from the inside. Then you feel nothing but an overwhelming sense of awe as your awareness grows to infinity and beyond. It's a total mind-blowing rush. It's nothing I could have ever imagined. She tilted her head. Like you're floating up to heaven? Lucas walked back to the group. Not floating, and certainly not to heaven. More like your body and your soul are melting into cold energy. Then you're liquefied and spread across space-time like butter on warm toast. It's the strangest feeling. Like I said, heaven. I guess, maybe. Right before you arrive on the other end, your body feels like it's nowhere and everywhere at the same time. Masago nodded. Sounds amazing. Cleesby cleared his throat. What's next? Lucas looked at Griffith. We need to get the glasses working and test the connection. Then we'll know. Masago brushed one foot back and forth on the lab floor. That's when you'll be able to talk to the future? Lucas nodded. I was able to before. No reason to think I can again, as long as the Griff continues to work his magic. Griffith spoke without looking up from the glasses he was inspecting on the work table. Our instruments and knowledge are woefully inadequate for this type of technology. 
I've never seen such complex nanopower structures as these. There has to be thousands of individual chambers involved, each needing a fluid charge reset. I don't know where to begin, and even if I did, it's going to take a while. Lucas put his hand on Griffith's shoulder, squeezing it twice. You're doing fine. You fixed the suit, didn't you? You're in my light. Sorry, Lucas said, stepping away. Who'd you say built this? Griffith asked. A man I know in the future. We call him Master Fuji. He's my great-great-great-grandson, Masago blurted out. My family's greatest achievement. I think you missed a few greats in there, babe. She shrugged. You know what I mean. His name is Master Fuji. He created the smart skin suit and came up with the physics for the incursion chamber, Lucas said, turning to face Cleesby. You built the device with him, and I became the guinea pig, all thanks to the knowledge gleaned by tapping into the Akashic field. Cleesby seemed to ignore the reference. He leaned over Griffith's shoulder. Since it's a free-flowing graphene core, I'd start by trying to identify the root cell. It's possible that resetting its charge may start a downstream reaction, rectifying the electron flow across the entire power core. You may not need to reset each of them individually. That's a brilliant idea, Griffith said. Why didn't I think of that? It's so simple. Sometimes the easiest solution is the hardest to find, Lucas said, staring at Cleesby. It was one of the professor's favorite sayings from the future, and he hoped it might surprise the man or provoke a reaction. Cleesby didn't flinch, never taking his eyes from Griffith. I'm guessing this is a derivative technology, loosely based on lithium sulfur technology. Am I right? Griffith nodded. Loosely would be the operative word. What better substance to use than liquid graphene? The possibilities are endless, especially if the configuration was utilized like a supercapacitor and deployed with a high-efficiency ion transfer network. The electron mobility would be off the chart. What made you think of it, Professor? Masago asked. It just came to me. I knew there had to be an efficient mechanism in place to recharge the system. That's how I would have designed it. Otherwise, it'd be a one-use device. Why go through all the trouble to invent an entirely new power system and not be able to use it repeatedly? The discharge of energy works the same way, regardless of the battery configuration or the power core. Just the nanomaterials have changed. Bingo, Griffith said, standing up from his work stool as the glasses lit up on the table. Already? Lucas snapped, picking the glasses up from the surface. Griffith grinned, showing his crooked teeth. The professor was spot on. Once I determined the liquid representation of the anodes for each cell, I was able to trace its nanocircuitry back to the root cell. All but one of them had, for the lack of a better term, leads running in and out of it. Only one was missing the incoming connection, the root cell. Granted, this is an oversimplified explanation, but since time is of the essence, let's just leave it at that. Lucas put the glasses over his eyes. Its interface booted instantly as the suit's nanopathways synced wirelessly to the headgear. He panned the lab, watching a horde of analytical data flicker and light up the virtual heads-up display. The metrics about the objects and people in the room appeared above each item and looked to be correct, as did the environmental data. He swallowed hard, knowing it was time for the ultimate test. The test that would determine not only his fate, but the fate of the multiverse. Everything he'd hoped to achieve with this visit to Earth of the past would now come down to the next set of words he'd utter. He closed his eyes and took two deep breaths to calm his nerves, then cleared his throat and spoke into the device using a slow, purposeful voice. This is Dr. Lucas Ramsey, calling from Earth. Can anyone read me? Earth Outpost Utopia 3. This is Lucas Ramsey. Is anyone there? Cleesby, Griffith, and Masago stared at him in silence, each leaning forward, turning an ear toward him. Lucas dropped his gaze to the floor. A handful of moments later, the Google glasses crackled with static before someone's answer came through the device. It's damn good to hear your voice. We were growing concerned. Lucas recognized the person, making his heartbeat take off. No need to worry, Professor. Just a few technical glitches, but we've been able to solve them. We... Lucas hesitated to formulate his response. Well, I wasn't able to stay off the radar like we'd hoped. Ran into some issues along the way. Some major unexpected issues. Had to enlist the help of a new friend and a couple of old ones. But if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be talking right now. Who, exactly? Has the video link synced? Fuji's working on it. Hang on, future Cleesby said. Lucas waited, aiming his gaze at Griffith's work table and equipment. Okay, the feed is coming through now. Looks like you're in the science lab. Am I correct? Yep. 
But that's not all, Lucas said in a sly tone, panning the room until the others came into view. Recognize anyone? Absolutely. So who's the girl? Cleesby asked. My new friend. She rescued me after General Alvarez took out most of my copies on top of that mountain. I see. Wait, there's more. You're gonna love this. Her last name just so happens to be Fuji. Masago Fuji, to be exact. Lucas expected a response, but heard only static. He waited a bit longer. Still no answer. You still there, Professor? Yes, I'm here. We're in discussion. Stand by. Masago tugged on his arm. Can I talk to Master Fuji? I'd really like to meet my descendant. Lucas shook his head. That's not a good idea. Besides, even if I wanted to, I'm the only person who can operate this link. It's been tuned precisely for my biochemistry. That figures, she said, with disdain dripping from her words. Don't be upset. He knows you're here and what you look like. That's probably enough for now. Any more is just asking for trouble. We need to keep further corruption down to a minimum. Of course, that's assuming there's still any of the original timeline left to corrupt, but it still feels like the proper thing to do. He's right, Griffith added. Local Cleesby joined in. I concur. In fact, the three of us should vacate the room and let you speak in private. Future Cleesby's voice came across the link. We've discussed the matter, and I think it's wise for you to move to a more private location before we continue this discussion. Already on it, boss, Lucas told him, swinging his head around to watch Griffith escort Masago by the arm to the lab door, with current Cleesby right on their heels. The three of them went outside, and the door closed. Lucas turned his attention to the static crackling across the link, waiting for one of his friends from Utopia 3 to speak up. Cleesby did. Give me a quick recap. Let's see... Minutes after I arrived, Alvarez opened fire with three armed-to-the-teeth Apaches, killing most of my copies. I think he knew we were coming. How? I don't know. Luckily, some of the Lucas copies got away, including me, but I was injured. Masago found me and nursed me back to health in her private bunker. The smart skin suit and the glasses were damaged in the process. Once I was well enough to travel, she and I made the trek across the desert to bring the tech here, to you, uh, the you in the past, and you decided to bring Griffith in to help. I see, Cleesby said, hesitating before he spoke again. Status of the experiment? Unknown. Thus far, I've avoided contact with my former self, focusing mainly on getting the link operational. It sounds like you've made the proper decisions, given the circumstances. Thanks, Professor. However, I need to tell you there have been a number of timeline changes. A few were noticeable immediately upon my arrival. I'm afraid something's changed in the past, uh, the past from here. A predestination paradox, Fuji said in his soft, controlled voice. Hey, Fuji, good to hear your voice, Lucas said. Fuji didn't answer. How severe are the changes, Cleesby asked in a more serious tone. Some of them major. Not sure what to do. That's why I'm contacting you. The fact that you were able to re-establish the link, and we're still here, means the contamination hasn't affected critical aspects of the timeline, but that could change. I agree. We might only get one more shot at this. I was thinking Fuji should send me back a few days before I arrived. If I'm right, the other copies won't be pulled here with me, and the General won't have anything to shoot at. It might even help unwind some of the localized corruption we're starting to see. Or make it worse. Right now, the facts indicate that enough of the timeline remains intact in order to achieve success. However, that might not be the case if we attempt a near-point re-incursion. We might cause additional crossover ripples, compounding the paradox exponentially. No, we need to run the numbers and plan this carefully. The last thing we need is to exacerbate the situation with carelessness. Lucas didn't like Cleesby's plan. It was going to require too much lead time before implementation, time he didn't think they had. What about sending me much further back, say a year or two, get ahead of the bleedback ripples and make our changes? What do you think, Fuji? Would that work? Quite possibly, Fuji said. Lucas appreciated the monk's semi-vote of confidence. The question is, how far? Before Fuji or Cleesby could answer, the entire lab rumbled around him and Lucas fell to the ground. The glasses went flying from his face, bouncing to the corner. Thirty seconds later, the lab door flew open and Masago ran in. Griffith and local Cleesby were right behind her. Masago looked to the ceiling. Earthquake? Lucas shook his head. That was no earthquake. How can you be sure? Because the same thing happened the first time around, only it wasn't supposed to start until later tonight, though I don't remember it being so powerful. Explain, Cleesby demanded. 
Across the hall, the other me and Drew just ran the experiment and sent the E-121 power module across dimensions and into the future, and if events hold true, they did so at full power. But that would also mean NASA ran their version of the same test at the same time, and did so at a time different than before. So then, the bleedback ripples must have changed the timing of both, making sure they both were initiated at the same moment, just as before. What are the odds of that? Cleesby's mouth fell open, but he didn't respond. Is that bad? Misago asked. Oh yeah, you could say that, Lucas answered, turning his gaze to the professor. The Krellians will detect the signal. Then it begins. What begins? Griffith asked. The invasion. The end of all we know. Powerful energy domes from another dimension will soon appear across the planet, destroying everything in their path. Then, the Krellian sentinels will come through a dimensional rift, kidnap my brother, and kill everyone who's still alive. Oh my god, why didn't you tell me? Masago asked. I was hoping to stop all of this from happening, again. Time finds a way, Griffith said. Lucas was shocked that Griffith used the same words as Cleesby did in the future. Maybe Griffith is the person who taught future Cleesby the phrase. Exactly, Griff. Couldn't have put it better myself. Masago stood motionless, with her eyes transfixed on Lucas. Now I understand, Cleesby said in a slow, solemn voice, while staring at the floor with a glazed look in his eyes. There has to be something we can do, Masago said. Cleesby hesitated, then said, We need to send Lucas further back in time to attempt another correction. Lucas walked to the corner and picked up the glasses. He put them on. Yes, that's what I was just discussing with the other you, the you from the future. Before Lucas could continue, his vision blurred and images distorted. Objects around him began to elongate, with their edges fading in and out like a cloud was floating past. He staggered, and Masago grabbed him by the arm, keeping him from hitting the deck. What's wrong? she asked. Lucas saw a black vertical distortion line appear in the corner of the lab. It began to move left. He pulled the glasses off, but the anomaly was still there and moving along the same path. What the hell is that? Griffith and Cleesby turned in a flash, staring at the corner, then looked at each other. Do you see anything? Cleesby asked Griffith. No, just the walls. You? Cleesby shook his head. The distortion passed through his friends, sending out a wave of pressure that smacked Lucas in the face. When it made contact, Lucas found that the glasses were back on his face, even though he hadn't put them there. He looked at his hand, wondering how the glasses had jumped from his fingers to his nose. But what he saw made him gasp. The middle finger on his right hand was missing above the second knuckle. Holy shit! Masago grabbed his arm again, though Lucas thought she was already holding on to it from before. What's wrong? she asked. My finger! She looked down, but didn't say anything. It's missing! Masago tilted her head. Yeah, I know. He didn't understand. Why wasn't she shocked like he was? Another distortion wave crossed the lab, but this one moved slightly faster than the first. It passed over before Lucas could brace himself. The glasses were instantly back in his hand, and Masago was now standing on the opposite side with her arms wrapped around his waist instead of his arm, like bad continuity in a low-budget movie. Lucas held his hand up and found that his finger was now intact. What the fuck? He opened and closed his hand to check the status of his finger. It felt normal. A third wave of distortion rippled across the lab. Again, it was moving faster than the previous one. The glasses were back on his face, and Masago was standing near Cleesby, whose face was now without a beard, only a mustache. Lucas turned to look at Griffith, but the scientist wasn't in the room. Where's Griff? Griff who? Cleesby asked. Griffith, the man whose lab we're in. I'm sorry, but I don't know anyone named Griffith, Cleesby said. The distortions continued, each faster than the previous, each causing more and more changes. Objects and people came and went, some of them moved or changed in some fashion. Lucas waited for another ripple effect. Instead, a wave of dizziness roared in his head, making him stumble and drop to a knee. He shook his head and blinked, waiting for the speckles in his vision to clear. They did. Griffith ran to him. Are you okay? What's wrong? Did you feel that? he asked, looking at Griffith and then at Cleesby. Cleesby shook his head. Feel what? The professor's beard and clothes had returned to normal. You look as white as a ghost, Griffith said. Lucas scanned the room, but didn't see Masago. He looked at the lab door and back at Griffith. Where's Masago? 
Cleesby moved two steps closer, shooting Lucas a focused glare. She should be still in the truck, right where we left her. In the truck, Lucas answered, feeling a cold numbness swirl around his body. We agreed she should remain in the truck. No, we didn't. That's not what happened. She was right here not two seconds ago. Cleesby flared his eyebrows, but didn't respond. Another ripple raced across the lab. Lucas closed his eyes and waited for the pressure to engulf him. It did. A moment later, someone touched his arm. He opened his eyes and turned his head, finding Masago standing there like nothing had happened. You okay? she asked. Lucas wrapped her in a hug. Not exactly, but I'm getting there. Another distortion passed, and Lucas found himself standing alone and outside on the grassy mall. The warmth of the afternoon sun washed over his face and caressed his skin. He looked around and took in the sights from the buzz on campus. The science building sat off in the distance while the student union rose up in front of him, untouched by the destruction he remembered the last time he stood in this very spot two years earlier. From the northeast, a trio of fast-moving fighter jets screamed over campus in formation, banking left to head south toward Davis-Monthan Air Force Base. Their flight path took them through a spread of strange-looking clouds floating across the sky in an elongated washboard pattern. There was an empty section in the middle that formed the letter X. Motion from his right caught his attention. He looked and saw his younger self pushing Drew in his wheelchair. Young Lucas was wearing a bright yellow shirt, something older Lucas would never have worn, not even on a dare. Older Lucas swung his eyes around and checked the stairs leading to the front of the student union. There were only seven students waiting in front of the theater entrance, not hundreds like before. He surveyed the crowd, but didn't see Drew's girlfriend Abby or her sexy new roommate Jasmine. Not enough people waiting, and not the right time, he mumbled, searching his memory. Plus, the girls should be there, and it happens at night. This isn't it. Before he could draw another breath, he found out he was wrong when a brilliant flash of white light erupted from the area a few feet behind the theater line. Then, time slowed to frame-by-frame -frame action. He watched everything around him creep forward, one second at a time, as the first Krellian incursion began on the steps of the student union. Oh no, not now, he yelled, watching the colors in his vision begin to fade. He turned to yell at his younger self and Drew to get down and protect themselves, but a distortion wave passed over him before he could get the words out. A heartbeat later, he was back in the lab with Masago holding onto his elbow. Griffith and Cleesby were standing where they were before, making him think everything had returned to normal. He waited for more ripples, but they never came. Did you see any of that? he shouted. Masago let him go. See what? Distortion waves, changes to people and things, time slowing, then a flash, Lucas said, grabbing his street clothes from the work table. He stood motionless as his mind whirled, trying to unscramble what he'd just experienced. It was clear the others couldn't see or feel the distortion waves, nor did anyone else notice the changes that the ripples brought with them. Since he wasn't affected, but everyone else was, it meant he was immune to the ripple effects. But why? He put on the street clothes while he ran through several theories, realizing only one of them made sense. The smart skin suit. It carried with it a residual charge after the connection with the glasses. The reserve power must have created some type of temporal shield, protecting him from the changes. It was the only theory he could muster, but it still didn't explain the random flashes of change he'd witnessed. Was he seeing alternate versions of his own timeline, or was it some type of looking glass, allowing him to see twisted versions of the past and future? He wasn't sure. Could be any, or all three. It was also possible the distortions might have been the after-effect of wormholes disconnecting from alternate universes, the very same universes where his copies had originated from. If so, they were showing him the results of various alterations as they were being made to their respective timeline. There was no way to know which of his suspicions was correct, if any, so he decided to let instinct guide him. His gut was telling him that most of what he'd seen was Father Time changing channels, showing him snapshots of alternate realities being created and destroyed as the predestination paradox worked its way further and further back through time. 
almost like it was narrowing down the timeline choices, trying to find the perfect set of events in the past in order to generate the final future. Just then, a phrase flashed in his mind, the narrows of time. But what about the last distortion event, the one that took him in front of the student union where his younger self was modeling an ugly yellow shirt? Why was it the last scene? That fact must be important. Otherwise, all of the craziness he'd just witnessed was simply random timeline static and meant nothing, a conclusion he couldn't accept. No, it must be important. It had to be. He believed the last vision was shown to him because Father Time had finally made a decision. If he was right, then Time had selected the future it wanted by choreographing the past, the past of this Earth. Then, by extension, none of what happened the first time around would hold true anymore. Time finds a way. That's the phrase Griffith used. The same phrase future Cleesby quipped frequently. Lucas was starting to understand its meaning. The order and magnitude of events aren't set, but the future and its predetermined end still arrives as planned, regardless of what has or will happen in the meantime. In other words, you can't change the end result, not if time had any say in it. He turned to Masago with eyes wide. Then he looked at the professor and Griffith, wondering if they'd follow him, no questions asked. He needed them to do just that. If his gut was correct... There wasn't time for a debate. Everyone, come with me, now! Chapter 28 Jesse Donner bent forward, fumbling between the seats of his girlfriend's Toyota Land Cruiser for his phone. He found it before the fourth ring and sat up, bumping his head into the low ceiling. He slid his butt lower in the seat to make room for his tall frame. The caller ID said it was his girlfriend, Cheryl. He swiped the screen with his finger while controlling the steering wheel with his knee. He put the phone up to his ear. Hello. Where are you? She screeched. On Campbell and 6th Street. I'm almost to work. What's up? I need you here. There's an issue at work. Is it that asshole Blake? No, no, no. Blake's off today. It's a regular. Did he touch you? Pull it out? What? It's not that. I need you to handle someone for one of the dancers who used to work here. Do you remember Stacy? A vision popped into Jesse's mind, remembering the stunning bombshell that worked at the club a few years ago. Wasn't she that blonde with the fake tits who could sing? I sort of remember her. Who are you kidding? What? You two flirted heavy every time you came to pick me up after my shift. Don't think I didn't notice. It was just friendly conversation, hon. It was more than that. But that doesn't matter now. She's married. To that scientist guy, right? Or was it the fat landscaper? I can never keep him straight. Griffith, the scientist at the university. We went to their wedding, remember? He hired Alice Cooper to play at the reception. Didn't the hotel manager complain about the noise? That's the one. Best reception ever, from what I remember of it. Griffith had a friend who used to bring him to the club. Oh yeah, that guy. The sweaty lawyer with hands that never quit. Larson, what a slug. He's here now, and I need him dealt with. Why? Stacy called and said he's threatening her and her husband. Jesse stopped at a stoplight and put his head against the headrest. Why is this always my job? It's what you do. Not anymore. I'm a mechanic now. A junior mechanic. You've only been there a month. Sorry, babe, but I can't. I'm still working off the community service hours from the last time you asked me to handle someone. The judge won't go so easy next time. Then don't get caught. I don't know. Need I remind you whose car you're driving right now? Who pays the rent? Who takes care of your little soldier every morning when you wake up hard as a rock? Who brings home girls from the club for you to sample? He sighed. I haven't forgotten. Then handle it. Otherwise, don't bother coming home tonight. Let's see how far that puny paycheck from the Harley shop takes you. The light changed, but the cars in front of him didn't move. Jesse blasted the horn. The man in front of him flipped him the bird. Jesse held up a fist and shook it at him before the line of cars started rolling forward. You're really going to make me do this? For some ex-stripper you hardly see anymore? Watch your tone with me, Jesse. Okay, okay, he said, nudging the turn signal on before moving over to stop by the curb. You need to understand, I've known this girl much longer than you. We go way back, and I owe her, big time. She got me out of some pretty tight spots before she quit dancing to get married. So let me be clear, if I owe someone big, then we owe them big, and we pay our debts, got it? 
Jesse exhaled a slow breath, rubbing his forehead. He swept a swatch of hair out of his eyes. Is he there now? Yeah, Larson's on his fourth round of two-for-one car bombs. He's slurring pretty bad and throwing money around like he's got a suicide mission in the morning. He's been telling the girls he's a former Marine, but I doubt it. Jesse shook his head. If he's spending money like that, your bosses aren't going to want me cracking his head open. Bloody brain matter tends to turn business away, if you know what I mean. Trust me, not a problem. When Stan went to lunch, I broke into his office and unplugged the power to the DVR, so surveillance is off right now. You've got at least a 60-minute window. Get down here now and take care of it. I'll probably lose my job if I call in sick again. There are ten other guys just waiting to take my place. There has to be another way. I love working on Harleys, babe. I know you do, but I need this done. Don't worry about the money. I'll work an extra shift a week and clear more than they're paying you. Then you can go play Desert Commando full-time with your militia buddies. Are you serious? Yes. And there's a cute little college girl who just started dancing here. She has the most delicious ass I've ever seen. I'll bring her home tonight for a little playtime. But I need you to do this for me first. Jesse smiled, feeling his chest tighten. Okay, sweetie. Whatever you need. Jesse walked inside the strip club and sat in the corner behind the bar, studying the dynamics of the environment. He counted seven patrons, all men in their forties or fifties, sitting at various two-seater tables around the club. Four girls were busy giving lap dances, and two more strippers were chatting together by the entrance to the changing room. Two cocktail waitresses were standing in line at the bar's service station, waiting for a scrambling red-headed bartender who was wearing a string bikini and a look of desperation. The bouncer working the door was busy counting bills from the day's tips, and Jesse's girlfriend Cheryl was on the main stage working the pole, with no patrons watching her. Jesse stared at her until she made eye contact with him. She swung around the pole and pointed covertly at the mark. There he was the wiry attorney, Larson. He was sitting three tables from the main stage with an anorexic white chick with a flat chest dancing in his lap. She couldn't have been more than 18 and was busy rubbing his crotch and kissing him on the neck. Larson's hands were all over her body, but she didn't seem to mind. When the song finished, Larson stuffed several bills into her G-string before she kissed him on the lips and turned to walk away. She squealed when he slapped one of her pale ass cheeks, leaving a handprint outlined in pink. Cheryl stepped off the stage with her huge breasts sagging down to her stomach. She was a bit heavier than the other girls, even for the afternoon shift, but she made good bank since she knew how to take care of the regulars who preferred a little more booty. She fit their tastes with a thick middle and heavy thighs that were highlighted by a pair of deep dimples in her ass. She wasn't a runway model by any stretch, but Jessie found her sexy and addicting. It was impossible to say no to her, especially when she brought home girlfriends for him to play with on a regular basis. She knew how to take care of a man, always trying to counsel her fellow dancers on the art of attracting a mate and keeping him begging for more. Men are simple, she'd tell him. Endless food, endless sports, and endless sex. Everything a growing man needs. Jesse watched the lawyer shift his attention from the rail-thin skank's ass to Cheryl's robust booty as she passed. Larson leaned forward in the chair and brought his hand around to slap her ass with a loud crack, making her cheek jiggle. She yelped. Larson laughed. Cheryl glanced at Jesse and gave him a look that said, Get this done already. He gritted his teeth and growled as his blood began to boil. Larson finished one of the two massive car bomb drinks sitting on the table, stood up and started walking in a zigzag pattern with his head bobbing on his neck. He opened a wad of bills in his hand and threw them at the next dancer on stage. He weaved through the tables, almost tripping twice as he walked to the back where the men's head was located. Cheryl made eye contact again with Jesse, cocking her head in the direction of Larson. Jesse took a couple of deep breaths and made his way across the club to follow his target. As planned, Cheryl went up the main stairs to flirt with the bouncer at the front door, keeping his attention focused on her and not on what Jesse was about to do. A minute later, Jesse entered the bathroom and heard the attendant talking to someone. Yes, sir, Mr. Larson. Some asshole or another is always getting in the way, like you say. Jesse rounded the corner by the stalls and stopped to assess the situation. He saw the bathroom attendant in a vest and bow tie staring at the ceiling. 
The attendant's name was Jamie or Joey or something like that. Jesse had only met him once before. The attendant made eye contact with him with lips parted. He was about to speak, but Jesse stopped him by holding his hands out to get his attention. Jesse didn't want the valet to alert Larson of his presence and hoped his hand gesture would make his intentions clear. The man across from him nodded, then closed his mouth, never making a sound. Jesse could hear a steady stream of piss spraying in one of the urinals just on the other side of the stalls. He bent down and checked beneath the area for feet, but didn't see any. The place was empty, except for the attendant and Larson. You're the only one who listens to me anymore, Joey, Larson said, slurring his words badly. Thank you, sir. Fuck those geeks, I say. A man makes his move and then they have to cock-block him for no damn good reason other than to screw up someone else's play. The attendant spoke, with his face still aimed at the ceiling. I hear you, Mr. Larson. It's a damn shame. Jesse moved two steps closer and peered around the wall. He could see Larson from behind, standing at the urinal, holding on to the walls on either side of it, still draining his bladder. His pants were down around his ankles, showing his white hairy legs and pimpled ass. The bathroom attendant was busy running a towel across the sink as Jesse approached him and gave him a twenty from his pocket. The man nodded to thank him. Then Jesse jerked his head toward the door. The attendant sneered at him and shook his head while pointing up with his finger. He wanted more cash to look the other way. Jesse dug through his pocket for more money. Larson was still pissing away at the urinal, oblivious to the money exchange happening behind him. I have half a million bucks and my ass on the line, and then two hacker fuck science camp weasels go out of their way to fuck up everything. I should twist those little shits into pretzels. My buyer will be pissed, and God help me, my brother-in-law will tear my head off and shit down my neck. I'm a dead man walking, unless I can figure out how to pull my nuts out of the vice on this one. Pulling a victory out of my ass. That was my thing back in the core. I told you about that, right, Joey? Yes, sir, you did, the attendant said, waiting with an open palm for more money from Jesse. My boys called it pulling a larson. I was the shit back then. Still am. I still am. Fuck those assholes. I just need time to sort some shit out. Trust me. I'll get even, in a big, big way, I'll tell you what. Larson paused to belch as he continued pissing the whole time. Jesse thought the dude must have been seeing yellow before he went to the head. He found two more twenties in his pocket, pulled them out, and held them in front of the attendant. Joey snatched the money and walked out of the bathroom. Larson never looked back as he continued his drunken speech. Alvarez is going to fucking kill me. I need to just go. Get in my car and fucking go. Disappear with what I have. I'll figure out the rest later. Just need to bring the family. Can't forget them. No, just get away. That's the plan. Grab him and go. Fuck the rest of the planet. Just go. This is the first day of the rest of my whatever. I should have beat that Ramsey kid senseless, then tore that snot-nosed crippled motherfucker a new one. Tell me to leave? Who the fuck do they think? Jesse grabbed the back of Larson's head. Stacy says hello, he said, slamming the man's face into the wall above the urinal, cracking four of the wall tiles in the process. Jesse stepped back, allowing Larson to topple backward, tripping over the pants wrapped around his ankles. The attorney's ass and then his head hit the floor with the full force of gravity. Three streaks of blood dripped from the red smear on the wall. Then a stream of urine rose up from below. Larson moaned, then rolled onto his stomach, pissing on the floor in short spurts. He got up on his elbows with blood gushing from his twisted nose. His poor excuse for a penis finally stopped shooting urine everywhere. He spat out two bloody teeth, mumbled something incoherent, then stood and gathered his pants, cinching them around his waist with a belt that was six inches off center. Jesse grabbed Larson's tie and threw a heavy punch, landing it on the man's cheek. The blow snapped Larson's head around as he stumbled into the attendant station. The drunk's hand skidded across the countertop, sending wire baskets stuffed with mints, gum, condoms, mouthwash, and cologne flying across the bathroom. He flopped onto his back, looking at Jesse with fire in his eyes. Jesse waved at Larson. Bring it, asshole. 
Larson got to his feet, grabbed a paper towel from the dispenser and tore it in half, twisting and jamming a piece into each bloody nostril. He looked like a walrus, a bloody, drunk walrus. He charged Jesse with a commando scream. Jesse stepped aside and stuck his foot out, tripping the man as he flew past him, sending Larson slipping across the floor, skating on his own piss. Larson's shoulder hit the panel of the first stall, making a foot-wide dent in its middle. He fell to the ground and laid there for a few moments before working himself to his feet. He turned, resting his back against the stall for a two-count before he stood erect. "'Haven't you had enough?' Jesse asked. Larson smiled, holding his hands out, giving Jesse a hand signal to bring it. Jesse rushed the bleeding man, intending to drive his back and head into the stall behind him. But Larson changed tactics by stepping back and gripping onto the stall with both hands. He wedged his body against the metal, releasing a hard two-legged kick that hit Jesse in the gut. The force was stronger than Jesse expected, taking most of the air from his lungs as he flew backward, slamming him into the attendance station next to the sink. The back of his head smashed into the mirror above the sink, sending shards of glass into the porcelain bowl. The inebriated barrister came at him, hitting Jesse with three rapid jabs to his chin, chest, and left arm. Larson swung a left hook, but Jesse intercepted it, trapping it between his arms. He used the man's weight against him, tossing Larson into the towel dispenser, chest first. Jesse stood behind him, pounding each kidney with blow after blow, making Larson cry out in pain with each thump of his fists. Jesse moved back to let Larson fall to the ground, then went to kick the man in the face, hoping to end the beating. But on approach, his foot slipped in a pool of piss, and he lost his balance and fell sideways, grabbing onto the bottom of the urinal where Larson had been peeing earlier. Larson grabbed Jesse by the back of the shirt and pulled him to his feet, spinning him around in the process. Jesse put his left arm up and blocked his attacker's right as it headed for his face. An instant later, Jesse fired a hard fist upward with the other arm, blasting Larson's chin from below. Blood and spit shot out of the lawyer's mouth as his head snapped back, but he didn't go down. He looked at Jesse with a look in his eyes, like he was enjoying the pain. Larson charged Jesse again, but Jesse was ready. He dropped to the ground on his back and used his feet to catch Larson's torso, leveraging him into the air as he moved forward. Jesse pushed his legs hard like a spring, flinging Larson past him. Jesse heard the loud crack of porcelain breaking behind him. He stood and turned. Larson was lying on the floor, face down in his own piss, twitching from head to toe. The urinal had been cracked in half vertically down the middle where the man's head had impacted it and water was spraying from its exposed plumbing. Jesse waited for the man to stop convulsing, then grabbed his ankles and dragged him away from the wall and out of reach of the plumbing leak. He turned Larson over and gasped. A jagged piece of porcelain was stuck into the counselor's right eye. He put two fingers to the side of Larson's neck. There was no pulse, and the man's chest wasn't moving. Oh, shit. Chapter 29 Lucas walked briskly out of the revolving front door of the science lab with Masago holding his hand. He scanned the atmosphere, but didn't detect any fighter jets streaking across the sky. He let go of Masago's hand, turned, and faced the science building, buttoning his shirt to cover up the smart skin suit. Not long after the last button was secure, Cleesby, Griffith, and Bruno joined them, each breathing hard from the old man sprint to catch up. Okay, we're here. What's so damned important that you needed to give the three of us a heart attack? Cleesby asked, gasping for breath. I'm redlining here, Griffith added with his chest heaving. He put two fingers to the side of his neck and stared at his watch. Lucas pointed up. That! Each of their eyes followed his finger to the sky. Cleesby shrugged, then bent over at the waist, still trying to catch his breath. Clouds? Am I missing something? Lucas shook his head. Not just any clouds. Look at the pattern. Elongated washboard with an X in the middle, just like in my vision. You're still not making any sense. It's the same formation I saw in my glimpse. I think it's going to happen today, not tonight. What happens? Masago asked. The Krellian invasion. Now? Griffith asked with panic in his voice. He ducked, then his eyes darted left and right. Shouldn't we evacuate campus? Hold on a minute, Cleesby snapped, turning his eyes to Lucas. Let's think this through. Take it one step at a time. 
It's their first incursion into our realm. Last time through this timeline, it began at night, in front of the student union. But my vision indicated the timing has changed. It now happens during the day. Could be right now or in an hour or two. Hard to know for sure. I don't remember the angle of the sun and didn't exactly have access to a clock. But those clouds? They're exactly what I saw. Fractal patterns like those have to be extremely rare. Especially in Tucson, where sunshine rules the weather forecast almost every day. Are you sure you just didn't see them on your way in? It's possible your mind is playing tricks on you. Lucas turned to Masako and pointed up. Do you remember seeing that earlier? Because I sure don't. I'm sorry, I really wasn't looking at the sky. Did the vision show you anything else? Bruno asked. Maybe there's another clue you're forgetting. Was it windy? Any strange sounds or smells? A group of pretty girls? Something that would make this moment unique and identifiable? No, the vision didn't last very long. I was pushing Drew across the mall in his wheelchair, and... Oh yeah, I was wearing a neon yellow shirt. I mean, the younger version of me, the one driving Drew to the Union. Then, a squadron of fighter jets flew overhead and turned south just before the flash came and wiped everyone out. Cleesby and Bruno looked up. So did Masago and Griffith. I don't see any jets, Cleesby said, with rousing skepticism in his voice. His chest was sucking in air half as fast as before. Just because you saw events in your daydream doesn't mean they're going to come true. These formations may just be coincidence, Griffith added. Now, it would be entirely different if the heavens were to open and start pouring red alien blood this very minute. That, my young friend, would be something we could identify as a specific event, lending credence to your prognostication. Lucas exhaled. Yeah, Griff, like that's ever going to happen. What would you call it? Red fall? Red rain? Sounds like a sci-fi channel movie of the week to me, but I see your point. Lucas exhaled. Maybe his friends were right. It wouldn't be the first time his mind showed him things that weren't real. Damn it. I really thought it meant something. Who has a vision like that except a crazy man? Bruno put a hand on Lucas's shoulder, squeezing it. Hey, buddy, we all make mistakes. It happens to the best of us. He's right, Lucas. Stratiforms come and go, allowing our minds to conjure up memorable shapes in them all the time. Don't beat yourself up over it, Griffith said in a soft voice. Masago hugged Lucas. We all know you mean well, but maybe we should get you inside and out of this sun. The medicine I gave you might be making you... Nuts, Lucas said, wondering if she was right. Delirious was the word I was going for. At least the quake was real, Lucas said, wishing he hadn't reacted so quickly. It's the same thing that happened the first time around. I may be losing my mind, but that much I'm sure of. Speaking of which, I need to get inside and check on the reactor. If you're right about that tremor, heads are gonna roll, Cleesby said with a stiff upper lip. Cut him some slack, Professor. They're under a lot of stress, Lucas told him. I know. I've been there, done that, if you know what I mean. I do. I'll take it under advisement. Before Cleesby could take a step, Lucas heard laughing behind him in the direction of the science lab. He recognized the distinctive, boyish laugh. He spun quickly and saw Drew strolling along in his wheelchair from the front door. His heart nearly popped out of his chest when he saw his little brother smiling and happy. It had been so long, he'd forgotten how much he missed Drew. Then, his eyes turned to the person walking with him. It was his younger self. I knew it, Lucas said with vigor. What, Masago said. Lucas pointed at young Lucas. Yellow shirt. Cleesby, Griffith, and Bruno all turned. Uh, that can't be good, Griffith said. He wasn't wearing that earlier when he checked in, Bruno added, sounding confused. Masago put her hands on her hips and tilted her head. He must have changed, silly. People do change clothes from time to time. Or the timeline changed after one of those ripples. There's no guarantee you're still in the same timeline as before, the professor said. So now what? Bruno asked. Lucas didn't hesitate. He started walking toward Drew and Lucas. Cleesby grabbed him on the elbow, stopping his departure. Lucas, you can't just walk up to him out of the blue. What's he going to think when he sees himself? I realize that, but we have to stop them from going to the Union. Bruno stepped forward. I got this, boss. They'll listen to me. Cleesby looked at Lucas. With your knowledge of future events, where's the safest place to be right now? Anywhere but here. The Krellians target major metropolitan areas first. I suggest we get out of town as soon as possible. We can take my brother's truck and go to his compound in the desert, Masago told Cleesby with excitement in her voice. It's a long drive northeast from here, but he'll protect us all. Cleesby nodded at Bruno. Get all four kids out of here. You go with and keep them safe. What about you and Griff? Lucas asked. We'll head underground. 
Cleesby put a hand on Griffith's back. You and I have calls to make. We need to get this place evacuated. Whatever you need, Professor, but I need to call my wife first. What about your mom in Phoenix? Masago asked Lucas. Shit. Been so long I forgot about her. Do we have the time? Bruno asked. We'll make the time, Lucas shot back to his friend. Round trip, it's four hours. Not with the way Masago drives. You can cut that estimate in half, dude. Masago smiled. Fasten your seatbelts, gentlemen. Cleesby stuck out his arm, using it to keep her from walking away. He looked at Lucas. No, I'll send a team to pick your mother up and take her to the underground silo. She'll be safe there. Silo? Griffith asked. I'll explain later. Let's get moving. We've got work to do, Cleesby said, before walking away from the group. Griffith followed him, two steps behind. Where'd you park? Bruno asked Masago. In the back. It's a lifted F-250. Can't miss it. All right. You two wait here while I go break the news to our younger friends. I'll signal you when it's safe to join us, Bruno said. Lucas scanned the sky with his eyes. Fine, but hurry up. If those jets fly overhead... Got it, Bruno said, not waiting around to hear the rest of Lucas's warning. Lucas spun the bracelet Masago had given him around on his wrist. His mouth ran dry and his chest tightened when he thought about the pending Krellian invasion, the meet-and-greet with Masago's brother Rocket, and the awkward ride-along with his younger self and Drew. Chapter 30 Rocket Fuji climbed the wooden ladder to the top of the three-story observation tower erected at the south end of his prepper compound. He had the rectangular structure built to face southwest toward Tucson, giving his team a wide-angle view of the nearly flat terrain wandering off for as far as the eye could see. Another perch stood on the north end of his property. However, with the Catalina Mountains to the east and Tucson to the south, this lookout was the more strategic of the two. His heart dripped with concern after the recent inspection of the mountaintop where the Apache helicopter attack had taken place. All that was left behind were random patches of blood and more questions than answers. It was doubtful he'd ever learn the identity of those who were the target of the military's rage, but one thing was certain. Tensions and suspicions were now at an all-time high, not just with him and his men, but with the rest of those in the know about the event. He'd checked the news, but there was no mention of the massacre. Typical, he thought, recalling something his father had preached to him years earlier. Those in power control the flow of supplies, and that includes the flow of information. Even before the ruthless attack, he didn't trust the government or its willing siblings, the military-industrial complex, and the liberal media outlets. Might as well lump in the general public as well. The world was teetering on collapse. He could feel it in his bones, nagging at him like a wrinkled old wife. His trust was only safe in the hands of his family and in his dutiful men, the loyal few he'd vetted and trained. Any sign of my sister? He asked Zed Bradshaw, his number two in command. Not yet, Zed said, panning the digital binoculars from left to right, never taking his eyes from them. Are you sure? Trust me, I'm sure. Your truck's hard to miss, even from this distance. But almost everyone else is here. All we're missing is the new guy. Cannibal? Said lowered his hands and gawked at Rocket with a snide look on his face. Yep, the very same. Are you surprised? Not in the least. His shift wasn't supposed to start until tonight, but he should have received the activation alert by now. Everyone else did. Of course, that's assuming he's carrying his cell phone, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I do. He's a huge man with a tiny brain. He'd better be on his way. If not, then so be it. Zed was the cleanest man Rocket had ever met. He was always fussing about his clothes and appearance, which included razor-short hair with gray patches on the side and olive skin that reminded Rocket of silky smooth cocoa butter. Zed was only 32 years old, but premature gray ran in his family. So did his balanced temperament, which made him an effective, well-respected leader. Rocket counted on him for tactical assessment and training of the team, especially the new recruits, and felt fortunate to have such a prideful warrior at his side. Rocket took the glasses from Zed and scanned the landscape beyond his property. The red targeting square flashed and darted around the screen, but failed to land on an object worthy of focus. Except for a few low rolling hills that seems oddly out of place against the endless brown, all he could see in front of him was dirt, brush, and cacti. No threats of any kind. 
A towering dirt devil was wreaking havoc a few hundred yards away, but other than the swirling funnel, there was no movement. He was starting to worry about his sister. She should have been back by now. After all, how long does it take to drive into town for some feminine products and return? Damn it, where the hell are you, Masago? Missing your truck? He nodded. I still remember the day my old man took me shopping for my 16th birthday and let me pick out any truck I wanted, as long as it was a Ford. Junior was sitting in the front corner of the lot next to one of those huge blow-up figures. You know, the giant Gumby-looking thing that bends and dances around in the wind like a drunken sailor on leave? Zed laughed, but didn't say anything. We've been through a lot together, and never once has he failed to start. Not once. 200,000 miles, and Junior still barreling along like he's fresh off the assembly line in Detroit. I put on every one of those miles myself. Every single one. At least until now. This is the first time we've ever been apart since the day I drove him home from the dealer. I'm sure he's in good hands. You haven't seen my sister drive, he scoffed, his mind playing a vision of Masago spinning wicked donuts in the sand. Bit of a lead foot, is she? That's an understatement, he said, giving the glasses back to Zed. Continue on and stay alert. Roger that. Zed put the glasses to his face, looking out across the property. Rocket's mind drifted to thoughts of his sister and the war games they used to play across the sprawling desert. Usually, the scenarios ended with a verbal spat, mainly because Masago was a high-spirited chick with her own rhythm and approach to everything. Her beliefs were deadpan strong, as were his, yet they still couldn't seem to find common ground when it came to the ideology of being prepared for the end of days. Dad had preached the same dogma to both of them, but somehow, the words resonated differently within him than it did with his sister. In the end, it didn't matter whether they agreed or not. Their blood ties ran deep, and nothing could or would ever change that. If there was one thing he'd learned during his years of government torment on this rock, it was that a happy family unit was not predicated on universal, like-minded thinking. In fact, differences in opinion strengthened the group, though it was a bit exhausting at times. He turned to make his way down the ladder, but froze when he heard a powerful roar of thunder coming from the northwest. The handrails of the platform they were standing on began to vibrate in his fingers as the sound grew progressively louder with every beat of his heart. He looked up and scanned the sky for the source. It took a few seconds, but his eyes finally locked onto three fighter jets screaming his way, leaving a trio of exhaust trails behind them. Here comes Uncle Sam, Zed said, while the planes ripped closer through the atmosphere, making a slow, banking turn south. Rocket realized they were on a high-speed intercept course with his location, meaning it would only be seconds before they arrived. Not enough time to sound the alarm and evacuate. He wasn't worried, since this wasn't the first time they'd been visited by the Air Force. Nothing hostile had happened in each of the previous four encounters, and he had no reason to think this time would be any different. Fast movers. Been a while. This should be interesting. Looks like F-16s. Must be tasked with checking us out again, Zed said, putting the glasses down. Just like last month and the month before. Count on it, Rocket said with certainty. They know we're here. NSA watches everything with their birds orbiting this shithole of a planet. Yeah, well, fuck them and the horse they rode in on. The planes leveled their wings and angled their noses sharply lower, as if to start a strafing run. A few seconds later, they made a low-level flyby of the camp. Rocket ducked and grabbed onto a safety rail. So did Zed, as the platform shook violently from the turbulent shockwave. When the jets passed directly overhead, their pilots kicked in the afterburners, injecting fuel into their exhaust systems to supercharge the flaming thrust. The roar was instantaneous and deafening. The kind of roar that sends chills down your spine in awe. It was an impressive show of power and speed, but not one rocket would let himself enjoy. Fucking 355th. What a bunch of adrenaline junkies, Zed said with contempt. Maybe so, but this wasn't some random flight path. They were sent here with a message, Rocket said, flipping the bird at the aircraft, zooming away, apparently heading for downtown Tucson. What message? Zed asked, taking his Glock from its holster to check the chamber and magazine. We haven't forgotten about you? And we haven't forgotten about them. If my father was still alive, he'd say we should bug out and relocate. You're not considering that, are you? No, never. We stand our ground, right here and right now. Let them come. They have no idea what they're up against. No, they don't. 
This is our land, and goddammit, nobody is going to force us from it. I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees, fucking fascists. Do you think it's time to activate your sister's tracker? Rocket hesitated, considering the idea before he answered. I'd hate to waste the battery if she's not within the transmitter's ten-mile range. Unless she's at her bunker, we're going to need to move a whole lot closer to Tucson first, and you know how much I hate that frickin' town. You ain't the only one, boss. It's too bad we didn't think about installing a permanent locator in Junior. Would have had a much stronger signal. How could we have known? This is the first time she's ever asked to take my wheels for a spin, Rocket said, sifting through his options. He wanted to go search for his sister, but there was a camp full of people to protect, too. Which would it be? The needs of the many, or the needs of the one? His one. It was a tough call, but he made a decision. No, we stay here and mind the fort. Masago knows this is the rally point. She'll show up when she's good and ready. She can handle herself, trust me. Just then, a massive, blinding dome of light pierced the sky near the horizon. It was located in the same direction as the jets were flying, indicating that whatever had just happened was centered somewhere near Tucson. He blinked, and a second later, the dome's intensity was gone. What the hell was that? Rocket gasped, trying to organize his thoughts. A dozen scenarios flashed in his mind, making the hairs on the back of his neck stand at attention. The flash was amazingly bright, especially for the daytime. He'd never seen anything like it before. His worry level shot up tenfold. Did they just light up Tucson? Zed asked. Nuke civilians? Are you serious? It was too big to be an industrial explosion or a plane crash. So what else could it be? If that's true, where's the mushroom cloud, the shockwave? No, you're right. Not a bright boy. I don't know what we're dealing with, but that was no explosion. Otherwise, we'd see smoke and hear something by now, Rocket said, turning all his thoughts to his sister. He felt Zed put his hand on his back. Then his friend leaned in and spoke in a soft tone. Now do we go find her? Rocket nodded, letting his heart take control. Let's stop at her place first. It's on the way. When you gear up, be sure to grab the buzzer and make sure it's charged. We may need it. Watch out! Lucas felt a twinge of pain in his knee as he yelled from the front passenger seat of Rocket's truck, watching Masago narrowly miss a pair of teenage girls running across the street with shopping bags in their hands. His mind was still reeling after they'd all just witnessed the initial dome of energy take out the student union. His greatest fear was now a reality. The Krellian invasion had started, and done so ahead of schedule, at least according to the original timeline. Are you trying to hit these people? He asked her. Everyone just needs to get the hell out of my way, she yelled, swerving to miss more pedestrians, taking the truck onto the sidewalk. She jammed on the gas, squealing the tires in the process. The front bumper caught a stand of newspaper vending machines, sending the periodicals flying in the air before the tires found the street again. What was that thing? Young Lucas said from the back seat, still wearing his bright yellow t-shirt. The wide-eyed scientist was sitting next to his brother Drew, with their friend Bruno hogging up the far end of the seat. Drew jumped into the conversation. Some kind of explosion? But why no sound? Lucas from the future turned in the front seat and leaned over the headrest, locking eyes with his younger self. When you ran the experiment a little while ago, and did so without permission, I might add, did the E-121 module vanish without a trace? That's classified, Drew answered. The hell it is, future Lucas snapped, slamming his hand against the seat. Masago flinched, making the truck swerve for a second before she corrected it. Calm down, boys. I'm trying to drive here. That's what you call it, young Lucas said. Who said that? Masago asked, glancing over her shoulder. Lucas 1 or Lucas 2? That depends. Who's 1? Drew said. Front seat is 1. Back seat is 2, Masago said. It was two, Bruno told her, sitting next to Drew, though I'm sure they're both thinking the same thing, as am I. I'm starting to sense that, Masago said, leaning to her right to make a corner at high speed. I'd prefer to be called Lucas Prime, Lucas One said, like in Star Trek, plus it's how you should label the first, and I am the first, the original, but not one of a kind, Lucas Two said from the back. Fine, whatever, she answered, with her eyes focused on the road ahead. Once again, Lucas Prime trained his eyes on Lucas II in the back. You can't keep the truth from yourself. I know, I've tried. What? Lucas II asked. I already know it vanished, remember? Lucas Prime said. Go ahead, Bruno, tell him. Oh no, I've already been through it once with him in front of the science lab. It's your turn. 
This whole from the future thing is a little hard to believe, Lucas II said, pushing the face of Prime away with his hand. Okay, Einstein, what else can explain my presence here, Prime said, leaning back over the seat again. Cloning, for starters, or a plastic surgery, or some random anomaly in the gene pool. Everyone has a twin, right? After all, there are billions of people on the planet. Statistically speaking, it is possible. Unreal, Prime said, rolling his eyes. Besides, your scars are different. If you were from the future, my future, they'd look precisely like mine. Scars fade, but they don't change location. That's true, Bruno said. Why are they different? Long story. Let's just say I had my mug fixed, then it got jacked again. Now the scars are different. Does that work for you? Prime asked his younger self. No, they're just words. Say what you want, but there's no way to prove it. That's not entirely true, Drew said. He looked at Bruno. Do you have your Benchmade with you? Benchmade, Masago asked. It's a brand, Prime answered her. Brand of what? Bruno leaned to the side and put his hand into the front pocket of his pants. He pulled out a dark gray four-inch folded pocket knife. He gave the knife to Drew, who then passed it to Lucas too. Careful with that. I keep it razor sharp, Bruno said. Lucas too held the knife up. What do you want me to do with this? Use the blade on your arm. Let's see what happens, Drew told him. Lucas too's eyes lit up. Are you serious? You want me to cut myself? Do you want proof or not, Prime said, or are you a chicken shit? Fine, I'll do it. He opened the blade and held it in his right hand, then pressed the edge against the skin on his left forearm. He winced and let out a deep moan as he pulled the blade toward him, opening a bloody inch-long gash in his arm. He gave the knife to Drew and covered the wound with his palm. Blood seeped through his fingers and ran down his arm. Fuck, that hurt. Drew pointed at Prime's arm. Okay, let's see it. Prime held out his left arm over the back seat. There was an inch-long scar exactly where Lucas II had just cut himself. He sneered at everyone in the back seat. Anything else? Prime waited for an answer, but only quiet was heard from the young Ramsey brothers. I'll take that as a no, he said, before flying sideways against the window when Masago turned sharply again. He righted himself, then pointed at Drew and his brother. You two assholes caused that flash. Yeah? How do you figure that? Drew asked. You're the asshole, asshole, Lucas too said. Guys, Masago yelled. Lucas Prime ignored her. When you cranked up the power, the E-121 was sent across time and space. It penetrated another dimension and caught the attention of a predatory race, who then sent a probe here to investigate. Its incursion into our space is what just took out the student union. A lot of people died today. That's why I'm here, trying to stop all of this. Looks like you failed, Lucas II told him. No, I didn't fail. We did. Just like before. Only this time, things are different, both in the past and in the future. Now you're talking in circles, Lucas too said, looking at Bruno. You believe any of this shit? The professor did. That's good enough for me. Fine. So now what? Young Lucas asked with a smirk on his face. A swarm of energy fields are going to attack Earth, destroying everything and everyone in their path. Probably soon, if I'm trending the changes in the timeline correctly. Millions of people are going to die unless we pull together and find a way to stop this. You need to listen to him, boys, Masago said, never turning around to speak. He's telling the truth. Prime spun forward and sat down in the front seat, hanging his head. He let out a long, slow groan. Masago rubbed his leg. What's wrong? I just realized I'm wasting my breath. Why? If Fuji sends me back earlier and I'm successful, then none of this will ever happen. Why am I wasting energy in this timeline trying to convince a stubborn me to listen to what I have to say, when everything is going to be replaced with a different reality anyway? Don't you still need their help? Not really. I have the glasses and the suit. Just need to get someplace safe so I can make contact and get the hell out of here. So, if you go back in time, what will happen to me? Will I remember you? Or us? Chapter 31 Rocket Fuji stood in front of Masago's mountain complex, staring at the rubble and debris pattern. The egress hatch and connecting tunnel were gone and buried, leaving only a pile of destruction and a set of ultra-wide tire tracks in the dirt. The tread pattern was distinctive, a knobby waffle board pattern, those of the tumbler, that led away from the area. What do you think happened? Zed asked. The facts smacked Rocket in the face, even though they didn't make sense. 
This didn't just happen, otherwise we'd see signs of my truck tires in the dirt. She must have detonated the place earlier and took off in the tumbler to come see me. But why didn't she tell me about this when she came to get Junior? She knows she can trust me with anything. So what the hell happened? Maybe the blast was accidental, and she was embarrassed to tell you, Zed said, crouching down to inspect something in the dirt. No, that's not it. She's hiding something. But what? Rocket answered, moving closer to Zed and looking over his shoulder. Zed pointed at two sets of footprints, one set significantly larger than the other. I think it's a who, not a what. A boyfriend what? I find that hard to believe. My sister wouldn't know what to do with a set of cock and balls. Zed laughed hard. I don't know. If I was her and you were my brother, would I really want to tell you about a new man in my life? Out here, in bumfuck Egypt? Sure, why not? She obviously wasn't under duress, otherwise she would have said something when she was alone with us. So, these prints must belong to a friendly. The question is, how friendly? Yeah, fuck you too, Rocket said. He shook his head, thinking about his sister's decision to bring a stranger into the family compound. His father never would have approved. Well, if she met someone, it was in town. Definitely not out here. Then she may be getting a taste for city life. You may be right. If that's true, it worries me more than her shacking up with some random dude. Rocket swung his eyes around to take in the sprawling outline of Tucson, sitting off in the hazy distance. Looks like a road trip. I was hoping we could avoid that. Me too. But where Masago goes, we go. 10-4, Zed reported, starting the 20-yard walk to where they'd parked the tumbler. Snap, pop, crack. Rocket froze, turning his attention to a heavy stand of desert brush on his left. The sounds came again, this time louder than before. He realized they were too loud to be made by a rodent or some other four-legged animal. A two-legged creature was approaching. He pulled his sidearm from its holster, racked the slide to inject a forty-five caliber hollow point round into the chamber, and pointed the weapon at the tall thicket. Zed must have heard the noises too. Almost instantly, he was on Rocket's flank with his weapon drawn and in the firing position. Identify yourself, Rocket yelled, keeping his eyes sharp and his shoulders hunched. The beat in his chest was no longer measured and quiet. Neither was his breathing. An adrenaline-charged tremor washed over his hands, making it difficult to keep the gun sight steady. Zed moved two steps to the left, tracking his gun with precision as he searched from point to point, waiting for a target to appear. Don't shoot! Please! I'm unarmed! came a male voice from somewhere inside the foliage. Rocket tightened the grip on his Glock Model 30, moving his finger from the slide to the trigger. We have you surrounded. Come out slowly with your hands up. No sudden moves, or we'll kill you where you stand. Okay, okay, hold your fire, the man yelled in a desperate, somewhat feminine voice. More branches and twigs snapped, sending Rocket's blood pressure into overdrive. Anyone else in there with you? he asked, taking a deep breath and letting it out slowly to calm his nerves. It worked. The gun held firm on the center of the vegetation, precisely where he wanted it. No, just me. Nobody else. I'm coming out. A few seconds later, a pair of hands made their way out from the green, followed by legs and a tiny body wearing a face that seemed familiar. Rocket scanned the trespasser's appearance, studying the contour of every detail for facial recognition. His brain searched its memory files for a match, Small stature, sculptured nose, weary dark eyes, Asian descent, soft cheekbones, tiny hands, shaggy black hair, shoulder length, and a swatch of recessed age lines painting his forehead. Just then, a familiar name came to him. His heart wanted to call it out, but his logic vetoed the idea after it couldn't reconcile what he was seeing or feeling. How could this be? Then... Without warning, his lips spoke on their own. Dad, is that you? Yes, Rocket, it's me. Riku Fuji? Zed asked the stranger. Yes, Dr. Riku Fuji, to be exact, the one and only. All at once, Rocket felt the muscles in his chest and abdomen tighten. He wanted to run and hug his old man, but his feet wouldn't move. Something was holding him back. I thought you were dead. No, son. I've been held in captivity since the night I left you and your sister, but I'm back now. Can you please secure your weapon? It's me, son. Rocket lowered the Glock without thinking, focusing all his thoughts on the war raging within. Heartache and anger had just squared off in a battle for supremacy, and he wasn't sure which one of them would win. K-4, 
captivity? Who? Why? Rocket asked his father with shortened breath and a dry mouth, trying to make sense of the situation. Riku lowered his arms and held them out, waist high. An evil, sadistic man named Starling. He forced me to create technology to further his empire, but I escaped. Escaped? How? I used my technology against the men holding me, and with the help of another prisoner, I was able to flee and make my way here. On foot? I hitched part of the way, but I would have gladly walked barefoot across a thousand miles of toxic wasteland and broken glass to see my children again. Only one thought was driving me. Get home. Rocket's anger waned. Where's this other prisoner now? We split up once we were clear. He needed to go in search of his people, and so did I, Riku said, brushing strands of his stringy mop from his face. He pointed at the rubble. What happened here? Where's Masago? I'm not sure. I just arrived from my place and found her bunker like this. But don't worry. I'm pretty sure she's not inside. She came to my place earlier and borrowed my truck. I think she's in town. Her bunker? Your place? Riku asked in a concerned, fatherly tone. Rocket dropped his eyes to the ground, not wanting to admit he broke his word to his father. He was supposed to watch over his sister and keep her safe, not run off and play survivalist with his half of the family's money. Yes, father. We split up. When it was clear you weren't coming home, I moved out and sold my half of the Gold Eagles to fund my own operation. Riku's eyes sharpened and his face turned a deep shade of red, but he said nothing. Rocket thought his old man's head was going to explode in anger. He needed to soften the detonation. I know I let you down, but I thought you were dead. The stress of you not coming home took a toll on the two of us. I should have stayed like I promised, but I had to get out of here. Just too many memories, and I needed to get on with my life. When I looked for a property to buy, I made sure it was relatively close so we could stay in regular contact. If she needed my help, all she had to do was call, though she never did. You should be proud of her, father. She's a better person than me, and perfectly capable of taking care of herself. That may be true, but family is family, and Fujis stick together, no matter what. I'm very disappointed in you. You gave me your word. Rocket sighed, letting his pride slip away. Despite all his training, weapons, and personal strength, they were no match for the stinging words of his father. They cut through his defenses like a red-hot laser slicing through steel. His dad always seemed to know exactly what to say and how to say it, breaking him down and commanding respect. Fathers must have that innate power over their sons, he decided. Maybe it was a genetic ability, or perhaps it was all part of some divine master plan passed down and honed over the millennia. Either way, he was worried his response was going to make him look weak and vulnerable in front of Zed, but it wasn't going to stop him from saying what he needed to say. I'm sorry, father. I truly am, but I don't know what else to say. If I could travel back in time and do it all over again, I'd do it all differently. Just give me a chance. I swear I'll make this right. Doubtful. You can't unring a bell, Riku said. Pointing at Zed, he asked, Who's this guy? Zed Bradshaw, my second in command. Zed nodded confidently. Heard a lot about you, sir. You know my rules about outsiders, Riku snarled at Rocket, folding his arms across his chest. You can trust him. He's a stand-up guy and a believer in the cause, too. He came here with me to find Masago. Zed straightened his posture, taking a firm stance in the dirt. I stand at the ready, sir. Whatever you need. Riku hesitated while his eyes wandered for a bit, obviously thinking things through. Rocket expected this level of cynicism from his old man. It wasn't the first time, or the last, but he'd manned up and offered his apology, and it would just have to do for now. There were more important issues at hand. He made firm eye contact and switched to his confident voice. Did you see that intense flash earlier, in the direction of downtown? What flash? Riku asked without hesitation. I take that as a no. Trust me, it wasn't something you see every day. You didn't answer my question, Riku asked. Neither did you. Get to the point, son. It was damn far away, possibly near downtown Tucson, but yet it was still massive and bright. It only lasted a second or two and wasn't followed by any sound or signs of smoke. I'm guessing you were on your way here and had your back turned. Obviously. If Masago's in town, like I think, then we need to find her. 
Sort of my point, Dad. Earlier, there was a low-level Air Force flyby of our camp on their way to Tucson. Then we saw a massive flash in town, and it looked like it was directly under their flight path. I don't know what's going on, but if we're looking at some kind of attack or a prelude to a military occupation, things could get out of hand quickly. If it escalates, it's only going to bring the worst out in every survivalist, militant, and prepper in the area. The desert's filled with them. I agree. Where do we start? Riku asked. Thanks to your son's quick thinking, we planted a GPS tracker on your daughter, but we'll... Need to be in range to pick up its signal, Rocket said. If she's in town, we have to head there now. Riku's face tensed. No, we activate the device now, just in case your sister is not where you think she is. Let's pray that's the case. Roger that, Zed said. We can't cover much ground alone. How many men do you have? Riku asked. Plenty, Rocket told him, trying to decide how many men he should task and search for his sister. At first thought, his heart wanted to send them all, but his logic took over and reminded him he had a duty to protect those in his camp. How many do you think we'll need? He asked his dad, hoping the number was small. Otherwise, he'd have to debate the decision with his old man, wasting even more time. I'd suggest, Riku said, stopping in mid-sentence with his mouth hanging open. He pointed at the horizon. Are those what you saw earlier? Rocket spun his boots in the dirt and saw three brilliant white-colored objects off in the distance. Again, they were in the direction of Tucson, but this time they didn't blink out after a second or two. They were pulsating and shaped like massive domes. Hell no. This is something new. We need to move. Now! Chapter 32 Lucas Prime couldn't believe his eyes when they locked onto three brilliant objects out the back window of Masago's truck. A trio of energy domes had just spawned in sections of the city they'd just left behind. He pointed from the front seat, trying to get Bruno, Drew, and Lucas II's attention. Shit! It's already started! Everyone in the back seat spun their heads and shoulders. Lucas II gasped. What the hell?! Faster, Masago. Faster, Bruno yelled. I've got it floored now, she yelled back. This is as fast as this beast goes. What are they? Drew asked. Krellian energy domes, Lucas Prime said. What? Drew asked. You've seen them before? Lucas too asked, now with a makeshift bandage wrapped around the self-inflicted gash in his arm. Drew had cut a strip of his t-shirt off to make the wrap and tie it around the gaping wound. Oh yeah, many times. Even had one of them chase me. What are they doing? Drew said. They're sucking up everything in their path, pulling matter into their universe for processing. This is how it starts. This is what I was trying to stop. Oh my god, Masako yelled. All those poor people and children. An invasion, Lucas too asked with a steady voice. An extinction. Jesus Christ, why? Because you ran the experiment without permission and did so at full power. Me? I'm responsible, Lucas too said. Yes, you and NASA. Haven't you been paying attention? This is what I've been trying to tell you this entire time. Yeah, I heard you, but I thought you were exaggerating, you know, to get my attention and drive home a point. Prime turned to Bruno. Was I really like this? Bruno shrugged and nodded, almost as if he was embarrassed. Prime dropped his head for a moment, then locked eyes with the security guard again. Wow, I'm sorry. What's NASA got to do with this? Drew asked. NASA built technology very similar to yours. When you powered up your reactor, so did they, amplifying the E-121's incursion effect across spatial dimensions. Those bastards, they stole our ideas? I'm afraid so. Since you lived these events before, you know what's coming next, right? Bruno asked Prime. Not exactly. What the hell does that mean? Lucas too sat forward in his seat. Events are different this time, both in the future and in the past. A predestination paradox, Drew added, with a touch of excitement in his voice. I'm right, aren't I? Prime nodded. Yes, the bleedback effect seems to be intensifying as I move forward in this time thread. What do you mean, intensifying? Bruno asked. The list of changes is growing, like what we're seeing now. The first time around, the energy domes didn't appear right away. The Krellians used a slow rollout, spread over days. It's almost like something is controlling the timeline now, speeding it up. How is that possible? Masago asked from the front seat. I'm not sure, but I get the feeling Father Time is trying to stay ahead of me, Prime replied, wishing she'd keep her focus on her driving duties and not be distracted by the discussion in the back seat. He looked at Drew, hoping the timeline copy of his younger brother could add some insight to the discussion. Drew only shook his head slowly. 
So this all revolves around you? Bruno asked. That's what I was told. By who? Masago asked from the driver's seat. Master Fuji, your great, 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 whatever, a little over 400 years from now. Lucas, too, tapped Prime on the arm. I think I remember reading a thesis that suggested time passes at different rates in each universe. Something about the flow of time is not a baseline constant. Could that have something to do with this? Actually, it wasn't a thesis, Drew said to Lucas, too. It was a guest lecture Dr. Cleesby gave last year in Phoenix at ASU. We tagged along with him so we could swing by and visit Mom afterward. We sat in on it together, remember? It was pouring rain during the drive up there. Oh yeah, you're right. That was the day the fat chick in the front row totally lost her cookies. Vomit everywhere. Lucas Prime didn't remember the lecture in his version of the timeline, and wasn't sure if the missing lecture was a good thing or not. As it turns out, Cleesby is correct. Of course, since he's actually from a different universe where time does proceed faster than here, he already knew his theory was correct. A different universe? Drew asked. Prime shot a concerned look at Bruno. Damn, I wasn't supposed to disclose that, was I? Bruno turned to the brothers in the back seat. Just forget you heard that, okay? Drew shrugged. Lucas too rolled his eyes. Prime continued. One thing I've learned the past couple of years is that the future and the past are not set in stone, though they tend to end up exactly where they intended, even if you attempt to make changes. More circular logic, Lucas too snapped. He threw his hands up and shot a hard glare at Bruno. We gonna listen to this, wacko? Yes, we are. Now keep quiet unless you have something useful to add, Bruno scolded, turning his eyes to Prime. What's the plan from here? Same as before. We get to Rocket's camp and out of harm's way. Then I contact my people and have them send me back earlier to fix this. What if more of those energy domes appear? Won't we still be in danger? Drew asked. If the pattern holds true, their initial focus will be on densely populated areas and military bases, high-value targets. I doubt Rocket's compound will fit into that category. I'm pretty sure we have some time, Prime said, swinging his focus to Lucas too. As long as nothing happens to you, otherwise I cease to exist. If you're correct about the future and past being set on a collision course with a specific destiny, how will you be able to travel back and fix the timeline? Lucas too asked. He turned to Bruno, not waiting for an answer. See, something useful. Prime cleared his throat, making sure everyone was focused on him and listening. They were. I haven't worked out all the details yet, but future Cleesby and Master Fuji should have the answers. They usually do. Somehow, some way, we're going to stop all of this from happening once and for all. We just have to target the correct anchor point. Prime felt the truck climb an incline, then leaned to the left as Masago navigated the dirt road. He gripped onto the back seat, keeping himself secure while looking at Drew in the back. Guys, we have a problem, she yelled from the front seat, hitting the brakes hard. Prime lurched forward, slamming his back into the dashboard. When he spun around in the seat, he instantly understood her concern. The road was blocked by three flatbed trucks, two Jeeps, and a Dodge Ram pickup. Every vehicle was painted using desert beige camouflage colors. At least two dozen men stood with assault rifles pointed at Masago's truck, each wearing tactical gear, helmets, goggles, boots, and chest rigs with ammo pouches. Back up, now! Bruno shouted from the back seat. Masago jammed the stick shift into reverse, then looked over her shoulder and out the back window. Looks like they have us surrounded, she shot back, never stepping on the gas. Prime whipped his head around. She was correct. Four more vehicles had pulled in behind them. The man in the middle of the roadblock ahead stepped forward, aiming his assault weapon at the F-250. Exit the vehicle with your hands up. I won't ask again. What do we do? Drew asked. We get out with our hands up, Lucas too answered. What about me? Drew asked his brother. My wheelchair's in the back. You're just going to have to stay low until I can get it for you. You can't just leave me here. I won't. Just stay out of sight until we figure this out. But don't worry, bro. It'll all work out. Even these animals aren't going to shoot a disabled kid. You can't know that, Masago told him. I'll carry him, Bruno said, patting Drew on the back. Right, little chief? Drew nodded with a petrified look on his face. Prime looked at Bruno. These guys don't look military. Bruno shook his head. Not with those vehicles. Looks like militia to me. With all that's happening in town right now, you can bet the area's crawling with them. You recognize any of them, Masago? Why are you asking me? I thought they might be friends of yours or your brother. Never seen them before in my life. The armed leader fired a single round from his rifle into the air. That was my last warning. You have ten seconds to surrender. Then we open fire. Everyone in the truck stepped out, except Drew, who was being carried in Bruno's arms. I said hands up, the leader screamed. That means everyone.
Drew put his hands up, but Bruno couldn't, not with his hands full. Drop the boy, now! He's disabled and can't walk on his own, Bruno told him. His wheelchair's in the back of the truck. Secure them, the leader commanded his men. Then search for weapons and ammo. Six men moved closer, taking positions in groups of three on each side of the truck. They pushed and shoved Bruno, Prime, and the rest into a tight circle ten feet in front of Masago's truck. Bruno bent down and put Drew on the ground. He repositioned himself and stood in front of the group, puffing his chest out. He didn't take his eyes off the leader. What do you want? The leader ran his eyes up and down the guard's body, focusing the longest on Bruno's duty belt and equipment. I hate cops. I'm campus security. Even worse, a rent -a cop I demand to know why you stopped us. You're in no position to demand anything, the man said, stepping back and turning his head to the southeast. Prime looked in the same direction. A moment later, he heard a faint noise that was growing louder. It was the distinctive, heaving, chopping sound of military helicopters. Obviously, they were not in whisper mode like on the mountaintop when he'd first arrived. Incoming! One of the armed men screamed, grabbing a cohort by the arm and tugging him toward a flatbed truck. Spread out! Another one yelled, sprinting to a defensive position behind the closest jeep. Bruno turned to the group and whispered, Get low. When I signal... Everyone crawl behind Masago's truck. Understand? Prime nodded. So did Masago and the Ramsey brothers. Alvarez? Masago asked Prime in a soft voice. That'd be my guess. I'm sure the energy fields in town have activated all civil and military defenses by now. You can bet the Air Force and National Guard are on high alert. Why focus on us? She asked, as more of the men standing watch scrambled away. Who's to say that's what they're doing? Could be on their way to somewhere else. Probably fly right past us. The sound of the rotors continued to chop louder, making Prime rethink his last statement. He looked in the direction of the noise, waiting to see if the helos would appear overhead or fly past in the vicinity. But he saw nothing, realizing it's impossible to judge distance and destination from only the echoing, thundering sound of the choppers approaching. As soon as the last armed captor stepped away to hide behind one of the vehicles, Bruno turned and gave the group a follow-me wave. Everyone crawled behind Bruno, inching their way around the back end of the truck. Bruno was the first to arrive next to the driver's door, then Drew, Masago, Lucas too, and finally Prime. They huddled together like a bush family, trying to generate body heat during winter in Alaska. Now what? Masago asked Prime in a whisper. Before Prime could respond, he heard a high-pitched buzzing sound whipping about his head. He swung his hand at the noise, trying to shoo the insect away or kill it. He didn't care which. However, the noise continued. First, it annoyed one side of his head, then moved to the other side. Finally, it moved in front of him and held its position six inches in front of his face. It was staring at him, with its tiny wings fluttering. Prime raised his hand to swat the insect, but Masago stopped him, grabbing his arm and pulling it down. No, don't. That's my brother. What? Are you nuts? It's his microdrone. Look at it. See the tech? Prime leaned in for a closer look. Oh, yeah. Amazing. A mosquito cam. I've heard about microdrones, but never saw one up close. Rocket must be here somewhere, she said, as a massive grin took over her lips. I hope he brought help. We're gonna need it, Prime yelled at her just as the helicopters arrived, the sound of their engines and rotors now at almost a deafening level. Bruno took a peek through the truck's window. Apaches, six of them. Armament? Prime asked him. Bruno nodded. Hellfires. Prime inched up and peered through the glass. The aircrafts were hovering above a rise several hundred yards to the south. What are they waiting for? He asked Bruno. Provocation. Right on cue, the gang of roadblockers fired their automatic weapons at the choppers. A moment later, the warbirds opened fire with their 30mm chain guns, tearing apart one of the flatbed trucks and both jeeps. We can't stay here, Prime yelled at Bruno, seeing the insurgents getting pummeled from above. Over there, Bruno said, pointing at a ravine about 50 feet from the road. He picked Drew up in his arms and ran toward the depression. Lucas, too, followed close behind, bending over at the waist and keeping his head down as his legs pounded the desert landscape. Your turn, Masago told Prime. No, ladies first, he told her. Go, now. She kissed him hard on the lips, then took off. So did the tiny drone, buzzing its wings behind her. 
He watched her run for a two-count, but then the F-250's bed and cab took fire from the thundering chain guns as metal ripped and glass exploded. He ducked his head and pressed his body closer to the ground, hearing round after round hitting the vehicle, sending chunks of the truck into the air like shrapnel. Prime began his sprint using a two-handed, two-legged, modified dog crawl, pushing his limbs as fast as they would go. He expected to feel the searing pain of a supersonic projectile tearing off a hunk of his body, but it never came. Somehow, he made it through the hailstorm of death, reaching the rest of his crew safely. He dove headfirst into the ravine, landing in the dirt next to Masago, who was lying on her back. Bruno was to his right, and the Ramsey brothers were on the other side of him. Prime couldn't hear the microdrone. It must have flown off or taken damage in the escape. Prime righted himself, but felt a sticky wetness on his hands. He looked down and saw that they were covered in blood. He panicked, checking every inch of his legs, chest, arms, and head. He let out the breath he was holding in his lungs when he realized the blood wasn't his. He looked up and locked eyes with Bruno. A dread-filled chill covered his skin when Prime realized Bruno's face was covered in tears. His rotund friend had his hands together, pressing down on Drew's chest. The boy had been hit and was coughing up blood. Lucas, too, was sitting in a ball with his back against the inside edge of the wash. His hands were wrapped around his face, wearing an intense look of shock. No, 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 Prime screamed. Chapter 33 Masago grabbed Prime by the shirt collar and shook him hard, hoping to snap him out of his emotional shock. It seemed to work. He was no longer staring at Drew's bloody chest. She pointed at the smart skin suit hidden underneath his clothes and waited until his teary eyes connected with hers. They finally did a few seconds later. She spoke in her most serious tone, making sure he heard every word clearly. You need to go back in time now. You can't wait any longer, Lucas. We're not going to be able to get someplace safe and plan this out. You have to fix this right now. Drew's losing a lot of blood, and those helicopters are probably going to kill us all. Call your friends and get this done. He nodded, then looked down and ran his hands over his body. He looked up at her, his eyes bulging in panic. The glasses. They're still in the truck. Where? She asked him. On the floorboard in front of my seat. I put them down when we ran into the roadblock. Get out of your street clothes now. I'll be back in a flash, she told him, before climbing out of the gully and sprinting toward what remained of Rocket's beautiful truck. The back half of the F-250 was now a pile of twisted metal, and the rear tires had been blown off. The top of the cab was missing, making it a shredded convertible. However, the seats and dashboard looked to be somewhat intact. She pushed her legs faster and harder, hoping to complete her task before the helicopters turned their guns away from the firefight with the insurgents and took another run at killing her and her friends. She made it to the driver's door, unharmed by staying low and moving fast. Her body rose up to the top of the door, allowing her eyes to peer at the choppers. They were still elevated over the rise and engaged with the armed men. As far as she could tell, they hadn't noticed her movement. The driver's door had a few bullet holes in it, but she thought it might still open. It took everything she had and multiple yanks on it, but she managed to force it open. She crawled inside and noticed that bits of glass and metal were scattered across the bench seat. She kept her head low and moved slowly, praying the men in the helos wouldn't notice her activity. She avoided the glass as best she could. The middle of the seat was now under her belly, allowing her to scan the floorboard in front of Lucas's seat. The Google Glasses weren't there, just broken glass and other debris. Maybe Lucas was wrong? Maybe he didn't leave them on the floor? She decided to check under the seat. Her hand went in and immediately hit something sharp. She yanked it back out. The tip of her finger had been cut and was oozing blood. She stuck the wound in her mouth and sucked off the blood, then pulled it out and checked it. There was a vertical rip in her skin, but it didn't appear to be very deep. Masago put her hand under the seat again, this time moving slowly to avoid more cuts. Her fingers found something a little farther back under the seat. Its shape and contours felt familiar. She pulled it out. It was the Google glasses. Lucas must have knocked them under the seat when he hopped out of the truck earlier with his hands up. She reversed course, sliding her body across the seat, back the way she'd come. First her legs dropped down, and then her stomach and chest as she cleared the door. 
She spun around and focused her eyes on the ravine, keeping her back to the vehicle. The top of Lucas's head and his eyes were peering over the edge of the ravine. She held the glasses up to show him what she'd found. He gave her a furious wave to get moving and bring him the glasses. Masago took a deep breath and steeled herself for what she was about to do. Just as her feet took off running, the pitch of the aircraft engines changed behind her. Before she could complete the fourth stride of her sprint, three things happened at the same moment. A searing hot pain ripped through her left arm, blood splattered across the side of her face, and the sound of rapid gunfire exploded around her. Masago lost her balance as a force propelled her body forward and twisted her sideways. She kept her feet long enough to flop into the ravine, landing in a heap next to Lucas with her right arm holding the glasses in the air. She gave him the Google glasses, feeling the world start to spin. Her eyes were growing heavy, and she was starting to breathe erratically. The gunfire seemed to ease a bit, making it easier for her to hear. Lucas's eyes were focused on the left side of her body. The expression on his face told her something was wrong. Masago's been hit, he called out to the group, hoping they could hear him over the helicopters and gunfire. Where? Bruno screamed back. She looked down at her left arm. It wasn't there. All that remained was bloody strings of tissue, yet the pain was missing. She wanted to cry out, but her mouth wouldn't move. Upper arm, what should I do? Lucas said. Wrap it up in a tourniquet, now, a voice commanded. However, it wasn't coming from Lucas, nor was it from Bruno, who was still tending to a bleeding Drew. Lucas Prime twisted his body and grabbed at his discarded pile of street clothes, yanking out the cotton shirt. He tore a strip of cloth from its midsection, then brought it forward. Before he could apply it to her body, a new pair of hands appeared from the left and snatched the material from Lucas. "'Who the hell are you?' Lucas asked the man, grasping at the strip of cloth, but he missed. Masago looked to her left, trying to focus her fading eyesight. A face came into view. She recognized it. "'Rocket?' Yes, sis, I'm here, he said, never taking his eyes from her bleeding stump. He was hunched low next to her, and the front of his shirt was covered in a layer of dirt. He must have been crawling on his belly. Jesus Christ, Rocket said, as his hands worked fast, twisting the wrap around the mess that was her left arm. She could feel the pressure of him working on her, but there was no pain. What are you doing here? she asked him in a weak voice trying to save you. Now be quiet and let me work, he said, looping the cloth around her wound a second time and pulling it tight. He made an over-under knot with the two free ends, tying off the flow of blood. Another man appeared behind Rocket. His chest was also covered in dirt. She studied the face of the long-haired Asian man. When her memory told her who he was, a rush of adrenaline charged her body. Daddy? she asked, feeling the loneliness in her heart melt away. She smiled, forgetting for a flicker of a second that she was fighting for her life. Hi, sweetie. His voice was shaky. Tears streamed from his eyes. What did they do to my beautiful baby girl? I'm sorry, she said in a weaker voice than before. For what? he asked, gently putting his trembling hand on the soft of her cheek. She'd forgotten how gentle his touch could be. I messed up. Don't be mad at me, Daddy. Please. I could never be mad at you, my dear sweet little angel. He put his finger to her lips. Shh. Save your strength and let us get you out of here and somewhere safe. I've missed you so much, she said, with her lips touching his finger. She turned her head and put out her right arm. She grabbed Lucas by the elbow and pulled him close. Go. Now. Fix this. Go where? Rocket asked, staring at the smart skin suit. Who is this guy? What's going on here? He's my boyfriend, she told her brother, feeling a wave of dizziness slam into her, but it passed just as quickly as it arrived. Your what? Help him, please. The firefight between the insurgents and the helicopters stopped, leaving only the whine of hovering engines and blades. Masago swung her eyes up and to the right to follow the whirl of rotors, looking to the sky beyond Lucas. Two helicopters were circling around, probably to get into a better firing position. Hurry, she told Lucas. Lucas nodded and put the glasses on. He touched the earpiece and spoke into the device. Fuji, come in. I need an emergency reincursion, and I mean right now. Is the system charged? Good. It's about time. I don't care. Pick one from the list. Just do it fast. I don't have much time. Whatever. Just do it now. The suit began to glow a few moments later, just as the helicopters turned their noses a few more degrees to complete their wide-angle loop around. 
The choppers dipped their considerable armament, picking up speed as they approached the desert wash. Masago pushed Rocket away with her good arm, realizing that only seconds remained before the warbirds would open fire. She rolled to her knees and threw her body in front of Lucas Prime, just as a torrent of rounds left the powerful chain guns. Before she could take another breath, she felt the overwhelming sting of flesh and bone being ripped apart across her chest and face. Chapter 34 Lucas felt his essence push through the fabric of space-time and arrive on his knees somewhere in the past. Dizziness swirled in his head and nausea in his belly, making it difficult to think. His empty lungs began to take in air, gasping a series of short breaths, seventeen to be exact, until the oxygen levels normalized in his body. He took the Google glasses off, rubbed his eyes, then looked down at his smart skin suit. The power shutdown sequence was in progress, giving off an ever-fading yellow glow until the residual energy drained away from the nanocircuitry. His mind was still reeling from what had just happened, Masago's arm getting shot off, and then her throwing herself into the line of fire to protect him. Then there was Drew, lying in a ravine, bleeding from a horrific chest wound. Lucas felt a wave of panic rise up inside. Nothing was going according to plan, and everything he tried just seemed to make the timeline worse. He took a moment to shake the disturbing images from his thoughts and flush the sickness swelling within. It worked, allowing him to focus and get himself together. His inner strength bubbled through the heartbreak and rose to the surface. He vowed to press on until he found the correct anchor point in his history and made things right. There had to be an answer to all of this. Somewhere. Everyone was counting on him. Everyone across multiple universes and across all of space-time. He felt his anger rise, supercharging his body with adrenaline. Fix the past, then none of the future will happen, he mumbled, with anger fueling his words. A string of new questions quickly burned. What anchor point did Fuji select? How far back did he travel? Where the hell was he? A bright section of white stretched before him, making his eyes water. It took a second to register, but his knees were on a sidewalk that bordered a residential neighborhood landscaped with mature bushes, grass, and towering trees. The sun was about an hour's distance above the horizon, and based on the heat level and the lack of dew in the grassy yard closest to him, he figured it was late afternoon. Early mornings in Arizona had a very distinct aroma, at least until the sun had a chance to dry everything out. His nose took in a deep rush of air. It didn't smell like morning. He ran a quick visual check of the driveways closest to him. There weren't any newspapers sitting on the cement. Yes, he was correct. It was late afternoon, and he was facing north. He thought about opening a communication link with Fuji and Cleesby, but decided against it. It seemed prudent to save the power until he actually needed it. Right before he removed the glasses, the battery reserve indicator showed only 11% remained. He needed to first determine where and when he was, then make a plan before checking in with his friends. Otherwise, he might have to do it twice, wasting the remaining power and jeopardizing the mission. Lucas put his hands on the concrete below, pushing his body to its feet, but he didn't remain erect for long. His back was sore and knees buckled, sending him south until the cement collided with his knees. Despite the wave of pain, he held the scream inside, not wanting any sound to leave his lips in case someone was nearby. Stealth was a priority. He wanted his arrival to go undetected. His eyes darted across the area, checking for witnesses. The only person he saw was an elderly man, six houses behind him and on the left side of the street. The senior citizen had his back angled partially sideways to Lucas and was holding a maroon-colored garden hose, watering the lawn. Lucas checked the front windows of the homes closest to him, but didn't see anyone looking at him. No cars were moving either. He let out a partial smile, realizing his arrival may have gone unnoticed. It was time to stand up again, or at least try. He pushed to his feet, wondering if his legs would hold this time. They did. He ignored the stiffness in his back and was able to walk, though his pace was uneven and slow. 
As he continued, the balance and speed of his stride improved with each step, eventually returning to normal. There were vintage cars sitting in some of the oil-stained driveways along the way, each with an Arizona license plate above the rear bumper. Two of the vehicles had University of Arizona bumper stickers, confirming he'd arrived in Arizona and in Tucson, as expected. Each of the anchor points coded in Fuji's system were targeted for this same city, meaning the pre-programmed emergency incursion system worked as planned. The older model cars were a positive sign of an arrival further in the past, but not conclusive. He needed a few more corroborative facts before he could declare this reincursion a success. The sidewalk curved its way around to the right and ran adjacent to a massive ten-story parking garage across a traffic-filled road. The rectangular open-air structure looked busy, and its perimeter spaces were packed on the first three levels, yet the remaining floors appeared to be mostly empty. His feet began to move faster when he noticed a sign over the parking garage entrance that said, Tucson Medical Center Parking. He knew where he was. Now, the question was, when? An advertising billboard stood a few hundred yards away with a woman with puffy hair and pink cheeks. She was holding a phone receiver with a spiral cord attached, and her mouth showed a set of perfect white teeth. Under her smiling mugshot was block text that read, AT&T lowers long-distance rates by 5.6%. He continued to the intersection, where he found a series of newspaper vending machines chained to a pole that was holding up a pair of payphones. He found the dispenser for the Arizona Daily Star, bent down and looked through its sun-bleached glass. The paper's headline declared in bold lettering, Fall Orange Crop Rot Still Haunts West. To the right of the main article was a picture of a young, serious-looking Harrison Ford. Above his face was the word witness in red lettering. Lucas remembered the hit movie starring Kelly McGillis as the Amish girl. His eyes drifted up the page and found the date. February 12th, 1985. His chest filled with a mixture of excitement and trepidation when he realized when and where he was. He also knew his task for this reincursion. Find a way to stop Drew's birth mom, Lauren Falconio, from driving home after her shift at the hospital tonight. Tonight was the night she'd get into a horrific car accident. The same accident that would take her life and Drew's legs. If Lucas was successful, Drew would never become an orphan, never lose his mobility, and never be adopted by the Ramsey family. That also meant Lucas would never become best friends with Drew, nor would they grow up together as foster brothers. The road ahead was difficult, but he was willing to make the sacrifice. It was the only way he could protect Drew in the future, and probably Masago and everyone else, too. First order of business, find some street clothes. Running around town in the smart skin suit was going to get noticed. He passed another neighborhood and an alley on the right as he approached the stoplight, keeping his eyes open for a source of clothing. Several car tires were sitting inside the alley's dirt entrance, but what caught his eye was the blood-red fur and animal guts covering the pile— it appeared a medium-sized dog had met its final destiny, having been torn apart and left to bake in the Arizona sun. A pack of coyotes must have wandered into town and attacked someone's pet. It was a gruesome scene, looking like someone had sprayed the rubber with red. He pressed on. He stepped into the crosswalk at the stoplight, planning to head for the stairs leading to the upper levels of the parking garage. He knew the University Medical Center had a fitness center for employees, and the staff was assigned reserved spaces in the parking lot. There would also be hundreds of visitor cars to check as well. It was possible someone kept a change of clothes in their car, something he could borrow, assuming luck was on his side today. He needed to score a pair of pants, a shirt, and of course shoes that fit, though footwear might be a little harder to come by. Some aspirin would be nice, too, since his sore back was still nagging at him. Once he was across the street, he came upon a young Asian woman with a stroller waiting at the bus stop. She was humming a lullaby to a toddler sitting in her lap. The kid was wearing a pink jumpsuit and a matching hat that covered the ears. The child turned its almond-shaped eyes and looked at him. Lucas smiled, then gave them both a friendly nod. They went that way, the mother said, pointing. I'm sorry, what? The rest of your group? What group? He said, stopping his feet. 
the bald guy, and the other two wearing the same outfit. It's not Halloween, so what are you guys, some kind of band? Or a fraternity prank? It must have taken a long time to sew all that gold thread so perfectly. A vision flashed, taking him back to the mountaintop right before General Alvarez opened fire. The angry, bald Lucas and the others streaming toward him. Shit! he snapped, not realizing he was speaking out loud. The woman covered her baby's ears with her hands. Hey, mister, watch your language! Sorry, my bad, Lucas told her, feeling awful for letting the curse word slip. She hugged her child, who was still staring at Lucas with her jet-black pupils. The mother's voice turned soft and gentle. I'm sorry you had to hear that, M. Bad language is a no-no, especially for a little lady. You don't want me to have to wash your mouth out with soap, like I did for your brother. I don't know what I'm going to do with that boy. The girl turned her plump cheeks away from Lucas and looked up at her mom. The child started to fuss, waving her arms and letting out a series of half-syllables like babies do. Shh, Em, it'll be okay, the mother said, grabbing her kids' hands and playing with them. The child calmed a bit, then spoke a single word in her cute, tiny voice. Walk it. Yes, Em, we'll go pick him up at daycare as soon as jury duty selection is over. Jury duty? Em, walk it? Was walk it the child's version of rocket? Could this be Masago and her mother? Didn't Masago say her mother ran off with a bailiff from jury duty? If so, then Masago saw me as a baby. Maybe that's why she's been so obsessed with me all her life. It would also mean this chance encounter happened before. Some version of it, anyway. He considered staying to talk with the young mother and learn more, but decided against it. If the baby was Masago, the last thing he should do is get involved. With everything he knew about her and her family, it seemed likely they were only supposed to meet briefly in the past. Before he could resume his trek to the hospital, eight rounds of time distortion waves hit the area. Each time, pressure hit his body as objects and people around him came and went, including Masago's mother, the baby, and the bus stop. However, just as before, the final wave set everything back the way it was before the anomaly started, with Masago sitting in her mother's lap. He needed to get moving, and that's what he did. His feet picked up speed as he considered the ramifications of what he'd learned. Somehow, three Lucas copies must have been pulled to the past with him, again. He didn't know if they were the only copies still alive in the future, or only a few of those still breathing. If only a few, then why them and not the others? What made them unique? He couldn't be sure, not without more information. Even so, he could assume their cells had been linked together across the fabric of space-time, which is why they were tethered each time he traveled back in history. But he didn't understand the purpose and timing of the distortion waves, and why the versions of him hadn't arrived on the same street as he did. That's what happened the first time around, even though the 200-plus copies had arrived first. He figured the difference was due to some type of interdimensional targeting malfunction, or possibly an unexpected bump of stellar drift. Yes, an unexpected bump. That was it. The Milankovitch cycle. The variances in the Earth's orbit due to the endless gravitational interactions during each astronomical session of 41,000 years. He must have traversed across an additional wobble in Earth's orbit, something not accounted for in Fuji's calculations. After all, stellar events weren't measured as precisely in the early years of NASA. He made it up the stairs and into the garage, starting his search on the third level. He knew most parking garages would fill up first on the lower levels, meaning the cars parked above were owned by visitors and employees who had arrived more recently. He wanted to check the upper floors first, less of a chance to be caught in the act by a returning owner. The first car he peered into was a four-door Buick, gray in color, with paint peeling across its hood. He checked the back seat, then the front, but didn't see any clothes. He moved on to the next car, then the next, until he spotted what he was looking for sitting on the front passenger seat of a Ford Ranchero, a pair of worn jeans, and a college t-shirt. The driver's window was partially rolled down, allowing him to stick his slender arm inside and grab the door lock. He pulled it up and opened the door. The dome light flickered on while he sat inside and closed the door behind him. He checked the jeans. The tag said the pants were for a 30-inch waist. A little big, but the length looked correct. 
He leaned back in the driver's seat, angled his legs up, and put them on. He did the same with the red t-shirt, then searched the back seat to see if there were shoes or a belt he could use. He found neither, and decided to get out of the car and keep searching. It took another 20 minutes, but he came across a dented Chevy pickup with a stock of painter's gear in the back. He noticed a pair of slip-on sneakers tucked loosely under a spree of empty paint cans and a well-used aluminum ladder. The shoes were lying on their side and covered in paint splotches, but appeared to be about the right size. He grabbed them and moved to the rear of the truck, where he planned to save some wear and tear on his back by using the tailgate as a chair while he tried them on. His hand went in search of the tailgate release, but the handle was missing. There was a yellow and red bungee cord in its place. It was hooked from end to end across the outside of the swing gate to keep the tailgate upright and closed. He removed the cord and let the tailgate drop, then spun and sat down to slip on the crusty shoes. They were stiff and not very comfortable, but they fit. He stood up and decided to try looping the bungee cord around his waist and using it as a makeshift belt. It worked. He took a moment to consider his ensemble. Smart skin suit covered by a pair of worn jeans, red t-shirt, painter's shoes, and a bungee cord belt. He felt like Jethro from the Beverly Hillbillies. His attire wasn't much of a fashion statement, but what did it matter? When you travel back in time to change the past, nobody will care what you are wearing when you change history and save the planet. Two slender men in scrubs approached Lucas. He thought about ducking behind the truck out of instinct, but changed his mind when the men never looked in his direction. He waited until they passed, then followed the overhead signs to find the exit and make his way into the hospital through the emergency room's entrance. The ER was packed with patients waiting to be seen. Some looked sick, others were clearly injured. Every chair was full, and there were also people standing in the corner near the drinking fountain. He knew Drew's mom worked in the ER, and if that fact still held true, then he'd need to come up with a plan to locate her. Her face was unknown to him. That's assuming he believed the professor about the fake photo in Drew's pouch that always hung around his neck. He figured it was best if she didn't know he was looking for her until after he had a plan to stop her from driving home tonight. That meant he couldn't ask anyone for help, otherwise they might tip her off. Lucas studied the name tag of each person he passed, a roving herd of doctors, three tired-looking nurses, and various other hospital staff. In modern-day medicine, most in the medical field went by their first name only to protect their identity from stalkers. But in the past, that wasn't the case. Last names were on every ID. He wandered the halls around the ER for at least an hour, but never found anyone with a name tag of Falconio. As time passed, he started to notice more and more eyes following him. He suspected his presence was making the busy staff a little curious and quite possibly nervous. He wondered how long it would be before an armed security team appeared with jittery hands and tense attitudes. He decided to suspend his search, hoping to lessen the growing attention. Ahead of him was an overhead sign that directed visitors to the cafeteria. Time for a break, he decided, walking ahead at full speed. It had to be close to the dinner hour, and if he remembered correctly, Lauren's shift ended later at night. If he was right, he had time to kill before she'd drive home. Dinner session meant a busy cafeteria and a hungry crowd. He should be able to blend in and not draw too much attention to himself, even in his hillbilly ensemble. Lucas glanced back to see if anyone was watching him as he neared the first corner. He swung his head forward and took the corner sharply, slamming into someone an instant later. He spilled across the tile floor, and so did the other person, sending a folder with paperwork high into the air. A shower of white pages floated down and around Lucas as he rolled over and pushed to his knees. A long-haired, bearded man wearing a physician's coat was lying across from him. His ID said Dr. Starling. The man grunted, then sat upright, allowing their eyes to meet for a second before the doc's weary face turned south. He grabbed onto his right knee, wincing in pain. Sorry about that, Lucas said, feeling a twinge in his lower back. Are you hurt? Do I need to get a doctor for you? I am a doctor, and no, I don't need any help. Lucas began scooping up the papers from the floor. Stop, the doctor snapped, yanking the sheets from Lucas. I think you've done enough already. 
Lucas stood and stepped back, trying not to make the situation worse. Look, Doc, I said I was sorry. I don't have time for this nonsense, Starling snarled, never looking up. He tucked the last of the paperwork into the folder, with the edges sticking out in random directions. He moved to his feet and stumbled for a moment when his right leg took on his weight. He winced. Seriously, let me get you some help, Lucas said as he tried to get a better look at the scraggly man's face. But Starling kept his head down and eyes turned. Lucas thought he looked familiar. The doc shot Lucas a quick sneer before limping off in a huff. A few seconds later, Lucas felt a double tap on his shoulder. Welcome to the club. Most everyone here has been given that same look at one time or another, a woman's gentle voice said behind him. He turned and gazed at a stunning brunette wearing a nurse's uniform. Her perfect olive skin and enchanting hazel eyes with flecks of green made him hold his breath. He stammered, unable to find his voice for a second. It... it was an accident. I tried to apologize and offered to get him some help, but he refused. Don't take it personally. Dr. Starling is always in a bit of a snit. Lack of sleep, I suspect, or stress. He's a unique bundle, to be sure. Or his beard is on too tight, Lucas added. For some reason, he felt compelled to make her laugh. Isn't there a law requiring physicians to own a razor? She laughed before her face turned serious again. That was quite a tumble. Are you hurt? I'm fine, but I'm pretty sure I jacked the doc's knee. But thank you for asking, nurse. He looked down at her ID. Falconio? He'd found her. Lauren Falconio. And wow, Drew's mom was a knockout. Another nurse cruised by, this one a 200-pound smiley woman with a 60s-style bun, rosebud cheeks, and caked-on layers of uneven makeup. She was in her 50s and whistling an upbeat tune he didn't recognize. Lucas thought she was going to zip on by, but after she made eye contact with him, she stopped and looked at Lauren with a furrowed brow. "'Is everything okay, dear?' the round woman asked Lauren. "'Yes, Gwen. Why?' Gwen took a step back, clearing her throat. No reason, except I heard that Dr. Starling asked you to work another double today. That's what, eleven in a row? Yeah, I'm totally beat, but I need the money. The bills never stop, so I can't either. You need to take a break once in a while, Gwen said. She touched her hand to Lauren's cheek. You look tired and a little pale. Have you eaten anything today, sweetie? Not yet, but I'll grab something from the cafeteria before I head home. Okay, dear, but you need to keep your strength up. Can't have you falling asleep on the job. Just promise me you'll eat before you leave. I will, I promise. Thanks for always watching out for me. That's what friends are for, dear heart. Do you need me to help you with your son again tonight? I appreciate the offer, Gwen, but I've got it covered. He's at a new after-hours daycare I just found. Isn't that expensive? A little, but I always feel bad having to ask you to watch him for me. I don't mind, really. You know Roger and I are there for you. I know. Thank you. But I wanted to give this place a try. Like you said, everyone needs a break once in a while. I understand, dear. Next time, then? Sure. That would be nice. Toodaloo, Gwen said, waving a flabby arm. She glanced at Lucas before she took off down the hall with a determined bounce in her step. Lauren swung her eyes to Lucas and smiled. He couldn't stop staring at her. It was clear now where Drew had gotten his boyish good looks. His mom was a total drop-dead gorgeous fox. He took in a couple of short breaths before his mouth continued on without his brain. Falconio, that's an interesting name. Is it Italian? She gave him a look that screamed, no shit, Sherlock. But her voice told a different story. Yes, but I'm thinking of changing it to something more generic, like Johnson or Smith. You know, to keep the creepers at bay. Like the Nabisco delivery driver that came in last month with a broken arm. I thought I was going to have to get a restraining order. You know the type. Lucas nodded, but kept his lips locked together. She continued, Falconio is pretty rare and easy to track down. I'd need to change my son's name too, but he might not be okay with it when he gets older, losing one's heritage and all. Where I come from, hospital personnel no longer use their last name. They go by first name, Nurse Lauren. It helps protect their identity from those creepers you mentioned. That's a great idea, she said. I'm going to suggest that change to the board next time they hold an open forum. Glad to help, he said, looking away for a few moments. This was Drew's mom, and he needed to get his mind out of the gutter. His mental redirect worked. Her eyes focused on the floor for a second, then back to Lucas. Hey... Wait a minute. I don't remember telling you my first name. 
Shit. Lauren was right. Now she's going to think I'm one of those creepers she mentioned. His heart started pounding at double its normal rate while he ran through several explanations until he found one he liked. You didn't, but the other nurse did. She paused. That's right, she did. You had me worried there for a second. Lucas needed to change the subject, not wanting her to ponder his lie. If she did, her memory might betray him. He tried to think of something to say, but his words came up dry. Are you sure you're okay? You seem a little shaky. I'm good, thank you, but I really need to get moving. It was nice meeting you, Lucas said, walking away. His head wanted to turn and take one last look at her, but he kept his eyes forward. She'd taken enough notice of him. Until he could devise a plan to alter events in this time period, something inside of him told him he needed her to move on with her day and forget she ever bumped into him. He hadn't planned to interact with her on this trip, other than to stop her from driving home somehow. But a covert intervention might not be possible now. She knew his face. Crap. What was I thinking? Chapter 35 Lucas sat with his back to the wall in a corner booth of the hospital's cafeteria on the third floor, pretending to be reading a newspaper. He picked this particular booth based on the lack of people around and the direct lines of sight to the main entrance, the cashier, and the buffet line exit. The closest group was eating four tables away, though the booth next to him had just been vacated by a young blonde woman and her three obnoxious kids. He was thankful when the noisy family finished their meal and took off. However, they never bothered to take their food trays and empty glasses to the collection station. They just left everything sitting on the table like a bunch of hillbillies. He wondered how long it would take for the lone custodial woman with gray hair, rubber gloves, and support hose to make her way over to the vacant booth and clean it off. His eyes swept the area, keeping watch for Lauren Falconio's expected arrival. Earlier, she'd told Nurse Gwen in the hallway that she planned to eat before heading home. At the time, Lucas knew he couldn't keep wandering the halls or loitering around outside, not without drawing the attention of the security staff. So, he decided to take up residence in a booth and wait for her. But that was two hours ago. Now, he was growing concerned Lauren wasn't going to stop in for a snack as planned. He needed her to keep her promise to Gwen, allowing him to sit down with her while she was alone and not pressed for time. He still wasn't sure how he was going to convince her not to drive home tonight, but he had to find a way. The end game was simple. Keep her out of the car accident that would take her life and Drew's legs, allowing his foster brother to grow up healthy and happy and never be an orphan. Then he and Drew would never meet in the state home, and they'd never be adopted by the Ramsey family. No Ramsey family meant no attending college together. No college would forever change the timeline and keep the E-121 experiment from being run a second time. The logic was sound, but he needed to sacrifice his future with Drew to stop the end of the world. Lucas felt a tinge of emotional pain swelling inside. He needed to be strong. For Drew, for Masago, for Cleesby, for everyone across the multiverse. It all came down to this moment in time, and he couldn't let his personal feelings get in the way. But what if Lauren didn't show? Then what? If she did, what would happen if she wouldn't listen to him? What if Drew's mom thought he was nuts and called security? He needed a backup plan in case he couldn't convince her of what was about to come. Let's face it, other than a chance meeting in the hallway earlier, she barely knew him. She had no reason to believe anything he said, let alone change her plans for the evening. He couldn't just delay her drive by a few minutes, not with the way the timeline seemed to be auto-correcting. He needed to be sure, and that meant stopping her from driving home completely. How the hell was he going to do that? He couldn't lead off by telling her he was from the future and was the adopted foster brother of her tiny son. How would that sound? The more he thought about it, the more ways he imagined her seeing him as a complete lunatic. Maybe he should just steal her car instead, or disable it. Either of those ideas might work. But he didn't know what car she drove. He'd have to follow her out of the hospital and into the garage, then surprise her from behind and demand the keys. They didn't teach carjacking at the university, so he'd have to work this out on the fly. But what if she noticed him creeping around behind her? 
She was already on high alert after the event last month with the Nabisco driver, and would certainly have her head on a swivel. He also had to be prepared in case she fought back, or drove off before he could take the vehicle from her. What if she carried a gun? He pictured her reaching under the driver's seat, pulling out a three fifty seven, and blasting a hole in his forehead. It was a possibility. After all, this was Arizona, and many citizens carried a gun, especially a single mom with a high-risk job. If Lucas chose to believe the ramblings of the local news in any time period, Arizona is the wild, wild west, and everyone has an itchy trigger finger. He shook his head, realizing there was an endless list of things that could go wrong, each one more troubling than the last. Then a new idea came to him. What if he threw himself in front of her car? Whether he survived the impact or not, there was a high probability it would delay her plans, sending a charge of adrenaline into her system and stopping the accident from ever happening. She's a nurse who's bound by ethics to help those in need. If she followed protocol, she'd stay with him until help arrived, then hang around with the police, answering questions and filling out paperwork. If he was right, she'd call Gwen and ask her to pick up Drew from daycare, thus avoiding his brother's whole mangled leg scenario, and Lauren would still be alive. A double win for Drew. Lucas was starting to like the idea, except for the part about being roadkill. He was a fan of quantum entanglement, but not quantum entanglement with a steel bumper. The impact would be painful, and the timing had to be perfect, assuming he could convince his legs to step in front of a speeding car willingly. The problem was he'd still need to follow her out of the building and to her car, running the risk of being tagged as a stalker. If he somehow managed to avoid detection, then he'd have to quickly deduce her exit path through the garage and sprint to reposition himself. He'd need to choose a secluded location where she wouldn't see him until it was too late to stop, and she'd need to be traveling at a speed sufficient to cause injury. Plus, he figured he needed a second or two to mentally prepare himself for the bloody meet-and-greet with the grill of her car. Or truck. He scoffed, calculating his chances of success. All it would take is one miscalculation, and the plan would fail. He only had one shot at the reversion, and he didn't like the choices thus far. There had to be a better way, something with a reasonable chance of success. A brush of movement caught his eye near the cashier. A group of four men had entered the cafeteria and made their way to the checkout stand. One of them was wearing a white coat and a thick beard. The others were dressed like orderlies, one of them completely bald, but each of the entourage had a similar face. He recognized every one. It was Starling on crutches and a trio of Lucas copies, who seemed agitated with the doctor. Definitely a tense situation. What the hell? he asked in a dull whisper, holding the newspaper in front of his face before the group looked his way. He didn't dare peek over the top of the paper, fearing his forehead and eyes might be enough to give him away. His brain took off in a race, crunching through a number of explanations as to why the Lucas copies were involved with the same man he'd run over in the hallway earlier. The Lucas copies were all his age, and therefore would have been toddlers in this time period. He doubted they knew this man in the past, even in their respective universes. He figured they must have known him in the future, or were instructed to find him in this time period by someone else. Otherwise, what would be the odds of three Lucas copies randomly connecting with Starling so soon after their arrival? Minuscule at best, he decided, just as tiny as the chances of the unlucky family dog that had run into a pack of coyotes near the stack of bloody tires in the alley across the street from the hospital. Extremely low, he mumbled. Either they were pulled back here by accident with him and then tracked down by someone they knew in the future, or... They came here from some other time in the future to meet with Starling specifically. If the latter was true, it seemed likely his copies were on a mission to change the past, just like he was. The complexity of this reversion attempt just shot up to a new level, making him cringe. Lucas waited until a silent count of 60 passed, then lowered his makeshift shield until he could see the vintage cash register. Starling and his entourage were gone, but now Drew's mom was in sight, talking with a group of nurses. 
She was wearing casual street clothes and carrying a leather purse over her shoulder. A set of keys was dangling from her hand. Her double shift must have been over, and she was about to head home. He slid out of the booth and stood up, ready to go have a talk with her. He was now on the clock, tucking the folded newspaper under his armpit. He gulped and took a deep breath to calm his nerves. However, before he could take the first step, the hospital's PA system screeched with three obnoxious chimes, making almost everyone in the eatery stop what they were doing and look at the ceiling with a concerned look on their faces. Attention, Lauren Falconio, please call employee services. Lauren Falconio, employee services, stat. Lauren's eyes flew wide, and she put a hand over her mouth. Her legs turned in a flash, taking her to the house phone mounted on the wall next to the dump station for garbage and food trays. She put her purse and keys on the surface between the dual trash bins, then took the white receiver from the cradle and answered it with her back to Lucas. As if on cue, everyone in the room turned in their seats and resumed their meals and conversations, all of it like nothing out of the ordinary had happened. Lucas changed his course, swooping in to grab one of the hillbillies' soiled food trays from the booth next door and take it with him. He made his way through the groups of tables, chairs, and chewing mouths, getting closer to his target. Lauren was still engaged in the phone conversation and facing the wall when he arrived. He stood in front of the garbage bins, close enough to touch her if he wanted. He put his newspaper on the counter next to her purse and keys, then dumped the leftover food into the trash can, tossed the silverware into a tote, and slid the tray onto the growing stack. Then, all in one fluid motion, he angled his body to conceal his hands from the staff behind him, laying the newspaper on her keys. He scooped his hands together in a flash, tucking the keys inside a fold in the newspaper while pressing firmly to keep them from jingling. Lauren never turned her head, still engrossed in the phone conversation, as he scooted past her and headed for the entrance. A minute later, he was outside, cruising down the hall with nobody running after him. Chapter 36 The elevator doors opened, and Lucas stepped into the crowd inside, working his way through a gauntlet of elbows and shoulders until he found the handrail across the back of the lift. Next to him was a tall, heavy-set young man wearing a jean jacket and a faded, striped gray shirt. If Lucas had to guess, he figured the plump neighbor was no more than 18 years old based on the smooth skin of his cheeks, the acne scars across his forehead, and the starter growth of stubble under his chin. A pair of vintage Sony Walkman headphones covered his ears as he bobbed in place on his toes, holding a whirring cassette player in his hand. The device had a red label on it with the name Leonard H. He made eye contact with Leonard, giving him a quick head nod before shifting a half-step to the left to give the kid more room for his bebopping moves. Lucas looked away, not wanting his growing smirk to insult the kid. Leonard may have only been a pudgy teenager, but he outweighed Lucas by a good hundred pounds. Granted, it was mostly flab, but his mind flashed Newton's second law of motion. It was an equation he knew all too well. Mass times acceleration equals force. The kinetic energy delivered by a punch from the music junkie would have been powerful regardless of their respective ages, or the tone of his muscle mass, or lack thereof. His sneer dissipated when he brought his eyes forward and checked the floor buttons. His destination was already selected. In fact, the G button was the only one lit on the control panel. The descent was going to be easy and quick. No extra stops along the way, since everyone was traveling to the garage. The doors started to close, then stopped in mid-motion as a series of time distortion events smacked him in the face. Wave after wave flowed through the elevator, bringing with them changes to the people in the car with him and their positions. Leonard was there, then he wasn't. Lucas found himself alone in the lift, and then standing outside of it looking in. Each time, the doors to the lift remained open, almost like they were frozen across time and space. An oddity, to say the least. During one iteration, he was the only male in a car loaded with teenage candy stripers. Four more time waves washed through the area. Then, the ripples stopped. As he expected, everything seemed to be back to normal. Leonard was next to him, dancing to his music and hogging up most of the space around him. 
the doors finished their close, reminding him of the final curtain of a Broadway show, but they stopped when a woman's hand appeared from outside. The closing process reversed course, and a frantic face came into view a few moments later. It was Drew's mom. Sorry, Lauren told everyone waiting inside. She ran a hand over her cheeks, clearing away a run of tears dripping from both eyes. She was clearly upset, probably by the sudden phone call from employee services she'd received a few minutes before. Lauren sniffed twice after she stepped inside the elevator, keeping her purse wrapped in her arms and pressed flat against her chest. Her hands were shaking. Two elderly women wearing matching poodle sweaters and identical crocheted handbags split apart from each other in the front row. Lauren moved between them, spinning on her flats to face the front with her shoulders pinned against the ladies. She leaned in front of the grandma on her right and pressed the already lit G button on the control panel several times. Come on, she snapped, pressing it again and again until the doors began to close. Finally. Is everything okay, dear? The woman on her right asked her in a slow, motherly voice. My son. I've got to get to my son. Daycare just called and told me he fell off the monkey bars and hurt his leg. My poor baby. Is it broken? I don't know. They said he's crying and in a lot of pain, she said, sobbing out loud. The woman rubbed her hand on Lauren's back, consoling her like any grandmother would do. Did they call an ambulance? No, we can't afford that. Besides, I'm a nurse and I've seen what comes into the ER. I don't want anyone moving him unless I'm there to supervise. Which daycare? ABC's? Is it far? The woman asked. Ten minutes if I make all the lights, Lauren answered, adjusting the straps of her purse across her shoulder. And I will make all the lights. Lucas wrapped his fingers around Lauren's keys in his right hand. The elevator's chime binged, and its overhead floor indicator changed to highlight the G symbol. The doors swooshed open, and Lauren took off running in an instant. Lucas waited for the elevator to clear and his fellow occupants to scatter. They did, like rats evacuating a sinking ship. Once the elevator was empty, he stepped out and started in her direction, following after her as she ran through a connecting hallway. He walked as fast as he could, not wanting to be seen chasing after an emotionally distraught woman. He looked at the ceiling, darting his eyes in search of the surveillance cameras, but there were none. Then it hit him. In this time period, Big Brother wasn't watching everything, not like they would be in another twenty-plus years. Normally, he was a proponent of technology and the wonderful advances that came with it, but not today. He was thankful for the lack of real-time monitoring. Otherwise, what he was about to do would have surely been caught on at least one video feed. Earlier, he'd been worried about Lauren noticing him as he followed her to the car, but that wasn't the case anymore. She was about 50 feet ahead of him, locked in a half sprint, and seemingly focused on a single task, getting to her vehicle quickly. A minute later, a blanketing shadow from the overhead structure masked her body when she entered the first row of cars. A heavy heartbeat knocked at his chest, reminding him of the difficult task ahead, especially if he lost track of her. He changed from a fast walk to a straight-legged jog, trying to find that graceful efficiency that exists somewhere between walking and running. It worked, smoothing his stride and leveling his vision, but he couldn't see her anymore. Even though darkness had her, it wasn't time to panic, at least not yet. He had her car keys locked in his hand, so she wasn't going anywhere. Not unless she had a backup set hiding in her purse. He figured the chances of that were slim. After all, who hauls around two sets of keys in case one of them gets lost? But she could have one of those magnetic key cases stuck under the lip of her car's wheel well. A thief's best friend and a vehicle owner's worst nightmare. It wasn't long before he entered the same outcrop of darkness that had swallowed Lauren only a minute before. He looked up and noticed the overhead light was out. He looked down and waited for his eyes to adjust before scanning the area. He didn't see any movement. There should be someone around, somewhere. If not Lauren, then another staff member or a hospital visitor coming or going. But it was eerily still and dead quiet inside the parking garage, except for his feet pounding on the cement. No car doors, no car stereo music, no voices, no engine whine, not even the distant sound of squealing tires making a sharp corner on the smooth concrete floors. Lucas realized Lauren might be difficult to spot, especially if she moved off in the distance. He stopped, wanting to consider his options. 
His hands moved on their own, making their way to his hips while he took in a few extra gulps of air to pacify his heaving chest. He angled his head down a few degrees and let his focus run into a soft blur. The new plan was to remain perfectly still and allow his peripheral vision and hearing to take over the search. They did, soaking in every drop of sensory input from the concrete surroundings. But alas, they came up empty, just as his normal vision had. He was stumped. Had she already found her car and realized she didn't have her keys? If so, maybe she circled around and went back inside the hospital to find them. Or had she gone to another level, leaving him in the dust and unable to follow her? Or could she have hitched a ride with someone else after discovering her keys were missing? Just when he was about to panic, he heard something from his left. It was a woman's voice, slicing through the silence. No, 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 the girl said. Damn it! She sounded like she was a few rows over, somewhere behind the twin support column standing alone. The voice was familiar, and might be Lauren's, but he really couldn't be sure. It was possible he wanted the voice to be hers, and was hearing what he wanted to hear. Lucas took off running in her direction, not stopping to think it through. His mind was focused on one thing, find Lauren and jack her car. But he'd have to wait for her to leave the area, which he figured would happen as soon as she realized her keys were not in her purse. She'd probably remember placing them on the garbage bin and run back to the hospital. That would be his chance. But he'd have to find her now, and do so before she left the car behind to go find her keys. Otherwise, he wouldn't know which car was hers. He increased his pace, weaving in and out of the vehicles in the next several rows, dodging a zigzag of door mirrors and the occasional spot of trash on the concrete. When he broke through the fifth row of Detroit metal, he stopped next to a dented cutlass with sanded gray primer streaks across its hood. Its driver had backed it into the spot. The uphill ramp corridor of the garage stood before him. So did Lauren, just thirty feet to the right and across the empty expanse. She was digging through her purse while standing next to a white Ford Escort with fancy pinstriping along the side. He assumed it was her car. The vehicle was covered with yellow and red flames that looked to have been hand-drawn. Except for the paint job, it was exactly the kind of car he expected a struggling single mom to drive. Not that it mattered. He had his answer and knew the ride. She just needed to leave. Then he could execute the final part of the plan. A thin smile grew on his lips when he realized the nightmare would soon be over. Finally, all that remained was to keep her from driving home tonight with Drew, and there'd be no car accident. No accident would keep her alive and Drew's legs intact. Drew would never end up in the orphanage, and they'd never meet and become foster brothers. He nodded slowly, realizing his agonizing saga was nearing its conclusion. Soon... Everything would be set right across the multiverse. A long, slow breath escaped his lungs, and his heart rate calmed a bit. Just one more step, and the future would forever be changed. All those billions of innocents who died would live again, cleansing his hands of the blood and ridding the guilt from his soul. The plan was elegant in its simplicity, but he needed to hold his celebration a bit longer— the final task might prove to be more difficult than he expected. She moved to the front of the escort and dumped the contents of her purse across the hood. Lauren was crying and talking to herself as her hands were tossing items around, looking for her keys. Lucas needed her to get herself together and go find her keys, now. He couldn't stand around much longer. Eventually, someone would cruise by and notice a man lurking in the darkness, stalking a pretty young nurse across the way. Right on cue, Lauren stopped sobbing. She turned away from the car and started walking in the direction of the hospital. Lucas moved back a step and lowered his body, keeping his eyes trained on her. Fifteen feet later, Lauren's swollen eyes swung in Lucas's direction. He ducked behind the cutlass and moved to the trunk of the vehicle. He didn't think she saw him, but he couldn't be sure. Regardless, he needed to time his movements around the back of the sedan to match her forward advance. If he was able to keep the cutlass firmly between them as she moved, he'd keep his location a secret. His mind's eye imagined her speed and course, counting a full second for each of her anticipated steps. He moved slowly past the trunk and around to the far side, staying low and watchful. 
the front of the car came upon him quickly as he listened to the echo of her nearby footsteps. She was to his left, and close. Damn close. That much was clear. He kept his head low and listened, trying to calculate her direction and distance. However, the footsteps stopped before he could gather enough information to pinpoint her location. He froze for a second and waited, now pressing his shoulder against the cutlass only a few inches in front of the right tire. Nothing changed. The area was all quiet, except for the stampede beating away inside his chest. He dropped to his knees and looked under the car, peering out past the front bumper. The area directly in front of the cutlass was all he could see, but her feet and legs weren't there. A sudden thought came unbidden into his mind, making the hairs on the back of his neck stand up and tingle wildly. It was something he hadn't considered before. What if she didn't cruise past the cutlass as he expected? What if she took off her shoes and was circling around behind? What if she was trained in martial arts or armed with that three fifty seven he'd visualized earlier and was about to start spraying and praying? He was totally exposed and unprepared. His breath held as his body swung around to check the area behind. He feared the worst, but only saw more parked cars and the empty space between them, except for a flattened soda can sitting under the edge of a badly worn tire. He released a breath when he realized she wasn't standing there ready to open fire and put holes in his skinny frame. The sound of footsteps started again on his left, this time at a faster pace than before. He peered over the hood of the car. There she was, a good twenty-five feet away, walking with fervor in her step. A moment later, she was beyond the garage exit, traveling through the night air outside, likely heading for the entrance to the hospital, a calculated shortcut, he imagined. He smiled and brought his eyes around to check the Ford Escort across the way. All clear. Nobody around. He verified her location again, still scurrying toward the hospital. It was time, he decided, time to make his move. The keys in his hand jingled when he brought them up and began to sort through them. He found the largest key, figuring it was the one to her Ford Escort. He pinned it between his fingers and stood up, walking with an even pace. He reminded himself to act natural and pretend like he owned the place. If he held his calm, it would appear as though he was simply heading to his car, just like anyone else. His eyes darted around the garage level, but there were no signs of life. It was odd. Only the two of them had been in the garage the entire time. He wasn't sure why, but it was nagging at him like something was off. Then again, maybe it was just his nerves. He decided to shrug it off, since it truly didn't matter at this point. Only about ten more steps to her car, and he would reset history once and for all. The door key slipped in like it had been greased with butter. He opened the car, climbed in, and sat down as his fingers found the ignition and started the four-cylinder compact. He swung his head around before backing out, but stopped when his eyes noticed a toddler seat in the back seat. It was red and blue with the letter S in the middle of its emblem. The Superman motif was the coolest thing he'd ever seen. It warmed his heart and brought a smile to his lips. Chapter 37 Lucas made his way out the garage through several miles of surface streets, then turned right and drove the stolen Ford to the last row of a parking lot behind a popular nightclub called Cowboys. He picked a spot, parked the car, and turned off the ignition, tucking Lauren's keys next to the Google glasses inside his shirt. If the glitzy marquee sign in front was correct, the dance club was featuring an outdoor country music event tonight, starting at 10 p.m., and the special live performance was sold out. Those facts, plus the mention of two-for-one Coors, were the reason he chose this location to dump her car. The escort should go unnoticed for hours as the drunken crowd filled the area with rowdiness and puke, leaving the cops to focus on traffic control and drunk driving stops. Plus, this location just so happens to be only a block away from ABC Daycare on North Tucson Boulevard. He laughed, thinking of the gabby old woman in the elevator. If they hadn't pressed Lauren about her son's injury, he never would have known which daycare had been assigned to watch baby Drew. 
He'd found the address in the yellow pages of a phone booth near the hospital after he'd managed an unfettered getaway from the garage. The original plan was to steal Lauren's car and park it somewhere safe, then fire up the smart skin suit and flash home to the future. But something inside of him took control and wouldn't let him leave so quickly. He knew every minute he spent in the past was a gamble, but a new, burning desire to see baby Drew was consuming him. He needed to know how badly his brother was hurt. Plus, if his attempt to alter the future succeeded, there was a good chance he'd never see grown-up Drew again. This may be his last chance, and he planned to savor the moment. He needed to say his goodbyes from a distance and make sure Lauren didn't borrow someone else's car and find a way to drive home tonight. Otherwise, he'd have to change his plan. Lucas thought he knew all the facts about her fatal car crash from Cleesby, but didn't remember Drew having a broken leg already. Maybe it was a new fact, or a forgotten one. He couldn't be sure. It wouldn't be the first time Cleesby omitted or altered important details to serve a secret need-to-know agenda. But either way, Lauren would certainly be distracted with an injured Drew in the car. The more he thought about it, the more he came to believe Drew's injury may have been the actual reason for her accident the first time through this timeline, not sleep deprivation. He decided to wait in front of the Three Spire Church across the street from the daycare. Its plush landscaping featured a neatly trim line of palm trees bordering the sidewalk, one of which looked to be the perfect height to use as cover from the cool night air. He took residence under its outcrop of palm fronds and waited for baby Drew to make an appearance. He figured he had some time to kill while Lauren searched for her keys in the cafeteria, then decided to bum a ride from a co-worker. Plus, there was the ten-minute drive. If he had to guess, the over-under mark for her arrival would be twenty-two minutes. ABC's front entrance was well-lit and directly across the street from his position. Four parents arrived during the first minute to pick up their kids, but none of them were Lauren. Lucas didn't have a watch, but he was able to judge time by studying the traffic light on the corner and counting its cycles. He ran a manual count of seconds and determined that each green-red transition took approximately two minutes to complete. Lucas kept watch on the area as seven traffic cycles came and went. Then his mind started to wander a bit. His focus drifted from Lauren's arrival to thoughts of the distant Earth outpost where his friends were waiting for his return. He knew it wouldn't be long now, making this moment in time extremely precious. His right shoulder leaned against the skinned trunk of the palm tree as the hypnotic sounds of city life embraced him. The melody was man-made and uneven, but carried with it a sweet undertone he wanted to remember— there were cars whizzing past with engines purring and music playing, potholes being hit with double thumps, metal tailgates rattling, and various rubberized tones from different tire treads skimming across the pavement. The rush of wind above him was especially soothing. Behind him, he heard the rhythmic clatter of the church's sprinkler system turn on. He glanced over his shoulder to see if the back of his pants might get wet. The water jets closest to him weren't active. Only the seven heads near the church's east wall were busy, each puffing out long sprays across the grassy knoll. Before he turned his attention back to ABC Daycare, another round of time waves erupted, interrupting his blissful moment with dizziness. The church's beautiful landscape was rotting and dead in the first cycle of change, then back to normal in the next— the parking spaces in front of the rectory on the right were full, then empty, then full again. Dizziness found him during the fifth distortion wave, making him grab onto the trunk of the palm tree holding him up. The series of displacement waves was much longer this time, numbering 22 before the event stopped and the woozy feeling disappeared. His eyes returned to the traffic light, but his attention was interrupted by a long blast from a car horn. It broke through the city noise and was coming from his right. He swung his focus in time to witness a city bus change lanes in heavy traffic, effectively cutting off an angry man behind the wheel of a shiny black Trans Am muscle car with wide tires spinning on a jacked-up rear end. The bus slowed to a crawl, stopping next to the sidewalk with a hiss of its air brakes, leaving at least a hundred yards between its position and the double doors of the daycare. The Trans Am spun its wheels violently, swinging wide around the transport, 
Its driver blasted the horn again while its squealing rubber took it swiftly down the busy roadway. The overhead safety lights inside the bus ignited, giving Lucas a clear view of the one passenger moving down the center aisle to the front. It was Lauren Falconio. The doors of the bus flew open, and Lauren made her way down the exit stairs. As soon as her feet hit the cement, she took off in a full gallop to the entrance of ABC Daycare. Lucas studied the bus, but no additional riders were standing, and none of them disembarked. He expected the bus to resume its journey after Lauren was clear, but it didn't move. In fact, the middle-aged driver sat motionless with his arms folded across the top of the steering wheel, the engine idling and parking lights flashing. Lauren pushed at the building's double doors and went inside. A few minutes later, she returned with a screaming baby in one arm. Lucas felt the sting of tears when he saw the crying face of his little brother. Drew's injured leg was sticking straight out with a flat brace along each of its sides, both secured with tan-colored medical wrap. Lauren's free hand was supporting his tiny leg, but Drew was obviously in a lot of pain. She found the sidewalk quickly, then picked up one of her legs and shook it back and forth at the bus driver. Lucas realized she was using her leg as a come-get-me signal since her hands were full. Lauren held the baby close to her chest, giving him a series of short kisses on the forehead as she waited for the bus to pull up and stop. It did. The overhead safety lights flashed on, giving Lucas a perfect view of the passengers, who were already standing near the front. Lauren climbed inside and sat in the third seat from the front. Her head disappeared from sight when she sat down on the far side. A heartbeat later, the doors swooshed closed, and the bus took off in a lurch. Its diesel engine let out a high-powered roar. Lucas watched the driver and his passengers head for the traffic light, with a heavy heart and a single tear rolling down his cheek. He whispered in a hoarse voice, "'Live a long and happy life, little chief.' Thank you for always having my back, no matter what. I love you, bro, more than you'll ever know. Lucas stepped away from the palm tree and onto the sidewalk, keeping his eyes on the bus as it traveled into the night. He was about to slip out of his street clothes and ready his smart skin suit for the trip home when a blur caught his eye. His vision locked onto the movement, seeing a yellow dump truck hauling a full mound of dirt, it was approaching the traffic light from the right at high speed. A beat later, its brakes squealed, but it wasn't slowing down. No! Lucas screamed while the bus entered the intersection on a solid green light. The dirt hauler blared its horn and tried to swerve, but it was too late. It rammed into the middle of the bus, on the same side where Lauren and Drew were sitting. The sound of the massive impact sent out a shockwave, staggering Lucas back a few feet. The bus bent where the loaded truck sliced into it, sending the bus skidding sideways. Glass and metal exploded into the air as the bus was ripped apart at its midpoint. Lucas gasped a shallow breath and held it when the two sections of the bus spun apart and entered the lanes of oncoming traffic. A wave of vehicles plowed into the front half of the bus, knocking it over and onto its side. The force of their combined impact sent it sliding into the back half of the mangled bus. More cars entered the intersection, with brakes engaged and tires smoking, smashing into the pileup. Each time another vehicle hit, it compacted the growing wreckage and pushed it a few feet closer to Lucas. Horns continued, and tires screeched, then more metal crunched. Just when he thought it couldn't get any worse, a powerful air horn sounded from the other side of the accident. It was a tanker truck, the kind that carried gasoline or some other hazardous liquid. Its wheels locked up, and its dual trailer was skidding sideways in a jackknife position as the driver tried to divert the payload from the intersection. Lucas knew what was about to happen, and his feet reacted before his brain could send the signal to run. He turned and took off for the church behind him. He wasn't sure his legs would be fast enough to get him to his destination in time, but he had to try. The deafening sound of the tanker's impact and subsequent explosion rocked the street. He dove headfirst for the grassy area, just beyond the east wall of the church. His belly landed first, allowing him to enter a long skid between the sprinklers. The heat from the massive fireball warmed his right cheek as he flew across the wet grass like a base runner stealing home plate. 
He ran a quick calculation and realized his right arm was about to smash into a sharp corner where the brick walls came together. Their edges would easily rip through his street clothes and damage the smart skin suit, so he tucked his arm in and rolled to his left side to slim his profile. It worked. A second later, his head and torso flew past the wall safely, but not before his eyes flew wide at the sight of the firestorm heading his way. It was massive, and nothing like anything he'd ever seen before. The flames and heat would surely consume anything it touched, like human flesh and a smart skin suit. His eyes swung ahead as his grassy slide continued, catching another problem in his path, the foot-wide base of a tree. He tried to duck his head, but couldn't get his hands up in time to protect himself. The top of his skull smashed into the stout trunk, and everything went black. Chapter 38 Lucas opened his eyes to find he was lying on his back with a mask covering his nose and mouth. His neck ached, and his head was throbbing. It felt like a herd of elephants were taking tap dance lessons inside. Floating speckles of blobs danced across his vision, making it difficult to focus. All he could see was a blurry image of a red-headed female and three retina-burning overhead lights. Plus, there was the rank smell of weak old B.O. in the air, but he wasn't sure if it was his stench or hers. The woman holding on to his wrist spoke in a soft, comforting voice. Stay calm, and everything will be fine. My name is Sarah. I'm a paramedic. You're on your way to the hospital. Hospital, he said in a slow, muffled voice, powering through his sticky lips. His mouth felt like someone had dumped a box of cotton swabs into it. There was an accident, but you're safe now. Can you tell me your name? Lucas, he answered, blinking rapidly to get a better look at the woman taking his pulse. Hi, Lucas. Nice to meet you. Do you remember how you received the cut on your scalp? Not really, he said, wanting to bring his hand up to feel the top of his head, but his arms wouldn't move. They were strapped to the gurney he was lying on. He started to panic, yanking his arms to test the restraints. She put her hands on his, squeezing and pressing lightly. Lie still now. We don't want you pulling the IV out of your arm. Why am I tied down? For your own safety. There were issues when I first began triage on you. Was I seizing? No, it was more restlessness than anything else. You were speaking nonsense and wouldn't let me get a good look at you. What was I saying? Something about a Krellian invasion, anchor points, and time travel? I've been doing this a long time, and I've heard some strange things over the years, but I have to say, never anything like that. So right now, I need you to remain still. Can you do that for me? Her voice had a calming effect. So did her touch. He nodded, though the pressure inside his skull was still there. My head. It hurts. You may have a concussion. I need you to breathe normally and lie still while I gather the rest of your vitals and address that cut. His memory still wasn't working, but his vision was clearing a bit. He could see that Sarah was a slender woman in her thirties, with a dash of freckles across her nose. Rather plain-looking, but she had kind, aqua-blue eyes and a gentle way about her. Lucas knew he could trust her, and he really didn't have a choice. He looked at his left arm and saw the IV line. She must have pulled the sleeve of his shirt up and then did the same with the smart skin suit to expose the vein. Sarah made eye contact and gave him a thin smile. It reminded him of how his mother used to smile when she was sitting on the edge of his bed, feeding him chicken soup when he was sick. I put you on fluids. Nothing to be concerned about. You're one of the lucky ones. Lucky? He asked in a shaky voice. What happened to me? There was a city bus collision and tanker explosion. I'm guessing you were knocked unconscious by the shockwave. We found you next to a fancy church with stained glass windows across the front. St. Michael's, I think. Do you remember any of this? As soon as he heard the words tanker explosion, the memories came flooding in. A charge of adrenaline rose up in his body, fueling his thoughts and words. My brother, where is he? Brother, she asked in a concerned tone. His name is Drew. Is he okay? I'm sorry, Lucas. We didn't find anyone else with you. Could he have run off? No. He was on the bus with his mom when the dump truck smashed into it. What happened to him? Is he alive? I wish I could tell you more, but I wasn't involved in the bus extrication. I did hear there was one survivor, a small child who was airlifted to the burn center. But other than that, I really don't know much else. 
A powerful knot formed in his gut, and his chest felt like someone had dropped a safe on it. His heart and his mind started to race, flashing a hundred thoughts all at once. Tears began to flow. Oh my God. Drew, this is all my fault. What have I done? Lucas, this wasn't your fault. Car accidents happen. People get hurt. You couldn't have done anything to stop it. Rest now. Save your energy. We need to focus on... He stopped listening to Sarah, even though her words continued to land on his eardrums. She worked on his scalp while he turned all his thoughts to Drew. All he could think about was a helpless child lying in the flaming wreckage of the twisted bus. His mind conjured a vision of Drew lying next to his dead mother and the rest of the bus fatalities. If Drew was the lone survivor who'd been airlifted to the burn center, then he surely was in critical condition and fighting for his life. If he survived the next few hours, he'd be disfigured for life. There'd be endless skin grafts, the scars, all the pain. But what about his legs and that gifted mind of his? What kind of life would he have now? The image of his beautiful foster brother's face faded from his memory and was replaced by a fresh pile of guilt. The universe was at it again, watching him, tormenting him with vicious intent aimed at those he loved. Each time he tried to fix the past, the problems escalated. Lucas had traveled back in time and changed the past all right, but his actions weren't helping anyone. His plan to stop Drew's mom from driving home didn't accomplish anything. Not a damned thing. She still died, and now everything else was worse. Deep down, he knew the lone survivor was Drew. It had to be. Otherwise, the future he came from would be gone forever, and he'd have nothing to return to. If that was the case, then he might as well take a gun, stick it in his mouth, and pull the trigger. Boom. End of story. Fuck history, and fuck the future. He'd already wrecked it all, so who the hell cared anymore? He didn't know how much more he could take. He screamed into the mask, sending every ounce of energy he had into his vocal cords and out through his lips. He yanked his arms up and down in the restraints, screaming again and again, trying to free the pain and guilt from his soul. Sarah slid away with her hands up and a frightened look on her face. Lucas let out one final scream and held it until he ran out of breath. When he was done... He felt better, though the look on Sarah's face told him she was petrified. Did I hurt you? She asked. No, he said, pumping more air into his lungs. I just needed to let that out. A guy can only take so much. You need to remain calm. I can't help you unless you do. He felt awful for scaring her. She was only doing her job and trying to help him. I know. I'm sorry. I lost my head for a moment. It won't happen again. He took a moment to let his private pity party fizzle on its own. It did. He needed to get a grip. Millions of people were counting on him to make this right, and he wasn't a quitter. It was time to stop acting like one. A wave of logic took over his brain, sifting through the available options. There weren't many left. In fact, there was only one. Anchor Point Alpha. The last remaining anchor point pre-programmed into Fuji's incursion system. Lucas figured the suit and glasses were running dangerously low on power by now. If he was right, he'd only get one more crack at this anyway. So, Anchor Point Alpha it was, his last best hope to undo all that he'd done. To get there, he'd need Fuji's help, assuming the monk was still waiting for him in the future. With Baby Drew's accident and all the other changes along the way, it was possible he wasn't. However, both Fuji and he were wearing smart skin suits, and the incursion technology was designed to protect them from changes to the timeline. He did have faith in Fuji and his science, though some of it was difficult to grasp at times, making Lucas wonder if any of it would hold true. In the end, his faith didn't matter. There was only one option left, and he had to try. Otherwise, all of history would fail, and so would the timeline reversion. If Lucas was going to travel to Anchor Point Alpha, it wouldn't happen if he was stuck in some hospital getting probed and prodded by a bunch of doctors. He couldn't take the chance he'd get sedated or locked away in a nuthouse, nor could he risk damage to the smart skin suit or the Google glasses stuffed in his pocket next to Lauren's car keys. His eyes turned to Sarah. I need you to stop the ambulance and let me out. I'm sorry, but I can't do that. Seriously, I need you to release me. She shook her head and pinched her lips. 
You need medical attention. The hospital's only a few minutes away. So right now, I need you to lay back and let me do my job. It's what's best for you, especially after your little tirade a minute ago. I said I was sorry, and it won't happen again. Just needed to vent. Can you please pull over and let me out? You need to be examined by a doctor, probably more than one at this point. Sarah, I appreciate your help, but you have a patient who's refusing treatment. Aren't you supposed to abide by his wishes? Yes, but we can't just drop you off in the middle of nowhere. Which hospital are we going to? University Medical. Perfect. That's right by my apartment. Trust me, I'll be fine. I'm feeling much better now, and I don't want any more treatment. Please, just pull over and let me out. I'll walk home from here. She paused, but didn't say anything. I know you have a job to do, but you're just wasting your time, and your driver's. As soon as we get to the hospital, I'm going to refuse treatment and walk away. Wouldn't you rather turn this transport around and go back to the accident and treat someone who actually wants help? I'm sure there are plenty of people who are hurt a lot worse than me. I see your point. Then I beg you, stop and let me out. I think you're making a serious mistake. I'll be fine. I really will. This isn't my first rodeo. I've been hurt much worse than this. A little bump on the head is nothing. It'll take a lot more than that to keep me down for long. Will you at least let me finish treating the gash on your scalp? Sure. Then I'm out of here. Deal? She hesitated, then spoke. Assuming the survivor is your brother, you might want to stick around until I can find out where they took him for treatment. But they probably won't let you see him until he's stable. Might be a day or two, so you'll need to prepare yourself and be patient. Sarah was right. His heart screamed at him to go check on Drew, but his logic told him otherwise. If it's him, the last thing I want is to see him like that. I'll never get that vision out of my head. That's not how I want to rem- He stopped in mid-sentence. How you want to what? Lucas tried to find words, but he couldn't come up with an ending for the sentence that would work. He decided to punt instead. Well, um, never mind. Let's just say that I have other more pressing matters to attend to. Please, just patch me up so I can get the hell out of here, okay? She nodded. I'm still going to check on the survivor for you. Whether you wait around or not, that's up to you. Fine, Lucas said, not having the energy to battle her anymore. He was completely spent, still needing to find out what happened to Drew and where they'd taken the lone survivor. Since the paramedic was offering, he decided to take her up on the help. Then he'd make his way back to Lauren's car and continue the mission. Chapter 39 The next morning, after falling asleep in Lauren's car by mistake, Lucas made his way to the critical burn unit on the first floor of the University of Arizona Medical Center in Tucson, looking for information on baby Drew. The paramedic had followed through and was able to locate the hospital where the first responders took the lone survivor of the bus crash. He needed to see his foster brother. It was the sole thought on his mind and the only reason he decided to remain in this time period. He wasn't sure how he was going to talk his way past the nurse's station, but he had to try. If nothing else, he'd force his way through them if that's what it took. Nothing was going to stop him. Not today. Not now. His logic had been correct the night before. Seeing a burned and disfigured Drew was the last thing he wanted permanently etched into his memory. But his logic wasn't calling the shots. It was his heart. He desperately needed answers, and the list of questions was growing by the minute. Was Drew the lone survivor? How bad were Drew's injuries? Were his legs crushed like before, or were burns the only new injuries? If Drew was dead, would Fuji still be there waiting for him in the future? How much power remained in the smart skin suit and Google glasses? Would he be able to make contact with Fuji? If he could travel back in time again, would his last attempt at a complete timeline reversion work, or would he continue to make everything worse? One question at a time, he scolded himself as he approached a trio of women working the 20-foot-wide CBU desk. Focus, dickhead. Start with Drew, then take it from there. Can I help you? The portly brunette nurse in the middle asked. Her hair was hanging limp and wrapped down across her left shoulder, as if a humidifier had taken all the life out of it. Her nose was holding up a pair of smudged reading glasses. Lucas checked for a name tag or ID. He found neither. I'm here to see my brother. Name, please? Drew Ramsey. The weary-eyed nurse punched at the keys on the ancient computer terminal sitting in front of her. It was the size of a commercial microwave oven, taking up half of the free space on her desk. Lucas leaned over the counter, catching a glimpse of the flickering 1980s green screen display as it filled with fresh lines of text. She looked at him, 
I'm sorry, but I don't have a listing for a patient by that name. Could he have been admitted somewhere else? I was told by a paramedic he was taken here, Lucas answered, suddenly realizing his mistake. Wait, try Drew Falconio. He might have been admitted under his mother's maiden name. His mother? Lucas knew he goofed. He should have said our mother instead. We're stepbrothers. The nurse locked eyes on the display again, pawing at its keys. She looked up a few seconds later. I'm sorry, no Drew Falconio either. Maybe he was taken to the county burn unit? I don't think so. I was told he was airlifted here last night from the bus accident on Tucson Boulevard. The skinny blonde nurse on the left rolled to the middle of the CBU desk in her four-wheeled office chair. Her wrinkled hands came up to cover her saggy cheeks as she whispered into the ear of her colleague. Their secret conversation lasted a few seconds, then the blonde rolled back to her station. We do have a small child who was brought in last night, though he's listed as Baby Doe, the brunette said. That must be him. Can I see him? Are you family? Yes, I told you before. I'm his brother. Stepbrother. Name, please? Lucas Ramsey. Is Drew okay? I need to see him. The nurse pointed at the bandage covering the cut on Lucas's scalp. Were you in the accident, too? Lucas was getting annoyed by all the questions. No, but I saw the whole thing happen from down the street. The explosion sent me into a tree. Can I see my brother or what? She leaned forward and scanned his stolen attire. Her eyes spent most of the time looking at his feet and then the bungee cord belt. She must have been curious about the paint splotches and the rest of his mismatched ensemble. A second later, she sat back in her chair, folding her arms across her chest. The expression on her face changed from helpful to suspicious. Can I see some ID? She asked in a serious voice. Hell no, I'm not showing you my ID. What is this, the Spanish Inquisition? Look, I just need to see him for a second. I have to know if he's okay. Not without proper ID. Lucas pinched his eyebrows and stuck out his jaw, wanting to send a strong message to her. Do you ask every family member to show ID, or just me? It depends. Jesus, lady, that's my brother back there, and he's probably fighting for his life. Why would I make up something like this? Until we can identify Baby Doe, I'm afraid I can't let anyone pass this station. His mother was just killed. Have some compassion, for Christ's sake. I'm all that's left of the family. How the hell do you expect to identify a baby unless the family does it for you? Sir, I need you to calm down. I am calm, but this is insane. Your logic doesn't make any sense. I am family, and I demand to see my brother. Sir, shift changes in a few minutes. When my supervisor gets here, we'll try and sort this out. She pointed at a waiting area across the hall. Why don't you have a seat over there? The blonde on the left picked up a phone, turned her back away, and started speaking quietly into the receiver. Based on her body language and the escalating tension, Lucas figured she was calling security. Can you at least tell me how badly he's hurt? She shook her head. I can't give out any information. You need to have a seat, sir. Please. Lucas tossed his arms in the air in frustration. If security was on the way, he needed to disappear, and fast. He spun his feet and headed down the hallway, the same way he'd come in. He knew it would take him to a connecting corridor that led to the south exit of the hospital. His plan now was to disappear into a secluded alley somewhere, then call Fuji and get on with the final incursion. It was the only option remaining. His feet passed a door stenciled with a placard that said private. Up next was the elevator bank, and then an intersecting hallway he'd passed on the way in. It featured two overhead signs, emergency and oncology. He'd need to take the second corridor and follow it around until he ran into the sliding automatic doors that faced the main parking lot along Speedway Boulevard. It was the same path he took when he arrived, except in reverse order. As he approached, the doors of the first elevator opened with a chime from the overhead floor indicator. A rush of people spilled out, so he had to bob and weave his way through the bodies. He kept expecting at least one member of security to step out of the lift, but it never happened. He turned his shoulders and eased past the final person, a man wearing a sharply pressed suit and tie, but stopped in his tracks when three men appeared at the far end of the hall. One of them was bald, but all three wore smart skin suits. Fuck, the Lucas copies. They'd tracked him down. There he is, the bald man shouted, pointing his finger at Lucas. The trio began a sprint. 
Shit! Lucas snapped, jumping into the empty elevator on his left. His backside just cleared the doors before they closed behind him. He randomly pressed the number five button and waited for the car to move. It did, allowing him to let out the frantic breath he'd been holding in his lungs. A minute later, the doors opened on the fifth floor. He stuck his head out to check the area. No sign of security or the Lucas copies. He started to step out, but he pulled his foot back when something occurred to him. If the copies were watching the overhead indicator on the ground floor, they'd know where he went. He decided to stay inside and let the door close again, this time selecting the number 7 button. He also decided to press the remaining 8 buttons above the number 7. That should slow them down, he mumbled. He'd need to make his way through the maze of antiseptic hallways and attending staff until he found the elevator bank on the far side of the hospital. If he kept his head down and his feet moving, he might be able to outwit and outmaneuver the others. Floor number seven arrived, and he flew out, not bothering to check the area first. There wasn't time. He went left at the first hallway, then turned right, heading north along his path. He was making good time and great progress until he passed pediatrics. As soon as he rounded the next corner, he noticed a pair of hospital cops. They were about 20 yards from his position and talking with two physicians in white coats. He reversed course and ducked around the corner, pressing his back against the wall. His mind was a blur, wondering if they'd noticed him. He didn't think so, but he needed to be sure, right now. He leaned around to take a peek. The cops were still chatting with the staff. That was the good news. The bad news was that two additional men with guns and badges were coming down the same hallway, probably to meet up with the others. He shook his head, realizing time was no longer on his side. Sure, there were dozens of other hallways to try and many other floors, but at this point, any route he chose was purely a guess. It seemed likely that security was fully engaged by now, fanning out and looking for him everywhere. Plus, he needed to avoid the Lucas copies, wherever they were. I'm screwed, he said, knowing it would take a miracle to weave his way through the gauntlet of threats without detection. Ten feet down the hall, a young female technician came out of a room labeled Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Her brown hair with blonde streaks was pulled back in a tight ponytail, and she had thick, black-rimmed glasses on her nose. She wore typical hospital staff attire, loose-fitting blue scrubs, and didn't seem to be in a hurry, though a $20 bill was in her right hand. Lucas was hit with an idea. MRI labs are usually staffed solo, meaning he should have the room to himself while she was gone. The question was, for how long? Since she wasn't carrying her purse, a coat, or car keys, he didn't think she was leaving for the day, so he didn't have to worry about her replacement showing up soon with shift change approaching. The money in her palm meant she was going in search of food or drink, probably breakfast based on the time of day. Otherwise, he expected to see a folder or a clipboard in her hands if she was on a work-related errand. He calculated the odds and liked his chances. She zipped past him quietly, making only momentary eye contact. He waited until her tiny feet took her around the corner, then went to the door of the MRI lab. His eyes read over the warning poster about metal objects in an MRI lab. He paused as he reviewed the items he was carrying. Some of them were ferromagnetic the Google glasses and Lauren's car keys, plus the smart skin suit's base fabric, graphene. However, since he wasn't planning on using the giant electromagnet inside, they shouldn't pose a risk, as long as he kept his distance. He pushed through the door, planning to secure it from the inside, but there wasn't a lock. Patient and technician safety guidelines must have precluded it. The lab's interior was perfectly clean with white cement floors, smooth white walls, basic white cabinets, and white drop ceilings with plastic supports. The donut-shaped machine was mostly white, too, making him feel like he'd stepped into whiteout conditions at the North Pole. Other than the manufacturer's logo on the front of the device, the patient insertion table was the only thing with color. A seven-foot-long tan pad on a raised plastic base, probably thermoplastic. The operator's control room was on the right, stationed behind a wooden door and viewing window, infused with a bronze-colored wire mesh inside the glass. He put his hand inside his shirt and found the Google glasses, putting them on the floor in the corner along with the car keys from his pants pocket. The street clothes were next on his to-do list. He stripped them off and tossed them away along with the ugly, uncomfortable shoes. Once the smart skin suit was exposed, he put the glasses on and touched the power button. 
The heads-up display came to life, highlighting the objects in the room with specs and dimensions. So far, so good, he thought, except the battery indicator showed only 7%. Power was running low, and he needed to hurry. This would be his last chance to use the tech, unless he could figure out how to recharge the system using old technology. Fuji, this is Lucas. Can you read me? Fuji, are you there? Come in. He waited a few seconds, but only heard silence. He spoke into the device again, using the same words in the same order. Again, only silence answered. He took off the glasses and checked them. The unit appeared to be intact and functioning correctly, so it should be working. He didn't know why it wasn't until his eyes landed on the indicator lights spread across the front of the MRI machine. The equipment was on, but running in standby mode using minimal power. Even so, it may have been generating a tiny but measurable magnetic field, which may have been interfering with the glass's communication signal. It was also possible the field might be enough to disrupt the suit's connection with Fuji's incursion chamber back home. He needed to relocate, but didn't think he had the time to find another secluded spot in the hospital, not with teams of security running around, and certainly not with three Lucas copies hunting him. Then he remembered the operator's station. It had its own room, and must have been shielded by some type of Faraday cage to trap and disperse the electromagnetic field generated by the powerful machine. Strong shielding would be needed in the walls and door to protect the computer equipment inside, and to prevent RF signals from being added to the data collected from the patient's scan, creating ghost artifacts on the resulting images. A lattice of copper mesh would make the most sense, and match the color of the metal grid inside the glass window. But unless he opened the walls and took a look, he'd never know. Lucas went inside the control room and shut the door. He felt a lock on the inside of the knob, which was odd, since the main entry door to the lab didn't have one. It must have been installed as a safety feature, keeping patients from wandering inside the control room and messing with the controls. Regardless of the reason for its existence, it didn't matter. He locked the door and tried the communication link again. A second later, he received an answer. Fuji here. Signal received. Waiting for video sync and thread stabilization. Hey, buddy. It's damn good to hear your voice. Mission status? Look, I don't have time for protocols. Power is down to 6%, so we need to make this quick. Instructions? Q anchor point alpha. I need to warn my deadbeat parents. Received and understood. Streaming displacement vectors now. Power sequence initializing. Chamber fast boot sequence commencing. We have a fast boot sequence now? Upgrades installed. How long? 90 seconds. Before Lucas could relay platitudes to the brilliant monk, a rush of movement caught his eye through the viewing window. He looked up and saw four burly security officers standing at the ready with their hands on their holsters, fingers touching their sidearms. Chapter 40 The faces of the four cops were burning a deep red color, and their mouths were flapping with angry words, but Lucas could only hear a faint, muffled version of their voices. It sounded like they were deep underwater. He was sure they were screaming orders at him, but he could only guess at what they were saying. The shielded walls and thick viewing glass of the operator station were doing their job with the utmost efficiency. Lucas put his hands over his head, giving the armed security team a facial expression and an exaggerated shrug that said, I can't hear you. They seemed to understand, moving their head and hands to tell him not to make any sudden moves. He figured the security detail stopped the MRI technician in the hallway and asked her about his possible whereabouts. She did make eye contact with him, and with his red hair, cheek scars, and stolen street clothes, it would have been easy for a trained observer like her to notice and identify him. One of the officers slid to his right, disappearing beyond the left edge of the viewing window. Lucas feared he might pull his gun and start shooting through the door, so he stepped forward to change his position. He felt like a rat trapped in a cage, a Faraday cage, with nowhere to run. Then his logic kicked in. If the guard sprayed lead, he'd certainly damage the expensive control equipment, costing the hospital several hundred thousand dollars minimum. Lucas relaxed his shoulders, realizing the officer was probably instructed not to shoot. Lucas started thinking about the equipment around him. An idea popped into his head. Sixty seconds, Fuji told him through the comm link. Lucas smiled at the officers in front of him, hoping to diffuse the itch that was no doubt building in their trigger fingers. He needed to buy a little more time. 
A bang rang out from the door on his left, then another. The officer he couldn't see must have been kicking at the door. Lucas let his eyes drop to study the relatively simple controls on the console in front of him, mostly analog knobs and old-school switches. Each instrument was labeled with its function, including a pair of power gauges with encoded limits and raised indicators on their plastic covers. He was thankful it was 1985 and not 2015. In the future, the control station would have been digitized with advanced computer screens and touchscreen controls. The sentry door thumped again, though this time he heard the wood crack upon impact. The man was making progress and would soon force his way into the control room. The three officers on the other side of the glass stepped apart from one another, increasing the space between them by at least a foot. Lucas figured it was some type of pre-assault maneuver. If he was correct, he only had seconds before they'd be through the door and have him in restraints. Certainly not enough time for Fuji's fast boot sequence to complete and energize the incursion stream. If they grabbed him first, their close proximity would disrupt the transmission and cause the matter stream to destabilize. Another splintering whack hit the door, then another... It was now or never, he decided, bringing his hands down in an instant. He ducked below the window as his left hand landed on the power control level and his right hand pressed the red initiator switch. Together, they fired the massive electromagnet standing guard behind the officers. The hum of the machine must have caught their attention, since all three of their heads snapped around to look at the device. Thirty seconds, Fuji reported. Lucas kept low and cranked the power well past the red line on its indicators, hoping the MRI initiated faster than Fuji's incursion chamber. All of the cop's duty belts were loaded with equipment, magnetic equipment. Each looked to be carrying several magazines of ammo in pouches along his vest, plus handcuffs, an expandable baton, a shiny security badge, a heavy belt buckle, metal snaps on their uniform, and, of course, a semi-automatic pistol with bullets in its clip. A moment later, a powerful field began to attract all the foreign metal in the room, grabbing hold of the four men, their guns, and their gadgets. Each of the men flew through the air toward the whirring magnet, snapping to its casing like insects stuck on flypaper. Another ten seconds went by before the smart skin suit energized, taking Lucas to his final destination, Anchor Point Alpha. Chapter 41 Lucas woke up from his trip to the past, lying on his back. He opened his eyes and found a dim overhead light flickering back at him. It was attached to a gray, dingy ceiling in a room that smelled like baby powder. He'd expected to find himself standing on the street in front of his parents' home in Tucson on his third birthday. His first childhood memory and the one anchor point in time that Cleesby and Fuji knew where his parents would be just a few months before his incursion to stop Drew's mom from driving home. But instead, he was somewhere else, and at night. He figured a supercharged magnetic field was the reason. His decision to crank the MRI device to full power must have altered the incursion stream slightly. Anchor Point Alpha was all about convincing his deadbeat parents to leave the drug trade and do so for the sake of humanity and the future— he knew it was a long shot, but it was the last shot, the only shot. He had to succeed, otherwise billions would die. If he could somehow make them understand what was at stake across time and space, they'd have to listen to him, right? He rolled to his side and sat up, locking eyes with a bleary-eyed male toddler standing in a crib. The boy was holding on to the wooden bars like a convict staring at his warden, expecting a release. The freckled youngster's hands may have been tiny, but Lucas soon learned that his lungs were larger than life when the cuddly kid started screaming. Lucas held a finger to his mouth, trying to shush the boy before his parents came running to investigate. It didn't work. The baby's high-pitched wailing only got worse. Lucas smiled and pulled at his face, twisting and distorting his skin to distract the child. His series of funny faces and goofy clown-like antics seemed to work. The baby stopped crying in an instant and giggled. It was one of those cute little laughs that babies make, the kind that melt everyone's heart. Lucas took a few of the quiet moments to look around the darkened space, searching for the door. 
The shadows were overflowing with toys and stuffed animals. Except for a half-full hamper bag and a four-drawer dresser standing in the corner, everywhere he looked, more toys. A homemade sign of paper letters hung on the wall above him. It was held in place on each end with masking tape, and it said, Happy Birthday, Lucas. He'd made it to Anchor Point Alpha all right, but was inside his own childhood bedroom instead of outside his family's home. He needed to get out now before his parents found him. If they did, they'd never listen to him. Not a strange man lurking around in their baby's room wearing a smart skin suit. They'd surely have him arrested, and this final attempt would fail before it had a chance to get started. There was also the likelihood of his father owning a gun. Most drug dealers carried, and finding a predator near his son would be all the justification he'd need to use it. The smart skin suit was a marvelous piece of technology, but it wasn't designed to stop a vengeful father and a barrage of hollow points. Lucas pressed to his feet and walked on his toes to the door, dodging three piles of playthings and the hamper bag. The door was sitting ajar, letting two inches of light drift in from the hallway. His eyes swung back to check the crib. Baby was sitting down and sucking on his thumb, his round, playful eyes watching Lucas's every move. There was a waft of smell in the air. Was the stink coming from the hamper bag or from the kid's diaper? When he'd gotten up this morning, the last thing he expected to do was smell his own baby poop or stare into the eyes of his toddler self. He didn't know why, but he had a sudden desire to pass along some wisdom before he left the bedroom. Baby Lucas was only three, but the words might hang around for a while and eventually sink in. Another long shot but it was worth a try. His entire life was nothing but long shots, so why stop now? He went to the crib and bent down, putting his palm on top of the child's thin, soft hair to pat it gently. Hey, little buddy, you're three now. Time to lose the diapers and the thumb. You need to take charge of your life because nobody else will. Trust me on this, he whispered to his blue-eyed self, feeling a strange tingle crawl across his arm and enter his chest. And... One more thing. When some bully calls you a freak, just turn and walk away. Otherwise, you'll end up looking like me. These scars are more than just skin deep. They never really go away. Baby Lucas smiled and giggled again, never taking his thumb from his mouth. Lucas turned and went for the door. His fingers pushed it open, allowing him to slip into the hallway. He gave baby Lucas one last glance, then shut the door behind him, leaving it open two inches as before. Before he could take a step, he heard a loud crash. The cracking splinter sound made him think someone had just kicked in a door. A second later, a woman screamed as heavy footsteps and clatter rang out ahead of him. Don't move, a male voice shouted. Lucas froze, wondering if he'd been discovered. Who are you? Another man asked, his voice lower in pitch. What do you want? The woman asked, crying through the words. Lucas heard a whack, then a heavy thump, like something had just hit the floor. All of the sounds came at him carrying a faint echo. However, all he saw was empty hallway, meaning something was happening in one of the connecting rooms ahead. Secure her, the first man commanded. Let go of me, the woman yelled. She sounded like she was struggling. The next few seconds were filled with scuffling sounds and several more thumps and whacks. Lucas stayed low and moved silently to an arched opening on the left side of the long hallway. He peered around the wall break and found a tall house plant next to the opening on the other side. Its thick leaves and branches provided an effective cover as he observed the spacious room. There were leather couches, plush recliners, glass coffee tables, a stone fireplace, and a ceiling-mounted projection TV. Seven tall, slender men, all wearing dark ski masks, fitted black suits, and white pressed dress shirts, were armed and huddled around a couple in the middle of the room. The man and woman were kneeling on an area rug. Both of them had wedding rings, red hair, and looked to be in their early twenties. The husband's face looked swollen, and he was bleeding from a cut on his lower lip. His wife was next to him, crying, with heavy splotches of makeup running down her cheeks. Her mouth was covered with a white strip of cloth, and one of the intruders had the barrel of his pistol pressed against the side of her head. Lucas assumed the couple was his parents. At first, he thought this was a drug deal gone bad, but what he was seeing didn't support the hypothesis. 
drug dealers don't typically wear matching expensive suits and ties and show this much restraint, at least not in any movie he'd ever seen. One of the assailants went to the kitchen. It was located on the far side of the room, directly across from Lucas's position. A suite of stainless steel appliances, beautiful raised panel hickory cabinets, and stunning granite counters caught his eye first. His parents were rich, at least by his standards, living in a spacious home with modern furnishings and state-of-the-art electronics, at least for 1984. Not exactly the kind of house he expected two low-life criminals to own. He was starting to wonder if the information he'd heard about his drug-dealing parents was wrong. If it was, it would mean he'd spent his entire life hating them for no reason. The skin across his chest tightened when he realized the very foundation of who he was and why he was ultra-motivated to make a name for himself had just been eroded to a paper-thin wafer. If they weren't drug dealers, then he wasn't a crack baby. The kid in the room behind him wasn't out of control. In fact, he was just the opposite, a happy, relatively calm kid who was loved by affluent parents who showered him with toys. Deep down, he knew his subconscious had always used the crack baby excuse as the fundamental reason to live with a bit of an edge, letting his temper roam free whenever it wanted. Had he been an asshole all these years and done so on his own? What kind of man did that make him? What else don't I know about them? The man in the kitchen retrieved a pair of fancy high-back wooden chairs from the breakfast eating area and brought them to the center of the room. As the man moved, his suit coat rose up and exposed something shiny on his belt. It was a pair of handcuffs, and they were hanging next to a handheld radio. Cops? Or feds, he couldn't be sure. It could also be a hit squad or a band of well-dressed mercenaries. Could even be the CIA, for all he knew. Something definitely felt off, and it wasn't just the squad of men with guns or the revelation about his parents. The scene playing out in front of him was all wrong. He didn't know what this was, but it wasn't about crack junkie parents and their drugs. His parents were pulled to their feet and forced to sit in the chairs by two different men who promptly secured their hands behind their backs. A man stepped forward and grabbed Lucas's father by the chin, tugging it up with force. Who'd you give it to, Chapman? Chapman? My last name is Chapman? I don't know what you're talking about, Chapman said after the man let go of his face. The floppy. We are here to reacquire the information you stole. You've got the wrong guy. Chapman nodded at the wall by the fireplace. See all those certificates? I'm a chemist. I design food preservatives. Lucas looked at the man's display of accomplishments and felt a wave of pride enter his body. His old man was a scientist, like him. We know who you are, Chapman. Or should I say, Red Seven. We've been tracking you for some time. I told you, you have the wrong guy. I'm a chemist, not a spy. Holy crap. My dad's a spook? But for what country? Ours or someone else's? The lead man looked to his right, grabbing one of his team members by the lapel. Bring in the doc. Time to expedite, the man said, with no perceptible accent. The tension in the room rose tenfold. Lucas watched the man's colleague hustle outside through the splintered door hanging gingerly on its hinges. It was a few feet to the left of the impressive kitchen. Lucas needed to go get help and save his family from these thugs. The hallway he was hiding in looked like it angled around and emptied into the kitchen from the right. He might be able to make it that far safely, then hide behind the center island where his parents' six-burner gas stove was installed. But getting to the broken door undetected was going to be next to impossible. He'd need a diversion or a miracle. Maybe both. Then he'd have to figure out how to slip past however many men were standing guard outside. What are you going to do? His dad asked the man in charge. Starling's going to administer a special blend of pharmaceuticals to your wife. Once he does, you'll have precisely three minutes to tell us what we want to know. Starling? Dr. Starling? The guy I knocked down in the hospital? What happens after three minutes? Chapman asked, spitting a patch of blood from his mouth. Her heart stops. But trust me when I say this cocktail is designed to induce more pain than anyone could imagine. At least it does right up until the moment when the heart explodes. We call it Protocol 2, and it's most effective on trained operatives. 
Lucas's mom started screaming muffled sounds into the gag, stomping her feet and shaking the chair she was strapped to. You can't do that. We're U.S. citizens and we have rights, Chapman snapped. Not today, Chapman. Today, all you have is a few minutes. So decide now. Tell us what we want to know or watch your wife suffer a horrible, painful death. If you harm her, I'll kill you where you stand. Those are big words from a lowly food engineer. Besides, I don't think you're in a position to be making threats. You might want to save your energy for what comes next. Lucas turned and looked at the baby's bedroom door. His mind slipped into analytical mode, sifting through all the data he'd gathered. If this home invasion happened the first time around, he didn't remember any of it. Why? It wasn't because he was only three years old. He had other memories from this age, albeit faint and spotty. Still, a home invasion of this magnitude would certainly be something he'd remember, even as a toddler. That meant none of this happened the first time through history. If it didn't, then this incursion, along with each of his previous, had caused bigger and wider ripples to bleed back and change the past. Fuji did mention something about significantly more power being needed to travel further back in time. More power would result in bigger ripples, affecting larger chunks of the past each and every time. With each change, the math would grow infinitely more complex, so much so that even a brilliant man like Fuji couldn't anticipate all the variables and formulate corrective action. Then it hit him. Time travel was a no-win scenario. Every incursion, no matter how carefully planned and executed, would always cause timeline changes to bleed back and alter more of the preceding past. The effects would spread and magnify, making the entire process unpredictable and unquantifiable. It was all starting to crystallize in his mind. Their plan to target specific anchor points with planned changes wasn't going to work, regardless of how tightly focused the selection process was. Time would always find a way to fight back and adjust, like the flow of a river around an obstacle. Regardless of the temporal mechanics at play, right now his task was the same. He couldn't leave the child to face a life without parents, a life in foster care, or face the wrath of the men holding his parents hostage. He needed to take the baby far away and keep him safe, avoiding the orphanage and a future with Drew. To do that, He'd need a car and a modicum of luck. His eyes returned to the scene in front of him and spotted his mom's purse sitting by the toaster on the kitchen counter. There were probably car keys inside, and he was already a pro at stealing women's keys. A chance came to move down the hallway undetected when all the men in the room had their heads turned. He took it, circling around to the unguarded entrance to the kitchen on the right. He crawled on hands and knees while the men's eyes were focused elsewhere, scooting into the kitchen behind the center island. His hand went up and felt around for the purse. He found it. Once it was locked in his fingers, he pulled it down from the counter, praying none of the cops saw his covert maneuver. He paused for a minute to listen and verify. The conversation in the other room hadn't changed. He figured he was safe and peered around the island. All heads were turned the other way, allowing him to crawl back to the hallway with the purse hanging from his mouth. A minute later, he was back in the room where baby Lucas was now sleeping. He dug through the purse and found a set of keys. The keychain said Lincoln. He put the purse down quietly and opened the bedroom window. It only took a second to push the screen out before grabbing the sleeping kid, who fell limp in his arms. He climbed outside and ducked behind a bush to check for sentries. There were none. Perhaps the rest of the invaders were out front and not on perimeter watch since the Chapmans had been secured inside. Then again, the men wouldn't want to raise suspicion with the neighbors, so a low-profile presence would have been wise. He may not have to fight his way through a gauntlet of men after all. A slight grin fell on his lips, realizing his simple escape plan might work. Like Professor Cleesby used to say, Sometimes the easiest solution is the hardest to find. Keep it simple, one step at a time. He needed to work his way around to the garage and slip in through the main door on the side. Mom drove a Lincoln, which in 1984 was a heavy sedan. It should make an excellent getaway vehicle. 
He needed it to be full of gas and parked in the garage. Otherwise, this would be the shortest escape attempt of all time. Chapter 42 Lucas peered over the fence from the side yard to check if there were any men out front. He could only see a small portion of the front yard, but didn't see anyone, and there weren't any vehicles on the driveway leading to the street. He used his mother's keys to gain entry to the garage through the side door. A four-door, lime-green Lincoln Town car was parked inside. It was spotless and looked brand new. The dome light had been left on, allowing him to see inside before opening any of its doors. He prayed the battery hadn't been drained completely, otherwise the starter wouldn't receive enough cold cranking amps to turn the engine over. A child seat had been installed behind the front passenger seat, much as he expected. In fact, he'd counted on it. He opened the door and put baby Lucas in the car seat in the back and strapped him in, taking extra care to ensure a snug fit for the rough ride ahead. He was amazed the kid was still asleep, out like a light. He couldn't remember ever sleeping that hard, at least not since he was dumped off at the state home as a preschooler. Danger had a habit of finding him, so he had slept with one eye open in his bunk. It was a tough habit to break, even after the Ramsey family took him in a few years later. If he was lucky enough to get four or five hours of actual sleep, he was usually good to go in the morning though perpetual tiredness did have a tendency to make him a little cranky. He was about to walk around to the driver's seat when something occurred to him. What if this child wasn't him? What if it was some random red-haired little boy whose name just happens to be Lucas? It wouldn't be the first time the universe had tricked him. He needed to know for sure before he risked his life and humanity's future. There wasn't time or the equipment for a DNA test, and he couldn't compare fingerprints with a child— so, only one choice remained, his birthmark. It didn't take much for his fingers to peel down the side of the diaper, allowing him to check the baby's hip. There it was, right where it should be, a random splotch of skin discoloration that looked like a wrinkled koala bear. The test was conclusive. This child was him, and the people being tortured inside were his parents. He couldn't risk waiting for the garage door to open on its own. The men outside would react instantly, surrounding the car before he could step on the gas. His only choice was to gun the engine in reverse and smash through the aluminum door, then spin a 180 and make a run for it. His plan would put baby Lucas in danger, but he didn't have a choice. The safety seat needed to do its job. The town car's seats were a gray leather, soft and plush, his butt nestled in, appreciating the comfort and fit of a true luxury car. He used the power controls to push the seat back to make room for his legs. He'd obviously gotten all his height from his old man, since Mom was a shorty, having to sit so close to the steering wheel and pedals. He put his forehead against the top of the steering wheel, taking a few deep breaths to calm his nerves. He had a plan in mind, but it was going to take everything he had to make it work. The number of men out front was an unknown, and so was their reaction. Would they fire their weapons, or simply try to block his exit? He figured they'd give chase regardless, but it would take them a minute to run to their cars and begin pursuit. Once he had a head start, he'd need to find a way to give them the slip. Evasive maneuvers was one of his favorite taglines from Star Trek. That's precisely what it was going to take to get away unscathed. He was planning to send help back for his parents, assuming he had a chance to do so. If not, they were on their own. If time was watching him and making corrections to his actions, then they were probably dead anyway. Baby Lucas was his one and only priority. It was a new twist on the old saying, take care of yourself first. He looked at himself in the rearview mirror, summoning all his resolve. It worked. He was now ready, and so was a snoring baby Lucas in the back seat. The eight-cylinder engine seemed to start on its own. Its powerful howl made his body react, moving the transmission into reverse and stomping on the gas. The rear-wheel drive Lincoln spun its tires on the slippery garage floor for a few seconds before they caught traction. The 4,000-pound beast lurched backward, crashing into the door and plowing through it. The garage door screeched and clanked as its metal was bent back and out of the way. The Lincoln cruised across the cement apron and made it to the street. 
A moment later, he made a U-turn and put the car into drive. He raced off, his eyes checking the scene. Three identical black sedans with government plates were parked along the curb in front of his parents' house, but he didn't see any of the men. They must have all been inside. He drove a quick fifty feet and turned onto a connecting street, cruising away from his parents' house. The compass ball on the top of the dash told him the car was pointed north. The rearview mirror showed four men running to their cars from the front door of the house. One of them was using a handheld radio, while the rest seemed content to holster their weapons as they moved. The neighbors around the home were stirring now as lights popped on and doors opened. Lucas made alternating lefts and rights, accelerating through the network of residential streets in what he assumed was an upscale neighborhood in Tucson. Probably East Tucson, if he had to guess, near the luxury homes he knew existed at the foot of Mount Lemon. The digital clock on the dashboard told him it was 1.37 a.m. He smiled and increased his speed, knowing the streets would be mostly deserted at this time of night. He continued north, planning to disappear on the mountain roads of Mount Lemon. If he could make it up and over its 9,100-foot peak, he'd be home free. Masago's underground complex was an hour's drive beyond it in the desert, and it was waiting for someone to bring it to life. He planned to be that someone. Since her old man hadn't purchased it yet, it would be the perfect place to live with his younger self until the Fuji family showed up for their first walkthrough. That should be one hell of a reunion. He couldn't wait to see the look on Masago's face when she locked eyes with the man in her drawings. He'd have a lot of explaining to do, but he had plenty of time to prepare a speech for their eventual encounter. Lucas kept the speed up, making it to the base of the mountain without issue. He'd used the mirror to watch for pursuers, but there were none. He wasn't sure why they hadn't decided to give chase, but was happy they hadn't. Fifteen minutes later, a reflective road sign flew by, indicating it was only three miles to the summit where the lone ski resort in Tucson was located. He'd never been skiing at the mountain retreat, mainly because he couldn't afford it, but also due to the thought of impaling himself on a tree. It wasn't his idea of fun. He'd driven this winding road a long time ago with Drew and his adoptive mother, and knew its scenic beauty during the daylight hours. The endless views of the cityscape behind him were impressive, plus the steep canyons were lined with majestic pine trees, all of it breathtaking. The view at night didn't do it justice, not with the darkness swallowing its beauty and keeping most drivers on edge with the intense danger lurking only a few feet to the right of the shoulder. At least once every winter, some drunk skier would miss a turn and plummet thousands of feet to his death. It would be all over the news for weeks as the steep terrain made it difficult for search and rescue to recover the body. Lucas remembered the story Masago had mentioned about the poor schmuck who managed to pick the single biggest drop-off point along the entire road. Talk about bad luck. The crash started with the guardrail giving way and ended in a towering fireball in the middle of a citrus farm at the foot of the mountain. Baby Lucas was still sleeping in the back, completely oblivious to the harrowing escape and the mountainous world around him. Lucas admired the innocence he once had as a child, wondering if part of life's master plan is to slowly strip you down one layer at a time until all that's left is a lonely cynic. It was a cruel reality, but one he might be able to change for the precious child in the back seat. Just a few more miles, and he'd be able to start that journey and do so in the role of a surrogate father for himself. Before the next bend in the road, the area suddenly lit up like a supernova. A spotlight from above was now beaming down on the town car, creating havoc with his eyes. He slowed down a bit, waiting for his vision to adjust. It did. For a brief second, he thought it might have been the Baku, the alien race of adolescent telepaths, returning to finish what they'd started on the Earth outpost. But then he heard a deep chopping sound ripping through the cold night air. A helicopter. They found us. But how? He was sure they hadn't been followed. Only twice had he seen headlights following in the rearview mirror, and both times the drivers had turned off and gone on their way. His brain searched for an answer. Then he found it. A tracking device. They must have installed it on the car. The dome light. That's why it was on. The thought never crossed his mind. 
One of the intruders must have gone into the garage and planted a transmitter on the vehicle, most likely under the hood where it could be easily attached to the battery for continuous power. It must have been standard operating procedure in case they lost containment of the home. The angle of the spotlight changed from directly overhead to a lower angle, burning in on the driver's side. His left eye was taking the brunt of it now, so he put a hand up to block the intensity. It worked, though he didn't know if they were focused on him or on the child in the baby seat. Just then, baby Lucas woke up and started crying. The damn light must have woken him up. It'll be okay, Lucas, he told the child. Just a few more minutes, I promise. I'm going to find a dirt road somewhere and turn off. Once we're under the trees, that nasty light will go away. The pavement curved left and continued its climb, cutting the light off for a bit as the tall stand of pine trees blocked its view. The crying in the back seat lessened as well, giving Lucas a chance to focus without the penetrating noise. He kept watch for a turnoff, but the steep terrain along the edge of the mountain didn't provide one. He calculated they were less than a mile from the peak. If he remembered correctly, the road straightened along the final approach. After two more bends in the road, his prediction came true. He could see lights ahead in the direction of the resort. Unfortunately, they were flashing red and blue. Dozens of them. Fuck, a roadblock, he snapped, not stopping himself from dropping an F-bomb with the baby in the car. He slowed the car down by ten miles an hour, wanting to consider his options. Turning around might work, but the dark, narrow road would make that a dangerous maneuver. A moment later, the helicopter peeled off and was replaced by a sea of red and blue lights in his rearview mirror. Somehow, they had caught up to him from behind. He was pinned in. Chapter 43 Lucas tightened his grip on the steering wheel, staring straight ahead with glazed eyes and no options. A string of patrol cars was closing in from behind, herding the town car toward the waiting roadblock a mile ahead. It wouldn't be long before he was arrested, and they'd take baby Lucas away. He could kiss the smart skin suit goodbye, and any chance of ever getting home to a future where everyone he loved was still alive. Time had adjusted and stopped his reversion plan again. He was correct earlier when he figured time was like the flow of a river, constantly avoiding the obstacles placed in its path. It's not possible to change the flow of time or stop it, not when it can see the obstacles coming. It seemed like the harder he tried or the further ahead he planned, the easier it was for time to take corrective action, just like a river might do with larger obstacles in its way. The further ahead it can see it, the more time it had to build momentum and adjust its path. Damn, he had been so close to a solution. This incursion almost worked when he snatched the baby. It wasn't planned, and for a short while, his attempt had a chance to succeed. Eventually, though, time caught up to him, making adjustments to restore history on its original course. What he should have done was not plan as far ahead. Fuji's selection of obvious anchor points with specific timeline changes was a mistake. They should have simply winged it with sudden changes, changes that time wouldn't see coming. It might have worked, but the changes would have needed to be unexpected and instantaneous, some type of swift, permanent change that time couldn't stop or correct. He looked at the dashboard clock, just as its LED numbers advanced to the next minute, 2.12 a.m. A smile of familiarity hit his lips. He'd grown accustomed to seeing that number, seemingly at every turn. 212 must carry some cosmic meaning, he decided, almost as if this exact moment in time was the singular focal point of his entire existence. Then the answer hit him like a freight train without brakes. He didn't want to waste another second, giving the narrows of time a chance to correct. He let his hands turn the steering wheel to the right, sending the bumper of the car crashing through the metal guardrail. A second later, the pavement let go of the tires, and he and baby Lucas were airborne, heading for the final curtain below. Screw you, time! he yelled. You can't fix this! His mathematical brain ran a quick calculation, determining that a little over 23 seconds remained before the 4,000-pound vehicle hit the bottom of the 9,000-foot drop. 
just a little over 20 more seconds, and this nightmare would finally be over. Baby Lucas was crying hysterically in the seat behind him. Lucas felt horrible for what he'd just done, but there was no other choice. He had to remove himself from the timeline, both versions of him. If his journey ended this very minute in the past, then all the misery that came after it would never happen again. It was the only chance to protect everyone he loved and save all those souls who lost their lives because of his reckless decisions. The Lincoln's left headlight was still working as the bottom drew closer in a wash of shadows. He could smell the scent of oranges getting stronger with each passing second, figuring the farmer's grove was the impact point. He waited for the time distortion waves to catch up to him, making changes to the timeline like a teenager switching channels with a remote control. But they didn't come. He'd done it. He'd beaten time. Sometimes the simplest solution is the hardest to find. Memorable words spoken in both the past and in the future by a truly great man and friend, Dr. Cleesby. A sudden vision entered his thoughts. It was a beautiful, loving scene, one he planned to remember for all of eternity. Drew and Abby were standing across from each other, holding hands on the altar of a church. Drew was dressed in a handsome tux and standing on his own two legs, no sign of a wheelchair or crutches. Abby was smiling back at him, wearing a gorgeous wedding dress that flowed down her body and across the steps of the altar. Abby's teary eyes were locked onto Drew's, and her smile full. The glow on her cheeks was obvious, as was her love for Drew. A blurry, faceless priest was performing the ceremony, while a throng of people witnessed the holy union with blissful eyes. He could see the faces of his friends and loved ones. Everyone was there everyone except him. He assumed the scene was a glimpse of things to come, a future he'd just created. He accepted his fate, knowing what he was seeing couldn't happen if he was still alive. The vision changed, this time showing only a brief snapshot. He saw Masago standing in front of an easel on a mountaintop looking west at dusk. She was holding a slender brush with its tip covered in red paint. But there wasn't a portrait of Lucas on the canvas, only a rendering of the stunning sunset. The final second arrived, and so did the consuming blackness. It was a fitting end for the East Side Exterminator. A man who never believed in the unity of life, but one who believed in the harmony of death. A hero's death. For Drew, for Dorothy, and for all of humanity. The end.